I declare open this additional estimates 2021-22 hearing of the Senate Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Legislation Committee. Today, the committee will examine the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, followed by the Department of Veterans Affairs. The committee is due to report to the Senate on the 29th of March 2022 and is fixed Friday 25th February as the date for senators to submit written questions on notice in order to receive answers by the due date on the 25th of March 2022. Information on procedural rules governing the estimates, hearings and claims of public interest immunity has been provided to departments and agencies and is available from the Secretariat. Senators, departments and agencies have been provided with advice on the arrangements in place in uh, to ensure the hearings are conducted in a safe environment. The guidance is also available from the Secretariat. An officer called to answer a question for the first time should state their full name and capacity in which they appear, and witnesses should speak clearly and into the microphones to assist Hansa to record proceedings. Mobile phones should be switched off or turned to silent. I now welcome Senator the Honourable Maurice Payne, who has an exceptionally long day ahead of her, <laughs> uh, and uh, thank you for being agreeable to change uh, the hearing of foreign affairs to the day. Actually, Chair, I thank you. <laughs> uh, and, uh, I'm not sure you really want to be here, but uh, <laughs> anyway, but uh, Minister, thank you. And Ms Campbell, um, as the Secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, uh, welcome as well. And Minister, do you wish to make an opening statement? I do, Chair. Thank All you right. very much. And I do want to thank the committee uh, for the committee's flexibility uh, in uh, being able to uh, bring foreign affairs estimates to today and uh, take defence estimates uh, tomorrow. It does enable me to depart uh, later today for the Munich Security Conference At 10 uh, and is to, correct? to present yes, to the Munich Security day. Conference, uh, as well as uh, part of a, a broader um, series of, uh, of international visits. Uh, I do appreciate the recognition the committee has extended to the importance of uh, that travel. Uh, Chair, given uh, my absence uh, tomorrow from uh, defence estimates, I do uh, seek the committee's indulgence in asking me to, in allowing me to make a short statement about a former colleague at the Department of uh, Defence, uh, Mr. Brendan Sargent, who died tragically and unexpectedly uh, in an accident over the weekend. Yeah. Uh, Brendan joined the Department of Defence in 1983 as uh, an assistant research officer. Uh, his public sector friends and colleagues know that he went on to work in the Attorney General's Department, uh, in then Centrelink, uh, in the Department of Finance and Deregulation, but he came back to Defence in March of uh, 2010 as Deputy Secretary Strategy. He also held the position of Deputy Secretary Reform and Governance before being appointed Associate Secretary in March of 2013. He held that position until he retired from the department and from the APS in uh, July of 20, 2018. He also acted as secretary on many occasions. I worked with Brendan in his role as associate secretary for three years uh, as defence minister. He was most recently head of uh, the Strategic and Defence Studies St Study Centre at ANU following his career in defence. The 2013 White Paper, and really importantly, the first principles review uh, were principally authored or overseen by Brendan before he left the department. In their statement, the CDF uh, and the Defence Department Secretary, Greg Moriarty, have observed that his white paper shed new light on changing circumstances in the region, including emerging cyber threats and the implications of the global financial crisis. In helping lead the First Principles Review major organisational reform agenda in the department, which I know this committee has concerned itself with on many occasions, he helped to modernise defence and position the agency to better contend with today's security threats. I'd say, Chair, that of the uh, many uh, Australian public servants that I've had the privilege and honour to work with, he was one of the most dedicated, professional and committed individuals you could ever hope to meet in the classic mould of a traditional public servant. Uh, he gave great service to this nation. It was an absolute pleasure to work with, and on behalf of the government, I convey my deepest sympathies to his wife and his daughters. Their loss is enormous, and we are thinking of them. 
Uh, thank you very much for that uh, very heartfelt uh, condolence message, Minister, and I'm sure I can say on behalf of the committee that the committee echoes those sentiments and extends uh, condolences to the family, and uh, not only is he a loss to his family, but clearly to the nation as well. Secretary, do you have an opening statement? Uh, Catherine Campbell, Secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. No, Senator, but if I could just join with the Minister in paying our deep respects to Brendan Sargent and uh, our sympathies to his family. He was the Audit Chair of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and had continued to serve. And uh, we were meeting with him just a few weeks ago in order that we uh, improved our governance across the department and he remained com very committed to serving his nation. Thank you very much uh, for that, uh, Secretary. Uh, just for uh, other senators' uh, um, plans for the day, the Greens will have a bracket of questions immediately after morning tea, and I'm told that at morning tea we'll be provided with a birthday cake, courtesy of Senator Kitching, whose birthday it is today. But, uh, <laughs> but, but we will bacon. await that it's cake. We will await that cake. Uh, she no, herself. no, what a look, um, uh, I have now put her under pressure on that. But happy birthday, Senator and <laughs> Senator Keneally, you have the call. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, thank you to the uh, minister and to the department for their attendance today. Um, We've seen the news this morning uh, on Ukraine uh, and uh, the, what appears to be a somewhat withdrawal of troops. Uh, is it possible for the department to give us an update on the current situation in Ukraine? I'll just ask Ms Cooper to come to the table. Uh, I would say, Senator, as, uh, as Ms Cooper does come to the table, uh, that I think it is uh, very important that um, verification is obtained of, uh, of those reports. Uh, that is an observation that uh, uh, the NATO Secretary General uh, has made and uh, the President of, uh, of the United States. Um, Secretary of State has also called for verifiable, credible, meaningful uh, de-escalation, but um, I'm sure um, Ms Cooper will add to that. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. Um, good morning, Senators. Katrina Cooper, Deputy Secretary, Southeast Asia and Global Partners. Um, we have seen those reports, uh, Senator Keneally, this morning. We have had a report out of um, our embassy in Moscow. Our ambassador has sent uh, uh, sent uh, an assessment. I mean, it's too early. I shouldn't say assessment because it's a little bit too early to do an assessment, as the minister has pointed out. Um, but it is it is an encouraging sign uh, that we are hearing those reports. Of course, they are coming out of Russia. So, as the minister has said, we do need to drill down a little bit into that and make an assessment. Um, the latest um, uh, uh, assessment of the number of troops on the border is 150,000. Uh, we heard President Biden say that just overnight. That's a lot of troops, um, Senator Keneally. So um, the capability is clearly there for a full-scale mm -hmm. invasion in Ukraine. Um, we're also hearing, though, um, suggestions that a diplomatic off-ramp is still possible. And you will have observed over recent days and weeks multiple efforts to engage um, uh, with uh, President Putin and Russia in, in the hope of finding a way uh, to avoid um, uh, uh, kinetic activity and invasion of Ukraine and find a diplomatic pathway. So we remain hopeful, uh, Senator. I guess there's grounds for a very cautious optimism in terms of what we've seen overnight, uh, but we remain deeply concerned about the situation on the Ukrainian border and uh, we've, you know, we are uh, standing up very strongly in, in, in what we say and, and how we um, conduct ourselves um, uh, to say quite clearly that um, you know, Ukrainian territorial integrity and sovereignty uh, should be inviolable. Mm. You mentioned there the number of troops on the border, 150,000, uh, according to the US President. Uh, my understanding is there are also a number of troops in Crimea. Um, could you uh, speak to uh, the government's assessment uh, that what, what was the government's assessment of the troop movements that led and, and, and what other factors led to uh, the decision to close the Australian embassy in Kiev? 
Sure. So that number of 150,000 does include um, uh, troops uh, in Crimea. So okay. that's the number of troops that are sort of amassing, mostly in the north and the east, and also in Crimea, around the ports as, as well, of course. Um, we've been watching this, as have other countries, as has the world very, very closely, and we've seen the situation ramp up. We've seen more and more uh, troops moving to the region. Um, so that's one uh, element of our assessment, uh, Senator, but there have been uh, we've had access to other information uh, that uh, has also fed into our assessment, uh, highly classified information, of course, which I am unable to share with you um, this morning. Um, the other important thing to note, Senator, is that uh, we're working very closely with our like-mindeds, and in fact, the embassy in Kiev is co-located with the Canadian embassy, which has closed and has moved to Lviv. Um, so our uh, remaining three officers, it's a small embassy, but we have uh, three people there, our ambassador and our deputy and one other, have, co have moved with Lviv, where they are, uh, continue to be working closely, co-located, in fact, with the Canadians. Mm, thank you. I, I understand that there are 147 Australian citizens, permanent residents and dependents registered with DFAT in the Ukraine. Is that number still correct? Oh, that might have we been. might just uh, get uh, Mr McLaughlin to the t or one of the consular people uh, to go through the details because I know they have changed overnight okay. uh, and I'm not sure whether that's due to people having departed or not so we'll just get one of the consular or someone with the expertise to the table. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Senators. Uh, congratulations, Senator Kitching. Um, Craig McLaughlin, <laughs> Deputy Secretary, uh, Security, Legal and Consular Group. Um, thanks for your question. Uh, the latest uh, figures that I have on the number of Australians registered with us, uh, by which I mean citizens, permanent residents and their family members, is now 186. Mm. I know that's slightly uh, lower than the number uh, we briefed to some of you in a private briefing yesterday. Um, the reason for that is we are uh, happily seeing a large number of Australians actually depart Ukraine, um, mm -hmm. it, as we've uh, urged people to do through successive uh, updates of our travel advice. Mm. But we are also uh, encouraging, encouragingly as well, seeing people register uh, with us in the country. Mm. Okay. And how does the embassy's closure and relocation uh, impact the department's ability to provide consular assistance, including the issuing of passports? Um, to be to be clear if I might say it, uh, to describe the situation, there are a large number of Australians spread across the country, and I won't go into the details of where they are. Um, the team that's relocated to Lviv is in a position to issue travel documents subject to the, the uh, requirements of those travel documents having been met. And indeed, I'm, I'm aware of at least one case in which they are actually uh, in the process of doing that now. So they have the infrastructure and the capability to do that in Lviv? Yeah. Can you please provide a, a brief summary, <laughs> acknowledging this is a complex situation, of how the international community, and particularly the US and the European states, have responded to the situation in Ukraine to date? Um, certainly, Senator. Um, uh, there has been um, uh, uh, activity in the United Nations. The Security Council uh, mm -hmm. has met once on Ukraine. It will meet again. Um, there was a statement from the Secretary General um, just on the 15th of February um, urging restraint and encouraging a, a diplomatic uh, um, outcome. Uh, the NATO countries have been working very, very closely together and as I mentioned earlier, really there's been a lot of shuttle diplomacy going on backwards and forwards in an effort to try and find a way forward and find a diplomatic off-ramp um, for this dispute. Uh, we remain closely engaged um, with allies and partners and other like-minded countries um, uh, so that we can uh, be quite united as, 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 in fact, you know, all countries should be united in efforts to prevent um, an incursion of sovereignty. So there's a very strong, um, a co coordinated and coherent um, 
position, global position, um, urging uh, uh, restraint on the part of Russia and uh, encouraging a diplomatic off-ramp rather than some sort of escalation mm. which could potentially lead to a conflict which you know, could be, of course, ex extremely serious. Can we get a, some clarity on the uh, UN Security Council? Because it's my understanding that they have had a discussion but that China and Russia did try to block that it nonetheless went ahead. Um, can you just give us an update on that discussion and the outcome of that? Um, I, I haven't got that at the, at the table with me, Senator, but I, I, I can bring that back uh, later, um, some details of that discussion. Yes, there's someone more off. Is there another one? I've got a paper there. I, can't, I think it's a yeah. Senator, we'll just get that paper if you wanted to ask another question and we'll try okay. and answer that while we're getting that paper. Uh, thank you. Well, actually, um, the uh, it follows on the steps that you know, and I thank you, Ms. Cooper, for the, your answer. Uh, similarly, what steps has Australia taken to respond to the situation in Ukraine? So I think Ms. Cooper's uh, talked about working with our partners, making sure that the messaging is very clear that this is unacceptable, that uh, should there be an incursion, sanctions will be applied. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have worked lockstep with our uh, like-mindeds to ensure that uh, the Russians were aware of our very strong views about what was being proposed. Mm. Have we also uh, provided any uh, support in terms of cyber security? Uh, yes, Senator, the, and we'll, we can ask Ms. Uh, Dr. Feekin to come to the table and talk about, he's our ambassador for cyber, mm. to talk about what uh, engagement he has had, if that would be of use to the committee. Uh, yes, that would be, in fact. Thank you. We'll just ask him to come to the table. Ms. Cooper will fill I in on the last question. I apologise to officials who I seem to be putting through some type of aerobic exercise this morning. It's how we do it, Senator. <laughs> this is, all good. and uh, it's good exercise. It's, go, it's called going around the world via <laughs> estimates. <laughs> Although we do want to make sure no one comes down the stairs too fast. Understood. <laughs> Thank you. We should have a fireman's pole. I've, I've suggested <laughs> abseiling and repelling before, but uh, the, the team haven't taken it up. I'm Senator. responsible for work, health and safety, and I would be <laughs> somewhat <laughs> concerned. Senator, thank you very much for the question. To my speaking, Ambassador for Cyber Affairs and Critical Technology. Sorry, just a little bit of breath from running down the stairs. Um, hopefully I can answer your question um, sufficiently. Um, I want to let you know that we are well progressed in, in detailed discussions with, the, with our Ukrainian counterparts regarding um, our proposed meaningful cooperation on cyber issues. So uh, on the 25th of January, I think the minister did say that she was asking you to underdo, undertake that work. Um, in estimates on Monday, the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet confirmed that actually no additional assistance has yet to be provided to the Ukraine in terms of cyber security since the onset of this crisis. Is that correct? At the moment, it's a, a live and confidence conversation. Mm. Um, I can't share the full details because of the inconfidence nature of the discussion between the two countries. Um, but I can reassure you that that is a conversation that has been taking place. We're also, Senator, working with um, particularly the United States who are playing mm -hmm. um, what I would describe as a, uh, su a support coordination role for the Ukrainian government, mm -hmm. uh, given the uh, amount of uh, offers of support uh, that have been forthcoming. Uh, and the um, very strong focus of the Ukrainian government on the immediate uh, challenges around mm. the, the military build-up, is it? Yeah. That's absolutely right. Um, and we've also been discussing, um, as Katrina Cooper outlined, um, the discussions with like-minded has extended mm. to cyber cooperation as well. Um, and it's true to say that there are a whole range of our like-minded partners who have already provided a great deal of cybersecurity assistance to Ukraine. Um, over the past number of years and are looking to now. So again, um, there's an important job of coordination that's going on to make sure that the Ukrainian system isn't overloaded with offers. Mm. Uh, Dr. Feigen, in no way do I want you to provide us with information that um, is sensitive or in confidential in terms of your discussions with the Ukraine, but I do just reflect that the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet has told the Senate, Senate that uh, no additional assistance has been provided since the 
onset of the crisis. So my question was, is that correct? Um, in, no, it, it is correct, yes, because at the moment we are in that live discussion with the government around what cybersecurity assistance mm. look like and understanding what Ukrainian requirements are as well. So, so you've had the dis you're having the discussions now. Yes. Um, thank you. Um, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong with respect, but the Russian troop buildup has not just sprung out of nowhere. It's been building for months. Um, when did I'm trying to understand uh, if this is a with respect to passive approach by government, uh, if the request from the Ukraine only came in recent days. It, 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 I mean, we heard uh, from my memory a couple of weeks ago about providing additional cyber support to the Ukraine. Uh, I believe, in fact, the Home Affairs Minister spoke about that as well. So I'm, I'm trying to understand you know, when did the request first come in? When did we start considering what we could provide? Um, and when can we expect that there'll be a decision about what we might provide? So, Senator, um, as, uh, as I made uh, public, I spoke with uh, uh, Ukraine's foreign minister on the, uh, the 19th of January, and it was from that conversation uh, that a discussion around cyber started. However, uh, to, take your, uh, to note your point about uh, the... the um, uh, about the lead time, if you like, in terms of uh, mm -hmm. these issues. And I'm sure they'll have more to say on this yes, uh, tomorrow. But over the past year, um, Defence uh, has been also providing uh, capacity building training to uh, officials uh, in the area of cybersecurity mm -hmm. in Ukraine. So mm -hmm. this has been an ongoing uh, engagement. Our, uh, our offer uh, was uh, as to whether we could add uh, to uh, that uh, activity uh, with uh, the Ukraine. Uh, we have had uh, engagements between uh, the ambassador and the Ukrainian uh, charge uh, to discuss um, further cyber assistance, but ultimately uh, identifying what would be useful and valuable mm. to, uh, to the Ukrainian government uh, is still, as, uh, as the ambassador said, uh, being discussed. As I noted in my previous remarks, uh, this is uh, a very challenging time for the Ukrainian government across multiple fronts. That's why the United States in particular has taken a coordinating role in the cyber question. Uh, so it is in no way, shape or form uh, an issue of uh, passivity or anything else. It is a case of working with a partner to determine what might be helpful at a critical time. Thank you. Uh there are, of course, m plenty of ways we can demonstrate our solidarity with the Ukraine. You spoke, Ms. Campbell, about statements. You spoke about sanctions. Um, and uh, these are measures that we would take short of military assistance, correct? Um, has the department provided policy options to the minister uh, in support of Ukraine's sovereignty? Yes, Senator, we have provided advice. And uh, to be clear, state, you know, diplomatic statements are part of those options, sanctions. Sanctions, yes, Senator. Uh, military assistance? No, Senator. No, Senator. Thank you. Is, um, so Ms. Campbell, you mentioned uh, targeted sanctions um, and presumably like-minded countries, the US and the UK, um, and if I take their public statements at, at face value, are also preparing targeted sanctions against Russian entities. Has the department made any sort of assessments on the global supply chain implications of coordinated sanctions against Russia? Um, Senator, just to, just to go back to sanctions and just to remind that we already have 220 yep. sanctions on um, uh, Russia from the 2014 annexation yep. of Crimea and Sevastopol. So we do have an action, uh, an active autonomous sanctions regime. Uh, and um, I appreciate that, and I, I think that's important to get on the record, but mm -hmm. it's been flagged that targeted sanctions or additional sanctions could be part of our response. Uh, there's been much public speculation 
uh, about the impact on global supply chains and on fuel, fuel shortages and fuel prices. You know, and this is, these are areas that would understandably directly impact the lives of Australians should those consequences occur. So what I'm seeking to understand is if the department's made any sort of assessments on what in the implications of coordinated sanctions against Russia might be and how, my follow-on question is, how are you planning to prepare, for example, um, for possible increased fuel or gas prices? And I, you know, Thanks. I, I mean, in terms of impacts of sanctions, and I know you will know this, but just, you know, for the record, there are very many sorts of sanctions, mm -hmm. so they can be on individuals, for example, which yep. may not have no impact at all. Um, the sanctions that are most likely to have impact are those on financial systems, um, for example, and um, assessment of those impacts are part of the assessment of whether or not we should impose sanctions on countries. Um, and we do coordinate with other countries on sanctions as well. Um, in terms of um, impacts on Australia, um, that's obviously not just a DFAT responsibility. You mentioned gas, for example, energy. There's obviously clearly energy um, security issues at stake here. Um, they are discussed by government. Um, that particular issue obviously doesn't sit with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, but I can tell you, Senator, that yes, they are considered and impacts um, assessed in terms of um, to, to feed into recommendations to government as to whether actions should be taken. Because Australia might be vulnerable to these consequences even if we take no Correct. further sanctions. Mm -hmm. it, in terms of gas prices and so on, yes. And so uh, who does have the lead on this in terms of government? Yeah, because I'm thinking there's the Australian Domestic Gas Security <laughs> Mechanism, there's the National Coordination Mechanism that sits within the Department of Home Affairs. Um, I'm trying to understand when we are thinking about the possible consequences for Australia and Australians, who's got the leading government? You said Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Does so, that. Senator, uh, I understand it's, uh, it's on the public record. I've, I've seen it reported, uh, I think, uh, today. Uh, this is a matter, these matters uh, across the board in relation to, to Ukraine and matters which have been considered uh, at the uh, level of the National Security Committee uh, mm -hmm. of Cabinet. That includes uh, the, the relevant ministers in those discussions in relation to industry and resources issues as well. And is Home Affairs involved in that? Is the National Coordination Mechanism part of it? Uh, I can't speak to the National Coordination Mechanism itself, but Home Affairs is, of course, uh, given the Minister is a standing med member of the NSC, part of that, yes. Thank you. Um, Minister, I do note that your colleague, the member for Wentworth, published an opinion piece in the Sydney Morning Herald on, in June 2020 where he argued that to manage the rise of China, Russia needed to be brought in from the cold, in were his words. Are you aware of that op-ed? Not specifically, Senator. Mm. So did you approve its publication? No, Senator. Okay. Did you agree with the member for Wentworth at the time? Uh, well, Senator, I've just said I'm not specifically aware of, of that op-ed. Mm. And uh, given the um, uh, creative juices flow strong and fast amongst members of the uh, government in terms of their publication of uh, uh, opinion pieces, I uh, don't have them all to hand. Mm. And, and we don't need ministerial approval to submit them. But I find that to be elsewhere. the case, Senator, yes. Yeah. Uh, so given how strongly I advocate on freedom of speech, Senator, exactly, that's unsurprising. Exactly. Well, then may I ask you, Minister, do you agree with the proposition that we need to bring Russia in from the cold in order to manage the rise of China? I'm not going to um, comment on, uh, on the uh, uh, observations of, uh, of a particular opinion piece, Senator. Um, what we're dealing with now is obviously uh, an extremely serious uh, matter, a serious issue and challenge for both security and stability, uh, not just uh, in, uh, in Europe, but uh, fr frankly, internationally. Mm -hmm. Uh, I take that very seriously, and uh, I think all of my statements in relation to uh, the Russian escalation and uh, the situation in Ukraine have indicated that. I'm not asking you to comment on the particular piece, but the proposition that it put, which is a, a, a diplomatic and po policy, foreign policy proposition that we need to bring Russia in. So that's one view, Senator. I'm not going to comment on that. 
It's not the policy of the government. Uh, Senator, I don't think you'll see that articulated by a member of, uh, of, the, uh, of the ministry. I certainly have not said that. The Prime Minister has not said that. Thank you. Um, the member from Wentworth also said a G9 configuration was needed. That is the G7 plus Australia and Russia. Has any work been done within government to progress that idea? Uh, Senator, the um, status of the G7 as it currently stands is a matter for the G7. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. Sure. Uh, Dr. Feakin, um, there's been reports just in the last hour or two about a number of cyber attacks that have been shutting down banks and ministries, etc., in Ukraine. Is there any assessment as to whether that's a continuation of what's occurred in recent years, or is that marking a significant escalation? Um, I don't have any official assessment of that particular incident, but absolutely, I've read about that incident. Um, to be frank, it follows a pattern of what we've seen in the Ukraine um, over the best part of nigh on a decade um, of uh, persistent cyber activity in that country, um, whether it be DDoS tax, uh, taking down of certain parts of infrastructure. Um, there's certainly been a sense that the Ukraine at times has been seen as a, a, a testing center for various um, cyber uh, activities. Um, so it's deeply disturbing again to see a report of a cyber incident of that scale in the Ukraine. Um, it further clouds what is already an incredibly complex and difficult situation for that government to respond to. Thank you. Senator, we have um, uh, been, we have seen confirmed uh, uh, this morning also that the Ukrainian Defence Ministry has uh, confirmed the experience of a cyber attack as well. I also would like to ask on in a similar vein uh, in relation to cyber. Maybe not <laughs> Thank you. Oh, my bad. Uh, the, um, is one of the possible consequences for Australia increased uh, cyber um, uh, attacks in our country? Um, are you, have you contemplated the risk of ransomware or other cyber security issues arising for Australian businesses, government departments and civil society? Um, the, the official assessments on that front would certainly come from the Australian Signals Directorate and from the Australian Cyber Security Centre. Um, certainly what I can say though in, in the geopolitical context is that um, when we see events going on internationally, it's, mm. it's, it's hard to extrapolate what's going on in the ge geopolitical sphere and what happens in the cyber sphere. The mm. two um, undoubtedly are inextricably linked. Um, what I can assure you is that whether they are um, CISO's chief information security officers out in industry or mm. within government, there's always close monitoring of what's going on in the globe in terms of fine tuning your cyber security settings. Senator, I can assure you from a department perspective, we are very seized of this challenge mm. and watching our security very carefully at the moment. In terms of government, are you aware of any action that's being taken to ensure that government agencies are completing the top four and the essential eight actions that are recommended uh, in order to protect themselves uh, from cybersecurity attacks? Cinder, I think that would be probably, I can talk about DFAN, but mm. I'd probably better ask of either the Digital Transformation Agency or the Australian Signals Directorate um, to get a, a more whole of government but we are working. I think it actually sits with the AGs, but to be fair to DFAT, yeah. um, but I'm, I'm just seeking to understand if DFAT has, oh, given your awareness of the risks yeah. uh, of cybersecurity attacks, if you are working with those partners in government, uh, because what we've seen from Auditor General's reports is that government agencies are in fact pretty slow in adopting the, the top four and the essential eight actions to protect themselves against cybersecurity attacks. So within the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and more broadly across the portfolio, we are very focused on upgrading our systems to ensure mm. that we can achieve that. Uh, I am working closely with the coup and the CIO uh, to ensure that the appropriate resources are put into our systems mm. to uh, drive that compliance. Mm. Okay. I might 
take that up with other agencies then. It's a, it is a concern we've, um, we've been raising for some time. Um, Minister, um, as, as we saw on Monday, the Prime Minister has not yet had a phone call with Ukraine's President Zelensky uh, to convey support, nor has he initiated calls with other international counterparts to discuss the situation. Uh, has that situation changed since Monday? Uh, Senator, uh, I have been uh, leading Australia's engagement uh, with both international counterparts and, uh, and with Ukraine. Uh, that is as I would expect it to be. As you can imagine, President Zelensky uh, is uh, absolutely focused on the immediate challenge. Australia has offered our support mm -hmm. through my engagement with the Ukrainian Foreign Minister. Uh, DFAT's engagement uh, over on multiple occasions with uh, the Ukrainian Chargé, uh, the work of our head of mission uh, in Kiev and now in uh, Lviv, uh, including with the Deputy Foreign Minister and other officials uh, in Ukraine, uh, and that is um, what I would expect to happen. Hmm. Well, we have seen the Pentagon warn of an imminent attack by the Russian forces. We've got hundreds of that, well, 150,000 Russian troops on the border. Um, and I appreciate that there have been many statements from the government supporting Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. But to date, we haven't, we haven't yet supplied any new direct assistance. We haven't put any place any new sanctions. Uh, and we haven't even had a phone call from the, the Prime Minister uh, to the President. Um, we're not suggesting that, no one is suggesting that Australians actions on the ground are central uh, to these events, but it does appear that these many fine words have yet to be backed up with actual action. It does appear there is some level of passivity to this very real threat of to our global peace and security. This could potentially be the first war in Europe since the Second World War. I completely why, disagree with your characterization, why is, Senator. Why is there such a passive approach? That is absolutely not the case, Senator, and uh, that has uh, been, in fact, the lie is given to that by the engagements that uh, we as a nation uh, have had, uh, including in uh, my conversations with the US Secretary of State, uh, the UK Foreign Secretary, uh, with uh, the other members of uh, the Quad also uh, in their uh, visit here, with the Ukrainian Foreign Minister himself, uh, and with those um, engagements I, I spoke about earlier. Senator, we have devised and are producing the um, potential set of uh, sanctions uh, applications with like-minded, that work is being done with uh, the US, the UK and Canada, uh, all of which have sanctions regimes. I stand to be corrected, but in the immediate term, uh, my understanding is those countries have not yet moved to apply sanctions in relation to the imminent actions of Russia, perhaps on other issues, but not on the imminent actions of Russia. We are ready mm. to move when those countries move. Uh, we are. Um, we also, as you, as you know, met with uh, one of the very interested European partners of Ukraine uh, in Australia last week in uh, Foreign Minister Gabriela Landsbergis' uh, visit from uh, Lithuania, a country that uh, has also had acute recent experience of uh, actions from an authoritarian regime in relation to its own uh, sovereignty and, in fact, experiences every day uh, the challenges uh, that Russia presents uh, on their own borders. Uh, so I would um, I'd suggest that uh, it is not the case in any way, shape or form uh, that uh, you could characterise the government's approach as passive. Mm. I, well, I apologise. Um, this is the Labor senator's well, time, Senator Van. Yeah, yeah, but, but we do um, in this committee not sure. doing it at 15 minutes. Oh, that's blocks. a, good, that's a so, lovely tradition. Like others do, mm -hmm. we have given Labor a fair run, but we do allow, um, if you like, supplementary questions I, I would from just other flag senators. Then I think but if you've got a specific line you want to pursue, and then we'll have Senator Van. I, I just flagged it, to, and thank you, Chair, yeah, for yeah. your for your um, your approach and. It's we try to be very diplomatic and, and, and conciliatory and in this committee. <laughs>
and perhaps you might uh, speak to some of your other colleagues uh, about your refreshing uh, collegial approach. I do not believe <laughs> I might remind you of that later in the day, Senator. <laughs> <laughs> I do believe that Senator Kitching has some questions on in this vein. Yeah, yeah, but I think yeah, Senator Van um, just has one or two. Yeah. If we can oh, interpose this, Senator well, Van and then Senator, Senator, Senator Kitching. Senator Van and Senator no, Kitching. Yeah. Seem to be I, as long as we can stay on topic, I'm, I'm happy. Yeah, I think Senator Kitching has some questions in this. Did you have well, questions, Senator Van? Yes, I did. Thank you, yeah, Chair. All right. Go um, for it, and then Senator Kitching. Just on that point of Pacific, um, Madam Secretary, that, uh, that Senator Keneally just raised. Um, an alternate view to the member for Wentworth uh, is, uh, rather than bring Russia into the tent, would be to Australia standing up to authoritarian regimes wherever they are in the world and joining with our like-mindeds and, and, uh, and pushing back on behaviour that, that the world would see as unacceptable um, encroaching on others' borders and challenging their sovereignty. Would that be a fair assessment? Well, Senator, I would note that this op-ed, which I haven't seen and I've asked to see a copy of, was written in 2020. There's been significant changes since that time. Uh, the government's been very clear on standing up for sovereignty of nations, and uh, that, that is what is happening in this, in this case, with our like-minded equally so minded. I, I might also point you to one I wrote last week, which is a little bit more current on this, this topic. Thank you, Chair. That's all I had. All right, Senator Kitchen. Um, are we planning on strengthening our Autonomous Sanctions Act, as the UK has done? So I think they can do under there. They're planning to do so. Ms. Truss is planning, so there's businesses, individuals, um, financial services. So it's a broader. Yeah, and no, I'm familiar with the UK sanctions, and I'm, I'm familiar with um, the changes you're talking about, which essentially go to um, sanction of oligarchs and. Um, um, I can certainly say that's under active consideration. Our current okay. sanctions uh, regime is really quite broad already, mm -hmm. um, uh, but uh, uh, you know uh, we are actively considering whether we, uh, as part of our consideration, obviously a decision for government, which is why I'm uh, being cautious here, but consideration for government, but yes, as a department we have it under active consideration, including the element that you are talking about, mm -hmm. Senator. Thank you. That's good. I can give a rundown of the UN Security Council um, yes, I'd be position, interested in that, if that yes. would be helpful. Um, uh, it, it was a couple of weeks ago, so I, I um, have to, had to refresh my memory. Um, it was called for by the United States on the 31st of January, um, and it was held on the 1st of February. Um, the title of the item was Threats to International Peace and Security. Uh, Russia called a procedural vote uh, on whether the meeting should go ahead. Um, and there were two votes against, which were Russia and China, but um, under the UN Security Council rules on procedural votes, um, you need 10 uh, for it to go ahead, and there were 10 voting in support of that. Oh, sorry, there were nine required, but there were 10 in support, so it went ahead. Um, and the Under Secretary General for Political Affairs, uh, Rosemary De Carlo, she briefed the council, she led the discussion. And um, Belarus, Lithuania, Poland and Ukraine participated in that discussion as directly affected states. Um, so the opening by um, Under Secretary De Carlo, um, she made very clear that there should be no alternative, um, that the sort of um, uh, comments that I made earlier about, um, you know, there should be no alternative to dialogue to find a way to, um, uh, to resolve this um, dispute and discouraging, um, uh, discouraging uh, any sort of aggressive activity. And um, pretty much all of the um, all of the uh, countries spoke uh, in favour uh, of the territorial integrity, obviously of Ukraine. Um, we can um, uh, Russia, Russia, as you can expect, uh, spoke in a different way. Uh, and Belarus, as I said, who was co-opted, also had 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 some comments uh, around that. Um, I note that those Security Council. You know, the, the, the details of those Security Council discussions are in the public domain, but that gives you a, a flavour of the discussion and explains perhaps why that uh, discussion could go ahead uh, in the Security Council, because mm. I know there's often a sense, uh, an understanding that there, there is a veto power in the Security Council, but in terms of this particular discussion, that was able to go ahead if nine of the Security Council members voted in favour, and in fact ten did. 
Is there any, uh, is, that, is it there going to be another meeting like that? Is, that one, is there anything scheduled? There is something scheduled, but it's not like this. It's actually something that you know, Russia is, is, is comfortable having, and that's around uh, the Minsk agreement. Okay. But in terms of another discussion of this sort, mm -hmm. there's nothing scheduled that I'm aware of. Um, it could well be, though, another uh, discussion in the Security Council. And as I said, we did see a statement overnight from the Secretary General. Mm. Thank you. I, I'm going to move on to France. <coughs> Are we finished on, on Ukraine or does Senator I, Keneally want uh, to come back to that? He's done his questions. Yeah. I'm, I don't have anything yeah. more for Simon. All right, back to Labor. Yep. Okay, thanks. See you later. Um, I've got some questions on the bilateral relationship with France. Could I just get an assessment of the current state of Australia's relationship with France? Um, thanks, Senator. Senator. That's me again. Um, uh, yes, our, our relationship with France is um, is important one for us. Obviously, uh, it's an important actor for us. It's um, it's a resident power in the Indo-Pacific. Um, we cooperated very recently with France in assistance to Tonga, and um, that was a really positive uh, uh, combined effort. And other countries too, of course. Um, our ambassador in Paris. Um, uh, is meeting regularly with um, uh, senior people in the uh, in the French administration to advance our uh, our bilateral relations. We do have a um, uh, a whole um, you know, program of bilateral relations and a whole plan which we've referred to as uh, affinity um, with our relationship with France. So all of those conversations are ongoing in terms of how we can implement that plan. So very very um, important relationship for us, Senator. A few years ago, this committee did a, uh, an inquiry into our bilateral relationship with France. So we also looked at the... And, and it was very well chaired, if I might say. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, and looked at our cooperation with France also in the Antarctic, uh, which was very interesting. Senator, I would, um, I would say in addition to um, uh, the observations that um, Ms Cooper has made, uh, one of the... Um, uh, most effective aspects of the work that we've been doing in the Pacific in response to the volcanic eruption and uh, tsunami uh, in Tonga has been through the FRANS Humanitarian Assistance and Disaster Relief Mechanism. Uh, so FRANS, uh, of course, being France, Australia and, uh, and New Zealand. Uh, I'm sure Defence will be able to provide more information uh, tomorrow in terms of that cooperation, but does include, as I understand it, um, embedding uh, a French official uh, in our operations command uh, work uh, in relation to uh, to the Tonga response and uh, and deployments, uh, and I think that is um, a, uh, a a reminder uh, to us all of uh, of the work that we are able to do. Uh, in addition to, for example, the Kiwa Initiative, uh, which is. Uh, France-led, uh, but a multi-donor activity in which uh, we participate about strengthening climate change resilience uh, in the Pacific uh, through biodiversity conservation for Pacific Island ecosystems and communities and, uh, and economies. So that work uh, is uh, ongoing and I think very welcomed in the Pacific. But the Tonga response in particular uh, has, uh, has really reinforced uh, that. Are there, pl are there plans for more alliances with France? Uh, well, Affinity itself has uh, a very significant breadth. I'm happy to ask Ms Cooper to go into uh, more details on that. I don't have a copy of the work plan here with me, uh, but is, uh, is a, um, a project of very significant breadth. Uh, we certainly intend to, uh, to continue with that, but uh, also to grow that where, uh, where we can. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Minister. I'd ask Lynette Wood, who works, uh, works uh, for me and who is uh, 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 principally responsible for implementing um, all of those projects, can talk in much more detail. Um, but it is a really comprehensive package of, of, of work that we're doing with France that spans across political, economic, military, cultural, um, and, and, and it's, an ongo it's not a one-off, it's a long-standing program. And, um, uh, and it deals with all aspects of our bilateral relationship, um, but also, of course, with a, an emphasis on how we work with France in the Indo-Pacific. Mm -hmm. Ms Wood. Thank you, Senator Kitching. Lynette Wood, First Assistant Secretary, Europe and Latin America Division. Um, 
to add to the comments that my colleagues have made, um, affinity was first agreed in 2018, as I, I think you're also aware. And last year there was an, an update on implementation of affinity that foreign ministers present, presented to leaders. And the update set out expectations for projects which will lead into the future. Um, it has a number of pillars, and under each pillar there's a range of activities. Um, pillar one, building security. Pillar two, strengthening resilience. Pillar three, embracing opportunity. And it covers, um, I, I chaired a meeting with colleagues across government last week. Um, it involves activities right across government, um, as has been referred to, everything from uh, in the environment area, culture, science and research, um, defence cooperation, um, projects such as bushfire management, um, in the Pacific, as my colleagues have already outlined, cyber. Um, so it's a, it's a very wide-ranging document, mm -hmm. and it gives us a, a roadmap into the future. And were there, was there a timetable for activities or projects under that agreement? Were any accelerated due to the future subs program finishing? <laughs> um, Affinity is an ongoing project. Um, when foreign ministers presented their stock take to leaders last year um, and added additional projects into the mix, there was the expectation that this will be implemented, I understand, by the end of 2023. And that was the purpose for my getting colleagues together recently so that we have um, a sense of momentum and that we're continuing to implement those projects. So there was no acceleration of anything because we were looking for opportunities you know, to have uh, you know, other areas where we could have a relationship with France after the future subs program was cancelled. So, so, Senator, we will always seek to uh, to, to do that, and uh, Ms. Wood has been uh, leading some uh, some very important work, uh, both in the implementation of uh, of affinity and and more broadly. Uh, but it does give us a very sound basis. Uh, I think we've done two reports to leaders, if I remember correctly. Uh, a very sound basis for um, uh, the the cooperation and. Um, the opportunity, as I said, to uh, to reinforce those uh, those partnerships in the region, has uh, come about most recently through um, a devastating uh, natural disaster. Uh, but it does remind us of how important those Pacific relationships, yes. particularly, are. Is it so? Is the update public? Can, is it possible? Can uh, you it's table? A report, it's a report to leaders, Senator. Um, I'm not sure whether it is, but let me see what it is possible to make public. Lovely, thank you. Okay. Um, okay. So yeah, that would be that would be great, Minister, if you could. Can I, could I ask, Minister, when you go to Paris? Um, and you know, I'm very jealous you're going to Paris. Um, but when you go to Paris, will you meet with the French Foreign Minister? Uh, is that on the? Is that one of your appointments? Uh, well, the French Foreign Minister is uh, uh, chairing the EU Pacific Indo-Pacific uh, meeting that uh, that I am attending, uh, and we are working through bilateral um, commitments uh, at this point in time. Like literally at this point in time, I'm still uh, working through those, so they're not settled yet. And will you have a one-on-one -on -one meeting? They're not settled yet. They're not settled yet. Has any so the ambassadors met with with whom in the French government? Uh, we'd have to take that on notice, Senator. But happy to provide you with um, uh, a response on that. Do you know? She certainly presented her credentials to the president uh, in December. 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 Okay. Um, At the um, Elysee. Elysee. Second of November. Um, Sorry, second November. Second of the record. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and was there any discussion there of the future submarines program? Not that or, I'm aware of, Senator. But again, we'll take this on notice. Thank you. So there was a on the 28th of October, so only a few days before the ambassador presented her credentials. There was a discussion. Uh, well, certainly a, um, the Elysee Palace uh, said that it's now up to the Australian government to propose tangible actions that embody the political will of Australia's highest authorities to redefine the basis of our bilateral relationship and continue joint action in the Indo-Pacific. Has the department or the government 
offered any initiatives to improve that improve the relationship. That's the sort of work I'm referring to that uh, that Ms. Wood is uh, is doing, Senator. Um, meetings in in Canberra and in uh, in Paris uh, with French officials. Uh, I have uh, met with the ambassador, as I think is on the public record, and met with him again uh, in the last uh, week. Uh, those um, those um, uh, discussions uh, continue, and it is about building on uh, that existing extensive cooperation. Is there any new funding? that's been allocated to the initiatives that, that Ms Wood was discussing. Uh, is there any new funding for that, for any of those projects? I don't think it's a case of funding allocations um, at, this, uh, at this point in time, Senator, but if, uh, if that is um, a matter which we think uh, needs to, to be addressed um, over and above what is already uh, within the affinity um, envelope, then we would certainly consider that. Okay. And any additional staff? I don't think so, Senator. I think um, uh, our, uh, our Europe team is, uh, and uh, the uh, focus on France is very strong uh, in the uh, normal work of, uh, of the agency. And has France, um, has France suggested any projects they would like to see? Sorry. Senator, I think um, in, in terms of going into detail of, uh, of the bilateral discussions, I wouldn't normally do that uh, on, the, uh, on the public record, but uh, we're certainly working collaboratively uh, across government here and, uh, and with uh, appropriate counterparts uh, on the work that Ms Wood is doing. Thank you. Um, because I do remember from our inquiry there was interest in the Antarctic in having a developed further developed relationship there, given... Given the history. Yes. Given Very the history. strong between Australia and France. Yes. Yeah. Could I ask, in terms of... Um, so I just want to ask you about um, meeting with, the foreign, with Foreign Minister Le Dion. Is... Are you... So is... You're, you don't... Those are still being settled. Is there any... So if you meet with him, would you also meet with the Defence Minister... I mean, do, you know, do you have a, an idea of what meetings you would like to have? Um, the last time I saw a report of um, Defence Minister Pali, she was actually in Indonesia, um, which was uh, a very welcome visit to mm -hmm. the region. I'm not sure what her program is. I would not normally uh, and necessarily do that. It very much depends on uh, the schedule. The Munich Security Conference has um, a large agenda uh, with uh, a number of commitments, uh, existing commitments that, uh, that I already have. And as I said, we are... Uh, working with um, multiple um, counterparts on uh, what the bilateral program looks like. Thank you. Can, what other countries, and I'm happy for this, um, for a list to be provided later on in the day, it, what other countries have been invited to the forum? The, Indo, the EU Indo-Pacific Forum? Yes. Uh, we'll take that on notice, Senator. It's a large group uh, and we'll provide that uh, on notice. Mm. Um, can I go to the it's not our invitation, of course. Yes, that's um, right. Yes, I understand. Yes. Um, can I go to the text message um, from the President of France to the Australian Prime Minister on 16 September um, that was published in the, da the Daily Telegraph? Uh, the Daily Telegraph also understands that two days before the AUKUS arrangement was announced, Macron messaged the Prime Minister to say that he was not available at the time Australia was seeking for a call and said, should I expect good or bad news for our joint submarines and amb submarines ambitions? Um, was there? Um, did the prime minister authorise the leak of a text message to him from the president of France? Uh, Senator, as I understand it, this was conveyed. Uh, this was discussed extensively at uh, PM and C estimates on Monday, and I have nothing to add to that. Okay. Um, Does that I think I'm Mr sure Birmingham's extremely sure straightforward as a finance minister. I always find him very clear. I think he's coming tomorrow. He is, Senator, <laughs> so, I believe. Um, could I, so could I ask, uh, Minister, when did you become aware of a private text message from President Macron had been leaked to Australian journalists? Senator... Uh, I would have to to check, well, I have to uh, 
recall, but my understanding is, is through media. Well, my so recollection through, is through media. Through the telly article? I, I couldn't specifically say, Senator, but I, I think it's through media. Did you have discussions with anyone in the PMO? Uh, I don't recall where I was uh, again at the time, Senator. I think I was travelling or in quarantine, one or the other, uh, and I'm not <laughs> sure uh, I was in a position to do that. Mm. Could I ask Secretary when you became aware of a private text message from President Macron uh, that had been leaked? Via the media, Senator. And when? Uh, when the media reported. Okay. So no one phoned you the night before? No, Senator. Did anyone in the PMO discuss a leaking of the text message with you? No, Senator. So on the 4th of February this year, the Prime Minister's office rejected a freedom of information request to release all of the text messages between the Prime Minister and President Macron. This rejection is on the basis that the disclosure, and I quote, would or could reasonably be expected to cause damage to Australia's international relations. So if there's an acknowledgement and that's a basis on which the freedom of information request was rejected, is there, have you made an assessment that there is damage to the relationship? I would say, Senator, and I'll ask, the officials can obviously respond as well, but I would say, given they make FOI decisions, that that category, that description in relation to FOI applications to the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade is a category of standard use, uh, if you like, um, across um, multiple FOIs that I have uh, observed in the past uh, three years and, in fact, preceding that in relation to FOIs requested through the Department of Defence. I know officials um, who, uh, who run our FOI uh, system make um, very robust uh, decisions, and I have no further comment to make on the PMNC decision, or whether it's a PMO or PMNC decision, uh, but I do know that that category is one that I have seen used on countless occasions. And can I just ask, Minister, in relation to that category, it is not only the potential content which is a matter of concern or damaging to our relationship, but if world leaders get to know that any text message to our Prime Minister might be, or <coughs> from our Prime Minister to then might become available under FOI for public uh, gaze, then uh, that sort of communication, one suspects, would stop very quickly and one form of diplomatic channel would be stopped or closed. Uh, well, Senator, um, I, note, I note that observation. Yeah. Uh, so, Chair, you, we were not involved with that decision, uh, so I can't um, uh, clarify that any further, but the comments both by the Minister and the Chair are accurate in the consideration that we would do when we were considering such matters. Thank you. Um, the second reason provided by Mr Morrison's office for declining the FOI request was that the text, and I quote, contain information that was communicated in confidence by the head of state of a foreign government to the Prime Minister. So the text exchange was confidential. Again, Senator, I'm not aware of the but details of this matter, um, and I have read like you have. So confidential, but one was leaked. I think it's a statement, Senator. A close advisor to President Macron told a French newspaper disclosing a text message <coughs> exchange, exchange between heads of state or government is a pretty crude and unconventional tactic. Would that be, would you agree, Secretary, that leaking private correspondence with an international counterpart is unconventional? I, I see from the information on the FOI that because they chose to use the national security uh, um, criteria for not releasing the information, that as we have discussed, that that sort of information uh, has the potential to impact on international relationships. And calling somebody a liar would be a pretty crude and unconventional tactic as well, I'm sure you would agree, Senator Kitching. Um, 
Would you say, Secretary, would you say that um, the leaking of a text message has, um, has weakened Australia's relations with France? Senator, we're working very closely with our French counterparts to uh, ensure that the bilateral relationship remains strong. And I think that both Ms Cooper and Ms Wood have outlined some of those uh, uh, initiatives that we have taken. We are very engaged with our counterparts, looking to continue the strength of this relationship because of the importance of France in the Indo-Pacific. And we've seen that demonstrated in the response to the uh, Tonga situation. So I am very focused on us moving forward and working with our counterparts to ensure that both nations are able to uh, ensure peace and prosperity, in the, particularly in the Indo-Pacific, and that's where our focus is. And there's been no discussion with other, other, country, other heads of state um, that, where there was an expression of, um, of concern that a text message from President Macron had been leaked? There's been no discussion with me about that matter. Minister? Sorry, Senator. Um, so there hasn't been any discussion from other heads of state expressing concern about a leaked text message? From Not to my awareness, Senator. Okay. Thank you. Just one second. Thank you. I have some questions about um, COP26 and the Prime Minister's attendance. So perhaps if Mr. Isbister is there, he is. Very good. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Isbister. Can you? Um, Confirm for the committee that during COP26, Australia did not submit a new emissions redu reduction target for 2030. Uh, uh, Senator Jamie Spitzer, Australia's ambassador for the environment. Um, <coughs> Australia did submit a new NDC, but it didn't include an update on the 2030 target. So we. Um, so despite. Um, all of the Prime Minister's rhetoric at the conference, we essentially took former Prime Minister Tony Abbott's 2030 emissions redu reduction target to COP26, didn't we? Well, no, I think, well, as I said, we, we um, submitted a new NDC, and in that it included uh, a 2050 net zero target, and it also included a range of quite significant targets on what we would achieve on seven low emissions technologies that are going to be uh, both critical in terms of what Australia is going to need to do to deliver on that net zero target but reduce emissions over the next decade. And uh, obviously equally importantly how that's going to have to work with other countries to support their efforts to accelerate that. Um, but the government have been clear that the 2030 target was set. It did include in the NDC, and we did communicate quite clearly, as the Prime Minister had, that our current projections had us uh, on track to get to a 35 per cent reduction from our 2005 levels, and the government's focus was how we were going to continue to exceed on that. But those, um, those are projections, aren't they? Not, um, no, nobody sensibly regards those as targets? Well, Senator, I think uh, Australia's record, um, particularly concerning our exceeding of our Kyoto 1 and 2 targets, uh, and uh, we have some of the best um, data, uh, and uh, I think data is the right word, but Mr Isbister will correct me if I'm wrong, uh, in terms of uh, the analysis that we do here um, of, uh, of our emissions, those projections, as he said, we'll see uh, Australia achieve up to a 35 per cent reduction by 2030. I think it is very important that Australia advances that, uh, that proposition uh, and to that end uh, why we included that uh, and continue to include that. 
uh, in our uh, engagements uh, at COP26. I mean, just yesterday, Senator, um, we signed a new and renewable energy technology uh, letter of intent with, uh, with uh, the Indian uh, government between uh, Minister Taylor and his Indian counterpart. This is ongoing work for this government uh, to pursue these emissions reduction uh, achievements. Well, precision is important, isn't it, in, when we're discussing these things? Um, That's why I've talked projections, about the data, Senator. Projections are not the same uh, as a target. Um, well, if, that's if you an look at the, that's um, an interesting debating point, actually, and we could uh, spend a very long time about how precise um, a target is as did, opposed to an did, achievement. Did, and an achievement is what we have on the record in relation to Kyoto 1 and 2, for there, example. There is no difference between the position that Australia took uh, under Prime Minister Abbott in terms of our 2030 target uh, and the position that Prime Minister Morrison took to COP26. Well, that's categorically there. wrong, Senator, because the position that Mr Abbott was able to take uh, was in relation to the target and the um, projections as they sat then. The position that Minister, Prime Minister Morrison has been able to take uh, says uh, is one which uh, notes that our uh, projections to 2030 will see Australia achieve up to a 35 per cent reduction by 2030. They are qualitatively different. And that is, but that is because of time. The targets taken by, by Prime Minister Abbott during his term between there's a, there's a 2013 and uh, 2016, 2015, uh, and then the targets taken in 2021. Of course, the, uh, uh, the projections are different. I'm sorry. Well, the, well, there's a credibility problem for Australia here, isn't there? No, Senator. That, look, the United Kingdom submitted a its own glossy pamphlet to the... Um, and the United Kingdom welcomed to, our, to our the, commitments at to, uh, COP26, to the conference. Senator. I know that's probably inconvenient for you, it, but Prime Minister Johnson welcomed our commitments at COP26. The, the um, oh, assertion you don't want to talk about that, that the government of the United Kingdom made was that 153 other countries submitted new 2030 reduction targets for COP26. Um, I'm going to ask you to provide that list on notice, but Australia isn't one of those 153 countries, is it? S Senator, um, I think what you're referring to is the, the, the document that the UK put out that sort of summarised their elements. Um, yes. I think the latest is actually 155 countries uh, submitting new NDCs. Oh, Australia oh. is one of those countries. Uh, the, the number of countries that included uh, increases on their headline target uh, was it was around 91 of those 155. Um, those new NDCs obviously reflect a whole range of elements around what countries are going to do and continue to do over this decade and over the next uh, um, decades under the Paris Agreement. And obviously, as, as said, uh, the government did bring the 2050 net zero commitment. We outlined significant ambitious technology targets, not only with cost points, but also with the date ranges. And uh, we also um, committed and announced as part of our broader packages of doubling of our climate financing commitment. So <clears throat> let me understand this properly. So the government's position is that, we've, that, that we took to COP26 a new 2030 target. No, I said, Senator, and so did Mr Isbista, um, that we had a fixed 2030 target, which this government took to the election in 2019, uh, and we took that 2030 target and our projections for uh, our latest emissions projections that will see Australia achieve up to a 35 per cent uh, reduction by 2030. And frankly, our record between 2005 and 2000 and, uh, and, and 2021 of over 20 per cent reduction um, more than, is, is more than double the OECD average uh, and is uh, an achievement that uh, is clearly and squarely on the record. So no new target at COP26 for 2030. Senator, I don't know if the standing orders here apply to tedious repetition, but um, at the risk of breaching them myself by saying the same thing again, I think, I think, I think mirror, we've both done it already. To mirror Minister, you, we've both done um, it already. let me say that uh, we have a fixed 2030 target. 
What we have been able to do is to take the latest emissions projections to 2030 that will see Australia achieve up to a 35 per cent reduction by 2030, but also our record between 2005 and 2021, which tells us that that is a 20 per cent emissions reduction as an achievement, uh, as an outcome, which quite clearly speaks to the pathway that these, pro these projections represent. And can you at least confirm for me that the at the conclusion of COP26 that Australia adopted the Glasgow Climate Pact? Uh, yes, Australia um, uh, adopted as uh, all other countries did in the Paris Agreement the yes. Climate Pact. So the Morrison-Joyce governments agreed, uh, agreed to the pact, that's correct, isn't it? Uh, the Australian government uh, agreed to the Glasgow Climate Pact. Minister, how is that consistent with the Deputy Prime Minister's claim on the 15th of November that the National Party hadn't signed the pact and that he as Deputy Prime Minister hadn't signed it? Uh, well, Australia has uh, supported the Glasgow Climate Pact, Senator. Uh, it's in not fact, the first time we... that Mr Joyce would be wrong, I suppose. Unlike yourself. Well, again, Senator, that could take us down a very, very windy path if we want to choose who we think is wrong on each other's side of politics. I don't particularly want to do that today, but if you wish, I can. Well, I'm asking you talk about you Mr Fitzgibbon for a while, if you like. I'm asking, I'm asking Fellow you. New South Wales Sen member of parliament. I'm asking Be happy you to do that. specific, specific Indeed, question Senator. about whether Mr Joyce's assertion is correct. I'm advising you, Senator, as uh, Mr Isbister has correctly advised you, that Australia supports the Glasgow Climate Pact. We have also been very clear in commending the UK and their presidency for being able to secure agreement um, amongst all parties on what are very complex uh, issues. Uh, and our advocacy throughout COP26 uh, included uh, the importance of turning negotiation and commitments into action, which is why we are uh, making the, uh, particularly the low emissions technology agreements that we are making across the globe, um, Japan, uh, Germany, Indonesia, Mr Isbista will help me if I can't remember the others. Um, Korea, UK. Korea in the UK. Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam. Uh, and uh, we advocated for the completion of the Paris rulebook, uh, including the transparency framework and the rules for international carbon markets. Mr Isbister, um, Minister Taylor, the Prime Minister, the team were very strong participants. So I'm grateful for you, um, you know, I, being clear about um, Australia having signed up to the pact despite the Deputy Prime Minister trying to slide out of it. What? what was, was the Deputy Prime Minister consulted on the draft text of the pact? Uh, and if, if he was, when was the Deputy Prime Minister's office consulted about the draft? Senator, as, as you know, these matters were, um, as is widely reported, the subject of Cabinet discussions. I'm not going to go into the details of those. You can't tell me whether the Deputy Prime Minister of Australia was consulted on the draft text. Well, the Deputy text Prime the Minister pact. is a member of the Cabinet, Senator. Yes. Thank you. Did his office provide any feedback? Senator, I just indicated to you that it is not my practice and it has never been my practice to go into the details of Cabinet discussions. I don't intend to change it today. So you won't tell me whether the Deputy Prime Minister agreed Senator, that Australia I have, I have sign said, up the pact? in fact, going further than I usually do, I have said, Senator, that this matter was the subject of uh, extensive Cabinet discussion, as you would expect it to be. Deputy Prime Minister is a member of the Cabinet. The, um, the document says, I think, at Article 28, it says it urges parties that have not yet communicated new or updated nationally determined contributions to do so as soon as possible in advance of the fourth session of the Conference of the Parties, serving as the meeting of the parties to the Paris Agreement. Can you, can you confirm, Mr Isbister, that work is going on um, for the Morrison-Joyce gov government to update its nationally determined contribution in the lead up to COP27? Um, well, well, Senator, the wording is that the, in the Glasgow Pact or in the CMA, the Paris Agreement element of it was to revisit and strengthen 2030 targets in, in their NDCs as necessary to align with the Paris Agreement goal by the end of 2022, taking into account different national circumstances. So Australia did update our NDC before um, 
uh, Glasgow, as, as, as we've discussed and outlined, um, the government's committed to continuing to um, provide an update, uh, it, a, a, an annual low emissions technology statement that looks at how we continue to accelerate and deliver on uh, that ambition to reduce emissions, not just in Australia, but, but also with, with other countries. I think uh, uh, Minister Payne um, uh, referred to a number of those <coughs> partnerships that Australia has agreed and signed to. And that focus is going to be how we continue to deliver on that and bring that uh, practical ambition to, um, uh, to COP27 in, in Cairo. So we are updating our nationally determined contribution? Or well, a decision of whether or not the government's going to uh, update its NDC um, will be a decision by government in the future. But as said, I think the government's been clear that its 2030 target's been set and uh, it, it took that to the election. And our focus now is how we're going to continue to uh, um, utilise technology, mm -hmm. international partnerships and, 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 par and engagement with private sector um, to accelerate that, that ambition. So this distinction between projection and target is very politically useful, isn't it, Minister? It allows slippage between these two quite distinct concepts. Well, I'm not sure it's fair to ask um, an official that. You might ask a no, minister. No, he was asking I just me. did. I did, don't you? Me. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Oh, right. I'm, I'm, and I would yeah. say, Senator, that's, um, I'll take that as a comment. Well, it was a question. And I'm taking it as a comment. <laughs> so, so the intention if, if we're precise about this, is that <laughs> seven years after Mr Abbott's policy was announced, we're going to Egypt for COP27 with Tony Abbott's 2030 emissions targets. No, Senator, that is, uh, that is not. And, and your precision's an interesting thing. I, I don't know whether you think Mr Fitzgibbon was being precise when he said uh, after 14 years of trying, the Labor Party hasn't made one contribution to the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions in this country. That's what he said in November last year. Uh, what Mr Isbister has indicated, Senator, is that uh, our uh, work for COP27 um, uh, will include, include uh, our ambitious low emissions technology stretch goals. They are reflected in our NDC. Uh, on clean hydrogen, on ultra low cost solar, on low emissions materials, on energy storage, on carbon capture and storage, on soil carbon uh, measurement. And the focus, as I understand it, of, uh, of the African presidency of, uh, of COP27 uh, in, in Egypt is very much on adaptation. So we will also, uh, with the Glasgow Sharm El Sheikh work program on the global goal in adaptation in the lead up to the global stock take in 23, be part of those strong discussions as well. Article 29 says, I'm sure you're familiar with it, Mr Isbister, that the conference requests parties to revisit and strengthen the 2030 targets and their nationally determined contributions as necessary to align with the Paris Agreement temperature goal by the end of 2022, taking into account different national circumstances. So by signing up to the pact, I just want to be clear about the implication of this, by, by the Morrison-Joyce signing Morrison Joyce government signing up to the pact. We, we have agreed to revisit and strengthen our 2030 target. It's correct, isn't it? Well, as I said, I think the, the, the agreement is clearly encouraging countries to continue to bring forward uh, at subsequent costs, uh, at subsequent COPs, greater ambition on a range of elements, including, as you, as you rightfully say, in 2030. I think what the government's uh, committed to is coming to uh, COP27 to Cairo, uh, demonstrating greater ambition and greater focus on reducing emissions in Australia and globally uh, over the next decade. And uh, as, as mentioned, uh, Australia uh, has released its second low emissions technology statement. It is uh, uh, um, looking at, under Alan Finkel's chair, releasing that annually. And as that process is looking at how we continue to review, identify, those technologies that the minister went through, they're going to deliver that greater ambition. And uh, we will, the focus is how we come to Cairo to demonstrate what we're achieving, uh, what it means in emissions reductions, what further international partnerships that we're uh, going to commit to and, and sign on to. I think the minister went through seven or eight of those, but also under the, the Quad, uh, there's a very strong climate working group that's looking at how uh, India, Japan, the US and Australia can 
work together to deliver on those emphasis. The Prime Minister's announced that in June there'll be a, uh, he, Australia will be hosting a clean energy supply chain fora that is focused around how we're going to work with other countries to get those uh, supply chains, those investments and that uh, research that's going to be critical to, to reducing emissions. So I think you know, that, that's the intent to be coming to COP with, uh, with, with the commitments and the practical um, actions to be able to reduce emissions. Thanks, Mr. Espiston. Minister, why then on the 14th of November did you feel it necessary to, with Minister Taylor, to issue a statement that says Australia's 2030 target is fixed? I've said that this morning as well, Senator. We took the 2030 target to an election. So, so why are you trying to suggest that the nationally determined contribution is a target? It's quite, they're quite different things, aren't they? Um, Senator, There's an enormous gap between uh, the projections that we've taken to the international community in our nationally determined contribution and the target, which as you say, Tony Abbott's target, is fixed. Uh, Senator, I, I think it sounds to me like we're speaking at cross purposes. I think I've made the government's position perfectly clear in response to your questions and I have provided a consistent answer in response to your questions. Did any of the um, Prime Minister's international counterparts raise concerns about the government's climate policies oh. um, and our conduct in relation to those um, in Glasgow, in the lead up to Glasgow? Um, Senator, in the lead up to Glasgow and at Glasgow, we, we engage with a wide range of different uh, <laughs> parties. Uh, we did uh, consultations, obviously, with all of our Pacific partners, with uh, like-minded, with with the UK as, as, as a presidency. Um, and as I said, the, the, the uh, Glasgow and, and COP26 was focused on a whole range of different elements of demonstrating action on climate, around climate financing, around practical commitments to demonstrate that on 2050 net zero targets, on 2030 targets. And in those discussions, absolutely, there was discussions about how we were keen to see greater ambition on different elements. There was requests for Australia, as, as flagged before, that we would look at how we would uh, release a long-term strategy in a 2050 net zero commitment, which, which the government took. And uh, yes, uh, how we continue to accelerate and commit to greater ambition over the next decade. OK. Um, did, um, did President Biden raise concerns about the position that Australia had adopted? I. Uh, um, I, wasn't, I know the US uh, certainly asked Australia to uh, look at bringing greater ambition on its 2030 target. Yes. Prime Minister Johnson did the same thing essentially, didn't he? Senator, we've had, um, as, uh, as Mr Isbister has alluded to, um, multiple discussions with uh, counterparts. Um, I myself met with uh, Secretary Kerry uh, twice, if not three times, uh, in, uh, in the uh, year preceding the um, uh, COP26. I've obviously discussed the issues with uh, counterparts um, across the yes, globe. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not asking about those. I've, I've asked Mr Isbister whether the United States, the government of the United States and President Biden raised oh. concerns about our position and he's acknowledged that, that as is clear publicly that they did. I'm asking now whether President, uh, whether Prime Minister Johnson uh, did the same thing. I don't. Um, so Senator, I'll come, to, I'll come to some of the other countries in a moment if necessary. But did Prime Minister Johnson raise concerns with the Australian government uh, uh, in, in, in the same way as has been reported publicly? Senator, I know that uh, as I have, and I've just indicated that. Uh, as I have, the Prime Minister has discussed uh, the challenges of, uh, of climate change with international partners uh, around the globe. Uh, there, is, uh, there is no secret about uh, those discussions uh, and I'm sure that they will continue. And it is not simply uh, a question, as you would assert, of, uh, of, seeking, uh, of, of seeking further Australian uh, contributions, but it is in fact a global discussion about initiatives that we, for example, are taking in the Pacific, uh, in, the, uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, our own initiatives in relation to our low emissions technology, which is reflected in the uh, partnerships that uh, we've already signed. 
Uh, in the interests of um, precision, which we've had some discussion about, Chair, I would like a list of all of the bilateral meetings that the Prime Minister had at Glasgow, um, uh, perhaps to be provided if it can later on during the day, and I see that we're at 10.30, so I'll bring that line of question to a close there, if I can. And that question is being taken on notice. And so uh, with that, the committee will be suspended until 10.45. So, Chair, I would say that should have been done through PMNC, but um, we'll seek oh. that from PMNC. Right, and after the uh, morning adjournment, we will commence with questions from the Greens. So if Labor and others want a longer morning tea break, they can. Thank you, the committee is suspended. Are we waiting for some people to join you? Senator, I'm just asking. We'll have to get the officials to the table, but keep asking. Sure, keep talking, no, no. Senator. Um, so I just wanted to know how much has Australia contributed in terms of funding, supplies and equipment so far, and what else is to come? Senator, um, I'll ask the, uh, the officials to go into the, uh, the details with you, but uh, in, um, in the last uh, month, I think we are uh, up to uh, we have obviously been working very hard with partners, uh, but most particularly with our partner, the Tongan government, uh, in the challenge that they are addressing following the volcanic eruption and, uh, and tsunami. Uh, the um, department has uh, engaged closely with the High Commission here. I've spoken with the High Commissioner myself, uh, and our ambassador um, has, uh, has uh, been strongly engaged uh, in Nukalofa uh, and more broadly mentioned uh, earlier this morning when, uh, when you were not here, um, the engagement of France, Australia and New Zealand in the FRANS uh, Humanitarian Assistance and Disaster Relief Mechanism. Um, but I think it is important to, to say that uh, given the spread of, uh, of islands in the, uh, in, the, in the nation of Tonga, um, those assessments are ongoing. Uh, so uh, this is um, a work uh, I won't describe it as a work in progress, it's not appropriate, but it is a, a piece of work where the Tongan government will advise us of their needs, mm -hmm. uh, and as they do that, we will work with partners to respond, uh, and the contributions will flow through that, um, that partnership. But I'll ask either... Yeah. Could I just Donald ask or... what the monetary contribution has been to, to date? Yeah, I was including just trying to explain everything. its context, yeah. Senator. Yeah, good morning, Senator. Ewan McDonald, uh, head of the Office of the Pacific. So we've uh, contributed $3 million so far in, in humanitarian contribution through the aid program. Of course, there's been a lot more provided through the defence force in terms of the assets that have been mm -hmm. provided into the region with, uh, of course, HMAS Adelaide and, and numerous flights uh, into the region, both for um, surveillance, uh, for delivery, of humanitarian aid and also in relation to uh, COVID in terms of the outbreak and preparation. And there's no monetary figure apart from 300 million on that? Uh, three million. Sorry, three million, three million. Yep. yeah. And of course, we've also used our bilateral program yep. that we have in Tonga. Okay. Um, just in terms of uh, the minister's earlier comments, I think it's uh, important to note that Tonga have led this response mm -hmm. and done it extremely well and we've responded to all their, uh, all their requests. Yeah. Just going to HMAS Adelaide, the delivery, I, I know that there have been issues obviously with COVID and with the power failures. And have we now been able to deliver all the required supplies on the ship? Yes, Senator, we've delivered a lot of things on the ship. So uh, just so you're aware, I can take you through that if you wish. Um, How much of the aid on the ship has been delivered it's, as it's a all, percentage? It's all, it's all, it's all been, been delivered. delivered. So it's done in a, a non-contact way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So with the protocols around the delivery were agreed with the Tongan government. Uh, just uh, each day, Senator, we have a whole of government IDC that I chair um, that works out the priorities across yep. the government and we've delivered all of that consistent with the Tongan government under their guidance. Is there another ship um, on the way? Yes. Ah, uh, yes, there yep. is. HMAS Canberra. And yep. HMAS Canberra will take construction supplies. Mm -hmm. uh, it is um, 
departing uh, later this week, as I understand it. Senator Defence mm. can speak more to that uh, tomorrow. Uh, but it is um, important to note that on HMAS Adelaide, uh, Fijian uh, members of the RFMF are also deployed in support mm -hmm. of Tonga as well as part of the Pacific response. Mm -hmm. And Minister, just confirming you said that anything over and above the three million that has already been provided will be discussed in future with the Tongan government? Absolutely, and, Senator, yep. yes. And our ongoing programs, for example, Australia and New Zealand uh, have the responsibility for the reconstruction of the Tonga Parliament House, mm -hmm. which was destroyed in a previous natural uh, a previous cyclone, if mm. I recall correctly. Yeah, yeah, um, right. Those will also continue, obviously, also continue mm. as well. Mm -hmm. And Thank also, you. I think, Senator, on that that vein of Fiji, P PNG are also looking at what they can mm -hmm. do. And today, I think FSM also contributed about a hundred thousand uh, US dollars as well. Thank you. I, I'm sorry, I'm tight with time, okay. so I might move on to other questions. Um, I just have a few questions about the latest Pacific practice note, which talks about women's economic participation and basically says that it will not automatically lead to empowerment and economic, equal and economic equality and makes several recommendations to address women's empowerment. I'm just wondering if you, you've read that report and responded to it. Senator, can you be more specific on the report? It's the latest Pacific practice note, which we have periodically. If you, if you I, haven't I have looked at it, it, I can... I'm just trying to work out who the author Yeah. I'm not sure who the author We're happy is. To take it's it. the WEE program, Women's Economic Empowerment Note. I'll just put them on notice then if you Thank haven't looked you. at yeah. it, because yeah. that's, uh, I think it's really important, the recommendations that they, are, that they are making, so it would be really I'm sorry, Senator, are you saying that's a DFAT document? It's not a DFAT document. Oh, thank you, okay. It's, uh, it's an Australian aid. Thank document. you. We'll have yeah. a look at that and we'll come back to you, Senator. Okay. I'd also um, like to provide on notice, Senator, uh, the details particularly of the, um, of the engagement uh, of Air Force, um, the 14 RAF flights, the aerial surveillance, etc. We'll provide that to you on notice. Yeah, that'll be good. Um, regarding, I just want to go to the 500 million climate finance pledged by the government at COP26. Um, will this be new and additional funding to Australia's existing ODA budget? Or is it based on reallocations of the existing budget? We'll just ask the ambassador for a to come to the table, Senator. Hi, Senator. Uh, Jamie Spister, Australia's Ambassador for the Environment. No. Um, the, commit, the, the new announcement was uh, of $2 billion, which was a doubling of the previous uh, commitment we'd had over 2015-20. Um, the, the, uh, nearly all, but not all, of the money will come from within the ODA program. It will be driven by particularly how we're uh, supporting a much stronger focus on climate change through our bilateral regional programs. Um, it will include some new initiatives, a number of them already uh, that we've got in place in terms of how we partner and work with the private sector. Um, so I just wanted to know if this was new, the 500 million that was announced, was that new funding or existing funding? And did you say that not all of it is coming from the ODA budget? The majority will come from the ODA how budget. How much is coming from ODA well, how much isn't? Um, in the last year, um, uh, the commitment was 346. There was mm -hmm. 3 million of that that was uh, outside the ODA budget. Mm -hmm. um, so the so majority, most of it is most outside? Of it, yes. Um, is, is the funding 100% grant based or is it loans as well? Uh, the majority of it is grant based, uh, though uh, we are increasingly through um, a range of initiatives looking at how we're using um, some non-grant mechanisms to engage and partner with the private sector, particularly in investments that can accelerate the uptake of uh, renewables, uh, low emissions technologies, um, but also some uh, um, nature-based solutions partnerships, uh, such as marine coastlines, blue yeah. carbon, etc. If 100% is not grant-based, what percentage is grant-based and what percentage is loans? Look, I'd have to take the exact percentage then on that, no, but each year it changes as well, Senator. Mm -hmm. So we do the final uh, accounting of how our climate financing is mm -hmm. flowing and the elements at the end of financial year. Um, but I'd have to take on notice okay. what it would have been in the last and financial And just on the 300 million that you said isn't from ODA, where is, what budget is it coming from? Uh, the majority of it is from the additional one-off um, budget measures, uh, including how some of that's flown in the Pacific. One-off, sorry? The, the additional one-off um, budget measures okay. that were made for the Pacific and elsewhere. 
Okay, thanks very much. I think my time is up, is up. over to you, Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Thanks, Chair. Um, DFAT's annual report from 2014 and 15 says there was a Great Barrier Reef Task Force that worked to ensure there was a strong understanding of Australia's work to protect the reef by committee members. Um, given all the activity that we've seen uh, in recent months, or, oh, going back at least six months with Minister Lay's uh, trip to Europe to lobby the World Heritage Committee to vote against an endangered listing, has DFAT re-established that task force or any, any similar structure? Um, Senator, uh, no, there's not a currently a, a Great Barrier Reef Task Force within DFAT. Um, uh, as you'd probably know, the Department for Agriculture, Water and Environment is, is a lead on the, the, the Great Barrier Reef and uh, much of the engagement with uh, the World Heritage uh, Centre, though DFAT certainly has and continues to uh, support um, uh, DOOR um, in, in engagement and dialogue with World Heritage Committee members, uh, not just on the Great Barrier Reef, but obviously on all of our um, World Heritage properties. So, um, so if it hasn't been re reconstituted, who, who within DFAT is primarily responsible or, de or dedicated to coordinating your efforts to help lobby World Heritage uh, Committee countries to vote against an endangered listing for the Great Barrier Reef? Senator Cathy Klugman, uh, Deputy Secretary, um, Development and Multilateral Group. That function sits within my group and specifically under Jamie Isbister's division. Okay, so um, can you tell us what you what your primary tasks have been? Are you? I've noticed a number of Australia's ambassadors are uh, taking to social media, Twitter and Instagram and Facebook, uh, with very positive messages about the health of the great and the future of the Great Barrier Reef, and the government's commitment. Um, who who's responsible for coordinating those activities? Is that is that done at the at the level of each ambassador's office or out of your office? The, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade supports uh, DOOR, which is Dr, as Mr Isbister said, is the, um, is the lead agency here. Yes, the sort of activities we undertake would include providing material to uh, relevant embassies overseas and otherwise to put forward, to build awareness of action Australia is taking to protect the heritage value of the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, are you making um, those uh, UNESCO um, World Heritage countries know about uh, the government's climate, 2030 climate ambitions, for example, which is on record uh, 30 to 35 per cent emissions below 2005 levels? Yes, we certainly are. Okay. Um, are you uh, letting them know about the approvals of new fossil fuel projects, uh, new coal mines, new gas projects? We estimate 114 new projects in the approval process the federal government's signing off on. We're letting them know about the action that the Australian government is taking. Well, what about the action the Australian government is taking in relation to approving new fossil fuel projects? Do you think that's something ambassadors should should be telling the truth about? So what Ms Klugman thinks or does not think, Senator, is not a matter for uh, for these estimates. You know that. Uh, and well, what about um, you, Minister? These are matters of public record, Senator. What about you, Minister? I've got, your, I've got a copy record. of your your latest communication here, which you if you give me a second, I'll, I'll just look up. It's very you, good of you, Senator. Yeah, <laughs> always happy to be of service, Minister. Uh, 28th of the 1st of the 22nd. Are you at Sofa, Pete? The Morrison Pete. government is investing a billion in caring for our magnificent Great Barrier Reef. On top of the two billion under the 2050 <laughs> Reef Management Plan, we will protect our most prized environmental asset and the 64,000 jobs that depend on it. Um, how, how are you protecting the Great Barrier Reef, Minister, uh, while you're approving new fossil fuel projects? Well, Senator, and, you, and you've got the least ambition of your 2030 emissions targets of uh, of the, the major major countries, the major polluters around the world, like the EU and UK and US. Uh, well, Senator, you um, had the great misfortune to miss the exchange uh, between Senator Ayres and I in the uh, previous session, um, which uh, spoke about uh, those issues at length, but also uh, about our achievements in terms of reductions, for example, between 2005 and, uh, and 2021, which are matters of fact, uh, and the projections uh, that uh, we have um, been able to make uh, in relation to 2030 of uh, um, emissions reductions uh, up to... Um, 35 per cent. 
Uh, yeah. Senator, and I think it is important to note that Australia, and Minister Lay has said this on multiple occasions, Australia has never hidden from the challenges facing the reef or the pressures of climate change. Uh, what we are about ensuring uh, in the work that we're doing with the World Heritage Committee and uh, with partners on these issues is a fair, consistent and transparent process for the reef and for the people who you and I both know work tirelessly to protect it. Minister, if you're not hiding um, from climate change, as, as you say, um, why are you lo helping lobby the World Heritage Committee members, uh, individual countries against an endangered listing? And as you know, UNESCO recommended that to uh, the World Heritage countries. There was a scientific report. I remember Minister Lay said China was behind this. There were some shenanigans, but we'll, we'll leave that aside. That's the science before us. They're recommending a World Heritage downgrade, an endangered listing based on climate change. Why are you lobbying against that? Why are you promoting climate denial writ large on the world stage when you should be telling the truth about what the future of the Barrier Reef actually is projected to be. Thank you for that statement, Senator. And um, the government is in no way hiding uh, or, uh, or misrepresenting the position. In fact, I've just been clear that we are not doing that. Uh, I think. I don't that see any of that on your, on your communications, minister, minister. Senator, you well, asked. Um, Senator, I could bring to the committee an analysis of your Twitter communications, and I think between. Feel, feel free to. I'd love to see your public. Allow yeah. the minister Great. to answer, please. So I think the, the point, Senator, is that uh, both uh, the minister and I spoke to Director General. General Azale, uh, in June of last year in relation to this matter, we did not think that the process that was being, the, the approach, the process that was being pursued by the committee on this matter, which was um, in, in context uh, in relation to the broader issues of, uh, of the impact of climate change on World Heritage uh, listed uh, areas, such as the great reefs of the world, um, was advanced by the singling out of one reef in the world. Um, we have worked closely with members of the committee, uh, and I don't have all of the, the notes uh, here, Senator, to refresh my memory on this, but we are continuing to work closely with all of the members of the committee uh, to ensure that we take um, a, a better approach on process. And a number of countries joined us on that, Senator, as part of those uh, considerations. 11 other countries wrote to UNESCO with concerns about process. After you lobbied it them. It is legitimate. It After is you lobbied them to do so. Senator, for us to raise concerns in relation to those issues, as many other countries do on countless um, occasions. So uh, we will continue to work constructively, collaboratively. We've invited a reactive monitoring mission um, here to assess the reef firsthand. That had not happened, Senator. It, it, so without that, in, that personal visit, I think that's okay. very important. Uh, no, I agree, and I, I hope they do come and see everything and they get a fair and balanced view when they're here. Um, perhaps if I could ask you or the department. Um, Minister Lay was very clear uh, when uh, it said that the government had been blindsided by UNESCO scientific committee recommending an, an endangered listing, because the climate, because the Great Barrier Reef, as you say, is one of many of the world's reefs that are in danger from climate change, and sadly are declining very, very rapidly. Um, she mentioned very clearly that she thought China was behind this, uh, and this was a punitive measure against the Australian government. Did you get advice from, um, from your department as to whether that was true or not? I don't, I don't think the senator, I don't think uh, the minister ever said that uh, uh, China was behind it. I think uh, China was the chair at the time of the World Heritage uh, Committee. We'd been clear that we wanted to, we were constructive engaging, uh, constructively, as the minister said, uh, trying to ensure the process that was going to make any such decision was fully informed, that it was uh, looking systematically about how climate change was impacting on all natural heritage sites and how that was done through a considered fashion. Um, and that was, was the focus. I mean, when the World Heritage Centre and Committee was initially developed, uh, climate change you know, 40, 50 years ago was not the issue it is today. And trying to understand how that issue is now going to be considered by the World Heritage Centre and the committee and its technical advisory bodies was, was critical to be informing and ensuring a decision was going to be... With, with all due respect, Mr uh, it, is Mr, um, this has been discussed now for at least a decade at, at, at very, in a very detailed and thorough way um, through many agencies. Uh, it's not something new. I mean, we all know that climate change is the biggest threat to the reef. Um, 
My, my question, uh, Minister, is, you know, will you, will you use your social media account and will the other ambassadors uh, who are talking to these uh, UNESCO countries that will vote on this, on the impending vote, will you use your social media account to promote that Australia is the third biggest per capita em emitter of emissions in the world? Um, we are also the third biggest exporter of fossil fuels. That's not included uh, in our uh, statistics that we've been uh, pub making publicly available. We're still approving new fossil fuel projects at a very rapid rate. <laughs> Even when the International Energy Agency says um, 2021 was the year to stop uh, expiration and approval of all new fossil fuels. And, and will you also make the very simple point that even our Paris protocols that we've signed up to, that your government signed up to, one, you know, limiting one global warming to 1.5 or 2 degrees, or we less than 2 degrees. We are now past the 20 minute mark, so um, if you just, would just like just to if, wind up this if you, I'll just uh, finish this question, Senator Betts. Will, will, you, will you make that the world aware that even under those Paris agreements we've agreed to, the best science says that coral reefs around the world will decline between 70 and 99 per cent, even on one and a half degrees warming, regardless of whether we uh, meet our Paris agreements. Don't you think that's the kind of information the world should see? Don't you think we should be sending the strongest possible siren call for global action, list the barrier reef in danger, all the world's reefs get listed in danger, and then we take political action around the world? Surely that's one of the most important things we can agree on to get this job done and secure the future of the reef. Senator, um, I'm going to be respectful of the time that is uh, limited for, uh, for this committee today, but uh, frankly, I could begin in 1975 uh, with the enactment of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Act uh, in a, on a partisan, non-partisan uh, basis, uh, the banning by the Fraser Liberal government of oil and gas operations on the Great Barrier Reef, the deeming of the reef to be a World Heritage Standard. What is important, though, uh, is that we are working with uh, our partners around the world to ensure that the process that is taken in relation to, um, to the World Heritage uh, listing of the Great Barrier Reef is a process which is sound and which is contemporary, as uh, Mr Isbister has pointed out. Um, also that uh, the Australian government has made very significant contributions, including the most recent billion dollars in funding for the reef, uh, extending that, um, over, uh, that investment to over $3 billion. Uh, and we will continue to uh, indicate that we do not, as I said on the record here, uh, we're not in, in, in the um, business of hiding from those challenges. We've been clear about the issues facing the reef, the pressures of climate change. Uh, but what we do want to ensure is a fair, consistent and transparent process uh, for this. Um, and uh, that is uh, the position that we'll continue to articulate. Minister, I'm asking you and all of you as human beings, you know you're going to look back on this later in life and wonder why you didn't right. do more. I think time has expired. This is our opportunity well, to send the strongest possible Sen message. Right. I'm sure that'll be good for your social media. Senator Keneally, you have the call. You could get a few tips from me, Eric. Well, I'm sure I could. You might need them too, mate. Yep, um, I fully Just agree. Quietly. <laughs> Are we done with Senator Betts' social media? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Minister, uh, this morning Paul Kelly wrote in The Australian, and I quote, Pivotal to Australia's success is in its pushback against China has been support from the public and bipartisanship from Labor. This bipartisanship is a national asset. Minister, do you agree that bipartisanship in this context is a national asset? Senator, I haven't, uh, I've, I've seen um, broadly uh, um, Mr Kelly's uh, piece this morning and um, there's much of it um, with which uh, I would agree and, uh, and broadly speaking, um, uh, that is, uh, that is uh, a reasonable observation uh, to make, Senator, but there are a number of examples, uh, well, a number of instances, um, where this has, has not always been the case. And whilst I would uh, seek to uh, prosecute the case for Australia's national interests uh, in an open and, uh, and transparent and consistent way, uh, and that is uh, what I do um, endeavour uh, to do. Uh, I have found 
in my time in this role, uh, that that has not always been the case from um, across the parliament. Mm. Well, the former ASIO Director, Defence Secretary ambassador, and Ambassador to the United States, Mr Dennis Richardson, is also quoted in The Australian today saying, and I quote, Australian governments have seen it to be in the national interest to have a bipartisan approach to critical national security issues. It is a long time since an Australian government actively sought to create a partisan divide on national security. He also said that the federal opposition, quote, has stood with the government in defending our national interests when it has come to economic coercion by China. Minister, is Mr. Richardson incorrect? Senator, I actually don't intend to, uh, to take this estimates discussion. Um, you can ask questions, but I don't intend um, to take this estimates discussion uh, in the direction of a um, comment by comment uh, analysis. I think there are other and more appropriate places, frankly, to uh, to do that. Um, but, uh, and may I say, um, I have uh, uh, the highest uh, regard for uh, for Mr. Richardson, uh, of course, uh, and have worked with him over many years. Uh, but, Senator, the engagement by politicians in the rough and tumble of uh, the political discourse uh, comes with a record, usually. You yourself have a robust record of engagement in political discourse. Uh, I recall uh, in your candidacy in Benelong, for example, Senator Ayres has a robust record in political discourse. Senator mm. Betts. Senator Patterson, I probably do but as well. Australia, as Minister, Minist as well, I, I could go Richardson to your comments, that. Senator, on such matters, but I don't intend to take this hearing down that path. I'm simply seeking to understand where Australia has had a long tradition of bipartisanship on national security and foreign policy issues. Indeed, as a member of the Intelligence and Security Committee. I think it represents the best of our bipartisan approach in the national interest. And I pay tribute to my Liberal colleagues on that committee. What I'm seeking Thank you to under that, Senator. Thank you, Senator Betts. I'm sure the chair sitting behind you appreciates that as well. I think that is overwhelmingly the case, Senator. I don't and disagree what I'm with you, but it's not always the case, Senator. What I'm it's seeking, not always the case. I'm just seeking to understand what your posture as Foreign Minister is in relation to bipartisanship and its role in supporting our national interest. I have said that that is overwhelmingly preferable. It is important in foreign policy. That's why I've pointed to the vital importance of consistency uh, and clarity uh, and been clear in, uh, in doing so, Senator. But I am aware and have been on the receiving end, frankly, uh, from time to time as a member of this government uh, of uh, statements which I don't agree reflected by partisanship by your side of politics. Mm. I don't think they're helpful from that either. Mm. Minister, we are in a pre-caretaker period. and these What's a pre-caretaker period, Senator? Well, we are about to go into caretaker period. So there's no such thing as a pre-caretaker period. There's a caretaker period, to well, be clear. Yes, but we are just before that happens, so... We are in a pre-caretaker period, and these discussions will be the subject of much domestic and international speculation. I note that this morning, Mr. Paul Kelly went on to say that, and I quote, the election needs to leave Australia in a stronger position to deal with China, not diminished and more divided. Now, I'm sure you would, as you have agreed, that bipartisanship is important, both to, and I would, say both to understanding the threats and the challenges we face and, our poli and on policy responses, which are important parts of our, our elements of our national security. So in this pre-election period, perceptions are, um, on bipartisanship are important, particularly to our international allies, are they not? 
Uh, they are senator, but I don't necessarily think they give a leave pass uh, to um, uh, to uh, people's records. And if people's records um, don't withstand scrutiny on this issue, then that's um, essentially a fact. Well, I think we would all agree, I would hope, that we face the most challenging set of regional circumstances since the end of the Second World War. And, and central to these challenges is a more aggressive and assertive China. It seems to me you are agreeing that it is in our national interest that our the asset that is our bipartisan approach to foreign policy and national security be ma maintained. I would certainly seek that um, those who uh, those who uh, participate in the national debate uh, consistently display that, Senator. And I would say that one of the points that has been raised um, in this uh, discussion in, uh, in recent uh, uh, times, in recent reporting, um, is uh, a lack of consistency. I might come to that, but I really want to explore this issue a bit more. So, Senator, I'm not going to take this hearing down the path of uh, a lengthy discussion on this matter. With the so you can keep asking questions. Yes, I was going to say with the greatest of respect. It, it's well, actually, with I none, I understand that, oh. but certainly. But look, I'm just seeking we, to ask some can, questions. Yeah, but look, we can get into what the minister has said, and I can remind uh, the committee that there may be a senator sitting at the table here on this side who may have made comments about the government being China-phobic in relation to the expression of some of its concerns, and you might be familiar with those comments, Senator Keneally. You might indeed have a very close relationship with that senator. And uh, if we want to have that he said, she said, we can do, but I'm not sure it serves any purpose. Minister, have you sought to reassure any of Australia's allies of the level of bipartisanship in our national security and foreign policy? For example, did you do this at last week's Quad Foreign Ministers meeting? Uh, Senator, as I, I think I said uh, earlier in the, uh, in the day, we have had um, a significant range of discussions uh, literally just in the, in the last week and, uh, and more to come uh, in, um, uh, in my engagements uh, in the coming days. Uh, certainly through the uh, meeting of the Quad with the um, Foreign Minister and Foreign Minister equivalents from the United States and India and uh, Japan, uh, with the meeting with the Lithuanian Foreign Minister, uh, with the meeting with the Minister for Foreign Affairs from Timor-Leste, with my counterparts with whom I, um, I speak uh, regularly um, uh, by, by phone and by um, video conference these days. Uh, I always assure them of Australia's uh, strength and resilience uh, and the, of the basic positions and values that we hold. Well, that is a quite comprehensive answer. Uh, the question I asked was, did you assure them of the level of bipartisanship that exists in Australia, such as is exemplified uh, by the consistency of his policy positions between the government and the opposition on matters like China, or indeed the good work that is done by the Intelligence and Security Committee? Uh, I was uh, pleased that uh, the Leader of the Opposition uh, and uh, the Shadow Minister for Foreign Affairs, uh, and I'm not sure if other Shadow Ministers were, were present, uh, had the opportunity to meet themselves uh, with uh, a number of uh, our visitors uh, in, uh, in that context uh, in those um, events uh, last week. Um, and I'm sure that that, that message was, uh, was strongly delivered. Thank you. Uh, Minister, I, the director of the National Security College, Mr. Rory Medcalf, has said that the government can't have it both ways, assuring our allies that we are in it for the long haul through the many changes of government that we'll take, it will take for our odyssey of building nuclear submarines, while insisting that only one side of politics can be trusted on security. 
But Minister, it is clear that your colleagues, some of your colleagues, are pushing such a narrative. How can this be consistent with our need to reassure our allies that on such long-term um, uh, objectives, there is bipartisanship on these issues? So, Senator, there is a, a point uh, upon which we agree, and that is the importance of consistency. Uh, and uh, one of the uh, issues which uh, has been raised in, in recent political debate uh, is that question of consistency. Uh, and that is an observation which uh, I think the government is in, uh, entitled to, uh, to make. It is absolutely important to be clear and consistent uh, in our approaches on these matters. Mm. You mentioned earlier the idea of the rough and tumble of politics, and I think we can both acknowledge politics at time is rough and tumble. But you know, Dennis Richardson has made the observation that the opposition has given bipartisanship on matters such as economic coercion by China. Shouldn't national security be outside the rough and tumble? Isn't that in the national interest? Yes, Senator. And I could point you to a range of examples, which I do not intend to take this committee through, where that consistency has not been delivered. Now, I would hope to see uh, that it is uh, the case, particularly, as you say, in a di very difficult um, strategic uh, environment, uh, that uh, Australia is able to continue to take the very strong approach that we have taken, for example, uh, and absolutely acknowledge mm. that this is an approach on Ukraine and, uh, and Russia, uh, where both uh, where, where the entire parliament, frankly, to the best of my knowledge, um, is united uh, mm. on respecting, acknowledging and uh, emphasising the importance of the sovereignty and territorial integrity of the Ukraine. Uh, I have not, uh, uh, that has not been an issue that has been uh, raised with me as, uh, as causing any uh, of the issues that uh, you have pointed mm. to. Thank you. Um, Secretary, we asked your predecessor on an, a number of questions at a previous hearing about the impact of language in this debate on our social cohesion. And, and she said, Ms Adamson said, when we're able to project a sense of bipartisanship and of unity about what matters most in our values, that's a powerful message. To be very frank, what I think Beijing is looking for is division and where they're able to sow division. What's your assessment of Beijing's uh, intent are they looking to sow division in our communities and in our policies on national security? Senator, I'll ask Mr Hayhurst, who has responsibility for this area, to answer that question. Senator Justin Hayhurst, Deputy Secretary, uh, Geo Strategic Group. I think, uh, Senator, it's fair to say that um, the Chinese system uh, seeks to exploit uh, social and other divisions in countries to, to pursue its interests. That's, that's, that's very apparent. And how, and what is your assessment of the best way for countries to resist that division, and particularly Australia? Well, our, our remit is about Australia's international posture mm. and policies, of course. Um, but clearly, at a time of uh, strategic and security challenges, um, having uh, the right systems and high levels of social cohesion, these things better equipped countries to handle disruption, challenges, security threats and risks. Thank you. Um, well, I do observe, and I think you're, it's a fair point you make, that this is not solely within DFAT's remit. The Director General of ASIO said last week in his annual threat assessment, it is critical we do not let fear of foreign interference undermine stakeholder engagement or stoke community division. Were this to happen, it would perversely have the same corrosive impact. 
on our democracy as foreign interference itself. And I can say as a former candidate in a seat that had a high level of Australians from a Chinese background, they, that many members of the Australian community who are of a Chinese background do feel acutely at times as if fear of foreign interference by China has somehow cast a suspicion upon them. So in considering the ASIO Director General's words, which do cross over into part of your area, do you agree that, we, that it is critical we do not let fear of foreign interference undermine that stakeholder engagement or stoke community division? Well, in my, in my framing, uh, Senator, uh, social cohesion uh, is, is, very, is very important. And I think the government um, and ministers, including the Minister for Foreign Affairs, have been at great pains mm -hmm. to emphasise that in relation to uh, members of, uh, of the Australian community who have of Chinese descent. Thank you. Um, bearing all this in mind, Minister, and I do welcome some of your comments today, um, what advice are you giving your colleagues about the importance of supporting bipartisanship on foreign policy and national security? Senator, I'm not going to go into, uh, into my discussions uh, with uh, colleagues um, on any matters. Um, I um, do not do that. As you know. Mm. But Minister, do colleagues sometimes have to take the lead on some of these issues, such as, I recall, certain phraseology directed at myself when I opposed an extradition treaty with China and all sorts of things were uh, accused at the time. Now I think nobody thinks it would be a good idea for us to have such an extradition treaty with China, and we are, in fact, unravelling the one that we had with Hong Kong, or we've suspended it. I think that's the correct terminology. So um, sometimes you do need people to make these comments and observations, same with the diplomatic boycott of the Beijing Olympics, which I raised quite some time uh, before it became part and parcel of uh, um, accepted uh, view right around the world. Um, and so it's very easy to make those sort of comments and say that somebody's not being bipartisan, yet after a little while it does become the accepted wisdom. Has that been your experience, Mr Hayhurst? Well, I think um, my experience has been that Australian democracy um, has been able to deal with these challenges in a very appropriate way. And um, by having these open debates, uh, the government has been able to um, have that context with which to consider the foreign policy and other advice provided mm. by agencies, including us. I think it would be... Course, oh, sorry, Minister. I was going to say um, the, uh, the importance of discussion and debate uh, cannot be cancelled um, by, uh, by some of the assertions that have been made in uh, this discussion, uh, in my view. Uh, that does not detract an iota from the observations I made about um, the importance of uh, Australia's foreign policy. But it is, it, it is the case that the record shows that there have been during the iterations of this government's enactment of a range of pieces of legislation since 2016, that there have been um, criticisms of those uh, which have uh, ventured into, uh, to use Senator Keneally's language, the national security space. Uh, that is a fact. Uh, there has not always been. Uh, consistency, uh, if you like, from all uh, on those. If I may, Senator yes. Yeah, yeah, keep on. And yeah, thank yeah, yeah. you for your, um, your observation, because it does remind us that bipartisanship is sometimes eventually reached, um, because uh, in that circumstance that you pointed to about the extradition treaty, of course, uh, Labor also opposed the extradition treaty. 
Um, and I believe... But Minister not at the time I did. I but, uh, well, I he believe... He came on board later, which I welcomed. Well, I believe, in fact, um, that uh, we were, uh, in fact, on the same page. And correct me if I'm wrong, Minister, but my recollection is that um, at that time the Cabinet had approved the extradition treaty with China. Correct? Mm -hmm. I wasn't... I don't... I believe you were a date, member... Senator, but I don't, yeah. And I don't have that information in front of me. You don't recall that the Cabinet approved the, the extradition date, treaty? Sorry. I said. You don't recall that the Turnbull government approved the extradition treaty with China? No, no, I didn't say that. I said I didn't recall the date. The, I don't have the date. I'm, I'm, I didn't ask the date. I, I asked... I'm oh, sorry, I thought you were asking about the time. You said at that time, and I did not have that information. I think there was talk about a timeline. My question was, you were a member of a Cabinet that approved the extradition treaty? to China, correct? I'm trying to recall the date, Senator. I'm not asking the um, date. I'm asking if you were a member of the Cabinet that approved an extradition treaty with China. I believe that was the case, Senator. Thank you. I, I, and, and, um, but as I've said, I, I think don't comment very on Cabinet deliberations, there. Senator, and you can't possibly have any insight on them, respectfully. No, I can't. That's why I've asked the question. That's the point of Senate estimates. Um, and thank you, Senator Batts. Um, well, Minister, what I take from your answers today, and I do thank you for them, is that you do retain a commitment to bipartisanship on national security and foreign policy matters, something I, I do welcome, and it seems to me you take that seriously. And I appreciate you're not going to comment on your conversations with your colleagues, but I am heartened uh, by the answers you've given today. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. All right, well. Uh, I do, well, I'm, uh, I'm does Senator. To, I'm happy to ask a few questions or we can go to Senator Fawcett now. I have, uh, I think I have Ayers. questions um, if uh, Senator Fawcett has a Clutch of questions. I'm happy to yeah, go to him. A clutch of well, questions. It's a new collective now. Yeah, All right, Senator Fawcett with his clutch of questions. Uh, see, I'm going to regret that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it could lead to just, a just lot of discussions things, about I'm chicken sure, and Senator. eggs and all sorts of things. Um, Secretary, could we get the relevant offices for the Solomon Islands? Yes, Senator. Please. The Office of the Pacific, the head of the Office of the Pacific will be joining us. And the Middle East as well. Yes. And the Middle East. I, think, I suspect there might be a few Israel questions we'll the, coming we'll up as well. Keep them close, prepared. They will come down from upstairs if they are upstairs. Yeah, that's why I'm calling them yeah. now, so that they can potentially make themselves available. Thank you. Um, Ms McDonald, I'd just like to get an update, if I could, on the situation in the Solomon Islands. Obviously, Australia had a significant role there after the unrest that occurred, and I'm aware that they have also had an outbreak of COVID. So I'm just wanting to get a, an update on the, the stability on our ongoing engagement, particularly with uh, our Pacific family. I understand PNG, Fiji and New Zealand are, were involved. Are they still involved? And, and New Zealand. The response. And, and New, New Zealand, Zealand, yes. And the response to COVID there. OK, thank you, Senator, and uh, good morning. Um, so, Senator, as you may recall, it was the 24th of November that Hon Honiara escalated into a series of sort of incidents of public disorder and instability. Uh, on the following day, on the afternoon of the 25th, Australia received a request to provide uh, security support under our bilateral security treaty, which was struck in 2017, and it was the first time that treaty had been utilised. Uh, later that day, Prime Minister Morrison announced that we would be deploying uh, to Honiara in support of, of that request. Uh, as you mentioned, Senator, we also work with our Pacific family, uh, so PNG, Fiji and New Zealand were also part of that and responded swiftly 
as well uh, to restore calm in the Solomon Islands. Uh, that calmness was restored very quickly in the morning of the 27th. Stability had, uh, had I suppose, got to a point that uh, it, was, it was more settled, might be the way to put it, uh, at that time. Um, and also, um, the parliament was able to resume in early December. And you may recall there was a vote of no confidence uh, at that time that was being considered. That was very important, I think, for, for just a democratic basis for, for the country. And, uh, of course, security and law and order was very important at that point. And the RSIPF, uh, the Royal Solomon Islands Police Force, uh, were at that point providing high visibility patrols and the like. Under our bilateral security treaty, the commander, the Australian Federal Police Commander, becomes a deputy commissioner of the Royal Solomon Islands Police Force, and he was also sworn into that role. Uh, subsequent to that, so stability still remains at this point, we still have uh, the contingent in place, and I can give you the exact numbers, but of course COVID. Uh, so perhaps just before we go on to COVID, yeah. um, can I just come back to the role of the uh, RSIP? Uh, my understanding is we have trained um, them yeah. for a number of years since Ramsey. Uh, as well as providing equipment. Uh, has there been an assessment as to the efficacy of their approach and, and the policing and responding uh, to that unrest? Yes, so, so Senator, uh, on that day of the 24th of November, I think the Royal Solomon Islands Police Force did an excellent job in being able to withstand the unrest that was happening at the time. That was a credit to the, the training and the non-lethal uh, weapons that they were utilising. It also, I think, uh, demonstrated the advice that our Australian Federal Police, who are there on a regular basis, are providing to the Royal Solomon Islands Police Force. And I visited Solomon Islands with Commissioner Kershaw not long ago, and um, he equally reiterated uh, the excellent job that the Royal Solomon Islands Police Force had done. Um, of course, when we arrived on the 25th, we were able to re replenish those non-lethal le lethal weapons and the like. So uh, an excellent job was done at the time and uh, that's continuing. The training and support for the Royal Solomon Islands Police Force is continuing both through the, the contingent we've brought in under the Bilateral Security Treaty, but also our existing ongoing Australian Federal Police program. So that's probably a good point to go to the, the COVID question, but a, a linkage is, I know we went to a lot of um, trouble to make sure that uh, none of that uh, Australian group or other allies from the Pacific family took COVID in. Uh, what, what is happening now with the COVID and where did the outbreak occur? Yes, yeah, so the outbreak uh, occurred on the 21st of January. Um, I remember that day. Uh, because, as you know, Solomon Islands had been COVID-free up to that mm. point and had worked very hard on that. And we had worked closely with them on preparation in case this was going to occur at a later date. It occurred from a PNG crossing at one of the outer islands. Um, and, of course, as you know, S Senator, from your time <coughs> travelling in the region, the health system in Solomon Islands uh, was put under considerable strain uh, as a result of that. So we have uh, since then uh, worked very closely with Solomon Islands on uh, a number of RAF flights have come in, um, certainly around six, including the last one on the 15th, which I think was yesterday, um, delivering humanitarian and medical supplies. Um, we've also had an OSMAT team in there at, at the request of Solomon Islands, which I think has been very important. and. Uh, and during the visit uh, to Solomon's a few weeks ago, uh, Dr Jimmy Rogers, who's the head of the Prime Minister's department, who is a medical practitioner, uh, put a number of requests to us that we have, have subsequently responded to. Uh, oxygen has been a, a problem uh, with any of the outbreaks we've had across the region, to be honest, and 100 oxygen concentrators have been provided as well. 
uh, six tonnes of uh, UNICEF emergency water and sanitation kits, um, as well as um, increased vaccine, vaccine doses, because um, as you can understand, a bit like Australia, where there's an outbreak, the vaccine, um, people willing to get the vaccine increases significantly. So uh, that was also important. I think the other bit that's worried us a lot, and the minister uh, has been very focused on this whole uh, effort uh, of Australia, is around food security, and uh, the foreign minister approved us supporting uh, the food security drops that have been happening to the outer islands. So as you know, in Honiara, there's shipping lines that go back and forth, COVID prevented uh, that occurring, and therefore uh, flights were needed. We did that with the Solomon Islands airline itself, where we could, where they could land, and we used the C-27s uh, from the Australian Defence Force. So. You know, the, the effort's been comprehensive, I think, and will continue uh, for us uh, into the future. OK, thank you. Uh, can, can, I, can I just intercede quickly and just... Uh, how many... Can, can you tell me how many vaccines we've supplied and what the, what the proportion... What, you know, what the vaccination... What, what, what is the level of vaccination in the Solomon Islands? Yeah, so we've... From, from memory, we've, we've given about 300,000 all up. There's... Uh, the vaccination rate on double vaccination was over 20 per cent. So it had a... It, it started pretty quickly, then slowed because they didn't have it. Uh, it's increasing again. There is no shortage of supply for us on vaccines, so we've been rolling them as the demand requires it. We're just concerned about um, ex expiration dates if we put too many in too early. Um, so, look, that's been a positive. The other thing that's been sort of asked for is... Um, as you can imagine, the testing capacity has been a problem. So getting rats in, as they're sort of known by everybody, into the country has been important. And we've recently delivered around 100,000, I think, there as well. So, um, look, vaccination is important. I think uh, we're seeing an increase and we're trying to encourage and support that. Thanks, Mr McDonald. Thank you. Just remaining with the Pacific and COVID, obviously COVID has had a big impact on their uh, GDP coming from tourists and other activities. Um, and so remittances uh, from you know, the Pacific Labor Scheme and Seasonal Workers Program have been important. Could you just talk to the committee briefly about the, the program that is bringing those two together um, and um, how many people have come? The, the PALM the, program, Senator. Yeah, the PALM program. Um, and the, the updates to that around welfare for workers, etc. Yes, yeah, so, so, Senator, there's about, um, I was going to say, 55,000 ready workforce to come into Australia from the Pacific. Um, it's dropped, I think, slightly because a number have, have come in, but it's certainly over 50,000. There's about 20,000 or so currently in Australia, which is the highest number ever. COVID has been a challenge as we've gone through this, and I think the numbers and interest from countries has been uh, excellent in the sense that, um, you know, we've required uh, people to be vaccinated as they arrive or vaccinated beforehand, quarantine arrangements that they've had to go into, uh, as well as other provisions in countries. So I think, you know, bringing those two together uh, has been a challenge, I'll be honest with you, with, with COVID. And, and, of course, in some countries, uh, and it's still the case, the borders have been closed, right? So the borders have closed in order to keep the pandemic out. That's restricted the number coming from those countries. Um, but now it's starting to free up. Um, there's opportunities for employers to support uh, increasing those Pacific labour numbers now. Um, the, the, the supply is there. Um, it's now an opportunity, I think, with Australia's changes. Uh, the other one that I think is worth mentioning is Fiji, um, because Fiji on tourism, as you mentioned, Senator, has had a really big hit. Uh, they're coming out of their third wave of Omicron at the moment, um, and they've just, again, reduced their restrictions. And interestingly, they're sort of... They're almost following in in step behind us in terms of what Australia's done, I think. Um, if we could come back to the PALM program, um, I'm interested specifically around how the reforms um, in that are, are working out. And I'm also interested 
of the numbers of people who uh, are available at the moment to come. How many of those have been here previously and see this as a, a net positive for them and for their families? Um, yes, I might ask Ms Heineke to help me with this, but I do know, for example, the seasonal worker program, which we recently, recently took over from the Department of Employment, uh, there's about 74% returnees of workers each year, often to the same employee, uh, employer, actually. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, there is a lot of return, there is a lot of continuation, and there's been a lot of interest um, in the program. But I might ask Ms Heineke to talk about the reforms that are being put in place. Sorry, sure. just to, sorry to interrupt. That was 74% return, Mr McDonald. Yes, Senator Van, 74 per cent uh, right. under the seasonal worker program, yeah. So that's, and, and often some are coming back to the same employer uh, because of the relationship they've had. And, you know, overwhelmingly, uh, the, the program is received very positively in the region and also obviously the interactions we have here, as you've been at yourself, Senator, with the, uh, the, the uh, ambassadors and high commissioners here. Yes, thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Senator. Danielle Heineke, First Assistant Secretary, Labor and Connectivity Division. Um, just to confirm, we, we undertook a, a review in 2021 that included consultations across Australia. There were 37 consultation, 47 consultations. We had 92 responses to questions. As a result of that review, the government made a series of announcements, first in September last year, the second in November. And that brought together a number of reforms. The first big decision there was to really introduce a PALM scheme, which put the programs together. The machinery of government change was part of that announcement, which brought the Seasonal Workers Program into DFAT. That was completed on the 20th of January, as Mr McDonald has said. Um, I'll just go through a couple of key points from those reforms. The first one, what we aimed to really do in that, based on the consultations, was to bring together the administrative efficiencies, both for Pacific governments as well as for employers in Australia. Now there's one department that everybody's dealing with. Um, we are in the process of negotiating a new palm deed. That's with employers, Pacific governments, community groups, unions have been involved in those discussions as well. Um, we're close to finalising those. A new deed will come into place on the 4th of April this year. Some of the, some of the benefits and changes that have been approved that we're implementing as part of that program include the long-term stream. Um, a visa has been the visa has been extended from three years to four years. That does provide greater opportunities as well as funding that we've provided through the program to upskill workers. There's also an, an option for employers to for employees to move from the seasonal stream. Um, that's in horticulture is, is the primary area that that seasonal stream has been used to date, but it is also available to tourism in regional and rural areas, they can move to the long-term visa. That can happen onshore, and it does allow employers and workers to work together to upskill workers um, into higher jobs in those sectors. We've removed recruitment caps for employers that have got a good record. Um, we've streamlined reporting across both programs, and we've also looked at um, improvements in the welfare space. Um, many of those will be are being negotiated as we speak in the Palm Deed which is under negotiation. A couple of other things I'd just like to mention um, is that for Pacific countries, we are in bringing the schemes together and one deed. We're also negotiating MOUs with those countries. There sorry, is what, um, high use? demand Pacific from the Pacific, uh, sorry? Me memorandum of understanding. Mem with, yeah, but you said Pacific gut countries? With Pacific governments oh. and Timor-Leste, which are okay. part of the, the scheme. You. There will be a new in-country IT database, which will be open to employers as well as for each Pacific Labor Ministry. Um, that's really important to Pacific governments and Pacific uh, high commissions here because it enables, enables them to track their workers in time. And that's going to be important both for recruitments as well as some of the work that they do here in Australia to track welfare cases with us. Mm, sure. Thank so you. my last question on this is, You've talked about the, the longer visas, the opportunity for upskilling. Uh, traditionally, much of this has been in the agricultural sector. Is there a, a plan, other activities underway to expand the options for work into other sectors rather than just agriculture? Thanks, Senator. Yes, uh, at the moment, agriculture has been the dominant, dominant sector, but we have got um, 
a high interest in aged care, other care sectors. There are 146 uh, aged care workers at the moment in country. We've, we have a pilot at the moment working with the Northern Territory Government um, train and Samoa, which is training up workers here in Australia, and that will enable um, them to go into aged care jobs, which of course are in short high demand here. Importantly, it is adding to the skills net gain of net, the skills gain in the Pacific, which is really important to Pacific countries. So we are looking to expand those types of arrangements. Um, now that borders are open, we expect that there'll be also high growth in tourism to hospitality. Um, there's also been some demand for, uh, in rural Victoria, for example, we have had recruitment through the Pacific Labor Scheme into light manufacturing, but that's been in relatively low, number, low numbers. It is available for any sector in rural and regional areas where labor market testing can demonstrate there's a gap and there's a demand. I was sure. told um, recently construction is also under consideration. Yes, if there's demand, we can work in any sector. Okay, thank you very much. It's encouraging. Um, I just want to move on very quickly. We can probably deal with this at the secretary level, uh, with the Middle East, specifically the Amnesty International report uh, into Israel. Um, I found it quite uh, offensive and poorly considered for them to use the word apartheid. And I know the minister and the prime minister have made comments, but from a departmental perspective, um, you know, can can the department offer a view on how valid they think the use of that term is and actions that we're taking to work constructively with Israel around some of those areas where there have been concerns raised uh, in the international community. Minister Innes Brown's well placed to answer this. Thank you, Senator Mark Innes Brown, First Assistant Secretary, Middle East, Africa and Afghanistan Division. Um, thank you. Uh, on, the, on the specific report, it's not a characterisation that we we have determined or, or share. A centre of those sorts of um, judgments are usually um, made in an appropriate um, uh, international context or setting. Um, we generally, um, in relation to the issues that it, that it makes allegations about, um, we, um, as you said, we seek to engage constructively with Israel on, on various issues of, of concern and um, we continue to do so on a regular basis. Um, most recently, um, last week on the 7th of February, where our ambassador spoke to the foreign ministry about a number of matters. Um, prior to that, he did speak to um, uh, parliamentarians um, a week or so prior to that. And uh, most recently in Canberra on the 21st of uh, January, I spoke to the uh, Israeli ambassador designate. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, I just have two other questions. I'm just conscious here of time. Uh, one is no. So, if, yes. Briefly intervene uh, on on this issue. Um, is it a fact that in Israel that there is an Arab party which is a key member of the current Israeli governing coalition? That is a fact, Senator. And is it also correct that all of its citizens have equal rights regardless of ethnicity or religion? I'd just like to check that characterisation, Senator, but I believe so. Thank you. And uh, are you aware of The Economist magazine's ranking of democracies in the world? I haven't. Uh Studied it recently, all right. Senator. All, all right. Uh, well, Secretary, possibly to you, can I ask, uh, do we consider, does Australia consider, or Minister indeed, that Belgium, Portugal, Greece, Cyprus and the United <coughs> States are democracies? We do, Senator. We do. Right. Because The Economist ranks Israel as the world's 23rd most democratic country and more democratic than Belgium, Portugal, Greece, Cyprus and the United States. So one wonders where Amnesty International gets off on this. Can I ask, have we made any representations to Amnesty International that if they want to be considered as a credible organisation pursuing genuine issues of human rights, 
that they might like to ensure that they don't engage in such inflammatory misinformation which clearly uh, defies the objective facts in relation to Israel. Okay. Um, well, we will have uh, we do engage them regular, regularly, Senator. I have had discussions with Amnesty International prior to this report coming out in recent weeks and, and late last year, and um, we are more, are more than happy to um, convey those views and and uh, to underline, as I said, that we don't. Um, my initial response to you, Senator, um, to Senator Fawcett, was that uh, we didn't share that characterisation and we don't support it. So I'm well, ve very happy to do so. Could I encourage you to do so proactively, not just on the occasion of another discussion, but to say, sure. after consideration of this inflammatory report full of misinformation, that uh, if it wants to protect its reputation and standing, it might uh, reconsider its stance. Sorry, Senator Paul. Senator, we, oh. as you know, have also joined a number of international partners uh, in uh, in rejecting the characterisation of Israel. Australia has been explicit, as has been acknowledged mm. at the table, uh, but Germany, the UK, France, the United States uh, and, uh, and others, uh, and uh, I do not agree with, cannot support uh, and uh, would not um, consider uh, an accurate representation, um, frankly, the comments that um, Senator of Western Australia, Senator Lyons made uh, in the Senate last week. Yeah, um, basically regurgitating the very misinformed and ill-founded amnesty report. And in the spirit of bipartisanship on matters foreign affairs, uh, I'm sure that uh, Ms Lyons does not represent uh, the views of the Labor Party, despite the very <coughs> senior position that she holds, that of the nominee for the presidency of the Senate. Senator Wong has indicated her position. Yeah. Senator um, Fawcett, Chair, thank you. Chair, sorry if I may, uh, just a yeah, clarifying yeah. question. On that, if you're putting those questions to Amnesty International, um, it, it'd be interesting to understand their motivations behind such um, reports. Um, it, it might be characterised as uh, seeking publicity, whether that be for donations or political reasons, I, I cannot ascertain, but it seems a lot of NGO activity around Israel seems to be publicity seeking, um, assuming to shore up uh, public uh, funds for public donations. Um, I'll take that as a comment, Senator. All right, back to Senator Fawcett. Chair. Thank you. Just two uh, questions, if I can, on Southeast Asia. Um, firstly, to Vietnam and uh, <coughs> Mr. Chow Van Kam. Just wondering if you have any updates on our consular access to him. Um, we'll just get the consular people to the table. Thank you, Senator. Greg Wilcock, Assistant Secretary, Consular Operations. Uh, could you ask your question again, please, Senator? Um, I'm interested in the case of Mr Chow Van Kam in Vietnam, uh, and I understand that despite poor health and a prolonged uh, legal um, wrangle, if you like, uh, that our consular access has been limited, and uh, I'm interested to know what representations we've made, whether that situation has improved, uh, and where we see um, the prognosis, if that's the right word, for his circumstances. You're right, Senator. It has been a prolonged period without face-to-face uh, -face consular access to, uh, to Mr Kam. If I refer to him as Mr Kam, you'll understand I'm mm -hmm. talking about the same person. Yes. Uh, our last consular access to Mr Kam was in April last year, around the time of Anzac Day. Since then, we've been able uh, we've not been able to exercise consular access to him on COVID-19 control grounds. We've advocated to the Vietnamese authorities that we put in place workarounds, uh, including telephone access. Uh, that has not just been us, Senator. We have uh, worked with like-minded to make those points. Uh, that has not been agreed to. Uh, I'm happy to report, though, Senator, that uh, our request for consular access to Mr. Kam for later this month, in about 10 days' time, uh, has been agreed to. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good. I'll look forward to uh, receiving an update from you. Senator, if I may say, uh, the 
matter of uh, Mr Cum's detention is a matter that I also raised uh, on my visit to Vietnam uh, in November, Senator. November, thank you, Craig. Uh, yeah. November, uh, with uh, senior ministers, uh, including uh, the Prime Minister uh, and the um, the Minister of Home Affairs equivalent. I'm not sure what the correct title is, uh, and the Foreign Minister. Thank you. Yeah. Um, can we go to Myanmar? Um, you'll be aware, Minister, from our previous discussions of. Uh, my interest through the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Committee, the Joint Committee in Autonomous Sanctions and the report we've passed, and I welcome the government's um, uh, introduction and subsequent passage of that legislation. Uh, but the question that logically raises then is what are we doing with like-minded nations uh, and indeed multilateral bodies like the UN uh, to seek to bring pressure on the junta uh, to stop the atrocities that we are seeing perpetrated against the people of Myanmar on a very regular, if not daily, basis. Chair, Chair if I might just interrupt. This is a very important subject. Um, Labor senators had anticipated getting the call um, a moment ago. If I could just get an indication of... That's my um, last question. Oh, so, sorry to interrupt then, Senator Fawcett. I'll, I'll leave it with you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Senator. Katrina Cooper, um, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, obviously, Deputy Secretary, Southeast Asia and Global Partners Group. Um, uh, we do have um, some sanctions on Myanmar, as you know, Senator, and uh, we have uh, uh, further sanctions under active consideration. Um, we are very active in trying to um, address the really dreadful situation um, in Myanmar. Overall, of course, our broader objectives are to, um, for the military to engage in a dialogue and return to democracy, um, for violence to cease, um, to alleviate the humanitarian situation, um, including uh, getting better access for humanitarian assistance, and um, to strengthen ASEAN unity and leadership um, in their efforts uh, in Myanmar. We also call regularly um, uh, and the Foreign Minister has done that just recently, um, Minister, um, about the unjust trial and sentencing of Aung San Suu Kyi. And just most recently, on the 1st of February, um, she issued a joint statement with many of her colleagues expressing grave concern over the sentencing of State Councillor Aung San Suu Kyi and other political de detainees. Sure. I'd be conscious of time here, so I won't extend this, but I'm. Yeah, statements are important, I understand that, uh, but for many people on the ground in Myanmar, those statements don't change the daily reality of what they are facing in terms of military attacks, uh, health, um, food shortages, a whole range of things. Uh, I guess I'm keen to understand what practical steps we with like-minded nations can be taking uh, to work with ASEAN and the UN to bring about pressure on the Tatmadaw to um, re-engage positively in that transition back to civilian power. Perhaps we'll leave that. You can take that on notice in the interest of time. So, Chair, I'll... Um... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I do have some questions uh, about the Australian women and children in northeast Syria. And, um, I don't know if the uh, inquiry ambassador will bring, we'll bring the officers to the table. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. Uh, 
Thank you, Mr. McLaughlin. Yeah, uh, Roger Noble, the Counterterrorism Ambassador, is also coming. So. Down, down. <laughs> Hoping he didn't get lost on the. He, oh, Dad is lost, Senator. I think he knows. It's point to point. He's got those basic skills down, don't you, Jim? There he is. Hmm? Don't do that, yes. Probably needs a navigator. Thank I didn't you. Say that. The secretary did. <laughs> I do want to start by acknowledging that uh, I, I understand the department works closely with Home Affairs, uh, and they did outline that in their estimates hearing on Monday uh, about to monitor the situation in the camps um, in cooperation with Australian security agencies and have explored options for safe repatriation and community reintegration. And I also want to make clear that I appreciate that this work is sensitive and complex and there are serious security concerns though in the camps themselves and security considerations of any repatriations. But bearing all of that in mind, I would like to explore with the department why it is that we are in the third year of this issue and these Australians and particularly Australian children or children with a claim to Australian citizenship remain in these camps. The uh, Roger Noble, Ambassador for Counterterrorism. Uh, Senator, I think the fundamental is the situation that those women and children find themselves in, where they are and why they are, make them persons of counterterrorism interest which is a whole of government responsibility that you correctly pointed out is coordinated by the Department of Home Affairs. Then on Monday, Secretary of the Home Affairs talked to you about the risk-based approach to analysing uh, their situation and the policy towards them. And I think he reiterated that the policy has not changed. DFAT contributes to that by helping inform the risks and putting, uh, getting the best information that we can. But the Australian government driver of the policy is, has been and remains that the protection of Australians and the Australian community. I understand that. I, I, what I sought to explore with Home Affairs officials on Monday is given the suite of legislation, counterterrorism and national security legislation that has passed the parliament, particularly with bipartisan support, control orders, temporary exclusion orders, and the like. Is there a legislative gap in our suite of counterterrorism tools? Is there a policy gap that, would, that is preventing the repatriation, particularly of these children? It is my understanding from some of the from speaking with some of the groups such as Save the Children, as well as some of the families, that the adults are actually quite willing to agree to a range of orders being placed upon them. Their primary concern is about the safety of the children. So have have is there a legislative or policy gap where we are not able to safely manage that risk in order to repatriate the children in particular? No, Senator. Not to the best of my knowledge or awareness. Uh, I think Secretary Pizzullo uh, said in his evidence on Monday, Monday thank you, um, uh, that uh, obviously conditions for repatriation uh, require an overall judgment. I would mm -hmm. augment that by saying also a whole of government um, approach, uh, which is about balancing the, the various risks. Uh, that includes that there wouldn't be, he said, an increased unreasonable and unacceptable threat to community safety here in Australia. Uh, we are also very conscious that uh, the security environment in Syria remains um, both volatile uh, and dynamic, uh, and ASIL's recent attack on a prison in uh, mm. Haskar in Syria would indicate that. I spoke with the Foreign Minister of Iraq uh, earlier this week, uh, and uh, a number of these issues were uh, raised in our conversation uh, as well. Okay. 
So are repatriations under active consideration? We are always uh, keeping the situation in the camps under review, Senator. We don't have um, uh, a policy, a blanket policy with regards to, uh, to repatriations. It's uh, one which uh, is considered um, by the government across agencies, uh, as Mr Pizzullo has explained and as um, counterparts here have indicated. Mm. Do you have information as to how many Australian women and children, or indeed children who have a claim to Australian citizenship, are located in our Raj? I'd so we uh, listened to your questions to Home Affairs on Monday. Thank you. Uh, haven't got the answer yet. Uh, the number I have is 65 men and women in Syria. The children number is oh, probably always going to be an estimate. Mm -hmm. uh, and we don't have it yet, but we'll undertake to get it to We're you and Home Affairs Senator. will do that. Mm. The, the reason is because the Syrian Kurdish authorities don't actually count the children by number. And that's why you hear the term often 12 family groups as yep. an indicative. Can so, we just, yep. sorry, Mr. Noble, I apologise. Did you want to finish that's your answers? No, that's it. <clears throat> when you talk about the women and men, my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that the men are largely in prisons, not the camps. Is that your understanding? Yeah. My understanding is the majority of women and children are in Al Roj. Yes. The men, their locations are uncertain, but they're yes. in detention and across Syria potentially not. But right. for those that we know, yeah. they're more they're more likely to be in prison than in a camp. And there are some that we don't know at all. That's where a, they are. And it, that's an accurate generalization. Yeah. Thank you. And I, I want to be clear, my questions are really here about those women and children in the camps. Um, although I am going to come to the particular issue, I think that the, the um, minister just raised about the um, prison attack. Um, as I said at the start of these questions, I'm not minimising the security considerations that are at stake. Um, but as you know, many other countries have steadily um, uh, conducted safe repatriations. We've seen um, the, United, the United States has done so. We've seen in the last few months Norway, the Netherlands and Sweden. I, I believe Sweden even did, after the prison attack, conduct repatriations. Um, Switzerland has also done so in recent months. Um, do you have any engagement with other like-minded countries about the way in which they've been able to safely conduct repatriations? We do. So we closely track all reports of repatriations by country. Mm -hmm. We talk to uh, regularly with nations who do it, and we share lessons about it. Mm. We also talk to nations that don't do it, of which there are many who have a mm. uh, non-repatriation policy or a policy close to Australia. Mm. But that's one of the defect contributions, is understanding the current situation and complexities and risks mm. associated with repatriation. And the fact that these countries have been able to repatriate their citizens shows that there is, it is possible to have access to these camps and to remove people, doesn't it? Yeah, yes, but it's about the risk associated with entering the camps and conducting repatriation. Mm. So one of the risks I think Home Affairs mentioned on Monday is risk to officials and those who actually conduct any repatriation. I'm really pleased you raised that because one of the questions Home Affairs could not answer for me on Monday was a report in the Sydney Morning Herald on the 3rd of November 2021 that <coughs> Australian officials travelled to Syria in late September to gather information about these, um, these Australian women and children. Is that report correct? So where of the report? The answer that I give publicly is the consular uh, interaction is indirect with people in the camps, principally through third parties such as humanitarian actors. And we cannot comment to protect the safety 
of Australian officials who are operating in the region. Mm. The report also states the government was waiting for a report from DFAT, Home Affairs and ASIO, on possible repatriations. Um, did the department complete that report? I'd probably refer you again to Monday in the Secretary of Home Affairs response, which is, uh, he said, which is accurate, there's been no change to the risk-based situation to indicate the need to change the policy and no decision to change the policy. And as the Minister said, we are in constant uh, interagency discussion around the matter and the risks associated with it. So it's an ongoing process with no decision to change policy. I'm not, I, I suppose what I'm asking here, Mr Noble, is not if the policy has changed because demonstrably it has not. I'm asking if, the gov if there has been a report to government as on possible repatriations subsequent to, from, since September. Has there been a report to government on possible repatriations? Has government been advised by the department? I'm not asking the content of that advice. I'm asking if a report or advice has been forwarded to government since September on possible repatriations. Uh, I take it on notice. I'm not tracking that, that it has, but I need to check. And Senator Keneally, if mm. I may, will yes. interrupt there for Senator Patrick. Um, could, I, could, I, could I ask, sorry, Kimberly? If you've got a burning final question, and we can go a minute or okay. two away the time. Look, and I, I do appreciate, I don't want to hold up Senator Patrick. I, I might come back to that, but just before I leave, if, I, if you don't mind, yeah, I'll be yeah, very yeah. quick. Go thank on. you, yep. Chair, and thank you, Senator Patrick. Um, the Minister raised the issue of the prison attack in um, northeast Syria, where ISIS did attack a prison, um, Australian males, including under 18s, minors, um, have, are being detained. It was reported that an Australian boy was injured in the violence. Does the department have any information on his welfare? And can we be told this boy what age he is? Uh, we're aware of the reports uh, we've got from a variety of third mm. parties. Uh, our understanding is his age is 17, almost 18. Mm. He was, uh, he was I believe, boy. I believe he was 14 when he went into a Kurdish yeah. prison. Is that correct, Mr Noble? I don't know, but that's highly like, I don't know when he went to the prison. So age 14, it'd be the same age as the young man that took out that police accountant in Sydney. Yeah, and um, it was reported on 24 January, he suffered a head wound as gunfire and explosions rattle around him. Um, he told his family via voice message, I'm scared I might die at any time. So I'm just seeking if the department has any update on his welfare. So from third parties, we believe he did escape the prison. We mm -hmm. don't know where he is and he is in detention. I can assure you that we're You all don't know where he is, but you know he's in detention? No, that's the report from third parties. Right. I'd assure you that everybody is watching closely and mm. seeking to understand where he is, and not just him, but actually uh, what's occurred after that prison break and mm. who might have escaped from the prison and who might not have. Mm. I, uh, in order to allow, to facilitate the um, committee, I'm happy to cede some time now and thank you, but um, I may come back to this later. Oh, yeah, yeah. of course. Senator Patrick, you have the call, and uh, just to indicate, we will go a few minutes over time. Thank you, Chair. Um, it, might, it might not be necessary, depending on the brevity of, of the answers. Um, <laughs> I might and the just, shortness uh, of the question. Yeah, and the <laughs> shortness of the question. Um, I uh, was listening to the exchange between the Minister and Senator Keneally in relation to uh, bipartisan uh, foreign uh, affairs support. Just to give some context to my questions, the Defence Minister said last week, we now see evidence that the Chinese Communist Party, the Chinese government, has also made a decision about who they're going to back in the next federal election. That's open, that is obvious, and they have picked this bloke, the leader of the opposition, as their candidate. He then went on to say, uh, or assert the claim, that, that the claim was based on open source and other intelligence. So just uh, you are the experts on, 
foreign policy in China. What open source information is DFAT in possession of that supports the claim that the Chinese Communist Party has made a decision to back Mr Albanese and the Australian Labor Party in the coming federal election? Senator Patrick, I think um, if I understand your question correctly, you're asking um, the department to comment on uh, the statements of the minister. Uh, I'll ask I'm, the just, I'm just trying to understand what... The department to say whatever they are oh. able to. Um, I would note uh, that this matter, or these issues, uh, have been discussed uh, this week, including in uh, Home Affairs estimates uh, as well, uh, that there have been a number of reports of both the Director General of Securities update, uh, the ASPI report, which are part of the conversation this week uh, as well. But I'll ask the um, officials whether they have anything to add. Senator, I don't have anything to add. I don't have anything. Sorry, I didn't hear that. Senator, I don't have anything to add. Okay. Um, what open source information specifically identifies when, where and which decision makers in the Chinese Communist Party arrived at the decision asserted by our Defence Minister? Senator, I think in asking the officials of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade uh, to comment, to respond on uh, aspects of the Defence Minister's statement uh, or, or any others other than perhaps mine, uh, is, uh, is a difficult question to uh, ask officials. If they have anything to add, I will ask them to do so. I have nothing to add, Senator. So no evidence, thank you. No. The, the no, Secretary no. said she had nothing to add, Senator. Okay, well, uh, I, I, I'm, you are, your department is the, is the uh, premier department in relation to foreign uh, affairs, and I'm well, it is the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Senator. Yes. yes, and I'm just trying to work out what grounded the statement by the Defence Minister. I presume he would have come to the Department to seek advice on these sorts of matters? No, Senator, the Defence Minister seeks advice from the Defence Department. So he's sort of gone right, a bit rogue. The Defence no. Defen Minister seeks advice from the Defence Department, Senator, and uh, he has made uh, a number of um, comments in addition uh, in, uh, in his recent uh, media statements in relation to these matters. Okay, I'd, and, and so this can, these can just be very quickly answered then. Is DFAT in possession of any published statements by the Chinese Communist Party or Chinese government, CCP communiques, statement by Chinese officials or pronouncements in the Chinese Communist Party uh, controlled uh, publications that supports the Defence Minister's claim that the CCP has made a decision to support Mr Albanese. That, that doesn't go to what he said, it's just do you have anything in your possession that would support uh, that, that claim? Well, Senator, uh, agencies would not always uh, be in a position to answer on the full extent of, uh, of matters in their possession, as, uh, as you put it. Um, I did uh, myself read uh, this morning, uh, some passing comments in relation to the Global Times. I think that was uh, an Australian that was writing for the, the Global Times, wasn't it? Yes, that is an interesting point to sure. make, Senator. Um, uh, <laughs> I have uh, found myself the. Uh, editorial control of the uh, Global uh, Times, uh, Minister. Pardon me? Who, who is generally considered to have editorial control? Well, not the Department of, of Foreign Affairs and <laughs> Trade. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, in fact, as I go on to say, I have found myself on occasion to be a beneficiary of editorials in the Global Times. As have uh, I. As have I. Um, it's a long list. It's <laughs> a competition for badges of honour. Uh, About four or five um, times for me. Uh, and, and, and not just uh, not just that outlet. Um, Senator, I'm, I'm not sure that officials can, uh, can add anything, but if they wish to, I'll ask them to. But look, to assist uh, Senator Patrick, uh, the Global Times, Albanese will not be a charismatic leader, but be positively but he positively shines compared to Morrison. Such is abysmal state of Oz politics. One would like to see a reset in ties with China, but Oz leadership is weak and US pressure is sustained. Mm -hmm. And that is, of course, from the Global Times. That's an Australian which, author, isn't it? Which is, which is the mouthpiece for that uh, brutal dictatorship. OK. Um, the minister also mentioned other intelligence. Uh, that supports his claim uh, of a Chinese 
Communist Party decision to back Mr Albanese. I'm sorry? Minister... Oh, Minister... Dunn. I'm sorry. Sorry, me. Minister Dunn. Me. No, I'm sorry. Uh, I didn't think I had just said that. Look, I know defence was going to be today, but defence is tomorrow. So sure, got but questions the, for defence. These are the preeminent people that I would expect would have access to all of the information. Uh, and if the answer is no, then the answer is no. Um, uh, so just asking, have you, in relation to the in other intelligence seconds. that was mentioned by the uh, defence in minister, um, is DFAT in possession of anything? Or is that also the Defence Department? Well, I think there are a range of other intelligence agencies and it sure. uh, might be better to direct those questions to those agencies, sure. Senator. OK. So you don't have, you don't have anything. Um, what about communication through any embassy or through the Chinese embassy back to Australia? Uh, has there been any communication from the Chinese government that they have made a decision to back Mr Albanese? Uh, Senator, the, to my knowledge, there's been no uh, communication on the Australian election uh, from from the embassy. What about from other embassies through through another embassy? Senator, I'm not I'm not sure what, to what you're alluding, but that is not something of which we have any knowledge. No, no. So from, from perhaps from the United States embassy to Australia. Well, Senator, we wouldn't normally uh, disclose those. Uh, we wouldn't normally disclose uh, sensitive communications. I'm not saying there are or there are not, mm. um, but uh, certainly um, posts, right. uh, posts in Canberra need to be able to communicate with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade uh, appropriately in confidence. Uh, in saying that, I make absolutely no suggestion sure. about communications or otherwise. I'm not asking for any country. I'm no, just, I understand that, Senator. So I'm not trying to drill into w uh, into where this might have come from, just whether or not there exists any communiques through our embassies that would that uh, you know, from any other government that would suggest that the Chinese Communist Party has uh, is is backing Mr Albanese in the Australian Labor Party. I don't have anything to add, Senator. Any of the other officials? I have nothing to add. Senator. Thank you. Um, and has DFAT received any responses from the Chinese government? Uh, to the claims made by the Defence Minister last week? Uh, if so, what has the Chinese government had to say about that? There are responses in the Global Times, Senator. I beg your pardon? There is a response, as I understand it, in the Global Times That's today, the Senator. formal way in which DFAT received advice from no, the No, no, I was government. simply saying that that does uh, include a response. A um, uh, mm. number of uh, communications have been received uh, in recent times, but I'll leave officials to see if they have anything to add. Senator, I, th I think um, we have regular exchanges with, with Chinese officials. Um, they can offer uh, and do offer critical comments about some public remarks in Australia. Sure. Um, I don't know whether specifically in relation to this. We'll take it on notice and uh, get back to you. Thank you. I've finished early. Thank you, Chair. All right. In that case, let's finish early uh, for lunch and the committee. So just, ju ju just Chair... I I'm thought it was too good to be true, yeah. Senator <laughs> Ears, You have the call. You've, you've had a series of opportunities, Minister, uh, over the course of this morning to reassert the value uh, of what is a many decades long tradition of bipartisanship on national security questions. Uh, in the face of what is a sleazy uh, and desperate assault uh, on the national interest by the Defence Minister and the Prime Minister, um, Wait, I would expect wait a minute. That is, I would expect no, no, that a no, foreign no, minister no, would, order, would, order, would, order, would stand Senator up for the national Chair, interest Senator. at Senator this point. Well, you should be but it is very Chair, clear. Senator Ayres, it is that very is clear, clear that you're not prepared to do that. All right, that the is, committee is adjourned. That is the problem. committee is I'm adjourned. Sorry, I'm sorry, Chair. Before you adjourn, if I may, Senator, you may not have been in the room. But I did have an exchange with Senator Keneally on these matters, in which a very different position was articulated on behalf of the Labor Party. A very different position. Mm. Well, well, what 
than the one you have just used. What the defence minister has done in the House. What the defence minister has done in the House is shameful. I reject your editorialisation. I reject your editorial characterisation. Uh, and frankly, uh, the discussion that uh, I had with Senator Keneally, uh, although um, imperfect, as they always are in an estimates exchange, uh, resulted in Senator Keneally making an acknowledgement in this uh, estimates hearing. But, Senator Ayres, it is the case, it is the case that members and senators, uh, no matter who they are or where they sit, ultimately have to own their own That's right. remarks That's and exactly language. Right. And like, I mean like every Senator single Lyle. one That's of right. them. That's right. All right. The committee stands adjourned and uh, suspended. Sorry, suspended until <laughs> one thirty. That's not true. I was The committee is. Uh, no, feel free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the uh, committee is resumed. I can indicate that I'll have a bracket of questions dealing with uh, matters uh, Lithuania and the pushback by uh, China, and then a few issues on China Taiwan, moving into Iran, Israel, uh, as in Middle East, and then Africa, and then issues on Christian persecution and where we are with a death penalty grouping of which we are a member, just so officials can get themselves ready to come downstairs if need be. But who are, you've indicated can start making preliminary moves. Great, thank you. If I can start in relation to the pushback that the dictatorship in China has um, been giving to Lithuania, and we've had discussions about that earlier this morning. But I'm just wondering, has Australia, or indeed is there within the world community, a grouping or a coming together of like-minded countries that have suffered this at the hands of the dictatorship in China, countries such as Norway, the Czech Republic, uh, Canada, uh, and the list seems to be ever-expanding, so that there is a grouping of these freedom-loving countries to say enough is enough and that we start looking after each other's back. Senator, I'll ask uh, Mr Hayhurst to start, but I'll also ask some of our colleagues from the trade area uh, to um, be prepared to pop forward as well. To oh, well look, things. if it is more appropriate, Secretary, for me to ask that under trade, I'm happy to do that. Probably best for both. So all right, we'll all right, done. And then thank um, you. later for trade as well. All right, thank you. Senator, um, you mentioned a number of countries that have been on uh, the receiving end of um, trade action by China. I, I think it is fair to say that, that there is a much greater coalescing of like-minded interest around the need for the rules to which countries have committed to be adhered to, um, that when commitments are made, they're met, um, and that the market-based multilateral rules to which all parties have committed are the, are the ways in which to deal with differences. Now that, that is apparent in many forums and in many statements and in many ways. There's no single like-minded group, but there's growing contact and cooperation to try and protect those aspects of the international order, the international trading system on which so many countries rely. So um, the trend is clearly there. Uh, Australia is not the only country, clearly, we know that. Um, there are many others and the potential is there. So the point is to um, act clearly um, on a principal basis so that the trend doesn't right. deteriorate. Right, look, uh, thank you for that, but to use a clumsy term, yeah. Is there a victims group, to use that sort of terminology, uh, in relation to uh, Chinese sanctions for taking principled stands or just for taking uh, a decision like Lithuania did in um, having a trade office in Taiwan or Taiwan in the Vil Vilnius? Vilnius. Vilnius, thank you. So I don't. 
victims group is, is not a not a phrase I oh, would no, use. No, no, clumsy term, but um, I think you get the drift. So, so the answer is we pursue our interests on that principal way, many forums in many ways. We, we talk a lot to other democracies and other countries about the sort of international order we want to see, uh, the principles upon which Australia's policy is based, the Quad is about that agenda, our work with the European Union is about that agenda, our work with partners across Asia is about that agenda, our alliance is about that agenda. So there's um, growing uh, concerted cooperation between Australia and its partners to push back against uh, efforts to undermine the system on which we've all relied and from which we've all prospered. All right, look, uh, thank you for that. Are you aware of the uh, report by Safeguard Defenders about involuntary returns to China? I'm not personally acquainted with that report, uh, Senator. All right, well, in that case, could I encourage you to acquaint yourself with it? And uh, that report indicates that uh, Chinese so-called law enforcement agencies uh, right around the world are either forcibly or under threat removing people from the countries in which they're in back to uh, China. And the assertion is made that I think 10 Australians have been so removed from Australia that if they don't come with these people uh, back to China, then their family in China will be under severe pressure. And Australia isn't the only country targeted. So if I could invite you, I think it's a report that came out on the 18th of January, so relatively new. It would be um, helpful if you could give us some indication as to the um, veracity of its, uh, of its commentary. I've got to say it looks pretty robust, but... Um, Senator, we'll, yeah. we'll follow it up, including with the um, Australian Federal Police and other security agencies. Good. Look, thank you for that. Um, the, our travel advice to people travelling to China, has that... Uh... So, Senator Vitz, can I just ask Ms Lewis to yes. add a very short statement in relation to the Safeguard Defender piece? Oh, Thank yes. You, Thank you. Out, Senator, that we are Ellie Lawson, First Assistant Secretary, East Asia Division. Uh, we are aware of that report. Uh, we have looked into it. Um, it's a different division who looks after those matters, but we are aware of that report. Thank you. Oh, good. I will provide further information on notice, Senator. Excellent. Thanks, Minister. Thanks, um, travel advice. Has that changed at all in relation to travel to the People's Republic of China? I think last time at estimates we were told that people were advised not to, uh, under threat of was it arbitrary arrest, I think, was one of the... Arbitrary detention. Arbitrary detention, thank you. Senator yeah. Kate Logan, First Assistant Secretary, Consular and Crisis Management Division. The travel advice for China was last updated on the 13th of January. It currently stands uh, at exercise a high degree of caution. It does make reference to the fact that authorities have detained foreigners on grounds of endanger endangering national security and that Australians may be at risk of arbitrary detention. Right, so that alteration on the 13th of January, um, without going into all the details of the wording, um, it either, in its change, it either says it's now safer or less safe from the previous... Um, Senator, I think the change didn't to include clear, the arbitrary detention. That's I think right. that was already That was there. already in there. Was yes. the change related to COVID? The change related to pre-departure requirements for travel to China from Australia uh, Right, changed? so the only update was on the 13th of January, January related to COVID matters. And health so, testing. And health yeah, 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 but so the previous concerns remain in place. Correct. Yep, yep, that's all I was seeking to confirm. A diplomatic boycott of the... Olympics. Um, how many countries uh, were engaged in that? I'll just ask to Ms. Lawson if she's got the full list. Uh, Sorry, I'm not making sure. you play musical chairs, but I'm not <laughs> sure who's responsible for what specific item. Uh, Senator, I don't have a full list with me here, but I can certainly take that on and provide If it you to could. You. Yeah. And uh, are we able to be advised whether Australia sent anybody? 
officially to the uh, Olympics? As the Prime Minister has indicated, uh, we did not send any ministers or officials to attend the Olympics. Good. That is uh, good news, and I was hoping that would be the answer. So, having raised that previously, and uh, I think the department was a bit uh, agnostic about that. But anyway, it is good that this has occurred. Where are we in relation to uh, issues uh, of representations in relation to the Uyghur community, House Christians, Falun Gong practitioners? Have we been able to have any discussion at all with the regime as to matters human rights generally in recent, since the last estimates? So we have maintained um steady drumbeat of representations on those serious human rights issues. Um, Ms Lawson might have the details, but we continue to do that both in China through our embassies and consulates general and here in Canberra. Uh, Senator, yes. Um, we have consistently raised our concerns about all of those issues. Uh, the most recent representations were on the 7th of January. That was in Beijing. And what about Australians that are in custody in China at the moment? Um, I'm just trying to have a look. Just get someone from ping. The ping, ping. Is there somebody by the name Ping? Uh, yes, we've yes. Got Jun, Dr. Thank Jun you. Jun, yeah, yeah. Is there any update that can be provided on that case, please? Thank you, Senator. Greg Wilcock, Assistant Secretary, Consular Operations. Senator, you'll be aware of uh, the Minister's statement of one month ago on Yang Jun. Um, the Australian Government's amply on the record uh, on the principles and interests at um, stake for Dr yeah, Young. Yeah, any updates, and for Australia. that's yes, all I'm asking. Senator, yep. Yep. Our most recent consular visit to both uh, Dr Young and Ms Chung was on the 28th of January. That's consistent with the pattern of monthly content. And that was a face-to-face? -face it was a virtual meeting. Virtual. It was at the detention centre to senator, but uh, over video link mm -hmm. in both cases. Mm -hmm. And any movement, status quo, regrettably? On the cases themselves, and uh, please, Senator, understand I have to be mindful of my privacy obligations mm. here, but on the cases themselves, the notional deadline for verdict in the case of Dr Young is uh, late, <clears throat> pardon me, is, let me get my glasses and I'll be sure to get this right, Senator. So in the case of Dr Young, the notional deadline for verdict is the 9th of April. Mm -hmm. That could be extended by another three months, Senator, or it could take place, the verdict that is, the verdict hearing, any time between now and the 9th of April. We'd expect, under the terms of our consular relations agreement with China, to be given a couple of days' notice right. of that hearing. In the case of Ms Chung, Senator, um, the notional deadline now for her uh, trial is the 19th of April. And as in the case of Dr Young's verdict, that could take place yeah. any time between now and then, or indeed be extended. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you for that. Um, are you able to provide us with any updates in relation to the human rights plight of the Uyghurs? Uh, I'll ask my colleague, Ms, Ms. Lawson, Lawson to come back to the table. Oh, right. Thanks, Greg. Thank you. Uh, Senator, sorry. Well, look, we continue to have very serious concerns about the human rights situation in um, Xinjiang. Um, as you know, we have raised. With the update, all I'm asking uh, is our view that things have improved or status quo or deteriorated? Well, Senator, it's very difficult to tell um, exactly which direction those, con you know, those abuses mm. have um, gone in because. There is a lack of yeah. visibility of what's going on in Xinjiang, and that is why uh, we continue to seek um, the finalisation of the review by High Commissioner Bachelet. 
Um, it is also why we continue to urge the Chinese authorities to allow an independent no. um, a visit yeah. to Xinjiang so that we can establish exactly what's going on on the ground. And lack of visibility, I think, tells us, unfortunately, all we need to know in that regard. What about the plight of Hong Kongers and uh, the democratic movement in Hong Kong? Uh, Senator, um, yeah, as we've made clear um, on previous occasions, uh, we have concerns over the imposition of the national security law um, by Beijing, Beijing uh, without the direct participation of Hong Kong's people, legislature or judiciary. Uh, furthermore, the changes to the electoral system uh, are deeply concerning. They weaken the city's democratic institutions um, and give greater control to Beijing over the nomination and the selection and the election yeah. of candidates. But, but have things improved, worsened or status quo? Uh, I, I would not say that things have improved. There's well, been a range of new reforms put in place. Uh, which reforms weaken. or changes? Well, they are reforms. They're, they're stated reforms as reforms. Reforms in the but these are changes in Beijing's to electoral terms. processes, mm. uh, which uh, it's safe to say have been initiated by, or at least um, Beijing has a great role in in putting in place. Um, and as you know, there have been continued targeted arrests, uh, impacts on civil society groups, uh, and of course the forced closure of independent media outlets. Uh, we did join a statement by the Media, media Freedom Coalition on the 9th of February uh, expressing concerns about the deterioration of those media freedoms. We expressed our grave concern in the Auckman joint statement on the 21st of January uh, and the Minister has also tweeted on our deep concerns about the closure of Stand News and the arrests of journalists. All right, and then moving to Taiwan and the relationship uh there, uh, the overflights uh, by the Chinese Air Force, etc. Have we made any representations uh, to the People's Republic regime as to the inappropriateness of that behaviour, to use a mild term? So, Senator, we have made representations. Yeah, yeah. And uh, when were they last made? Are you, uh, the or, last. Or take it on notice. I'll try to answer it in the And so of I don't discussion. steal Senator Patrick's thunder. I'll allow him to ask a few questions on Taiwan. I would also note that DFAT issued a statement expressing Australia's concern about the air incursions um, during the... That was when the, the large number of incursions were taking place. That was back in October. All right, thank you. Senator Patrick. Well, thank you, um, Chair. Um, in a radio interview in late January, the Chinese ambassador to the US made an unusually explicit reference to the likelihood of a war over, over Taiwan. He said, the Taiwan issue is the biggest tinderbox between China and the United States. If the Taiwanese authorities, emboldened by the United States, keep going down the road for independence, it most likely will involve China and the United States, the two big countries, in a military conflict. What's DFAT's view of the relationship um, or um, in relation to China and Taiwan uh, uh, since October last year, since the last estimates? And I'd be happy to use the, the chair's um, improved status quo or, or um, deteriorated. deteriorated categories. So, Senator, I think since October, the situation I don't think has appreciably deteriorated, but remains very serious um, because uh, the mainland side um, continues to put uh, significant pressure, the incursions into the air defence identification zone, etc., on Taiwan. Um, also, the official and public positioning of of the authorities in the People's Republic of China is very clearly um, hardening. Um, at the same time, uh, in Taiwan, of course, um, people uh, want to cho choose their own destiny, the bottom line. So um, I think structurally the situation is in a difficult position. Um, our view has always been that the status quo uh, which, which has preserved peace and stability in that region and more broadly uh, is the thing that needs to be uh, protected and preserved and that's what our diplomacy is geared towards and the same applies 
to the United States and others, and that includes, I should say, um, continuing to engage unofficially and providing um, support in international organisations where statehood is not a prerequisite for membership for Taiwan's international participation. Um, so that's our sure. that's our broad approach. So the bottom line is, I think, categ in category terms, it's not significantly different. It was serious then. It remains serious now, and we're watching it with concern. So you said the the, the words uh, that the sort of Chinese position was hardening. Is, is the rhetoric, the threatening rhetoric, increasing, or is that is that on the status quo? So I just I think. Um, When I say hardening, I mean, I think it, it's, it's articulated publicly in ways that um, suggest uh, that dialogue um, has limited prospects for success. Um, clearly, uh, contact between the parties across the strait is one way to seek to lower tensions and move forward on this matter. Um, Again, my broad judgment is um, that the situation hasn't appreciably deteriorated, nor has it improved since since then. So structurally, we're in this difficult uh, position, and we're concerned about it, as I say. What about military provocation? So that's perhaps more slightly more measurable. Have the, the incursions that uh, Senator Betts was talking about, have they uh, increased, or has there been a change in the way or in the nature of those incursions? So I'm not sure. So they've been sort of daily incursions, but in the single digits, the biggest number recently was, I think, uh, 39 on the 23rd of January is like the, the, the largest number we've seen um, since that greater number, you know, late last year, but yeah. they continue. Okay. And what about the, the new development of the sort of um, the relationship between China and Russia and how they, that may affect the tinderbox. So I, of course, we're watching uh, that closely as well, Senator. I don't think that has an appreciable effect specifically on the Taiwan situation. Um, but clearly, the two countries are coordinating more and are, I think, signalling a much more overt challenge to the international order. Um, Russia, in effect, publicly now affirms the position of the People's Republic of China on this matter uh, in explicit terms. But, but I don't think it makes a big difference. I, I think the difference from that partnership manifests itself internationally in other ways of concern to Australia rather than directly on this situation. Okay. And, um I guess there's some, some uh, milestones that, sorry, this is a project management term, but um, there's the completion of the Olympic Games and through to the elections in 2024. Do we see that as, a, as, a, as the potential for perhaps um, uh, danger, an increase in danger between those, you know, before the election? I don't think we're in a position to judge whether the risk will grow. Uh, I think structurally it's already uh, got some elements about which we're concerned. Um, elections in Taiwan, uh, I think, are always... There's a possibility, as there has been in the past, there's growing tension there. Um, but, you know, there's... With, with so much at stake and the status quo helping um, preserving stability in the region, there is no reason um, directly for that to be challenged in our view. Uh, so I don't want to speculate whether it's before 24, after the Olympics, um, both, uh, you know, the People's Republic of China does not need to up the ante in ways that apply coercive and other pressure on Taiwan.
Oh, okay, just a couple, just a couple of quick questions. I note that Very there quick. has, okay, I note there's been some sales of howitzers from the United States into Taiwan, and just uh, in the last uh, month or so, a hundred million dollar support contract relating to upgrading Patriot missile systems. Is that something we publicly support? And secondly, are, are we in a position where we support export applications for? Um, military products to Taiwan? So we don't, Australia doesn't sell arms to Taiwan mm -hmm. um, and the United States, uh, consistent with its own long-standing policies on Taiwan, has a policy of selling arms. Um, we don't have a we don't have a direct view on those transactions but of course we do have a strong interest in um, in Taiwan's uh, uh, security and instability uh, and the status quo across the Straits. And, and my final question, just in terms of our messages to, or communications with the Chinese and uh, the Taiwanese, um, wh what are we doing in respect of um, discouraging uh, any sort of military conflict that might uh, you know, possibly be on the horizon? And, and, and at what levels? Senator, we are absolutely explicit that uh, conflict uh, is in no one's interests uh, in all of our public and uh, diplomatic engagement. That is our clear uh, view. We make regular representations uh, to China on the importance of peace and stability uh, across the Taiwan Strait uh, in the interests, as I say, of a secure, stable uh, Indo-Pacific that is based on the rule of law. Thank you, Minister, and thank you, Chair. I'll Chair, ask I'll my you. other questions later on. Do you have a quick follow-up? And then we'll start the Greens 20 minutes. Very quickly. Mr Hayhurst, do you think the uh, Ukraine-Russia situation uh, at all complicates the, the situation across the Taiwan Straits. Um, is one country looking at another to see whether aggression might be um, rewarded or, or pushed back against? I don't, I, don't, I don't think there's a direct connection, but clearly in any situation where people use force to, to resolve disputes um, across international borders and so on, so there's some differences obviously between the two, um, so I think that there are lots of things to be concerned about, but a direct and immediate impact on the situation on Taiwan isn't one of them at this time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. All right, Senator Rice, you have the call. Thank you. <coughs> um, Minister, obviously most of the geopolitical no negotiations you undertake, or at the very least many, they're very complex and delicate. And I want to acknowledge the work that you put into those processes and thank the departmental staff for the many hours they spend on very sensitive and delicate work with major international powers. Um, do you think that the Defence Minister is putting that work and those delicate relationships at risk when he politicises national security to try and run a khaki election? I don't agree with your characterisation, uh, Senator. Uh, I think uh, the entire um, uh, the range of issues that uh, you have uh, identified are ones that the government takes very seriously uh, right across the cabinet, uh, led by the Prime Minister. Uh, and um, I acknowledge the points uh, that you have made in relation to uh, my own approach. Does the defend, did the Defence Minister consult with you before, or does he consult with you before commenting publicly on international relations? Uh, Senator, um, Mr Dutton is the Australian Minister for, for Defence uh, and uh, in that role has a, a range of responsibilities and opportunities uh, uh, through which he, uh, he exercises his, uh, his ministerial uh, undertakings. I uh, don't uh, expect the Defence Minister to... Um, I don't think you've characterised the, uh, the relationship uh, in the way that I would. Uh, and uh, equally, I would say that uh, having held that role myself uh, in the past, um, it, is, uh, it is the case that uh, the Defence and the Foreign Minister um, uh, work closely together uh, and extremely closely together, um, overwhelmingly, and uh, in close concert with the Prime Minister. Um, 
Um, Minister Dutton specifically clarified after a question in the House of Representatives question time that he was reflecting on the Chinese government and on the actions of the Chinese government. Did he consult with you before he chose to reflect on the Chinese government as a political strategy in the parliament? Senator, um, I don't uh, discuss my conversations with uh, my cabinet colleagues uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the- So in yes or no, Minister, did he consult no, with se you? Senator, you can't direct me how to answer a question. Uh, <laughs> I don't discuss my conversations with my cabinet colleagues in public. I'll take that as a no then, I think. I said you can't direct me as to how to answer the question you can't presume either. Um, Minister, in allying ourselves with India as part of the Quad strategy, is there a point past which human rights abuses in India would cause us to reconsider how close that relationship is? Uh, Senator, I'm not going to answer in, uh, in a hypothetical of, of that nature. Australia's growing relationship with uh, India is extremely important uh, to Australia, uh, including with the signing of a comprehensive strategic partnership in uh, 2020 between uh, Prime Ministers uh, Modi and uh, Morrison, uh, including the work that, uh, that um, the Trade Minister, Minister Tian, uh, has been undertaking in, uh, in recent weeks. Uh, particularly on the development of, uh, of trade um, agreement. Senator, that does not prevent us from uh, raising issues of concern with our partners uh, in India, uh, and uh, they may be human rights issues, uh, they may be others. Uh, India is indeed uh, a vibrant democracy, has a very robust culture of, uh, of public discourse, uh, and uh, I know that there are issues uh, of concern in relation to human rights, and uh, you can uh, rest assured that matters of that nature are raised in our interactions with India. But is there any point at which we would reconsider that relationship? Senator, that is an absolute hypothetical. Well, I mean, Gregory Stanton of Genocide Watch has warned that genocide could very well happen in India. Presumably that would lead us to reevaluate our relationship if genocide was occurring in a quad uh, ally. Um, Senator, I'm not, I don't think it advances any cause to engage in a hypothetical discussion of that nature. But where there is plenty of evidence of the sort of abuse of human rights that's currently going on in India. I mean, would national leaders enabling and permitting hate speech and ethnic violence, does that is that enough to give you pause about our relationship with a Quad ally? Senator, I think I've set out in my, uh, in my statements um, areas uh, in which uh, we do raise concerns uh, with India uh, and uh, our post uh, and uh, the uh, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade uh, here in, uh, in Canberra. But it's one thing to raise concerns, Minister, and then if those concerns aren't being listened to and we've got ongoing abuses of human rights, at what point do we actually say we haven't got a robust, thriving democracy that's a, 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 you know, consistent with the rule of law um, that would con consider, make us reconsider India's role as a quad ally? Senator, I'm, I'm not going to engage in hypotheticals. So other than raising concerns, so, I mean, what, what is your current, um, the current level of concern that you're raising with the Indian government about abuses of human rights in India, in India and in Kashmir? What do you mean? Well, I mean, there is the potential of genocide. There are the issues of the crackdown well, you're on, on, on statements, there's, Senator, there's the I'm crackdown not on them. the crackdown on speech. There's the detention of people arbitrarily. There is the what's going on in Kashmir. You're making statements, Senator, and I am not agreeing with your statements. You're perfectly entitled to make them. What I am saying to you is uh, that in our engagement uh, with the uh, Indian government, both uh, in Canberra, uh, in New Delhi. Uh, and bilaterally, uh, where, where uh, matters are required to be discussed, we have those conversations. So Senator. are you concerned about the abuses of human rights by the, in India by the Indian government? There are a number of matters which we have uh, discussed, Senator. I've spoken about them on the record here before. I want to move on to China. Um, how many Australian citizens and permanent residents are arbitrarily detained in China currently? Uh, well, Senator, there is, I'll ask officials um, from our consular uh, section to, to answer that question. There are a number of consular cases uh, which we are engaged on and some of which have already been discussed here uh, today. Uh, I would also note uh, that um, on occasions where there are 
where there is the detention of dual citizens. Uh, that does add complexity to our ability mm. to uh, both uh, assist and on occasion to uh, be aware of, uh, of legal processes. But Mr Wilcock may wish to add to that. Uh, Greg Wilcock, Assistant Secretary, Consular Operations. Thank you, Senator. On the exact number of Australians detained in China, I would need to come back to you on that. Uh, you used the word arbitrarily detained, uh, Senator. Uh, we refer to the detention of Dr Yang Jun as arbitrary detention. Yes, so it's where we, um, our consideration is their arbitrary detention. My question did absolutely want to include dual citizens that may not be recognised or I know aren't recognised as, yes. as Australian citizens in China. And, so, and Mr Walker is correct, Senator. Um, we have uh, certainly, uh, uh, certainly regarded the case of uh, Dr Yang Zhong as arbitrary detention. Um, we've obviously got the report of the individual detained in Hong Kong. Is the government aware of any other Australian citizens detained in Hong Kong under the national security law? Under the national security law, no, Senator. We're aware of one other Australian, a dual national again, detained in Hong Kong. Uh, this is for uh, on criminal charges, not national security charges. Uh, that person uh, has been deemed by the local authorities to be Chinese uh, and not Australian. Uh, and China sorry, sorry Minister. Please. Yep. The Chinese uh, authorities typically will give us consular access when the individual enters mm. China on their Australian passport. Yes, but I'm, I'm even where we are, we haven't got access to them. So you're saying that there's a, there's only, there's one other, one other in Hong Kong, one yes. other Australian citizen who you understand is detained under the national security law. No, one other Australian detained in Hong Kong, but Hong not but not on national not security, on national not on the new national security offences on a criminal matter. Okay. I might ask uh, Mr Wilcock, if I may, uh, Senator, to speak briefly to uh, the nature of the travel advice and the amendments. Uh, can, I, can we not do that because I've only got 20 minutes? If, I'm, I'm very happy to receive that information, um, uh, to have that information tabled. Um, Your I priority, did, Senator. Yes. <laughs> I did want to go to um, whether the Australian government had made any representations to the UN Secretary General regarding his attendance at the Olympic Games in Beijing. Uh, not that I'm specifically aware of, we, Senator. We, we might have to take that on notice, Senator. And what representations has the government made to the IOC regarding the disappearance and censorship of tennis player Peng Shui and the IOC's involvement in Chinese government propaganda alleging that everything's fine when others like the World Tennis Organisation Association haven't been able to get in contact with Peng Shui at all? Uh, Senator, I'll ask um, Ms Lawson to, uh, to um, add anything that she wishes to those um, matters that have, have been raised by the IOC, I don't have details with me. No, Senator, we don't have um, details about the IOC. We have raised the case of Peng Shui uh, with the Chinese government, um, but I'll have to come back to you on your specific question. And whether we've made representations to the IOC. You said you've raised them with the Chinese government, but it's yes, the IOC. I said, well, and Ms. I'm not aware said, we'll of come that. back to you on that. Yeah, any representations. You're not aware of any? No. Okay, if you could get back to me. Um, I want to move on to the, your meeting minister with the ASEAN chair. And when you met with the ASEAN chair, you said you made representations about Sean um, Turnell and then Hun Sen then boasted about securing his release before apologising with Agony's face. Um, did we commit anything or what did we commit in order to secure Hun Sen's advocacy? I don't understand your question, Senator. Well, we had Hun Sen advocating, I mean, saying that he was advocating to the Myanmar junta about to release um, Sean Turnell. Um, he claimed that he had received his, um, secured his release and then he had to um, backflip and obviously that hasn't occurred. So he indicated, uh, Senator, that uh, him, those statements were made in error, uh, I understand, and uh, clarified that. Uh, in my uh, discussions with uh, the Prime Minister, uh, we sought, we indicated uh, that we had been working assiduously through ASEAN, particularly through uh, the previous chair, uh, Brunei, uh, and uh, other members of ASEAN in advocacy for Professor Turnell, uh, and reiterated our expectation and our hope uh, that as the incoming chair of ASEAN, uh, both uh, my counterpart, Praxakon, uh, the Cambodian Foreign Minister, 
uh, and the leadership in Cambodia would continue uh, that advocacy, uh, which had been so strongly taken up by um, the uh, second foreign minister of Brunei. So did we make any commitments as to, you know, things that we would or wouldn't say about ASEAN and about um, actions in Myanmar in order to secure that advocacy from there, Hun Sen? There is no requirement to make any undertakings of any no. sort, Senator. And did Hun Sen, um, what did Hun Sen communicate to the Australian government about his advocacy to the junta? Um, I don't have the, uh, the details of, of what may have been communicated via post uh, in Phnom Penh uh, with me, Senator, uh, but uh, he did make a public statement to say uh, that he had advocated for Professor Turnell's release. Yes, and so uh, that was. But what was there anything further that he communicated that to the Australian Senator. government? Not You're that I'm not aware, aware of, of, Senator. Okay, um, I want to move on to the Magnitsky legislation, um, Minister. Since the passage of the Magnitsky legislation through the Australian Parliament, what steps have been taken to implement it? Well, uh, regulations uh, came into force. Uh, if I'm, um, if my memory is correct, on the 21st of 21st December, December. Uh, Senator, and uh, I am working uh, with the department. We've met uh, twice since then uh, on uh, the on next steps in relation to uh, the application of uh, of any sanctions. So, that, so all of the necessary regulations are in place. That is my understanding, Senator, and they came into, as I said, uh, into operation on the 21st of uh, December. So I don't think there is, there is no further process uh, that is uh, required in terms of the operations of the system. Okay. And has now with those regulations in place, um, has the department been engaging with civil society in terms of information that they may be able to... Um, bring to the, the government's attention in terms of who would be sanctioned? Senator Cathy Cuckman, I'm Deputy Secretary of Development and Multilater Multilateral Group. Um, there have been conversations with civil society. The minister has made clear that her intention is to establish some mechanisms by which the department can engage bit more regular, like regularly and specifically on the Magnitsky and sanctions regimes with, with civil society. Whether we do that as an adjunct to our NGO human rights consultations that I think you're aware of and that are, um, uh, go back some considerable way, uh, we will provide advice, which we haven't yet done, to the minister on what we think is the best structure to ensure that those consultations can take place and that they're timed in a way that is relevant to the processes that so through you, so which you, the minister will determine listings. Mm, under so you, you've had some uh, some engagement with civil society since uh, since the legislation came into place. Can you tell me what um, what engagement that has been? So it I'll hasn't been structured. You're basically saying. So I'll far. ask my colleague uh, Natasha Smith to come to the come to the table. But as I said, uh, Senator, uh, and I think as you know, we do have established uh, fora for consultations, mm. the one that I think is most relevant and through which there has been some um, structured discussions has been the, uh, uh, our NGO consultations on human rights. And how often uh, do they occur? They're an annual um, uh, exercise. Now, do you think I that could would be, be a, sufficient a sufficient timing um, for this legislation, or would you think you would need to have more regular consultations well, on this? Well, sorry, Senator Rice, we are looking at that now, and we will give advice on that to the to the foreign minister. Mm -hmm. We haven't done that yet. Senator Natasha Smith, first Assistant Secretary of the Multilateral Policy Division. We haven't had any formalised um, engagement with civil society since the regulations have uh, the legislation and regulations have uh, come into effect. Uh, but as Ms. Klugman says, um, we have uh, plans to make sure we have mechanisms in place uh, for that, um, and we're working through that at the mm. moment. Do we have we pro progressed as far as having a list of possible people to sanction so far, Senator? I, I don't think um, uh, it's not in the. Uh, uh, in the interests of the sanctions process to speculate about uh, those who may be uh, sanctioned. 
Uh, it uh, enables a degree of uh, avoidance um, that I don't think is uh, useful for the application but, of the sanctions. But even without going saying but, who is on that list. But, yes. but of course, uh, Senator, um, I have uh, in both of my discussions with uh, senior department senior departmental representatives, including the Deputy Secretary uh, and Ms Smith and others, um, uh, engaged in those discussions. So do you, so you were in the midst of preparing that, preparing a possible list of people to sanction? Uh, Senator, I don't want to characterise it like that. I've, I've met twice with the department in terms of, uh, of the options that we have, next steps, uh, and uh, we will um, the department will provide advice to me based on those discussions. And do you have any expectation of a timeline as to when you may have a list of, you know, possible not people that to sanction? Not, not that I would um, would uh, uh, apply here, Senator. No. So it's not a priority. No, it's an absolute priority. That's why I've met twice with the department mm -hmm. uh, in um, recent but, weeks. I mean, there are a lot of people in civil society and people who are extremely concerned about uh, the human rights abuses that would be covered under Magnitsky legislations who are wanting to see action, who currently haven't seen action since that legislation's passed. So it would certainly so, be so, really, so Senator, it would be the really appropriate. It came into operation on the 21st of December. Uh, and uh, we are working with the department uh, in the, uh, and they are preparing uh, advice to me uh, to um, take the next steps in relation to the Magnitsky sanctions. Okay, thank you. I now want to move on to Palestine. I know there was some discussion this morning about the um, Amnesty International report. Um, sorry? There's one minute left. But okay. I might go an extra two. Okay. Thank you. Actually, I do want to start first of all with the um, Israeli government's uh, allegations of making the unlawful designation of six Palestinian civil society and human rights organisations as terrorist organisations. And what's the government's response to the Israeli government's refusal to provide its evidence to the groups affected? And has the Australian government been provided with any evidence? Thanks, Senator. Um, we continue to uh, monitor, monitor this case. Um, we did um, ask for some information um, on what the basis of those um, designations was. I think we covered that um, in the previous estimates. So we have received some information. So have you received that evidence, what the Israeli government claims to be the evidence? We've well, we've re received some information from them. Whether it's all the evidence or not, I don't know. <laughs> well, that's right. I'm trying to d differentiate yeah, sure, sure. whether, I mean, they, sure. so we did, they, they did, refused they, to provide that evidence to the groups affected. And so are you, they, they gave, do you they, feel you have been given that evidence? We, 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 I feel I've been given some information, whether it's the entirety of, what, of the, um, the basis of their activity, um, sorry, the basis of their, the actions they've taken, I, I don't know. Have you requested further information from them? Not recently. They provided they provided some information to us, and, and so I, um, they obviously um, what they provided us. They as a they obviously felt that was the uh, what they could tell us, and uh, we have received it. And so, are you satisfied with that evidence? If you haven't re requested any more, do you still think that it's an inappropriate and and you know, <laughs> unacceptable thing for them to have done? Senator, the, um, I, we, we are not um, experts on um, the Israeli legal system, and um, and it's not really for us to judge whether whether the information they've provided us meets the test of Israeli law. Because I, I, I I'm not qualified to do that. And so the Australian government and and DFAT are not willing to call on Israel to immediately revoke these designations. Not at this stage, Senator. Uh, it's really a call. For, it's a matter for Israel. Australia is not a party to the issue. Um, and what's the government and DFAT's view about the legality of the Israeli government applying domestic anti-terrorism statute against civilians in occupied territory? I mean, doesn't that con um, constitute a violation of international humanitarian law? Well, I I'm not sure that I'd accept that characterisation. As I said a, a minute or two ago, um, I'm not quali we are not qualified to, um, to um, and, make declarations or decisions about the applicability of actions that Israel has taken. And so, in so therefore, you're not going to criticise them. Very lenient. One last 
Okay. Um, look, I did, in terms of the um, amnesty report sure. um, about um, and allegations of apartheid, in response to the report, both the Foreign Minister and the Prime Minister indicated that they don't agree with the report's characterisation of Israel. Yeah. I mean, putting aside the legal definition, what specific facts about human rights does the, does the government believe Amnesty International has got wrong in this report? Have you done your own analysis? Well, Senator, as, um, as I noted earlier, um, there are a number of issues that um, from time to time we take up with Israel um, um, that we, the Australian government, feel that we should be taking up. And um, we've done so quite recently and uh, we have done over a period of time and we will, as necessary, will continue to do so. That's, it's for us to do, for our own assessment of the, um, the situation, including information provided by our post, uh, to, um, to, to take issues up that we see, see, um, see are relevant. But are there any specific issues in the Amnesty report that the Australian government believes that Amnesty have got wrong? Senator, as I said, we continue to take issues of concern up and we'll continue to do so. Uh, that wasn't my question, with all due respect, Mr Innes Brown. <laughs> my question was whether are there any specific issues that the government believes that Amnesty have got wrong in their report? Well, as a, I, I think we're in danger here of just re repeating what we said earlier, earlier this morning about our view on, on some, of the, some of the phraseology that's been used in the report. Um, but we do... There are some categories of issues that we are concerned about, and we do we do take them up um, in our engagement with Israel. Could, both. You, could you take on notice then, if there are particular issues that you feel that Amnesty have got wrong in this report, um, to to take on notice what they are? Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Senator Keneally. Yep. Thank you have the call. Chair, thank you. I have some questions about uh, recent. Um, concerning um, activities at the Australian Embassy in Bangkok. I understand from media reports that a uh, former locally engaged staff members at the M Australian Embassy in Bangkok was arrested by Royal Thai Police on the 6th of January after cameras were discovered in women's bathrooms in the embassy. Is, is that correct? Senator, uh, the Chief Operating Officer, Mr Adrian Hudson, will um, provide details on this matter. Senator Adrian Hudson, Chief Operating Officer. Yes, that is correct. And was the, the person an employee of the Australian Embassy when he was arrested? Uh, yes, they were a locally engaged employee in that embassy. Right. Um, and ha I'm presuming he's no longer an employee? That's a correct presumption, Senator. <laughs> right, thank you. And when, when, when did his employment with the Embassy cease? On the same day that he was arrested. I appreciate that there is an ongoing uh, Royal Thai Police investigation into these events and that the department is likely to be limited in its comments on these concerning developments, but um, are you able to confirm if any other embassy staff are being investigated by police in relation to these hidden cameras? Uh, so it's limited to this individual, Senator. Right, thank you. And uh, will the Royal Thai Police be allowed into the Bangkok Australian Embassy compound to complete their investigation? So, Sandra, I can confirm that we are absolutely cooperating with the Royal Thai Police, and if that's a necessary part of their investigation, then yes, that will be facilitated. And do we have any indication of where the investigation is up to? Do we know when this individual might face court, for example? I, I, don't, I don't have a, a sense of that at this stage, Santa, but it's something we are closely monitoring. And are you aware if the accused has written to some of the complainants and asked them to withdraw their complaints and offered them compensation to do so? So I'm not... Uh, I was unaware of that, I'm, Senator. I'm not specifically so aware Hudson's of that. I not aware, but we will chase that up and see if that's been part of media reporting or anything, or any information you have would be helpful. We're happy to chase that up. Clearly, that would not be what we're looking for. Okay. All right. Um, so... I've seen reports that say the Royal Thai Police have said that the Australian government has asked it not to share any information about its investigation. I appreciate you have given us some information today, so I thank you for that. Um, and it's also understood the accused was told by the embassy the ongoing invest in investigation would be kept private. Now, I get there are privacy considerations about the complainants, 
Uh, but is there any decision that not to comment publicly or to to speak to this investigation? I mean, it seems demonstrably not, given your, yeah. your no answer senator. in our questions no, no today. Senator. No. no, Senator. And in fact, uh, we have no tolerance for this sort of appalling behaviour. Thank you, Minister. Um, when did the embassy staff first become aware of the hitting cameras? So the first time we became aware of it, um, and I'll use the term indirectly, and, mm. and I don't mean that to be coy, but indirectly was, uh, I believe, in, in August. However, at that time, um, the extent of the matters were not understood. Mm. There was a there was a piece of um, uh, equipment. I, I don't think that we should um, go into the details of that. If I could suggest, given we have an ongoing investigation, I think we should be very careful about this. Because of the Royal Thai Police investigation. Correct. I, and I appreciate that very much. Senator, Senator, is it possible that I could suggest that? Uh, in light of the, the, the live investigation by yep. the Royal Thai Police, that um, my department would be very willing to mm. uh, provide you with a private briefing uh, to the you. extent that we are able on this matters to avoid any prejudice. And That's, given I'm dealing with a that, different Minister. legal system, I think it is important to be um, yep. prudent. That, that, and I appreciate that, and I believe that um, uh, Myself or Senator Wong, indeed, when she returns from leave, would may well wish to take you up on that. Thanks, Senator. Um, but I, I might ask a couple of questions that don't go to the investigation itself, then. Or the details of the events. Yes. Yes. Um, that I, I don't. When was the minister advised of the existence of these cameras, these hidden cameras in the embassy? I don't have those specific dates with me, Santa. So I'll have to take that on notice. Mm. The minister was advised, though, at a, at a, I, I presume the minister didn't find out from media reports. No. 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 I did not find out from media reports, no, Senator. Thank you. Um, and also, is the department aware of whether the Australian Federal Police is planning to launch any investigations into these incidents? Uh, so, Senator, my understanding is these matters are on investigation by the Royal Thai Police. Right. Um, and is the department's security branch investigating any matters in relation to these hidden cameras? Uh, we, we did make some initial inquiries, Santa, but um, the matters are now under investigation by the Royal Thai Police. Right. Um, and has the, uh, has the, either the security staff or the department itself recommended any changes to security procedures? Um, in relation to this embassy or indeed any of our embassies? So I think it's fair to say, Santa, when an incident um, occurs, whether it be of this nature or any nature, we take that as, as an opportunity to re-examine our risk assessments, mm. our protocols and processes, and we look for opportunities to make improvements. Mm. And that may be in a particular location or where there could be broader applicability, we, we may apply that to other locations. We so probably that, wouldn't want to discuss that too much no. further, though, Senator. That's why right. I'm being slightly Absolutely. broad in my response, Senator. Okay. Um, the AB, I want to refer to an ABC report of these developments from the 5th of February, which states, a government employee with knowledge of the incident told ABC employees at the embassy, uh, told the ABC employees at the embassy were shocked and shaken um, and the person said, female staff, Thai and Australian alike, are very anxious. Some of the women don't feel safe to stay there. They feel compromised and threatened. Um, and the government employee went on to say that embassy staff wanted more support to manage the serious psychological impacts of this matter, uh, or even the possibility of security breaches. Uh, what support has the department provided to the staff since this incident happened? So, Senator, as uh, was said earlier, uh, we take these matters very seriously and we're very concerned about them. Uh, mm -hmm. A range of support has been provided to uh, staff at the Embassy, uh, including uh, in-country counselling support, uh, virtual support when we had travel restrictions in place where we mm -hmm. couldn't physically travel over. Uh, the Department has um, 
24 7 access to both our uh, counselling services mm -hmm. uh, externally as well as our in house mm -hmm. staff support office. Right. Uh, and, and shortly, now that travel uh, is slightly easier, in the next few weeks, uh, our in house staff support team will also be travelling across to Bangkok. Mm. So, that, that, so there's been a series of ongoing uh, supports provided, uh, and that's in addition to, uh, as you can appreciate, the on site support that both the head of mission and the deputy head of mission have been providing mm. staff. Mm. Uh, so this incident took place on the 6th of January. That media reporting was on the 5th of February. When did you start deploying those support teams, for example, the in-country um, support? So, so they, they, these, have been, these have been deployed over a period of time. Um, they, they weren't in response to a media, in, in response to a media report. Mm. So before the 5th of February? I don't have the specific date on which we commence those processes, but the, the supports have been in place for some time and they precede the media reporting that mm. you've referred to. Did you... Um, in response to that media reporting, did you add anything or did you survey staff to see if they felt they were getting adequate support? So I guess the way I'd describe it, Senator, is it's, it's an ongoing approach to providing support uh, mm. and we will continue providing that support. Um, as I indicated, now that travel restrictions are uh, not as great as they are, um, our dedicated uh, family support area from from here in Canberra will be travelling across in the next few weeks. So that will be an additional thing mm. we would have liked to have done earlier. Uh, but we had to supplement those arrangements with in-country support given the travel restrictions. Mm. Um, Secretary, have you spoken directly with any of the Australian-based or local staff in the Bangkok Embassy who've been impacted by these events? I haven't spoken to the staff, but I have spoken with the head of mission who uh, is managing this issue. Mm. Uh, often, uh, rather than have someone from Canberra come down, it's it's kind of better for the to locally, and I spoke with him about what supports were in place. We talked about our specialist supports here from Canberra actually going and and uh, mm. visiting, and that's what Mr. Hudson's just spoken about. Mm. So, you haven't spoken directly to any of the women who've been impacted by this. No, I haven't spoken to the women who've been impacted. Um, but I, the head of mission, the deputy head of mission, who's a female officer of uh, a very uh, experienced officer mm. has spoken with them. She's there on the ground. She knows them, mm. and she understands some of their um, their circumstances. And she's been there providing that support. Mm. Uh, Minister, I understand you're going to be stopping in Bangkok on the way home. Uh, will you be uh, taking the opportunity to speak to some of the staff who've been impacted by this? Uh, Senator. Uh uh, that had been uh, the uh, the intention in terms of uh, return travel. Uh, it's no longer um, feasible to uh, to make uh, Thailand the uh, the return uh, location, and uh, it had been uh, put in my um, in my schedule that I would have that meeting. Mm. In the absence of that, I will determine an alternate approach uh, to engage. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, though, the uh, the Thai leg of the travel has has shifted. Okay. Thank you, and I, I, I apologise if I missed that detail, but I'd heard this morning you were stopping in Bangkok <laughs> on the way home. <laughs> so, um, so um, in terms of the department more broadly, what training is provided to D DFAT staff on the disclosures of um, sexual misconduct? Um, so, Senator, uh, more, more broadly than this matter, this is obviously something that, that we take quite seriously. Um, the department has a very clear um, sexual harassment policy mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, response protocols, if I can describe them in that way, uh, where we encourage and support people to raise concerns that they have, either with their supervisors or directly with the um, specialised area in the um, HR area here in mm -hmm. Canberra. Um, and, um, uh, we take all of those matters seriously um, and uh, where, uh, where we get those sorts of reports, we work with the individuals to understand um, the best approach we should take in response to their concerns. That may include, uh, for example, formal investigations and those sorts of things. It, it depends on the circumstances. Sure, and I appreciate that. I'm trying to understand what kind of training is provided to staff in terms of um, either in terms of receiving such disclosures, for example. So this is so our staff. Mm, so yes. um, we have both our HR staff, and mm. we also have a specialist uh, 
um, cycle support. I'm trying to remember the name yeah, the, of it. The, the staff support area. Staff support area, which is headed by a psychologist as well. Mm. So we have psychologists on staff mm. to assist with this. We, the actual training, I, I think I'd have to take on notice mm. what that training, but I know um, in previous organisations where I've worked, we've had staff uh, training provided by Lifeline, in particular here in Canberra, mm. where Lifeline do a course about receiving those um, complaints. So I'll just check what we've got here and we'll get back to your notice, Senator. Right. Um, could you also um, could you also check for what training is provided to locally engaged staff? Mm -hmm. That would be, um, I would appreciate that, thank you. And I expect the training might be different in each location mm -hmm. depending on the cultural sensitivities of those environments. And do you do training here in for DFATS Canberra based staff? Uh, we will uh, we will check on what I'll confirm the specifics of, specifics of what of we that. actually provide. So yes, we do, Senator, yes. and we'll provide you with the details. With the, on with the details yeah. on notice, yep. Thank you. Um, and uh, um, on the tr and I don't again want to ask about the uh, trial. It's the the, the the investigation itself, but rather that. Thinking ahead, I, I imagine there's going to be a level of interest in the court proceedings, both for those directly involved and more broadly, and I'm sure many back in Australia will be also seeking to follow this story. What's your expect? Do you have any expectation or understanding of what the media access will be to the trial process? No, Senator, I don't think we have that at this time. That's not a matter for Thai authorities. Right. And um, we will, of course, be seeking to have access. To, we, the department, yep. will be seeking to have access so that we are informed, so that we can inform our ministers, but also that we can inform the staff um, to ensure that they're aware of what's going on. Right. So you're seeking that through your counterparts would, in Thailand. Yes. Um, and do you understand if you'll be able to attend the hearings? So, Senator, I think we're way ahead of ourselves here in terms of... Right. Um, the process of the investigation, uh, given the individual was arrested and charged um, mm. uh, just over a month and a bit ago. Mm. I think we are slightly ahead of ourselves, but I would assure you and the committee mm. uh, and uh, the impacted staff that uh, through the ambassador uh, and his team and through the team here in, in Canberra and, and particularly Mr Hudson and the secretary, uh, we will be fully engaged with the Thai authorities mm. uh, and uh, and sensitive to the sorts of issues that uh, I understand you're raising, mm. particularly uh, in relation to uh, any republicising or re-publishing um, mm. uh, the uh, the events that have uh, led to this charge and arrest. Mm. Okay. I or arrest and charge. Uh, I, I noticed you take, and, and I appreciate, a number of questions on notice. If I could add just a few other things. Is there is there an independent complaints mechanism that DFAT staff can access? So staff can make complaints through to the HR area based here in Canberra. Right. So, so that's independent from um, the place in which they work, if that right. makes sense. Yep. And uh, has the department engaged any external experts to review its processes of reporting disclosures of sexual assault and misconduct? So my recollection, I'm looking for someone who knows that this may have been done a couple of years ago or 18 months ago, um, but uh, we will try and see whether we can find someone in the next break. Um, uh, I'm re recalling in my incoming secretary's brief that there was a, a, um, some items about the fact that there had been a recent review of mechanisms, but I'll chase that in the next break, Senator. Great. Thank you so much, Ms Campbell. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I do think that Senator Ayres has some questions. I just flag for your management of the yeah. committee. Thanks, yep. Senator Ayres has the call. Thanks, Chair. Um, secretary, I, I have a series of questions about an article in the Daily Telegraph from the 4th of January entitled UK High Commissioner George Brandis in Diplomatic Crash in Scotland. Um, if, I just, if there's anybody, it might just be you who's dealing with this matter. Um, I'm dealing with it with Mr Hudson's assistance. Perfect, thank you. Um, the article reports that nobody was injured in this uh, crash, is that is that right? That is correct and that was the first question of course we asked when we were alerted to it on the day of the crash and, and we were very uh, pleased to hear that no one had been injured. 
So according to the report, Mr Brandis was trying to catch up to the motorcade of Mr Morrison uh, during the Glasgow Climate Summit uh, after the High Commissioner refused to take the staff bus. Uh, according to the report, security officers in two Metropolitan Police cars saw Mr Brandis's official car attempting to join the motorcade um, and took defensive measures to head off the perceived threat. And so the other cars involved in the smash were the two police cars. The, the article reports that there is a, um, uh, a diplomatic investigation underway. I assume that means an internal investigation. Is that, is that the Senator, case? Senator, I have um, uh, instigated uh, an investigation into what occurred because of the work, work health and safety implications of the incident. And uh, there was a preliminary investigation at post which was a little narrower and I've instigated that from here in Canberra. Uh, so we have engaged a legal uh, firm to conduct an investigation of the incident. That investigation is not yet complete. So there was a preliminary investigation, but you've engaged a firm yes, here I have. to. Can you tell me who the firm is? Ashurst. Did, did you deploy, or have you deployed, any security advisers or anybody else from Canberra to the UK to investigate? No, Senator. So the investigations. Um, uh, um, interviews over the phone and, um, and, uh, uh, so and a Ashurst document have, review? Ashurst have um, uh, staff in London. I uh, see. The investigation will be conducted from here, but they will use staff that they have in London to do that. We have a regional security advisor located in London, and of course there are other staff. It's a large mission in London, and there are it's a hub of administrative type support, so there are technical and security advisors already in London. So preliminary investigation gave you cause for enough concern to uh, then launch this more formal no, Senator. investigation, or just explain to me how you yeah. got from the preliminary investigation to this So broader. I think the, the preliminary investigation had been commenced at post. Um, I didn't think it would be broad enough to deal with the matters at hand. So I asked for a more comprehensive investigation to be conducted from here in Canberra. And when is the investigation going to conclude? Uh, I'm hoping in the next short period, but of course we've had some disruption, particularly with Omicron and COVID in London that has slowed us down somewhat, Senator. So the Telegraph quotes a diplomatic source who said George was late and was telling his driver to hurry up and catch up with the motorcade. Did your preliminary investigation suggest that that was the case? Senator, I have intentionally not. Um, there's been lots of speculation and I have not engaged with that speculation. That's why I've asked for the investigation by Ashurst to collect the facts and, uh, and to determine what happened and that's when I'll be able to uh, consider what actually occurred. So you won't be able to say at this stage whether any speed limits were exceeded or other Not at this traffic stage, laws Senator, broken. I won't that's be able to. a matter for this inquiry that to use um, Mr Gaitchen's phrase is weeks, not months away. Is that, that right? Uh, I will have to engage again with Ashurst. They are doing uh, their best, but they are limited because of some of the restrictions we've had in place. Some of our staff in London have been working from home rather than in the High Commission. So I will engage and uh, get back to you on the time and on when we're expecting that. Can, can you tell me whether Mr Brandis was supposed to be on the bus along with everybody else? I'm, uh, I'm unaware of that, Senator. I, that'll be, um, I'm unaware of that, so I can't comment on that. I don't usually get into that level of detail. Can you tell me whether Mr Brandis's driver had been rostered to work that day? I am unaware of that as well. And one of the reasons why I haven't delved into the detail is so that I can look at the facts when they come in on the investigation. So and nothing's been put to you about on this point before? Uh, Senator, I have purposefully asked for it not to be put to me so that I don't have to speculate, so that I can have a factual basis, and that's why I've asked Ashurst to do a review so we can get facts rather than 
gossip and speculation which sometimes occurs around events. What about you, Mr Hudson? Uh, so, Senator, I wasn't in the department at the time these uh, matters occurred. Uh, who, so, who was? Um, uh, Ms Sadu was the Chief Operating Officer at the time. Is she here? She's not here, Senator. She is on leave at the moment before a new position. Well, I want to know um, whether the driver would, had been rostered to work that morning, um, whether when he was notified that he'd be required to drive that day, whether he'd been rostered to drive Mr Brandis the day before, um, what time did they finish, what time did the driver finish that evening? Um, and I'd like to know, I, I assume on, on notice those questions, I, do, do we have a copy of Mr Brandis's work program for the evening before? I don't have that copy, no, Senator. You can't but tell you can't you can't tell me why Mr. Brandis or his driver weren't able to inform the Prime Minister's security detail that they wanted to join the uh, the motorcade. Senator, I expect these details, which you've just outlined, will be part of the investigation report once we receive it. It's pretty extraordinary that we're not in a position to understand some of these basic details. I, I, I understand what you're saying to me, um, Ms Campbell, about taking a, um, uh, a, a disinterested approach in, that, in, in its proper sense, right? Um, I don't mean in its pejorative sense. Um, but this has been the subject of some public discussion for a while. It has, it's Senator. It's pretty, pretty difficult to be in a position where you can't furnish these details. Um, has there been any discussion with the Metropolitan Police about paying for the damage? So the Deputy Head of Mission contacted the Metropolitan Police the day after, I think, the incident and offered uh, to compensate them. They declined that offer. And she, uh, uh, in, in order that we have a continuing good relationship with the Metropolitan Police. Can you tell me when Mr Brandis was appointed as High Commissioner to the United Kingdom? Uh, my recollection is 2018, in May of 2018, but I'll just get someone to see whether we can get the exact date for you, Senator. I think that's it's about that. Correct. Can, can you tell... So, so the, the preliminary investigation... That was, a, that was a report that was provided to you as the Secretary? The preliminary investigation was provided to post and it dealt with a, a very... To, to, sorry, I missed that last part. Oh, sorry, to the um, High Commission. Yes. And it was a pretty narrow investigation about the actions of the driver. And what did, what did it say? Uh, it, uh, it, it said... Um, I, have, I, haven't, I haven't read it again because I, I wanted to have the Is more Is there somebody in the building who has read it, Mr... Have you read it? I don't have a copy of it, Santa. So um, the post has um, explained to me that it was quite narrow and it was about the drivers, um, the actual incident, and it didn't, uh, it didn't talk to a number of other parties who were involved in the incident, and we thought it best that we engage with those parties before coming to a view. There was a motor vehicle accident in any other situation. You wouldn't engage Ashurst to um, do a review. What is it about this situation that's... Um, made you decide that you're going to engage one of our larger sort of top-end law firms to investigate? Well, depending on the um, depending on the circumstances, I have engaged Ashurst in the past to do reviews uh, because this one involved um, the High Commissioner in the Prime Minister's motorcade with the Metropolitan Police. I thought it warranted appropriate attention, Senator. And given that there has been subsequently media speculation. At the time, I felt it was very important that we got the facts sorted early. Can you um, table a copy of the preliminary report a bit later in the day? Uh, I, 
I will review it. I think there's some privacy issues uh, in it, but we will have a look at that for you, Senator. You could, you could. Uh, what, what privacy issues could there be? The driver's name, perhaps. Yep. You could. I, you I'm, could delete that for us. I, I assume. I'm concerned that the preliminary investigation uh, may not be um, fair on other people who may be named in the investigation because they were not given the opportunity to respond. And so I don't think there's been due process. And by therefore putting it in the public arena, I don't think that would be fair on anyone. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I've asked for the Ashurst investigation, so that we can ensure that due process is applied. When did you first engage with Ashurst? Uh, in... Uh, hmm. So in January this year, Santa, I what, believe what? they were officially appointed on the 11th of January. I had asked for it before Christmas and I think we were discussing it before yep. the, fi the final bits and pieces were put together. So the department engaged with Ashurst after the Daily Telegraph article? No, Senator, I had engaged... Sorry, your colleague... So, so sorry, your colleague so, said they, they were engaged that was they on the were 11th. Engaged. You're saying you... Can I... I, did, I might did just what clarify. Prior to Christmas? Yes. I clarify, Senator. I think Mr Hudson said that they were engaged legally, signed up um, mm. in January. I had engaged with the department in December uh, to ensure that they um, were, that we were able to get a firm to do this, noting the challenges of uh, them being in London and wanting to make sure that we had people on the ground. Did they have people in London that could do this? Uh, so it was well before the Daily Telegraph article. So and how much will the uh, Ashurst investigation cost? I don't know whether we've got an estimate or not. No, I don't have details of the contract for Ashurst with me, Senator. But, but, but there is a contract and, it, there and, and there yes. is an assessment of costs. Yes, and, likely and, and costs. that was the date I provided earlier. Apologies for using the same term, engaged. No, no, no. I yeah. wanted to ask carefully so we, we got to the right uh, answer. Uh, can you provide, over the next short space of time, the likely cost? Come back to us during we'll the day? We'll take that on notice, Senator. Assume that's something that you can access. Um, what, what broader issues do you think our Secretary might the uh, formal investigation deal with that the preliminary investigation did not? Uh, I'm very interested in the work health and safety uh, matters. So uh, clearly uh, we have motorcades frequently. We need to ensure that um, there are lessons learnt uh, and that this is not repeated in any of our posts throughout the world. So I think it's important that we understand what happened and put in place mechanisms to uh, seek not for this to happen again. We clearly know that car accidents do happen, but if there were um, there were mitig there, um, if there were factors that would mitigate it in the future, I'd like to ensure that that's put in place right throughout DFAT posts. So there's nothing about the Daily Telegraph article that concerned you about. Senator, I don't want to speculate about what's in the media. I'd prefer to wait until I receive the report, which has the facts. And will the investigation deal with those issues that I went through before? What, what were the circumstances of the drivers yes, rostering? Um, what, yes, did, what did the work program of the High Commission have been that day and the day before? Yes, Senator. So Mr Brandis has been the High Commissioner for four years. That, that's a year longer than usual, isn't it? He, he was extended for 12 months, is that right? Senator, there are some head of mission posts that are four years. Uh, I think, um, if I recall, there are a, a couple like uh, Dublin, uh, uh, Consul General in New York. I think I think there's a range of... So was it a four-year appointment, uh, sorry, a three-year appointment, appointment that's been extended no, for Senator, a year? No, Senator, I think it was a four-year appointment four in the year, beginning. It's a four-year appointment. Is it likely that Mr Brandis will be extended? Uh, no, Senator, Mr Brandis will conclude his um, uh, term at the um, expected time. Has any uh, consideration been given to his replacement? Uh, Senator, that's a matter for government. There has, of course, been some speculation about another political appointment to this position. Can you confirm that Mr Hunt is a candidate? No, Senator, I can't confirm anything of the sort. Uh, or Mr McCormack? I can't confirm anything of the sort, Senator. It's a matter for government and it will be considered uh, in the normal course. 
I think on my count since 2013, 17 former Liberal National Party politicians, I think only one national, might be wrong, 17 in any case have been appointed to diplomatic posts. Is that, is my count correct, Secretary? Uh, Senator, oh, I don't think I am counting them along that line, but I can take on notice uh, when there's been non-career diplomats appointed to posts overseas, Senator. Is there any prospect? Like Mr Gray. Sorry, Chair. Including Mr Gray. Yeah, like Mr Gray. Is there any prospect of a career diplomat being appointed as High Commissioner? It's, it's, it's a matter for government, Senator. I'm not mm. going to speculate. But the track records would indicate that people join the dots and assume that another political appointment is going to be made. There are a number of posts, Senator, where both um, uh, governments of both persuasions have made um, key political appointments. I've worked constructively with many of them over the years, including particularly uh, Mr Beasley uh, in Washington, mm. uh, for example, and uh, that has been uh, historically the case. I think... Um, it's, it, it, well, exactly. It's a quality and quantity argument, isn't it? Th that may be your argument, Senator. Well, I'm not sure what Mr. point Beasley's you're making. Beasley's got quantity. <laughs> well... <laughs> I think, I think he's universally regarded, you know, not just across the parliament, but more broadly as an excellent appointment and been supported by um, we're, governments we're, of both, we're, we're bipartisan governments of both persuasions and it's been regarded as a very good appointment. Um, that's um, my, uh, my concern is with the, the volume of political appointments that have been issued by this government. Has, has a woman ever held the position of High Commissioner to the United Kingdom? Uh, I don't believe don't. Uh, a woman has been appointed to that role historically, no, Senator. So over the course of the last century, we've managed to pull off two blokes called Alexander Downer and not one woman as appointments. Senator, I don't have the, uh, the full list of uh, appointments to the role of uh, High Commissioner to the United Kingdom, uh, but uh, you're correct in saying there has not been a woman appointed by any government to that role. <clears throat> Either yours or mine. Okay, I want to ask some questions about uh, passports, um, the passport office. Um, thank you. Um, we'll just get the officers um, to the table. Um, thank you. Brill, uh, while they're coming to the table, I might um, fill this valuable gap by um, reminding uh, myself that uh, we do have 44% uh, of, uh, of uh, head of mission and head of post uh, appointments currently held by women uh, and uh, exceptional women across the board, Senator. Is that the highest level? No, it's not the highest, Senator, but it is uh, uh, nevertheless a significant uh, uh, increase um, when we were uh, elected in 2013, Decided I think it was go. at 27% um, or thereabouts, mm. or 22%, and now it's 44%. Um, uh, right. um, I, I understand that there's been a significant demand in uh, applications for passports. Um, What's the current wait time for a new or, or a renewed passport? Have we got on? Well, Senator, I can Oh, sorry. <laughs> wait for your colleague. Mr McLaughlin, Ms Brill. Are you, are you able to tell me the, the wait time for a new or renewed Australian passport? Yes, good Thank afternoon. You. Bridget Brill, First Assistant Secretary and Executive Director of the Australian Passport Office. Sorry, Senator, I rushed so downstairs. I, I <laughs> might, okay, I take might. your time. Do you want to do the answer first? I don't How, want anyone to do that. How about I patient, am. are we not, colleagues? Yes, no need for rushing down the stairs. So, Senator, um, the average wait time at the moment uh, for a passport is 16 days. 16 days, and uh, same for renewal as a new passport? That's right, it's, uh, it, that's correct. Obviously, renewals can often be processed faster 
simply because they are renewals and we often have all the details necessary. And priority passport, priority processing? What's it's two days, two days, Senator. And the fee? The fee is $225. Um, since the international borders opened up on the 1st of November, um, what's, what's happened to the average delivery time? Senator, obviously we had um, an expected surge with the reopening of the border in November and we were advising Australians in advance to allow a minimum of six weeks for processing. Yes, that's what your website says, I think, yes. That's correct. So um, we did um, move from a normal 10-day processing time to 16 days. So we warned out people so that they could make their plans for their travel, uh, but Ms Brills and her team have worked really hard to try and get that six weeks down to something much, much lower. Yes, but and, a, and the, the average time, um, um, a 60% difference in the average time is um, not inconsiderable, but, but I assume what that means is as you approach longer applications, the difference Correct. Has so been the quite 16 days is an average, yeah. Senator. Um, we do find that where the 16 days blows out is actually related to um, in the customer providing all the necessary information. So unfortunately, um, some of the applications that take longer than 16 days relate to us having to get all the necessary documentation from the customer. So the clock doesn't start when we've got a complete application, it's when we receive the application and often we've got to chase details. Can you tell me how many applications take longer than the six weeks? I don't have that information with me, Senator, um, but I can certainly look to see if I can provide it. Unfortunately, our systems are quite complex, but I'll absolutely do my best to be able to provide that, that, that to would you. Be, there would be some sort of reporting, presumably, at, at intervals that tells you how many passport applications fall outside yeah. the six week? I, I don't think, Senator, we have uh, invested in the management information around this sort of stuff in the past because we've had such a good record there for a while. Um, but one of the things that I worry about is that um, whether or not we capture when it's because we're waiting for customer information and if we ask the customer for information, how long it takes them to get back yeah. to us on it. So I don't think our systems capture that yet. But um, we, we can do the best we can, but we are very conscious. Um, I mean, I would like the, stop, the clock to stop when we were asking for a customer for more information, but our systems don't allow that at this time. And Senator, I, I should add that not only do we have our priority processing for, for, a, for a fee for two days, but we obviously also um, process all compassionate and compelling immediately, and that's a seven day service. So anyone that has an urgent need to travel uh, because of a death or illness or mm. an urgent unexpected business requirement, um, we are able to um, process that um, immediately to ensure that Australians can meet their travel um, travel plans. I'm told that the um, that the passport office phone line has been impossible for people to get through over the course of the last two months. Do you do you have a record of when it's stopped being available or how many times it's not been available to people making so inquiries about their applications? Thank you, Senator. I don't have um, a record of um, when it's not been available. We do use congested messaging when we're particularly busy. And you are right, Senator. Well, sorry, when you say congested messaging, what does that mean? So rather than have um, the customer wait on the line and use up their valuable time, we let the customer know that we're experiencing a very busy period, often at lunchtime or at end of day, uh, particularly mm. on a Monday and a Friday, and um, advise the customer to try again at Tell a later call time. Back. Yeah. That's right. Um, Senator, we also do have a client uh, mailbox uh, that we provide uh, for um, questions, and that um, customer facing mailbox. Um, responds within 48 hours. So if customers aren't able to get through on the phone, um, we also have the mailbox in which they will receive a reply within a 48 hour period. And can you tell me, um, so, so you can't tell me how often the phone contact line was too congested for people to be able to get through? I would, I'd have to take that on notice, Senator. Can you tell me how many staff work for the passport office? 
So, Senator, we um, have had quite a variable staffing level over the last two years. Obviously, um, for the last two years, while the international border has been closed, we actively redeployed our staff to assist in other urgent areas of service delivery. And this, of course, includes uh, departments such as Services Australia. Um, from October, we had obviously brought back all of those staff and engaged a further 130 staff um, ready for the expected surge that we would have over um, the November, December period. That takes our staffing level to around about 600. So 470, circa 470, some redeployed over the course of the, um, the pandemic, back to 470 in October. No, Senator. And then an additional yeah. 130 engaged, is that? Sorry, I, perhaps I didn't explain myself. Um, we had over 250 staff redeployed, um, and um, we obviously brought them back, plus then we added an extra 130 to bring us to 600 at the moment. We are currently recruiting again um, in anticipation of a, of a further spike we expect as part of the European summer. Um, and so that will continue over the next year, 18 months. Um, and are they all permanent staff or do you um, engage people through labour hire companies? We have a mix work? of permanent and uh, contractor staff, Senator, to give us the flexibility to surge the business as necessary. And, and what proportion of the 600 are permanent staff or uh, staff engaged by, directly by the department and what proportion are we have a larger, larger proportion as permanents. Senator, I can give you the exact breakdown on notice. Um, we obviously have quite a skilled workforce, um, and so we have a larger proportion that is permanent compared to our contractor, which is essentially for our, our surge. So I can take it on notice, Senator, but it's about a 70-30 split. That will change, obviously, as, as we as we um, continue to staff up. At the same time, we're also currently running permanent recruitment process. Put aside um, my concerns about the very high level of labour hire and casual insecure work across the Commonwealth, um, there, there are significant security issues attached to dealing with passport applications properly. Um, how many labour hire companies are engaged in these staff? I'd have to take that on notice, Senator. So m more than a dozen? I don't think it's more than a dozen, Senator, but I'll take it on notice. Well, maybe not for today, but that does seem to me to present some difficulties managing this kind of you know, getting assurance in this kind of work? So we, um, we are, of course, a national network um, and an international network, but we obviously work with companies that are specific to the state that we're recruiting in. Um, they have the best knowledge of the labour market. Um, so we obviously work with um, a variety of contractors in order to be able to ensure that we've got um, enough staff working right across our state offices. What, what kind of security requirements are there for permanent staff who work in the passport office? A criminal background check or what's the... So the there is the criminal background check and then is, are they protected? That's right. Yeah. So we have... I missed that second bit. So we have a criminal background check. It's, it, it, it's a, um, a staged or a, a variation of levels depending on depending the work that our staff do. Yeah. And so some of our staff are involved in, in the, you know, uh, processing the photograph. Other staff are involved in our very complex case management around particular passport issuance, and they would have an MV2 clearance. So, so, so same requirement for labour hire staff? Uh, absolutely. So our labour hire staff generally do um, the administrative type roles. They, they're not involved in the full processing of a passport or the issuance of a passport from end to end in terms of approving that. And when was the assessment? passport office advised that the border would be reopening on the 1st of November? We were working very closely as whole, part of a whole of government exercise on the reopening of the border, Senator. And, and, and so when, when was the passport office aware that the 
border was programmed to open on the 1st of we November? I actually have to check the actual date yeah, when the you. government took the decision, but the um, passport office had been included in all of the work up to it, so I think it didn't come as a surprise at all to us because we had been working with our colleagues on that. So no surprise there was workforce planning engaged in prior to the... Absolutely. We were already uh, recruiting and training our staff, Senator, in anticipation of the surge. So, uh, and is the the 130 additional staff, uh, is that because you've got approval to increase the full-time equivalent staff footprint of the passport office, or are they all labour hire staff? We had, we had uh, some headroom in our ASL cap, and so that was allowed us to do some issues there. And, and how, how much, perhaps perhaps on notice, what, what was the headroom? Yep, we did um, not take that on notice. What's either. the proportion of the 130 new employees who are full-time? And you say you're advertising for more staff, how many more? Uh, so we will continue to staff up in various areas. Um, at the moment, we plan to engage a further 100 staff over the next two months. Um, and then we'll, we will reassess our forecasting and modelling um, based on um, the current trend. We work very closely with the travel sector and of course our counterparts globally on understanding likely trends um, in terms of um, people wanting to travel. We are aware, of course, of our unmet demand and how many passports we're expecting to have renewed over the next 12 to 18 months and we'll be working to meet that demand. Okay, and you'll be able to come back to me on notice about the... the so you, you, you're going to get to sort of 700 before there's an assessment done of what the future workforce demand is, and you'll be able to tell me of the 600, how many are permanent... Very happy how to many are, How many are labour hire staff? Correct. Thank you. I think Senator Keneally has some questions, Chair. All right, Senator Keneally has the call. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, I have some questions about the Pacific Labor Mobility Schemes. My initial questions start, um, they may actually involve the department's protocol branch and legal division if those officials are present. They are, but we might bring to the table the head of the Office of the Pacific and Mr. Ms. Heineke and see whether we can answer some of those questions. But the protocol and uh, legal will be coming down from upstairs down to downstairs yes, so that. Should they be needed, they can jump up. Wave up at them as they come down. Yes, please, don't rush. I think the need down. I want Danielle at the table. Thank you. Well, as you are no doubt aware, reports in the, from reports in the media and from the department's participation in the Senate Select Committee in inquiry into job security, I understand that in July 2021, the Australian Border Force issued a warrant as part of an investigation into individuals who were under sponsored visas and were allegedly being encouraged to leave their employment and com commence employment in other areas. I understand that the High Commissioner of Vanuatu was named in the second condition of the warrant, and this warrant was executed through a raid of the Queensland property of Geoffrey and Jane Smith. Have I got anything wrong there that you're, I need to correct? No. Senator Daniel Heineke, First Assistant Secretary, Labor and Connectivity Division. That's correct as far as we understand from advice from Home Affairs and ABF. Thank you. I also understand through evidence that was provided to that select committee on 3 February that the Department of Foreign Affairs was not consulted prior to the warrant being issued or prior to the raid being carried, on the, carried out on the Smith's property. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you. I also understand from evidence provided to the select committee on 3 February that the department's legal team provided legal advice to the Australian Border Force as to the application of the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations and Australia's Diplomatic Privileges and Immunity Act 1967, and that that advice was provided on 10 December 2021. Is that correct? Uh -huh. Senator Adam McCarthy, I'm the Chief Legal Officer and First Assistant Secretary Legal Division. Uh, yes, that is correct. The request came in on the 9th of December uh, and advice was provided on the 10th. So just so we're clear, the warrant that named uh, the, uh, the High Commissioner of Vanuatu uh, was issued in July 2021 
and the D Australian Border Force sought legal advice from the Department of, of, on the application of the um, Vienna Convention and our Diplomatic Privileges and Immunity Act on 9 December. Uh, Senator, if you give me one second, the dates that you've stated are correct. I just need to double check my notes to check whether the re request to us came in from Home Affairs or oh, from okay. Border Force. That's fine. Thank you. The dates were the main thing I was seeking to confirm. The dates are correct. Yeah. I note that Section 7 of that Act states that the provision of Articles 1, 22 to 24 inclusive and 27 to 40 inclusive of the Convention will have the force of law in Australia and in every external territory. Um, and then it goes on to, um, per Articles 29 and 30 of the Vienna Convention, which have the force of law in Australia, that a person of diplomatic, of a diplomatic agent shall be inviolable, as well as his papers, correspondence, and his property. Is that correct? Uh, Senator, that is correct. Right. So can you please explain why it took nearly six months Did you inquire, in fact, to Home Affairs or Border Force why it took them six months to provide advice, to seek advice on the application of our domestic and international obligations in the context of a High Commissioner being named in an ABF warrant? Well, Senator, uh, that's really a question that you'd need to direct to Home Affairs. Well, I'm asking you, <laughs> with respect, when you got that request, did you go back and say, well, but you issued this warrant back in July. Did you perhaps suggest to them they should have sought advice before they issued the warrant? Well, Senator, uh, we may unfortunately play musical chairs uh, here. The first um, uh, time that this information came into the department was actually to the protocol branch. Uh, I think the chief of the protocol was behind me, Ian McConville. I might ask mm. him to step in for one sec. Uh, Ian McConville, chief of protocol. Uh, Senator, I can add one further uh, item of uh, information. On the mm. 2nd of September, mm. uh, after we had been advised by the High Commissioner of the fact that he had been named uh, in the warrant, at least his uh, mm. communications had been Im implicated in the warrant, I then spoke with the Assistant Commissioner of the Australian Border Force mm and underlined our concerns at the time that we had not been consulted. Right, thank you. So how should it work if uh, a law enforcement, or in this case, a border force, an agency that can issue a warrant, if they seek to uh, investigate a foreign head of mission, how should that process work? So the process had, in this case, been less than satisfactory, mm. and that was the message that we had delivered to ABF at the time. Uh, since then, we have, along with the Chief Legal Officer and myself, uh, written to the Commissioner of ABF, I think that was on the 11th of February, uh, to further underscore the process that we uh, would require. Mm. Uh, it is a process that we have uh, well and truly entrenched in place with the Australian Federal Police. But the moment the, right. uh, there is uh, an individual who has uh, credited status, then an ABF or AFP should contact uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, and we do have in the protocol branch a uh, permanent duty officer, if it's out of hours, uh, then we can be advised mm. of that. And then in consultation with our legal colleagues, uh, we would then talk through with, whether it's ABF or AFP, uh, the implications mm. of any future course of action. So Mr McConville, if I understood you correctly, there had been an arrangement, there, had, there is an arrangement in place with the AFP and and there really hadn't been one with the ABF, or the ABF just made a mistake? Well, it's, uh, that's true. There was a, a the, the difference being that AFP uh, engagement with the diplomatic corps mm. and consular corps is much more common 
it is in fact unusual mm. for ABF to conduct investigations or have issues of concern mm. involving accredited diplomats or consular officials. Mm. Nevertheless, uh, it is uh, something that uh, they should have been aware of. Uh, we have since uh, worked with them on a notification form, which I understand ABF has now, uh, is now finalising, which provides instructions and guidance to those out in the field of the process mm. that should be followed. Obviously, in this case, we are talking of a situation that uh, unfolded in regional Queensland. Uh, so the awareness of the uh, officers in question may not have been uh, as um, acute as if it was an AFP officer dealing with an issue in Canberra. Mm. I'm pretty sure the law applies consistently, though, in Canberra or regional Queensland. And I don't mean to suggest you're suggesting it doesn't. No, but this, that's right, Senator, but this does involve, it's more about the process. Mm. Uh, we're not talking about the, the legal mm. uh, uh, assessments of whether the ABF conduct was uh, uh, within the scope of our legal framework, but mm. it's the process that we registered concern with on both mm. occasions. Mm. I won't ask you to comment. I, I suppose my observation is a war an agency that has warrant issuing powers should have a process in place to understand um, the legal obligations upon them. I'm pleased to hear that after your representation to the IBF that is happening. When, so you said the department became aware on the 2nd of September? It was shortly before then. Right. Uh, I spoke to ABF, the Assistant Commissioner, on the 2nd of September. Right, and how did, how did you become aware? Is that when that, because the High Commissioner contacted you? Yes, I've right. had regular exchanges with the High Commissioner on this issue, right. as I have with our Pacific right. colleagues in our legal division. And Minister, when did you become aware of the warrant and its inclusion of the High Commissioner of Vanuatu? Senator, I would have to take the, uh, the actual date uh, on notice, mm -hmm. uh, but I can uh, say that uh, the Secretary uh, hosted a, an event at which the Vanu um, High Commissioner of Vanuatu uh, was in attendance with both uh, Minister Seselja and, uh, and uh, me also attending uh, recently, and we obviously engaged with him there. But as to when I became aware of that, um, I will have to check. And, and did, was that via a briefing from the department or when it became... I'll check, Senator. ...in the media? I'll check, Senator. Right. Does the department... Did you prepare a brief for the minister? Senator, I think I was advised via my staff, by recollection, which would have been advice to my office from the department, but let me check so that um, the answer is uh, mm. complete and come back to you. Thank you. Uh, the... So let's go to the legal advice then that was provided by the department to the ABF. Did it provide an assessment that the ABF's listing of the Vanuatu High Commissioner in the warrant was compliant with the Diplomatic Privileges and Immunity Act 1967? Uh, Senator, no. Um, the advice I would characterise, firstly, I would characterise it as being, if you like, preliminary legal views, mm -hmm. uh, and it was not definitive. It was not definitive. Well, it did not provide a definitive view. Uh, that's uh, not uncommon with legal advice, that it mm. would say there's a range of ways of looking uh, at the issue. And in this case, it recommended uh, that if a definitive view was um, required, that AGS be engaged. So it has, is a definitive view required? Has AGS been engaged? Well, that would be a question for Home Affairs. Oh, right. So, essentially, Home Affairs, having received preliminary legal views from Foreign Affairs, would need then to go to, for a definitive view, would need to go to the government solicitor? 
that would be, in this instance, that would be correct, Senator. Our advice mm. was these are some preliminary considerations as mm. you look at this issue. Uh, and if you want a definitive answer, well, really a definitive answer can only be provided by a court of law, but if you want a more considered view, then you should engage AGS and put the question to them. Mm. Mm. Is it, well, let me ask this then. The Article 30 of the Vienna Convention clearly states that diplomatic correspondence, and indeed in his person, the, the, but diplomatic correspondence in this circumstance enjoys inviability. That, that sounds pretty definite. It doesn't sound like there's a lot of wiggle room there. I think, Senator. How, how should we interpret that? Well, two points, uh, Senator. You'd be well aware of um, the long-standing convention that we don't disclose uh, the content of legal advice mm. uh, in these proceedings. We can provide uh, an assessment of the character of that advice, which I've done, mm. but I can't disclose the specific content of that advice. Mm. I would say that I think the section that you're referring to refers to the archives of a diplomatic mission, which is, is different from the correspondence. And that's about as far as I can go. Mm. What well, we have here, based on the ABF's evidence to the Select Committee on 3 February, was um, that the, essentially that there's been a considerable amount of communication between Mr. Smith and the Commissioner of Vanuatu um, even if we were to set aside the questions about Mr. Um, the High Commissioner's uh, archives or documents, clearly it would seem that his correspondence has been uh, is not has not been treated inviolably. Uh, that in fact. There, there was in fact communication, as Mr. Smith says, on his phone with the High Commissioner. What's the Department's understanding of whether, in the course of the ABF raid of the Smith's property, any communication between the Smiths and the High Commissioner were seized? Well, Senator, you once I'm very happy to outline the general legal principles that apply. Um, but once we get into the subject matter of the application of those to the facts in a particular instance, that's um, becoming legal advice. Mm. So I'm trying to be as helpful as I can uh, without crossing that line. Mm. Senator, I yes, could Mr. add McConville. that during our discussion I had with the Assistant Commissioner that we uh, did receive an undertaking that they would not be using uh, any exchanges with the High Commissioner uh, in legal proceedings unless they uh, consulted further with us. And right. that has not occurred. So our understanding is that that information hasn't been subject of any legal uh, right. outcomes so they, from the- Your understanding is that they've ruled out using any material that would reflect the High Commissioner's communications um, in legal proceedings. The ABF and Home Affairs Department were careful to say on 3 February they did not, quote, examine any official material relating to the High Commissioner. Is that your understanding? Well, Have Senator, they their advised under... advised you of that? That's right. That's consistent with the undertaking mm. that they gave me, which was to say that they would consult with us further if they were uh, so minded to use that information mm. or to further interrogate mm. that information. And so essentially As it's quite possible. Senator, can, can you wind up for another bracket for the Greens coming up? Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I do have a few few questions, but I'll, I'll try to wrap up on this chair. Uh, so it's your understanding that it's possible that material relating to the High Commissioner, such as text messages, could have been seized but not examined and will not be relied upon. 
in legal proceedings? We, we are not aware of whether anything was seized or not. Right. But certainly within the uh, terms of the warrant, uh, which is, of course, publicly been disclosed. Mm, mm. Um, you would have seen from the evidence provided, and I'll just wrap up here, Chair, as my last, last little bit of questions, the evidence provided to the select committee that um, Commissioner Outram at the ABF was not initially advised, in fact, that the High Commissioner uh, was named in the warrant. Now, that's ABF processes, I accept that, um, and I accept that you have um, already taken advice, you know, taken upon yourselves to advise the ABF and to seek to instill better processes there so that they understand their obligations. Um, just on the point that the ABF, um, you say you contacted them on the 2nd of, you, you contacted ABF on the 2nd of September? I spoke with the acting uh, deputy commissioner at the time. Uh, yes, and, um, but then they didn't seek legal advice until the 9th of December? What explains that lag? Senator, that's a question you'd have to put to them. Mm. Well, it seems that they only requested your legal advice after the warrant issue was raised in the Senate. Um, so it seems to me if this warrant had not been raised in budget estimates last year in select committee hearings, it's quite likely that, that they might not have sought legal advice at all. Did you at any time suggest they should seek legal advice? Senator, as I said, the first mm -hmm. that we as a department were aware of this issue was uh, well after uh, the execution, the issue in the execution of the search warrant yep. uh, in September and the first that the uh, legal, uh, the first time that the uh, legal division was asked for review was on the 9th of December. And just to go back to uh, my previous evidence, Senator confirmed the request came from the Department of Home Affairs on the 9th. I know I'd confirmed the dates, but said yep. I wasn't sure if it was Home Affairs or it was Home, ABF, affairs. It was home right. affairs. Thank you. Um, Chair, that's actually a um, natural stopping point given Excellent. the flow of questions Senator that I Rice, have. Senator Rice, you have the call. Thank you. I want to start with Myanmar. Um, Minister, did the Australian Government encourage Woodside to cease operations in Myanmar? Senator, the, uh, the Australian Government would not take a position on a commercial decision uh, by Woodside, would be uh, my First response, and if officials wish to add anything further, I'll ask them to do so. So that's a no, that you didn't engage with them? Uh, Senator, I speak to um, senior, official, senior officers of uh, Australian businesses all the time, including Woodside. Um, so did you in encourage them to divest? So, so, Senator, no. The Australian government does not encourage businesses one way or the other in relation to their commercial decisions. OK. Um, Minister, media reports indicate the junta has started cancelling visas of high-profile opponents. So it's still your position that we should try for ASEAN diplomacy rather than joining other countries in, in imposing targeted sanctions? Uh, Senator, uh, Australia has been uh, very clear that our sanctions position in relation to Myanmar uh, remains under review, and I reiterate that uh, today. Uh, these are um, options that uh, remain available to the Australian government. But in my discussions with uh, counterparts, including with uh, Quad uh, foreign ministers uh, on Friday and Saturday last week, uh, and, and including in the Quad foreign minister's statement, uh, the focus of effort from ASEAN is essential in this region. And we have strongly supported uh, the engagement of ASEAN. The achievement of the five points of consensus was uh, an extremely significant step. I do acknowledge that the uh, lack of progress made by the regime uh, in, uh, in relation to that uh, is a matter of concern. And it is a matter that I have raised uh, repeatedly with, uh, with counterparts, uh, both uh, in the uh, previous leadership of ASEAN under, as I said uh, earlier in our conversation, under Brunei, uh, and now in relation to, uh, to the same issues uh, and, and others in uh, the leadership of, uh, of Cambodia. Uh, this is a, an issue which we have raised consistently both uh, in the region uh, and uh, more broadly, uh, including a discussion uh, with uh, our colleagues in Aukmin as well. Mm. 
but we still haven't got to the stage of imposing sanctions, despite the US and the UK increasing their sanctions on the first anniversary of the coup. I mean, Secretary of State Blinken said that there was a robust discussion about Myanmar sanctions um, at the time of your Quad meeting. Did Secretary Blinken ask you to join the US in imposing sanctions? Senator, let me repeat myself. I am most unlikely to engage in a public forum uh, in a canvassing of the conversations that I had with Quad, quad Foreign Ministers within uh, that meeting. There was indeed uh, a discussion, and as I said, and I'm just trying to uh, so find the So what's it going to take, Minister, for us statement? to decide to impose sanctions, given it's currently under review, we've got our major partners increasing their sanctions, and yet we are unwilling to do so? What's it going to take? Senator, again, I reiterate that in this region, it is my strong view that ASEAN leadership is essential in addressing the issues in, in um, Myanmar. And do you think, is, it, is it going to be leading to no, I don't need to, to say anything, to, Senator, because you won't even let me finish my sentence. No, you, I've heard what you had to say, Minister, but we've had a year now of the coup. We have had thousands of people dying. We've had hundreds of thousands of people impacted. And yet we are not joining our major partners in imposing sanctions. We join our major partners and, in fact, lead with our, with our partners on calling for an arms embargo, Senator. We have an existing arms embargo and we have been very strong in reiterating the importance of, uh, of that embargo. We have, as you know, uh, supported calls for a global arms embargo. We have, uh, in the context of Myanmar nationals who are in Australia, uh, extended their visas. We have suspended our limited uh, bilateral defence cooperation. We have worked extensively to uh, endeavour to provide humanitarian and development support uh, in a very difficult Minister. environment. Yes. Um, Minister, when the Future Fund divested from the Chinese weapons company, they said that it was in response to US sanctions. Doesn't that actually show that sanctions work? Sorry, Senator, can you repeat that? The, um, we recently, the Future Fund divested from a Chinese weapons company that was providing weapons to the junta. And they said that they did that in response to US sanctions. Doesn't that show that sanctions actually work? Well, I've already also, sorry, Senator, already I withdraw. I have also engaged uh, on the matter of uh, the Future Fund with uh, both of our shareholder ministers, Minister Birmingham uh, and, and Minister Frydenberg, including uh, raising the issues raised in uh, reports uh, that were, I think, uh, publicised in, uh, in December. Um, DFAT is going to engage uh, with the Future Fund uh, and increase their engagement with the Future Fund uh, in response to that uh, as well. Mm. I've consistently said, and you asked me about commercial interests uh, before, that Australian companies and investors with interests in Myanmar should absolutely undertake uh, heightened due diligence. They should be seeking independent advice regarding, as you say, relevant sanctions and human rights obligations to ensure that they're complying. Which, and that which, includes the Future Fund. Which to me makes it sound as if sanctions are actually working. I mean, Minister, in November, Minister Dutton attended the informal virtual meeting of ASEAN Australian Defence Ministers with the Myanmar junta regime. We're not imposing sanctions, but we're taking meetings with them. Aren't we, in effect, legitimising the junta? No, we are not, Senator. Um, we do recognise, for a range of reasons, including Australia's regional interests, that we have, have to have some capacity to engage. We have to have some capacity to engage. I don't know if you're suggesting, Senator, that I should abandon uh, Australia's no, consular obligations, for example. No, I'm suggesting that the Defence Minister uh, shouldn't to, be attending have, meetings uh, with the Junta. Capacity to it engage. It looks like we're legitimising the regime that. when our Defence Minister attends meetings with the Junta. I can see we're not going to get much further there. I'd like to now move on to Syria. Um, what charges have been laid against the Australian women and children detained in the Syrian camps? I'm sorry, camps? Senator. I think you have just actually made an assertion which is not correct. Can you can you repeat what you said about the defence minister? That he had attended an informal meeting with um, an informal virtual meeting of ASEAN Australian defence ministers with the Myanmar junta regime. I'll come back to you on that, Senator. Thank you. Um, so moving on to Syria, what charges have been laid against the Australian women and children detained in the Syrian camps? Oh, 
Hello, Senator. Roger Noble, Ambassador for Counterterrorism. I'm not tracking any charges against women and children currently detained in Syrian camps. I would uh, check with Home Affairs to 100% verify that in the case of Australia. Sorry, you, you don't know whether any charges I'm have been laid? I'm not aware of any charges laid against them. Okay. Um, so, you, so you don't know under what... what? You know whether under what Syrian or Kurdish law, in fact, that they are being detained. Uh, our the people who are detained in the Syrian camps, it's a result of armed conflict. You're obviously aware of the campaign against ISIS, 84 mm -hmm. nation global coalition. So, the view is that the status of each individual would have to be assessed to determine the basis of their detention. Um, do you know? Do, I mean, do, this, do you know whether the Kurdish authorities plan to take the Australian women and children to court for any alleged crimes? Have you asked the, the Kurdish authorities about this? Uh, our interactions with them are in, indirect or through our posts periodically. Uh, I don't believe we've asked them that specific question. Why not? Given that they've been detained for for now a period of, of some years. Uh, I'd have to take it on notice. I mean, we've got Australian women and children who've been in detention for over two years, no charges mm -hmm. laid, no court dates, no due process provided and no legal basis to justify their deprivation of liberty. I mean, isn't that arbitrary detention? Isn't that what this government says it's so firmly against? As I said, the camps are there and the detention is there as a result of the armed conflict. Each individual would have to be assessed on, a, on his or her own basis. And the government uh, stands against arbitrary detention and supports the Copenhagen procedures and guidelines. But we don't know. We haven't asked the Kurdish authorities specifically whether they are actually going to be charged under what laws. They've just been there for two years and we haven't, we've got no further clarity about that. It would be, have to be person by person and our con consul, we don't have consular presence in Syria. And so we're not doing it person by person either then? Not presently. Um, since September 20. 21, when has the Australian government actually engaged with the Syrian Kurdish authorities? So uh, regularly, but often not in Syria. So through principally our post contacts. So when you so, say regularly, what? Uh, most weekly, recent was February. Monthly? Uh, it's not periodic, it's regular. It felt, it's so probably monthly. So February was the last this month. Okay, if you could take on notice for sure, details. Sure, I can give you a list. Yep. yep. And during those engagements, have we raised the question of the detention status of Australia? I'd have to take that on notice. Okay. And have we used those conversations to verify information regarding the ages, the conditions, and other factors regarding the well-being of Australians? We do. Okay. Um, Minister Payne, I'd like to go to how information from different agencies feeds into your work with the department. And so in general terms, I just want to confirm that the Australian Secret Intelligence Service is accountable to you as Australia's Foreign Minister? Yes, Senator. Um, and that work includes working with the intelligence or security services of other countries? Uh, broadly speaking, um, yes, Senator. Yeah. And so again, without going to the specifics, is that there's been public reporting on Australian intelligence officials in Syria and presumably, again, in general terms, not commenting on Syria specifically, if ASIS becomes aware of a risk to an Australian citizen, they'd report that to you? Uh, Senator, I, I don't think it's um, in the interest of this discussion to comment on hypothetical issues in the intelligence space. So I'll um, ask you to place your questions on the record and I'll respond to them on notice. It's rather, but it's not hypothetical and in fact it's not even, I don't want to go to the specifics of Syria. So I just want, you, it's just the general I'm going term. to ask you to place your questions on the record and I will respond on notice. But I just want to know in general terms whether ACES would tell you about a risk to an Australian citizen. Um, Senator, a threat to the life of an Australian citizen. Senator, as you know, we don't make public comment on intelligence matters. If you wish to place your questions on the record, and I am it's very a, happy in, for you to do that, I will respond on notice. It's in general terms. If, you, if ASIS is aware of a threat to the life of an Australian citizen, would they report that to you? Senator, I'm not going to comment on intelligence matters okay. on this record. Um, in, on the 28th of October, last set of estimates, following a question about Julian Assange, 
you said that I would say in relation to the question you've just asked about the media story that I found out in the media. So that's still your position? I'm sorry? With regards to Julian Assange. I'm sorry, Senator, I don't know what you're referring to. Well, that you, you, uh, it was an issue, I mean, in terms of, in terms of the threats to the life of Julian Assange. And the, I don't, and, I don't and recall the, and this discussion, and the, the, Senator. I don't recall this, this specific discussion. Um, I'm happy to, uh, to refresh um, my memory and I'll look at my consular brief to see if that assists me. Um, but I don't recall this, this particular discussion. Okay. It, was, it was with regards to the reporting of a threat, the threats to the life of Julian Assange that you said that you found out about it in the media. So look, if you could check your... Thank you. Check, check your um, records. And, and whether you, after making that statement to our estimates committee, whether you checked for any other notifications to com confirm the veracity of that. Um, I, the Department of Foreign Affairs has on file, there's a report by the independent UN Special Rapporteur Niels Meltzer on torture and other cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. Um, confirming that Mr Assange has all the symptoms typical for prolonged exposure to psychological torture. Minister, have you read that report in its entirety? Uh, the Meltzer report I have uh, uh, read in part, Senator. I'm not sure that I've read it in its entirety. Uh, I recall at the time that I was advised uh, that the report was produced with uh, no contact with, and I stand to be corrected by officials, but no contact with the Australian government. Um, we were not given an opportunity uh, to engage with the special rapporteur, uh, and that is, the, that is my recollection. If I need to correct the record, I will. Okay. All right. Uh, but can I just ask, but have, have you raised, there has, have you or the department raised any factual inaccuracies about that report? with Mr Meltzer. Uh, Senator, I will take that on notice. All right. The committee is suspended until 4 p.m. 4.03. 4 4.03, 4 Minister. Oh, All right. Senator Rice stole the time, Senator. The committee is resumed. Um, can I ask a, well, I'll give myself permission to ask a number of questions and uh, turn to Iran. I said I'd take on notice. I thought it was really important that I got Yes, of course. Back. Yes, yes. Well, but of the Ashurst contract had now been made available, and I was looking for my glasses, and the chair's got them. That's terrific. <laughs> well, it's always quite hard to find your glasses when you're not wearing them, I find, Senator. Please. Uh, uh, Senator, I think we're still looking for that, but we've still got a little bit more time. Yes, of course. Thank you. Uh, just on the, the department, we talked about the department's mechanisms to provide professional support to employees who are reporting sexual harassment or assault. We have a a network of 200 trained diversity and anti-harassment officers, I think they're called Idaho's, across the network, including overseas. They receive training in uh, preventing sexual exploitation and harassment. Uh, we also have dedicated staff and family support office, support office staff with highly qualified and experienced psychologists, and as well external counselling support <coughs> through the Employee Assistance Program, EAP. Uh, in addition, the department's recently released um, our Preventing Sexual Exploitation and Harassment e-learning course, and that can also be conducted face-to-face, -face, practitioner training on, on, that, um, on that module. 
In addition, we also have when our head of missions or head of posts or any SES officer are receiving uh, their training before they go overseas. This includes handling sexual harassment and assault matters, and that's part of their managing overseas operations course. And each time they go overseas, they have a one-on-one -on -one pre post briefing with the Chief People Officer and the Director of Ethics, Integrity and Professional Standards to ensure that they're aware of these, um, the way to report these matters and to support people who are reporting. Thank you very much, right, Ms Campbell. You. I appreciate the efforts the department went to to find that information. All right. Now to Iran. Who can tell us about the nuclear issues, the JCPO? Uh, yep. We'll ask someone. If to that's the forward. right, ac uh, not all at once. <laughs> uh, and we'll, um, we'll just see where the anti our yeah. ambassador for uh, non proliferation, uh, can come to the table. Thank you. Do we have an African specialist down we here? We have an African specialist. Yeah, down here. The all right. Down Good. Here. Good. Let's uh, briefly then deal with an issue, and that is the Congo. I was given a kind update to question. Here we go. Question 27, supplementary estimates, topic Congo. I'm just wondering whether you are able to provide any update on that answer as to how things are going in the, um, let me get this right the Republic of the Congo as opposed to the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Thanks, uh, Thanks Senator. Um, so um, the Republic of the Congo uh, held presidential elections. Oh, look, look, just quickly, if I may, yeah. um, um, I was told that I think in the answer, is there any new information that you would want to supply to us from the, uh, from the written answer provided? Sure. So, um, we remain um, concerned about the human rights situation. Yeah. Repression of political parties and candidates is commonplace, unfortunately. Public gatherings are closely monitored and tightly controlled, as are the activities of civil society organisations, particularly when they're connected to opposition groups. And, um, and that's especially for the, how do I pronounce it, Bank, Bank Congo sure. from so, the south? So there are tensions between the president and his follow followers who primarily come from the north mm. and the Bakongo from the south. Bakongo primarily um, make up the majority of the civil servant mm. and te technocratic positions in the country, but um, unfortunately um, very few hold leadership positions. And um, we've received reports that neighbourhoods with large Bakongo populations are often subject to heavier police and military focus, um, particularly around election. During time. election, yeah, which is what you provided me in yeah, the written answer. Sure. But, so basically that's still very Yeah, there much hasn't been, I can't report to you, Senator, unfortunately, there's been um, right. a remarkable improvement in the situation in the Republic of the Congo. All right, thank you. And now we have Mr Biggs at the table. So uh, thank you for that. And that was my only question about Matters Africa. So. Thank you. Uh, Mr Biggs, what can you tell us about the JCPOA and uh, developments uh, with Iran? So, Ian Biggs, Ambassador for Arms Control and Counterproliferation. Uh, JCPOA is important to Australia. Mm. We are um, strongly committed to the non-proliferation uh, ambition of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action and we continue to urge Iran to engage in good faith uh, and, and to hope for a return to the JCPOA. We are not obviously party to that particular mm. agreement, uh, but it has uh, support. The whole of the global community supports the inspection and verification uh, work of the International Atomic Energy Agency that should make the JCPOA work and to provide the assurance that we're all looking for. But we are, are we convinced that that is happening or are they now developing a, um, nuclear material beyond that which they would be entitled to under the agreement and greater quantities of it? Senator, uh, we don't have the assurance that this is going to work. Uh, mm. I, I, I know only what the um, quite positive signals 
in the last few days out of, out of the negotiations in Vienna um, that an agreement may be imminent, but, but I, I can't confirm that. All right. What I can say is that we are very concerned, everyone is very concerned, about the amount of material that's been produced as a result of Iran's suspension of its obligations mm. under JCPOA for the last three years. A great deal of production has happened, and, and we're concerned about that. We're very concerned about the inability over the last period of the International Atomic Energy Agency to verify mm. um, uh, the commitment, the, the compliance with, with its obligations. So if this agency is unable to verify, um, who is verifying anything? It, 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 has, it, it has been able to conduct some limited verification uh, during the uh, whole of the period that the JCPOA has been in suspension or not, not working mm. as it's meant to. Uh, and, and they were excluded at one point and then negotiated an agreement to come back in. Uh, some of their activities are subject to resumption when the JCPOA is, is fully restored. Um, I, I, I could perhaps ref, refer you to, to, to my colleague, the Director General of the Australian Safeguards and Operation Office, who's here and, and, and can give you chapter and verse but, on... But look, uh, but, I don't want to take up mm. too much time, but very concerning that uh, the monitoring, what has been, what, in suspension and not verified, not verifiable given the circumstances in which we find ourselves in, but we've got our fingers crossed that that which is occurring currently might develop. The, um, the characterisation would be that Australia is deeply concerned uh, All right, and how do we then send that message to Iran or indeed around the world? Uh, Senator Australia has, has a very active embassy in Tehran, which is in frequent uh, contact with Iranian officials and mm -hmm. passes on that, that message. Uh, there's, there's no... No secret about the concern Good. that she... All right, thank you. And do we also pass on through our embassy in Iran our concerns about the lack of human rights in the country, persecution of Christian, oppression of women? For I that think I'm I... moving up to the other end of the table, yeah, thank Mr. You. Thank Ms. Brown. You, uh, we certainly do. We can regularly um, take up those um, issues of concern with the Iranian government, both uh, in bilateral settings and multilateral settings. And uh, that um, is a, a, a major focus of our um, interaction with the Iranian government. Are you aware of the National Council of Resistance of Iran, which is based in the United States? I've heard of it, Senator. I don't right. know. Right, they've uh, produced a document. Um, Iran exposing the latest terrorist game plan of the IRGC dash, and I'm not sure how to pronounce this, but it's capital Q. Quads Force. Quads, yeah. all right, without an A. Right, Quads Force, thank you. Um, what can you tell us about that? Because that seems to be a, uh, what, creation of naval units consisting of proxy mercenary forces. Um, would that be a fair description? Senator, I haven't um, seen uh, the specific report, but I can say that the IG CODS force has been very active over a number of decades in developing um, forces in the region to conduct um, operations in support of Iran's um, uh, um, objectives. And, that is and what are Iran's objectives? Uh, I know this is diplomatic talk, but uh, is it for peace and stability in the region or is it to help create, uh, to help terrorists undertake their activities or to help create, uh, help um, criminal activities? Sure. Well, I think, um, yes, uh, Senator, I wouldn't um, characterise Iran's activities um, since the um, Islamic Revolution in 1979 as promoting peace and tranquility in the Good. region. Um, so, so quite the contrary. Um, right. Iran does um, where it can, um, in particular countries where it is supporting opposition groups or, or wishes to 
um, <clears throat> promote a particular cause, does um, seek to um, um, promote instability. Um, we've seen that in a number of places um, and, and so forth. For instance, um, in Iraq, they're a very influential um, country there, but um, his, for historic reason, reasons, including the 1988, um, the 1980 to 1988 war with Iraq, they are uh, interested in, a, in, a, in Iraq not falling apart, but no longer being strong enough to threaten Iran. So they want to um, have all considerable influences over the levers of power in, in Iraq. Of course, in Lebanon, um, they're a strong supporter of Hezbollah, which is a very well-known fact. And in other places, um, I, I think um, they're no, known pro, a provider of assistance to the Houthis um, in Yemen. Um, over time, that's been chronicled. Uh, shipments have been intercepted um, and so forth. So shipments that, that uh, of arms yes, that's and right. weapons. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Senator. All right, look, um, are we aware of the teachers' strikes in Iran and have any representations been made about that to the Iranian authorities? And my Labor colleagues would be delighted that uh, I'm asking this question because I understand the Australian Education Union has also released a public statement on its website condemning the regime for its repressive measures against teachers. Thanks, Senator. I'm aware of the strikes. Um, they come in a context of um, uh, living conditions in Iran the, uh, and the economic situation. And it's not only teachers, is it? There's others, there's yeah. farmers in, play in central Iran, including around Isfahan, where there are long-standing water resource problems, um, supply issues, environmental problems. But yes, there's been significant um, economic problems in Iran um, due to mismanagement, um, largely. And um, uh, there's a very high rate of inflation. Um, conditions for workers have not been good for some time. Um, the ability of workers or any other group to um, take up their claims um, as we would in Australia um, has been very circumscribed and pr public protests of course have been uh, are met often with force and uh, the uh, detention of, uh, of protesters. So that's commonplace. Is the women found out as well with their very large demonstrations against the requirement to wear the hijab? Is that correct? There have been when, at which period are we talking about, Senator? Are we talking about in 1980, 1979? No, no, no. Uh, uh, a lot more recent times yeah. that uh, those uh, demonstrations have occurred and uh, the women leaders of those protests have been arrested. And uh, yeah. as, I, as I said, Senator, um, unfortunately the situation is public protests of any, any sort mm. are usually met with, uh, with force and uh, the organisers are incarcerated. Do we, moving on to Israel or the United Nations, do we, and I always forget this, is it agenda item seven, Israel, agenda item seven, 17, what is it? Yeah, yeah, on, on the Human Rights Council. I think it's seven, Senator. Seven, yeah. Let me check that. But agenda no. item seven, uh, thanks. Uh, I got a nod from the back, so thank you very <laughs> much. Uh, um, can, we be given an update as to whether there's any movement or likely movement in getting rid of that very offensive um, agenda item against Israel, noting that there isn't one for North Korea or Cuba or the People's Republic of China, which and Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia, oh, which yeah. might sort of give us an indication of uh, what motivates uh, such an agenda item. So, um, Senator, yes, we, um, the, uh, we continue to express our concern about that item, item seven, um, and we maintain our um, principled opposition to that, most recently at the um, 44th um, Human Rights Council session. Um, we continue to do so. So in, in terms of um, is there any progress on it, um, I don't think so, but um, we, we will continue to oppose it. All right. Uh, in recent times, uh I've been delighted that the government has taken on the definition of anti-Semitism, um, IHRA. R -A. Um, how many other countries have now adopted that definition? 
Senator, I'll have to. Um, yeah, yeah, take that on. Take, take that on. Uh, I think it's a slowly to growing number. I'm delighted that Australia is uh, sure. is now a part of it, having advocated for that at uh, previous estimates. We are part of a group of countries uh, seeking the abolition of the death penalty, and as is my wanted estimates, I ask for an update as to. How many more countries have signed up, if any, and uh, whether we have any extra statistics uh, one way or another of the um, use of the death penalty? I'm looking for the relevant officer who's coming to the table. If the relevant officer is not there, I've put it on the hand okay. sad, and let's take that we'll on take notice. We'll take it on notice for yep. you, Senator, because I'm not seeing any movement. And then, look, can I uh, put in a request as well from Christian Faith and Freedom. Uh, they unfortunately pepper my email inbox, and I welcome them doing so, but when they pepper my inbox, we told about uh, persecutions occurring in Afghanistan, Kenya, Iran, Pakistan, China, uh, India, uh, lots of various countries, Cuba, Myanmar, Burma, Pakistan, etc. Um, do we have a, any coordinated approach, either Australia or freedom-loving countries around the world who seek to protect people of the Christian faith um, who are being persecuted around the world and supplementary to that, people of any other faith? who are being persecuted. Senator, um, officials will come to uh, the table, but we have been uh, participating in um, a broad alliance on freedom of religion uh, or belief uh, for a number of years now. Uh, and um, you're correct to say that uh, there are ongoing uh, incursions on freedom of religion mm. or belief, or freedom mm. not to have a belief, uh, in, uh, in many places uh, around the world, uh, that um, uh, alliance um, met relatively recently, I think, uh, in the United States, uh, and uh, I think we attended with um, a representative from Post uh, in the in the U.S. Uh, but that is something which uh, we uh, which we place a significant um, focus on as a human right, mm. uh, and work with um, counterparts. Uh, around the world uh, on that. Um, and that alliance, is, does it have a name? It's, it, yes, it's called the International Religious Freedom or Belief Alliance. Thank you. Thank you. Good. At least I now know what it's uh, officially called. That was close. Called. No, very close, Minister. Senator, Sorry. I, might ask, I might add that uh, just to Mind. bring you up to to bring you up to date, I'm sorry, Senator yeah, Cathy right. Klugman, I'm Deputy Secretary, uh, Development and Multilateral Group. Just to bring you up to date, which I know that you like to be brought up to date in these committee processes, um, the most recent session of the third committee, the UN Third Committee, which is the committee that deals with human rights and mm -hmm. other sort of social, social issues, social and cultural issues. Uh, concluded on 19 November 2021, Australia there delivered a national statement specifically on freedom of religion and belief, which is consistent with the priority that the Minister gives to this issue in our um, global human rights uh, advocacy agenda. All right. Thank you very much. Senator Keneally has the call. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, I would like to ask some questions about the proposed agriculture visa. Yes, Senator. Mm. How would the department characterise the status of the visa? Is it operational? Uh, 
right. Well, Senator Eeyore McDonald, Head of the Office of the Pacific. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, so, Senator, uh, the Ag visa at the moment has uh, one final aspect to go, which is the finalisation of the bilateral agreement. So, discussions are ongoing at the moment with a small number of Southeast Asian countries. So, has any country signed up yet to a bilateral agreement? No, uh, but negotiations are proceeding with Indonesia uh, in particular, and we expect that they'll be concluded uh, in the not too distant future. Can you tell me, you said a small number, can you put a number on it? I'd just say a small number. The only country that's really made that public is Indonesia, and in the nature of the negotiations, I'd appreciate uh, that being kept as a small number of Southeast Asian uh, countries. Okay. Uh, am I correct in my recollection that there was also a public acknowledgement from Malaysia that they would not be entering into a bilateral agreement for the Ag visa? Yes, that's correct, Senator. And they gave a reason for that? Yes, uh, which had to do with their own Malaysia nation program and seeking to keep workers correct in their domestic horticulture industry yeah so at this point they didn't want to participate they made mm. a later point but not at this point so i suppose then it's safe to assume that no workers have arrived in australia under the agriculture base i'm only i'm not laughing at the i'm not mocking i'm laughing at the obvious logical conclusion of my question yeah i think i i can answer that uh, senator in the affirmative but i would say that uh, you know, the discussions that are going on at the moment mm. uh, are normal in terms of finalising the bilateral mm. arrangements. I mean, mm. uh, discussions need to occur as they do in, in any government mm. agency and with ministers to finalise those uh, to the satisfaction of those countries that we're entering into arrangements with. Um, I believe that uh, Minister Littleproud has previously said that um, Indonesia, he told Sky News on the 29th of January that Indonesia is one of the four countries that has been prepared to name themselves in bilateral negotiations. So he's put a number out there. Are you, are you able to confirm that number? Uh, he has put a number out there, I agree, and we are in discussions with those, with four countries, yes. But we're not, we haven't disclosed other than Indonesia what those mm. countries are, yes. Okay. So he also said in the same interview that Maurice Payne and her department are in charge of this, and Maurice has given us a very strong indication those negotiations are nearly finalised and we should some positive outcome very soon. Is that, can the department confirm that is the status of the negotiations? So, Senator, I can't uh, speak on when those negotiations will be finalised. That's a matter for Indonesia. But I would say that they're progressing very well. We've had at least six discussions and there's a further discussion this week. Um, so once they've worked through those internal processes, we expect that there will be a conclusion to that. But that's a matter for the Indonesian government, of course. Right. Uh I believe that the minister has previously made a public commitment that the agriculture visa would be up and running by Christmas 2021. Um, do we have any sense if it will be up and running by, say, Easter this year? Senator, as I said earlier, I expect um, those negotiations to be completed shortly. Um, mm. They're very active and they're nearing completion. Uh, but I can't put a specific time frame on it other than to say it. I, I expect that to be quite soon. Mm. Yes, um, Minister Littleproud also told Sky News in late December that Minister Payne had given himself uh, and the Prime Minister, sorry, the Deputy Prime Minister, and I quote, a strong commitment that she believes she'll be able to achieve a country signing up to the Ag visa in January next year. So. We're in February. I understand that sovereign countries have to make their own decisions. Um, 
Minister, are you able to update us, uh, given that Minister Littleproud has put a month on the record? I'm just wondering if you're able to update us, if you've got a sense of what month we might see uh, a country signing up to the Ag visa. So you're correct, Senator, and sovereign countries do need to, uh, to make their own decisions, and uh, that is uh, why it's uh, important to work closely with those countries in mm. an appropriately confidential and respectful uh, manner, as we are doing. Uh, the um, discussions with uh, Indonesia are well progressed. Uh, the matter has been discussed uh, between myself and uh, Foreign Minister Masudi. Uh, importantly, of course, uh, Minister Littleproud uh, went himself to uh, mm. Indonesia uh, around uh, the time of uh, Australia Day, mm. um, if I recall correctly. Uh, to um, to pursue these uh, these issues uh, with counterparts uh, as well, I think it is very important that uh, we are able to assure sending countries, as of course we do through the Palm Program uh, as well, uh, of the protections that will be in place uh, for their workers, of the arrangements that will underpin. Uh, the administration uh, of the scheme. So I am very respectful of those processes mm. in, um, in sending countries and particularly at this point in time uh, with Indonesia. Uh, and I hope to finalise those soon. I'm also cognisant, Senator, of uh, the very significant uh, workforce demand that mm. uh, exists, uh, particularly in a number of uh, agricultural industries uh, around the country. And that is one of the reasons that we have uh, been uh, so uh, we have worked so hard with our Pacific uh, friends in terms of the Palm program itself, as Mr Macdonald said earlier mm. today. Uh, we have a work-ready pool of uh, give or take over 50,000 workers in the Pacific, more than half of those double vaccinated, uh, and the others vaccination um, programs in process through their labour sending units. Uh, and uh, I encourage, um, uh, encourage uh, employers uh, in, and the states and territories uh, to engage with the Palm program and to ensure that they can bring more Pacific workers to Australia. I signed an MOU with Timor-Leste last mm. week uh, in terms of uh, addressing this demand uh, with uh, Foreign Minister Adeliza Magno when she was uh, here last week as well. Yep. Um, thank you. That's actually quite helpful. Um, and I, I, I think there would be another area of bipartisanship to be pursued in terms of a bipartisan support for the Pacific Labor Scheme programs. Uh, and that's very pleasing. And I do agree with you, they play a, a really important role in filling both demand as well as the other benefits Australia gains from those programs. Um, but in terms of the agriculture visa, um, I am, I did note a report in The Australian from 30 December 2021, which says there's a spat within the coalition over the visa, with some national MPs accusing the Liberal Party of obstructing the progress of the visa as they call for deals to be finalised. Minister, are you aware of such a spat? It's absolutely not the case, Senator, and self-evidently not the case, given the work that is being done. Uh, through uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and by posts, mm. uh, including uh, in Indonesia in particular, um, to progress this. So, Again, yep, I would sorry. remind, um, even I would even remind journalists who are uh, writing on these matters mm. uh, of the need to be respectful uh, of countries who are sending workers to Australia. I don't mm. think that's often referred to in media reports uh, mm. that I see, um, because these are sovereign decisions for, for them to make, and we will work with them as they mm. do that. Well, I, and look, I think it's, that's a fair warning to give to media to give to media organisations, but. On, to be fair to the media as well, they, when they see comments from Minister Littleproud in late December that he's saying on media interviews that he's got a strong commitment that there will be a agreement in January this, this year, I think it's fair enough that they might have at least take heed of what the minister says. So what, um, what advice have you been able to provide advice to Minister Littleproud uh, about uh, the, um, the status? Because it, it, it does seem he has, in the past, provided commitments publicly 
Um, I note his media release when he visited Indonesia did not speak specifically to any time frame any longer at the end of January. So I'm just wondering, ha, ha, is Minister Little Proud now aware of the proposed time frame to uh, bring this to a conclusion? I would say, and, and uh, I'll ask officials to, uh, to add to this, that uh, our agencies are, are working closely together. Uh, my post in, uh, in Indonesia, uh, which um, effectively facilitated uh, the minister's visit, or well, in fact did facilitate, I should say, the minister's visit mm. to, uh, to Jakarta, uh, is obviously working closely with uh, agencies as well. Mm. And there are a number of agencies across the Indonesian system um, with which we are engaging. And uh, in fact, I hope uh, to have the opportunity to, uh, to again discuss this with Foreign Minister Masudi in the coming days. Mm. And Senator, just adding to that, I think it's, uh, it's fair to say that we're working very closely with the ag Agriculture Department mm. as well as Home Affairs here. So we're all mm. joined up mm. on that and everyone's aware of where we're up to in terms of those negotiations. Mm. Minister, has, have, any, have your National Party colleagues raised their concerns with you about the delay in the visa negotiations? Uh, I actually had, a, and again, I don't go to the detail, Senator, as you mm. know, but I had a series of very constructive <laughs> conversations with a range of uh, um, national and liberal colleagues from regional uh, Australia on mm. these issues prior to Christmas. Prior to Christmas, okay. Um, and without going into the um, details of the negotiations, but are there, is there a general overview the department can provide in terms of the types of questions that are being raised by those uh, four countries in terms of what might they might be seeking to understand or if they, they, there are barriers to them uh, completing uh, bilateral agreements? Uh, Senator, I think it's, um, it's th to be fair, I think you know, I wouldn't want to go into the details of the negotiations publicly in a respectful mm. way with those countries, but I will say that of concern to them are the same issues that Minister Payne just mentioned around protection of their workers and their people mm. in terms of uh, this program as any labour sending program. So uh, I think the, the negotiations are being held in, in the right spirit and across, mm. uh, across government in both countries. Mm. And, um, you know, this is, this is a new program. This requires uh, good consideration of the issues and, and discussion uh, to finalise a good agreement uh, that, we're all, that we're, we are all looking for as part of the negotiating. Mm. Right. Uh, so, if we um, step back a bit, um, the fact sheet that the department has circulated uh, or made public, I should say, uh, in relation to the visa, um, there's some questions that I still have having looked at it. Um, do you have a sense of how many workers you're, comp you're contemplating um, might access this visa once, it's, once you've got it up and running? And what would, is there a target? Is there an expectation? Uh, Senator, I think this has um, been publicly talked about before, but um, you know, there will be, uh, following consultation across a number of stakeholders in relation to this visa. Uh, there will be some form of cap at the start to implement the program. Uh, as the Minister talked about earlier, you know, the Pacific uh, Labor program still remains uh, in terms of primacy and we want to retain that. Uh, and there's a number of workers, as the Minister said, that are available to come into Australia mm. now from the Pacific. So yes, there will be, there will be some cap at the initial uh, outset of the, the program. Mm. And I think it's worth saying that the stakeholder consultation that's been done uh, has been very important in terms of uh, the various respective stakeholders understanding those issues. Yep. Okay. So no specific projection in terms of the number of workers at this stage? Yeah, I mean, we will, um, in, as you know, there's um, assessments done or labour market testing for any of this in terms of Australians. But mm. I, I'd imagine uh, that as this program settles in, uh, that amount of workers coming in under this program will be reviewed each year in terms of the, the needs that are required. Mm, okay. 
And what sectors will be eligible? Because the fact, see, fact sheet seems to suggest it could be quite wide ranging. It's more than just horticulture. Yeah, they're, they're specified. Uh, Ms. Heineke might mention what they are. I think they're dairy. Well, they're specified, but then it, there also has been a suggestion that it could be broader than what's specified. So maybe go through what's specified and then if there, are, there is a capacity to broaden. Senator Daniel Heineke, First Assistant Secretary, mm -hmm. Labor and Connectivity Division. So the sectors that have been agreed at the moment, um, as you say, are broad. It includes all horticulture, meat processing, dairy, wool, grains, fisheries, including aquaculture and forestry. Um, within that, there, there has been an agreement at all skills level of the ANSCO skills level. I apologise, there's an urn Sorry. going off behind me. <laughs> I'll try and so speak a bit louder. Speak. Yes, thank you. That'd be loud. Um, it, it has been agreed oh, within me, that. your moment, Senator Van. <laughs> I'm, I'm quite happy for you to keep going. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, within, just, just, did you hear that? Did you want me to repeat what that I said? That would be great because Thank this you. <laughs> was very loud. The sectors that have been agreed as part of the policy settings for the agriculture visa uh, are across the primary industries of the agriculture sector, which includes horticulture, meat processing, dairy, wool, grains, fisheries, including aquaculture and forestry. Mm -hmm. And it does include all skills level on the ANSCO ranking from one to five, which encompasses low, semi and high skilled occupations. But we expect that the initial cohorts will initially be low skilled positions. Um, and that is why we get skills assessment processes in place with partner countries. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's some, um, and, and is there capacity to expand, did you say, beyond those? Sectors? It needs to be broadly defined within the primary industry sectors, mm -hmm. but at the moment they're the sectors that it includes. We're working very closely with the Department of Agriculture um, and they've looked at the, the codes across all agricultural sectors and we have got a detailed list that we were, have worked on with the Agriculture Department, which does include all the codes um, of all those job categories. So, so there is scope to expand it. Um, there are review points in place. Senator for the Ag Visa, which would give us scope to expand those codes within primary industries. Right, and the review points being triggered by what? The, it was agreed that there'll be an independent, there'll be a review of this um, as well. Importantly, um, we'll be looking at the numbers in line with demand and supply in the agriculture sector as part of the annual migr migration review, which Home Affairs leads. Okay. And I apologise. Uh, did you mention Meatworks yes. in that list? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, and all skills categories one to five. Yes. Right. Okay. Uh, have can you speak to me about the worker protections that you that will be in place? Yes, there'll be, we, we've looked um, obviously very closely, and this is an important part, as Mr. McDonald said, of the negotiations with various mm. countries. Um, and we're working with them on some of their own regulations as well um, that they will require for their workers, mm. which, will Im, which will influence our design. But basically we've looked at um, best practice uh, in terms of our own experience on the PALM scheme, as well as, as well as other experiences in broader visas like the temporary skills visa, the, the miller in the meatwork sector, horticulture mm. labour award. Um, it will include pre-departure integrity te checks. We are looking at working with an offshore provider, which mm. will support partner sending countries to ensure the integrity of those that we send. So there'll be an offshore process, as well as normal processes that we do employ under our PALM scheme. So that does include things like pre-departure worker uh, briefings. Um, there'll be vetting as per the fact sheet of employers. Um, they will need, it is a sponsored visa. Uh, so this is only for approved employers that go through the relevant uh, financial bankruptcy and fair work history checks. Um, there'll be a 24 seven welfare work line. We'll be working very closely with consulates who already play 
this function here, mm. but those the consulates of those partner countries will be part of it. Um, there will be assurance teams, um, and again, we'll be employing best practice across other other programs. Mm. So, for example, that will include. Uh, assurance checks of paychecks. Um, we're working very closely mm. with the Fair Work uh, Ombudsman. Um, and as you would be aware, Senator, um, we will be working within the Hort Award, which is, which got, is going to change on the 28th of mm. April in, in line with um, minimum pay benchmarks. So all of, those, uh, all of those features will be part of the program. That last part is that that relates to the Fair Work Commission's yes. recent decision. Yes. Right. Um, if I can, thank you. That's helpful. Um, can I just go back uh, on Indonesia? Um, it's my understanding they are already entitled to send 4,264 backpackers to Australia each year under the work and holiday visa, correct? I don't know the exact number. Right. I can't confirm that, but they can. That is, they, they have a, yes. a yeah, an allocation. They have an allocation. Yeah. I, I'm not asking to yes. five, I think. And, and it's my understanding that is it. Um, so this agriculture visa would allow Indonesian visa holders to work in Australia. And I'm not picking on Indonesia. I'm just trying to more tease out, <laughs> if you will, um, the, the differences between and the intersection between the working um, holiday maker, the work and holiday visa and the ag visa. So the working holiday making maker visa, as you're aware, is usually negotiated as part of trade agreements. Yep. Um, it's unsponsored in the sense that they're not they're here for a working holiday and they're yep. not bound to one employer. The agriculture visa is a sponsored visa. Yep. Um, and the types of programs that we benchmark our policy settings are against are things like the the meatworks industry labour mm. award in, in agreement, um, the horticulture industry labour agreement, which also. Yes. Um, applies against low and semi-skilled occupations. So the, the agriculture visa would allow um, visa holders from Indonesia to work in Australia for up to three years. Um, how many, do you have any sense of how many of the Indonesian visa holders are currently in Australia on work and holiday visas? We'd have to get that data from Home Affairs at, as to how mm. many are actually here at the moment, Senator. And so that given the yeah. last two years, mm. I think yeah. we could expect it's a small number. I, I imagine that Potentially would be the case. Um, uh, so is it, is, I'm just trying to understand, with countries, and again, I mm. don't want you to necessarily uh, comment on Indonesia specifically, but with countries where there is an agreement for a work and holiday visa, you know, is this part of the negotiation as to whether or not ag visa numbers would be an addition no, to work Senator. and holidays? No, Senator. The working holiday maker was a deal that was negotiated in the past. Right. Um, so that will stand. This is in addition. And ag visa will and be an just addition. And to, just um, to let you know that yep. the duration, there's two, there's two different durations. There's a seasonal stream, yeah, which oh, allows correct. workers to work from up to nine yep. months in every 12 months for a visa that can be one season or multiple over four years, mm. or yep. there is a long-term stream, which is one to four year visas. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. That's good. Um, does, the, does the department have any projection as to whether the government, or understanding of whether it's the government's aim to have uh, fewer people in Australia under the ag visa compared to the Pacific Labor Program? Uh, Senator, as I said earlier, yep. the Pacific Labor Program will retain primacy. So mm. when, this, uh, when this program commences with a cap, uh, it will be less than the Pacific Labor Scheme, which has 20,000 workers currently, or more than 20,000 workers currently in Australia. Mm. Um, so again, you know, I think the government's been very clear about Pacific Labor and its primacy. Mm. In so the, remind me the cap again? There is no, uh, there is, as I said earlier, that needs to be defined. Finalized. Yeah, that across but it would be fewer than twenty thousand, presumably. Oh, yeah, 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 I think it's more more thinking of of a figure like a thousand or that to start off with. Right. Okay. Yeah. Senator, if I can just um, add for context, um, pre-COVID, just before COVID, we had about eight thousand Pacific workers mm. across the seasonal workers scheme and Pacific Labor scheme in country. Um, 
it's it's expanded obviously with um with the prioritization of Pacific and the opening up the borders for Pacific. We mm. are expecting around about at twenty five thousand by the end of March, early April to be in Australia to meet this harvest and mm. we have made it very clear as the minister said that and worked very hard with employers um, particularly after borders opened um, where quarantine costs were no longer required to be paid mm. by employers which was a major constraint um, and we we have got a, a really strong pipeline in place with Pacific countries yep. to, yep. to meet that objective for this harvest and as I said I, I think that's you know it's quite clear we would we that there's a bipartisan support for those programs, um, given the benefits that they have for our region. Um, so uh, that's really quite useful to understand the relative numbers and the potential cap and the idea that, that the, of the primacy of the Pacific labor programs. Um, uh, now, I, I believe there was a question on notice 84 from the most recent budget estimates that um, no Pacific countries have raised any concerns with the department about the potential negative impact of the proposed ag visa on Pacific labour programs. Does that remain the case? Yes, Senator, that remains the case um, without checking every single sure. person, but uh, no, it hasn't. There hasn't been any concerns raised. And I think part of that is our information that we've provided mm. on the Pacific labour scheme and its primacy. Right. And Forgive me if you've covered some of this ground previously, but let me put the question this way. Um, are, there difference, are there differences in the conditions between the ag, agriculture visa and the Pacific labor programs? Um, that is, I'm thinking about things like industry accreditation um, and, say, English requirements. Yes, Senator, there will be differences, um, and there are a number of reasons for some of those differences. I'll set out a few. Um, first of all, in the Pacific scheme, we do provide considerable support, noting that it is partly funded, uh, it is fun funded through the development program um, to Pacific government. So part mm -hmm. of what we do is actually supporting each of the labour ministries in the 10 countries we work with um, to support their capacity. Um, that includes other, other recruitments and other policies that they do have mm -hmm. in the labour sending space. Um, skills development is part of what we do in the Pacific scheme, which won't be part of the ag visa. Um, it is not ODA funded. Um, English requirements um, will be set at an international, an IELTS level international English equivalent of 4.0. Mm. In the Pacific, we don't have a specific qualification around mm. English. We do require it in our seasonal worker program deed mm. to have to have a, a adequate um, English, which is judged by each labour sending unit. Mm. Um, there are also differences just around, as I said before, the skills level um, in the Pacific labour schemes. As I think I said in earlier evidence, um, and Senator Fawcett was asking about, um, we do provide not just the agriculture sector. So although the agriculture and meatwork sector are the largest part, parts of it, we can provide ass assistance to any sector in regional and rural Australia. So aged care, tourism, hospitality, and some areas of light manufacturing right. are an important growth area for Pacific labour. Pacific yep. Labor at the moment also is only from skills level one to three, whereas the agriculture visa will allow people to come in under skills level one to two. Right. Higher skills. Yes, thank you. Um, what about a pathway to permanency? Because Minister Joyce and Minister Littleproud <coughs> media release in the 23 of August says it will complement the Pacific programs we've got in place, but also provide a pathway to permanency. Is it the government's intention for this visa to provide a pathway to permanency? Uh, I think it's fair to say the government's committed to um, creating options around that. Mm. Um, but as I said earlier, the negotiations are at just at the, we're just trying to finalise the first of the bilateral arrangements uh, firstly. So mm. um, I think that will involve further consultation and design work in the future. Right. Um, well, Home Affairs estimates, um, Home Affairs answered on Monday. Uh, the government has, the, que the question was, will there be a pathway to permanency as part of the agriculture visa? And the answer was, the government has committed to creating options for permanent residents. 
So yeah, that's is the government committed to permanent option? I mean, I, I can appreciate it might not be fully designed yet, but is yep. the government committed yes. that there is a, a yeah, they're committed residence. to creating options, yeah, as you've just said. They're committed to creating options. For permanent residence pathways. <laughs> I know we sound now like we're in an episode of Yes Minister, and I do apologise. Um, you can create options. Yep. But that doesn't mean you're necessarily committed to creating a pathway to permanency. So if I go back to the media release, the ministers... Joyce and Little Proud say it will provide a pathway to permanency. So, are we just creating options, or are we creating options that are actually going and we are committed to a pathway? So, Senator, uh, the responsible department around that is Home Affairs, and you had that discussion with them on Monday in terms of the design of the pathways. So, I don't have anything to add on this. this I, I think the answer is that's for future. The options are for con future consideration for government. I understand the options are, but is the goal a commitment of government? Is the goal of a pathway to permanency a commitment of government? So we'll make further announcements on that in the future, Senator. What we are doing now is looking at, uh, to use the, the word Mr Macdonald used, what those pathways uh, might be. It does require a great deal of consultation, does require design work, uh, and we will make further announcements on that in due course. I'm, I understand that, Minister. I'm, I'm trying to understand, are you going to announce what the pathway looks like, or are you going to announce that there will be a pathway? Well, I think the consultations uh, and the design work are part of that process, and we need to receive those uh, to inform that. Okay, so does that mean that Minister Joyce and Minister Littleproud were a bit premature when they said in their media release on the 23 of August? But that the Ag visa will also provide a pathway to permanent residency? Uh, well, I think, uh, Senator, my only qualification is to say that um, it does require the consultation and the design work to go with it. Um, mm. That is what uh, we have to do, and then we'll make further announcements on that. Okay. I'm going to brief the Deputy Prime Minister and the Ag Minister. Um, so, uh, just a couple quick questions before we round off this chair, just to give you an update. Um, so the department's fact sheet does state that there are 55,000 pre-screened Pacific employees ready to deploy, subject to quarantine arrangements. Um, so really, I suppose the question is, why, if there are 55,000, why do we need a visa that at best might Sounds like I only provide a thousand or a few thousand people a year. What is the problem we're trying to solve if we have such a, if we have got 55,000 and yet we may only get a small amount each year on an ag visa, um, given the amount of time and effort we're putting into these negotiations? I'm trying to understand what's the reward, that, 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 the return on investment here. Uh, that we're going to get? What's the benefit we're going to get if we've got 55,000 already screened and ready to go in what you say is the primary program um, and we're going to get a, a fairly small amount from the Ag visa? Well, Senator, uh, as I said earlier, the 55,000 or, you know, uh, let's say over 50,000 because some have come in sure. as well. Uh, that will retain primacy, but the whole idea behind both of these visas is to meet the requirements, the workforce requirements of those sectors. So mm. that will inform the demand that, that arises, and it could be, you know, there are a whole set of things in the Pacific the, at the moment that are restricting some of the, the mm. workforce coming to Australia, as you know, around COVID and the like. So there are other factors at play here. So more options, I think, for industry. Um, and Pacific remaining in the primacy mm. is a key. So how many staff does the department have working on these negotiations? Um, so Ms Heineke has a branch that's mm. responsible uh, for this and um, they are working very hard and very active at the moment. So I'm not sure the exact number. Oh. She might be able to help us. <laughs> 
At the moment, we have about 12, 13 people in that branch, but really important to point out that they're not all working on those bilateral negotiations. We've, that team has also needed to develop the policy settings across mm -hmm. government, the program design, the relative the procurements that we're progressing in, in country as well as um, in Australia. So there is a much broader set of work that, that they're doing other than the bilateral negotiations. But that's all work geared around the Yes, it, the, the branch is, uh, is about 12, 13 people yeah. at the moment. And right. I, I okay. think it's fair to say, Senator Keneally, that uh, our posts are very important in this as well. They've done a lot of, a lot of activity. At and the posts are engaged yeah. as well. Yeah, so you've engaged. got yeah. about a dozen people in Australia and overseas posts working on the program. Yeah, on the, the negotiations. On the yeah. negotiations, the design of the program and the like. I, I, I suppose my, then, it leads me to wonder why this is the best use of our resources in the Southeast, in Southeast Asia, given that, you yeah, know, the Pacific labor schemes, the Palm schemes remain, you have primacy, there's 55,000 pre-screened, we're only going to have a, a small number relative um, coming on the ag visa. I'm just trying to understand again the relative return on investment. Um, yeah, look on that, Senator. I think the small number is at the outset, which we often do on programs mm. to test the design, to mm. test that it's doing what the government would like it to do. So mm. I would expect those numbers to increase over time. Mm subject to demand in Australia. So the but small... But not grow larger than the Pacific... Correct. ...the Palm schemes. And as Ms Heineke uh, mentioned earlier, the Palm scheme is growing at quite a substantial rate mm. uh, to 25,000 by March. Mm. So the demand in Australia at the moment is still large uh, mm. for those workers. So you sure, know, I, think, I think we'll I just have to see over time how that all plays out. I suppose, Mr. McEwen and uh, McDonald, I apologise. Um, this is not a criticism to you, but this has been pitched in some. Percept There's been a perception around this basis that it will be, it will resolve the current issues of workforce shortages, and it appears that it will not because it's not yet operational. And even once it's operational, it will still it will have a, a significant. Um, uh, build up or, or lead in time before it builds up to anything that resembles a substantial number of people, workers coming here? I don't think you can say definitively that it won't end up a substantial amount of workers. But it's not going to resolve this year's harvest or even next year's harvest? Uh, I don't think you can forecast into next year's harvest. I think, uh, as I said earlier, the negotiations with Indonesia are proceeding and will be completed hopefully soon. Mm. And then the visa will, will be able to become operational. So and that's one country in a program that is going to be capped and in a program that is going to supply a substantially fewer number of workers than the Pacific Labor programs. Yeah, and certainly initially, and that's not different to the Pacific program when mm. it commenced with smaller numbers. So. Mm. Any program commences that way. Mm. Th that's right, Senator. I think um, Ms. Heineke referred earlier to um, the uh, start-up, if you like, of, uh, of the Pacific s schemes themselves, particularly the Pacific Labor Scheme. Yes, which was... Uh, yes. And we have seen those grow in size, and I expect um, progressively the agriculture visa will do the same. But it's a new program, yep. and, as you know, in the migration system. Um, it is complex, and um, we're working very hard on that consultation uh, okay. as well. Senator, if I can just add on the start-up, um, we have worked uh, in designing this very closely with an industry stakeholder group. We've had very extensive consultation mm. with a number of bodies, including unions. Mm. But on the stakeholder group um, in particular, we've worked uh, with this group of stakeholders, which includes um, National Farmers Federation, mm. um, also organisations like Australian, for Australian Fresh Produce Alliance, um, Ausveg, and, and the Improved Employers Association and the Meatworks Association, um, their preference has actually been to work with us to get the settings right. Um, mm. And we've, in working with them, it's been very clear that we, we, we will look at a scale up over time. So it will be a gradual mm. scale up. We were looking at an initial phase um, to test the settings, mm. which will then allow us to scale up 
as more countries come, as some countries start to come on board. Mm. Okay. Uh, this might be premature since we don't actually have any agreements in place yet. So, but is, can you give any indication of how DFAT is planning to administer um, this program once it is operational? That is, are you, will you need to recruit additional staff? Uh, Senator, we, we will be employing a similar model to what we have for the Pacific Labor Schemes, and that is that we will, as I said before, we'll have an offshore contractor mm. that, that has experience um, working in Asian countries. Mm. Um, we're in the, in the midst of that process at the moment. Um, we'll also have an onshore provider that will provide some of the services that I outlined before in the assurance and welfare space um, right. that will have that responsibility, but the department will also have staff members um, in the team that play some of the, the, the relationship, um, risk escalation, um, policy, mm. adaption of the policy and whole of government work, um, stakeholder management mm. that will happen in the department. So it will be a mix of delivery model, hybrid but, delivery model. So does DFAT, just explain this to me again, I'm trying to, rec does DFAT have the responsibility for enforcing um, compliance with the rules and conditions of the visa? So similar to the Pacific Labor Mobility Schemes, uh, we have a deed which we have, which yep. we will have in place as well for the Ag Visa, and that sets okay. out our requirements. It provides what we expect from an assurance perspective. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's required to be in line with the various awards that mm. the different um, employment contracts are made under. But yes, we will have that responsibility. We will outsource. Um, right particularly in the assurance welfare space, we will yep. we will outsource that to the private sector through the procurement that it will be underway shortly. And has any new funding been allocated to the department? Yes, uh, in my FO process, um, there was 87.2 million across four years um, allocated across government. Uh, I can find the table with our specifics in it for DFAT. find that right now, but DFAT was allocated, it's in here somewhere, Is this it's around about 50 over the four years with a scale up over time, but I can take that on notice. So it is in the MyEFO documents. So this is the agriculture visa? Yeah. Yeah. 87 so across government. Yeah, so is this page 18 of the additional estimates document? Oh, okay. I think we've got to add both the departmental and the administered on together. Yep. So that it's in the uh, document where there's a, a, an, an amount of money for the administered annual approach, uh, which is uh, 13, 17, 30, 45, about 47 across the Fords and Australian agriculture visa for the departmental, which is about 14 across the Fords. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Oh, Chair. Senator Van, I've concluded my question. Any other Labor? I do have a series of questions, yes. Then. Okay, okay. Senator Rose. Thanks very much. I. Um, I have some questions about the ADA budget and just wanted to follow up on a questions on notice uh, response to Senator Wong um, on ODA budget. Um, we'll get the officers to the table on the ODA. Thank you, Secretary. Thanks. Kathy Klagman, Deputy Secretary, Development and Multilateral Group. Senator, I'm being joined also by my colleague who will be able to help you with some answers. Great. Together, we can help you with some very answers. Very good, thank you very much. I, um, I've reviewed the uh, response that the department provided Senator Wong um, 
think the 28th of October 2021. Um, is the department able to provide an update to its response to each of those questions? I think we've traditionally gone through a similar process at previous estimates. Can you remind us what? Yes, okay, if you don't have it in front of you, um, the, first, um, the, the first set of responses is, really goes to the pause in the ongoing base ODA, and then it sets out what the impact of indexation is gonna be over 2021, 22, 22, 23, and ongoing financial years. So, sorry, Senator. Is it, would it help if I tabled the? Yeah, can you? Sorry, we, do you know which number it is again? Sorry, I think I've got the wrong yeah. one. Oh, so this was at budget hearings, not at the supplementary budget hearings. Yes. Okay. So I think so. Hearings, so. So, but the title of my document here is just Senator Wong ODA budget, 28 October 2021 responses. All right, 28 October, and and the question. Uh, I don't have a question on notice. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, let me see. At tw Supplementary budgets estimates in October, so it must yep. have been handed up. Okay, so it was supplementary budget. We'll just. Yes. Uh, Rod's got it. Well, what, let, let me see if I can walk you through it without. Um, He's good. Yeah. Without you having it in front of you, is that? Uh, hi, Senator uh, Rod Hilton, first assistant secretary for development policy division. I don't have the exact, but I think I know exactly what you're getting at, which yeah. is just to walk through the the adjusted forward estimates for the total ODA budget. Um, are there adjusted forward estimates that are an update that could be provided today? Uh, yes, yes, they were adjusted and they were uh, highlighted in the PAES, so we can provide that update. I'm happy to read through the figures or Thank I can you. provide that on notice. Yes, terrific. Yep. Could Should you I do that? So for um, uh, the, uh, the current Current year, I'm just getting the, sorry, the right chart. So for for our current, fina uh, fina the, the current financial year. Yes. Uh, the baseline uh, ODA remains uh, 4 billion. Yep. Temporary measures are on top of that remain 329.11 with a total ODA for 2122. Uh, being 4329.11. For 22, the financial year 22-23. Yes. The baseline ODA uh, is 4088.7 billion. Temporary measures above that, 179 million for a total ODA in financial year 22-23 <coughs> of 4267.7 billion. Thank you. For 23-24, baseline ODA of 4199 billion, uh, million, 4.19 billion. Yep. Temporary measures on top of that, 106.47. For a total ODA in that financial year of 4305.47. Four, three, four, three, yeah. seven. Seven. So I know these, these um, to, so the commitment to resume indexing is still being followed through in terms of the base component, but effectively, uh, there are some updates, that, so those figures are somewhat different to uh, the figures that Senator Wong was provided in October, but not substantially different. Yes. I think there's a decline in one year and an uplift in another, but essentially the trajectory is for this year and next year, uh, substantial cuts uh, in our total aid budget. No. No. Well, we go from uh, a total a total amount in 21-22, put aside last year, 4329. 22-23-4267, and then we start to see some upward movement in 
If we put the temporary measures and the, and the base measures together, that's what we effectively get, isn't it? So as, as we measure the ODA budget, uh, Senator, we rely on the figures in the baseline ODA. And as mm -hmm. you can see there, they are increasing in line with the, the government's commitment to index that budget over those forward estimates. So the, yeah, the, the pause stops in terms of the base the pause stops, yes. figure. Um, but the overall figure, the combined effect of a period of pausing plus, plus a number of these programs the temporary programs concluding, the overall impact of that is a, a fall this year and a fall next year, and then an uplift in 23-24, if you, if you put the, the base and the temporary programs together. The base continues to be $4 billion, Senator. Yes. Which the government has been quite explicit about. Yeah, I think we're agreeing. You just don't want to characterise it as a cut. Because it's not. Well, the base has been paused and then indexed. Uh, the temporary programs are there and then they're reducing. The combined effect of those two things is that the overall expenditure on the overseas uh, development assistance budget reduces so next the baseline, year. The baseline ODA has um, we talked about before on multiple occasions. Yep. It's four billion dollars. Uh, events of COVID, um, in particular, and overwhelmingly, have uh, have uh, required the supplementation that we've talked about. Whether it's in the context of partnerships for recovery or the vaccine and health security initiative or um, the economic impacts of COVID-19 in Southeast Asia through a range of things. The government has always been very clear about what the base is and continues to be uh, in terms of it being uh, a very targeted and focused overseas development assistance program, Senator. Yeah, we're only arguing about how it's characterised. I, I see an overall expenditure in overseas aid that decreases um, over uh, last year, this year and the coming year. Um, you, you want to point to the base component and say that is only frozen. The, the truth is since 2014, there's been a cut. I'll review these figures, but somewhere between 11 and $12 billion in the government's commitment here, hasn't there? We've discussed this many times, Senator, and uh uh, including with um, with your colleague uh, Senator Wong, and uh, indicated that um, the government has uh, has planned and set um, the the four billion dollar baseline in a way which we think is uh, is targeted and focused and affordable uh, within the uh, the context of the full budget. Well, let's just look at a couple of these uh, temporary measures. Then the COVID nineteen Pacific response package support to the Pacific and Timor-Leste. The, the development outlook in the Pacific and Southeast Asia has worsened, not got better. Are we still terminating that program this financial year? Governor will make the government will make those decisions in due course, Senator. They're part of, as you would imagine, budget processes. Well, there's, a, there's, a, there's no prospect of that in the forwards that were provided to Senator Wong, um, is, there, um, is there some change in the government's position in terms of that temporary measure? Well, I'm sorry, I'm not sure what you mean, Senator. Well, well the information that we were provided with was um, $200 million in 2021, $100 million in 2122, zero in 2223. Well, Senator, the government will make budget decisions in the normal course, as you would expect, uh, in relation to uh, to these matters. Um, I think there was there is a, a strong record of our commitment to the Pacific, which again, uh, we've discussed through these hearings and many preceding hearings, uh, including in the context of the Pacific step up, uh, and that commitment absolutely continues. So I just, just want to understand what you're saying. Last year when this was dealt with, there is no provision for 22-23, but I don't want to put this any more highly than this. 
that the government is considering its position in relation to that. Is that right? Well, we, there... would, we would always do that, Senator, in terms of uh, what further commitments need to be made, of course. Yeah, there's a difference between a sort of um, catch-all, uh, you know, we can always consider everything, um, but is there some is there some active consideration of um, that line item being extended beyond what what is what the the message that's been sent to the aid community and to the region is that program terminates this financial year? So, Senator, I'm not going to engage in um, pre-budget speculation, uh, and um, uh, you, you may expect me to, but I won't. Similarly, the um, support to the Pacific and Southeast Asian countries scheduled to terminate in 22-23. My response, same, same my response would be similar. And again, in terms of the, uh, the commitment we've, commitments we've uh, made uh, in Southeast Asia in particular in response uh, again to uh, COVID uh, response and recovery uh, have uh, it affirmed uh, our commitment uh, to the region, reinforced our commitment uh, to the region, uh, and that is uh, that is something that the government's been very clear about. Is that just the chickens are coming home to roost in terms of you know uh, the, the impact of an 11, somewhere between 11 and 12 billion dollar cut in foreign aid, is is now having an impact, isn't it? Uh, well, Senator, I think it's rhetorical, to be honest, um, because uh, for the period of time uh, in which I have held this role, I have been consistent in, uh, in articulating the government's position in relation to that $4 billion base uh, and uh, the work that we have done uh, in the uh, last two calendar years uh, <coughs> in relation to, to health, health security, partnerships for recovery, COVID response, vaccine distribution, uh, vaccine uh, administration support or delivery support, I should say. Um, those, uh, all of those initiatives um, are a clear indication of our, uh, of our strong commitments with our partners uh, on what is the most difficult issue that we have faced uh, in this region in generations. Yeah, and there's, there's the likelihood of long-term economic scarring in some of the countries in the region because of the impact, the, the um, sustainable development goal set an objective of the eradication of extreme poverty by 2030. If we just consider our region, has DFAT done some analysis about what would be required uh, to reach the goal of eradicating extreme poverty by 2030? Senator, we're constantly assessing and reviewing um, needs in the region. That's one of the reasons why uh, this year our record $1.44 billion contribution in ODA to the Pacific um, is such an important part of our programs. Uh, and we work with uh, international counterparts, uh, with all of the multilateral agencies uh, in these assessments all the time, Senator, yeah, constantly. Yeah, in fact, not... Ms Klugman's uh, um, area of, uh, of the department uh, is uh, very very much engaged, as you would expect, uh, on all of these, not just here in Australia, but uh, in um, the, the multilateral centres in New York, in Geneva uh, and elsewhere. Yeah, I understand other, other partners are engaged in our region, but if the objective well, we deliver that people a lot have signed up to, as you know, yeah, that, uh, as well. in, in conjunction, there are partnerships in, engaged in some of these projects, some of them we, we are on our own. But if the objectives that we've signed up to are the eradication of extreme poverty by 2030, um, what, what analysis has the department done to determine whether or not, uh, in conjunction with our partners, whether we're meeting that objective in the region? Well, as I, as I said, Senator, this is, that's core business. That's what we do all the time. So, d Secretary, is that, is that, what's the nature of that work? Is that, I hesitate to use the word gap analysis, but the gap between what our objective is and, and what is likely to occur. Um. Senator, as the sustainable development goals are a really important motivating force behind the yep. development uh, cooperation program, we've done a few work over the last couple of years to um, take account of the COVID situation. 
um, uh, and with the coming of the Partnerships for Recovery Framework to translate the, the SDGs into our Partnerships for Recovery. We can come back to you on notice if you wish with some of the detail of that work that's been done. Uh, you're quite right, um, particularly in light of the economic uh, and other damage done by COVID-19, but also before that, uh, there, some uh, countries in our region were struggling to achieve the progress they wanted to achieve against the SDGs. Yep. Uh, we are in very active dialogue with each of those governments, particularly but not only in the uh, Pacific. Um, and the SDGs continue to be a really important touch point for, for us. So if you're able to provide that, that on, on notice, that, uh, and, and that deals with the other objectives of education, healthcare, All uh, of gender the, equality. Yeah, the sustainable yes. development goals. All yeah. of the SDGs. Where, where do we currently rank uh, amongst the OEC Development Assistance Committee donor countries in terms of ODA assistance as a proportion of gross national income? I don't have a ranking with me, Senator, but I. I'm Can you tell me where we were notice. in 2020 and 2021 in terms of our ODA to GNI ratio? We'll come back to you on that, Senator. You don't have any additional information? Um, I've already taken it on notice, Senator. I'm just surprised that officers wouldn't be in a position at the table to tell me what our current overseas to uh, um, ODA to GNI ratio is. Well, I want to make sure that we provide all the correct information to you, Senator. The officers are always helpful to this committee, always. It's not the officers on. Well, remain surprised, Senator, and ask the next question. Mm. Feel free to reflect on me any time you like, Senator. The, uh, well, I didn't do that. Um, the, uh, the Centre for Global Development's 21 a 2021 Commitment to Development Index ranked Australia 27th out of 40 countries. Um, looking at traditional OECD donor countries, we're ranked 21st out of 22 countries on development finance. Doesn't that, doesn't that diminishing position for Australia over time reflect the chickens coming home to roost in terms of our that reduction since 2014 of our commitment so, on overseas aid? Senator, I don't agree with your characterisation, and I think Ms Clugman's going to add to that. Senator, um, three times. Mr Hilton might have something to say about the specific right. league tables that you're talking about, mm. but one thing that we find um, is a really important um, factor in understanding those league tables is that we're often being compared against countries that do a great deal of lending under their aid program. Uh, our aid program, our development cooperation program, as you know, Senator, is, uh, has been traditionally and, and uh, either exclusively or preponderantly a grant aid program. Yeah. So I think that's actually quite an important factor to take into account when you're looking at these sort of league tables. Well, in, in my UFO, the, um, the government provided just over $160 million over nine years for the Comprehensive Strategic Partnership with ASEAN. Will any of that funding be uh, ODA? Yes, a portion of that is ODA. Senator. And how does that work? How, how is that portion Depends allocated? what it's being spent on. So in conformity with the DAC guidelines? Correct. And assessed against the DAC guidelines? And does that mean all you can say at this stage about that is that a, a portion of it will, because there's some in the sort of beyond the forwards? Yes, uh, well... It, it, is it possible to determine now how much of that will be allocated, or is that something that can't be determined at this stage? We have some indicative figures, um, but always with these things, you only really know... Could you provide those on notice? Sure. Um, Scholarships to support ASEAN students. Are scholarships for students from developing countries yes. li likely to be ODA? Yes. yes. Um, there's our 
The MAIFO measure international economic support includes a loan of 250 million IMF special drawing rights. I think that's about nearly, nearly half a billion dollars Australian. And a further contribution of 36 million special drawing rights to the um, IMF Poverty Reduction and Growth Trust. I understand it's a Treasury measure, but the question for DFAT, I suppose, is is a, is a portion of those special drawing rights, loans and contributions ODA? Senator, I understand that it, there is a proportion. I'd have to take it on notice and get back so, to the So the answer proportion. is a proportion, and yes. you'll be able to come back to me yeah. on notice with a little bit more information yeah. about that. Um, I think the IMF made a general allocation of SDRs to member countries in August last year. According to the IMF's website, that included $6.3 billion, billion SDRs issued to Australia. Is that, is that correct? I, I'd need to check that. Senator, that is a Treasury. Treasury lead, but we can check and come back to you. And is the Australian government considering channeling further SDRs to assist developing countries beyond the 286 million? The Australian that government has recently made a decision to allow that to happen. Uh, the question of whether, so I don't know where your briefing takes you up to. Um, yeah. and, and as I said, that's a Treasury lead. But uh, we can take on notice what we've done so far and what might be contemplated for future reallocations yeah, of SDRs. So what, what mechanisms for redistributing as Australia's holdings are under examination? It's done through the IMF and our participation as a member of the IMF. And as I said, that's led by the Treasury. And there's a 100 billion target, I think, that's been that's my uh, understanding. What, what does Australia regard as our fair share of that undertaking? I'll have to take that on notice, Senator. So the G20 summit in October set a target, set the target that I just outlined. Mm -hmm. So that's, that is 15% of the additional IMF SDR allocation last year, so our contributions I suspect you'll take this on notice as well, but the, the Australian contributions are 286 SDRs to the IMF Poverty Reduction and Growth Trust is 4.5% of Australia's additional SDR allocation last year. It seems in the absence of some change, we're lagging. I'll what? have to take that on notice, Senator. Yes, if you could take the detail on notice, Minister, what, why are we why are we behind the pace there? Um, Senator, I didn't hear all of, uh, of your question and I did hear Ms Klugman say uh, that she would uh, take that on notice. So let me review the Hansard and I'll come back to you. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Senator. Chair, I have a yep. few short questions and I think Senator Kitchen asked those questions. Uh, in a moment of weakness, I agreed that Senator Rice could have the last five minutes. Uh, as in from 5.55, so you have 20 minutes. Okay, thank you. I, I think I'll be rather quick. I just want to return to the um, matter that Senator Fawcett raised about Mr Chow Van Cam, and I appreciate the information that was provided in response to his questions. Um, Minister, uh, you did travel to Vietnam last November. Did you have the opportunity there to raise Mr. Chow's case with your counterparts? Um, Senator, my recollection is that in that discussion this morning, I indicated that I raised um, Mr. Cam's case with the uh, Prime Minister in Vietnam, with the Foreign Minister in Vietnam, and with the Home Affairs Equivalent Minister, whose title I don't have. Terrific. Front of mind. Thank you. And I do apologise. There was part of it I was dealing with another matter. Um, so that's helpful. Um, and what was the response received? Did you indicate that this morning as well? Um, Senator, uh, not just those representations, but representations uh, we have made mm -hmm. here in Canberra uh, and in Hanoi uh, through uh, our post um, are received, are noted, and um, we seek to have them actioned. Mm -hmm. 
and the Australia-Vietnam Human Rights Dialogue on the 8th of December 2021. What was Mr. Chow's case raised in that forum? Yes, sir. Yes, and, and uh, how often does the department provide updates to Mr. Chow's family? I would have to come back to you on the exact mm. frequency, Senator, but we are in regular contact with uh, Mr. Kam's family, yes. And um, have we had confirmation that he has been vaccinated for COVID? Yes, we have. Right, so, and any, you know, I understand that uh, you may not have visibility of this, but you know the current prospects for his release. Senator, I don't think we can speculate um, mm. on on that. Um, we are advocating, given his age, mm. and, and I don't wish to breach any privacy obligations that the department holds in our consular um, role either. But mm. we are advocating, well aware of the circumstances um, in uh, in which um, uh, Mr. Cam. Uh, finds himself, uh, by virtue of his age and other factors, we're advocating um, for his release. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, I'm uh, yes. happy to cede, my, cede some to, to some Senator some... Kitching. Thank you. Could the I ask birthday you? girl. <laughs> so so the, the cake was misleading. Yes, yes. yes. Um, Senator we are all bitterly disappointed. Senator Abetz yeah. asked for a black fresh. Got a cappuccino, <laughs> but. <laughs> Um, could I ask about Mr. Puna and just in relation to um, his stepping aside and whether we've uh, been involved in those negotiations? Ask Mr. McDonald to come to the table, Senator. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Senator Kitching. How are you? I'm well, thank you. How are you? Good. Um, this was in relation Mr. to Mr. the speculation Puna, around Mr. Yes. Puna. And your question was what involvement? Yes. What, have we been involved in the negotiations around his stepping aside? No, those negotiations or discussions, as it would be put, uh, would be led by the chair of the PIF, which is Fiji. So, so we, we haven't we, had any, we've had no involvement? No, Al, um, right through Senator, we've been advocating for unity of the PIF mm -hmm. and wanting the PIF to remain together. Uh, so uh, whatever uh, is decided as a result of the discussions that occur would require a consensus agreement amongst the PIF countries and we're supporting that. And of course, uh, the pause, that was announced recently is something uh, we're very supportive of to allow the discussions to, to continue. Uh, there's also been a lot of advocacy about unity and staying together by Prime Minister, Minister for Foreign Affairs, Minister for International Development in the Pacific and, and officials. Uh, yeah, and, and Ms Pete might want to add to that, but Hello. that's my summary. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator. Elizabeth Peake, Deputy Head of the Office of the, the Pacific. Uh, just to, to add to Mr McDonald's um, answers, uh, on the, the 12th of February, the Federated States of Micronesia indicated yes. that it would pause its withdrawal from the forum. And of course, that's a, a welcome development. That provides time for the negotiations to retain PIF Pacific Island Forum unity to, to proceed. Uh, those negotiations are ongoing uh, and Fiji as a Pacific Island Forum chair is, is absolutely in, in the lead on that and we support uh, Fiji uh, progressing those negotiations. Thank you. Um, look, I probably don't have any more questions on that but I do want to go to um, evidence given uh, by the ABC Managing Director in relation to um, programs they're doing in the Indo-Pacific and um, countering a, right, a rise in um, Chinese media in the region. I'm not sure whether you saw his, oh, you saw his comments. Um, could I just ask, so firstly, just an overview of the 
uh, arrangements you've arrived, the DFAT has arrived at with the ABC, and then, uh, you know, is the, is the purpose of that to counter an increase in Chinese media? Thank you for your question, Senator. We've had a long-standing engagement in the Pacific media sector uh, for, for many years. In fact, uh, our arrangements with the ABC, our support through our development program of ABC International's engagement to strengthen the media sector have been long-standing, uh, indeed 14 years long. Uh, our engagement uh, with the ABC uh, supports a range of media activities. Um, journalist training um, to support the independence of journalists, supports media infrastructure, and importantly supports uh, the development of local Pacific content. Uh, that, uh, as I say, has had a long-standing um, engagement of 14 years. It's now in its third phase, uh, which um, will uh, conclude uh, at, the, at the end of 2022, and uh, we would then look to, to proceed uh, to a new phase. And um, would you look to increase the ABC's presence, or, well, to the programs that are involved in that? Would you look to expand those? Uh, as we go through each new phase of, of any development program, we take into account um, the new circumstances that we face, we take into account the effectiveness of uh, the previous programs, and we uh, look to, um, to improve every time. Um, so the, the particular design of the next phase would be a matter uh, for the design process as we go forward. Senator, uh, sorry, I was going to say, Senator, I understand the context of, of your question and, um, and uh, the evidence that was uh, given last night, which I've read about, I didn't see. Um, but I think it is also important, as, as Ms Peake has reminded us, that we have been engaged in this work for uh, a long time now. Uh, and I think it's a combination of uh, supporting um, a resilient and independent Pacific media. Uh, which is not always comfortable with the Pacific either, uh, but it is very important and we acknowledge and, and recognise that. I've been on the receiving end of some of their uh, um, questioning uh, in a number of countries around yeah. the Pacific, only to find they were trained by Australians <laughs> and through our development program uh, for their forensic uh, approach, um, but also um, amplifying Australian voices in the mm. Pacific and reinforcing the partnership uh, that, uh, that, that exists between, uh, between Australia and, uh, and those countries. So I welcomed um, uh, hearing of uh, David Anderson's uh, comments that the ABC was looking at ways to expand uh, its, uh, its presence, and I understand um, they've uh, communicated with, with government, uh, and that will obviously be considered. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sorry, Ewan? Uh, the 550, Senator Van would like the call for a few minutes before Senator Rice. Okay, thank you. Look, I was just going to just add a small thing, Senator, which you might be interested in, which is the Pacific Oz TV initiative the government put in place uh, as well for three years, which is a, a $17 million program that rolls out Australian content into the region. Uh, and the three, the three most popular shows there have been around um, The Voice, uh, sea change and 60 minutes actually so yeah so there's content getting out there through the government's initiative that initiatives run through infrastructure department could I do you, do we have a breakdown on so you know what percentage uh, of uh, media in the region would be Australian what percentage would be uh, Chinese what would percentage would be um, you know from from the island nations of the Indo-Pacific. Do we, uh, is that possible? In a poss terms of the volume of voice, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure, Senator. Yeah, we can I, check. Senator, Thank I would you. say it does vary country to country, right, in terms of that. Um, so we, we can have a look at it, but it's probably not something we have readily available, mm -hmm. but we could take it on notice and have a look. Yeah, thank you, that'd be great. Thank you. I'm just seeing how, okay, I've got five minutes mm. left. So I might just, while we're in the region, uh, I'll go to the under the undersea cable, the Micronesian undersea cable.
Could I just ask, um, were there institutional mechanisms which were involved in bringing the six countries together uh, in order to do, the, to do this cabling? Uh, yes. Uh, the, the East Micronesia cable is designed to connect Kiribati, Nauru and um, the Federated States of Micronesia to the, the Hantru cable. It, uh, it's the, the mechanisms that we've used are, are twofold. One, consulting, of course, with the, uh, these three countries, most importantly, and in, ensuring that they were comfortable with the, with the design of the cable. And, and secondly, consulting with our um, trilateral infrastructure partnership um, colleagues, that is US and Japan, to arrange the financing for, for that. Um, you may know that the Foreign Minister announced that, uh, along with um, uh, the, her Foreign Ministerial colleagues from US and, and Japan and leaders from the three Pacific Island countries, that, that we would be proceeding with the East Micronesia Cable. And uh, negotiations are, are very active to finalise the financing agreements. Um, do you have a cost yet? Uh, we are, we are finalising that at the moment in terms of um, the, the absolute details of that, but we uh, are working in an envelope, um, but we, we usually disclose that at the time of the financing agreement uh, in order not to prejudice the negotiations. I was going to ask you how much Australia would contribute, but can you give me a percentage, if not a cost? Uh, that's still to be negotiated, okay. Senator, but as soon, uh, like all projects under the um, Australian Infrastructure Financing Facility for the Pacific, um, once the financing <coughs> agreements are struck, uh, those details that be will become public. And it is through that mechanism? It, it is, is from the Australian perspective, yes. Is, have you got timing for the project? Uh, so, so I guess when it's expected to be commencing and then ending? I would have to take, take that one on notice, Senator. The first step uh, for us, the one that we're, we're um, working very hard towards, is closing the financing. At that point, there will be a procurement process. Uh, and so we're then, at the beginning of this? Yeah, we're, yes. at the, we're at the beginning. That's correct. Okay. I was struck in Palau um, recently, uh, December, I think, um, I where we... Struck, I said, struck. but um, <laughs> but, uh, but but as it happens, Senator Vieira Vieira of Andy Wells, I was also stuck in Palau um, by cyclone conditions as well. So it was one of those strange experiences. Um, I was struck, but however, by um, at the sod turn uh, of the Palau cable for the landing site, um, the. Uh, quite extraordinary enthusiasm, um, not just of the of the leadership, but uh, at community level, uh, particularly young people who realise what a transformative um, effect it can have on their education systems, um, health professionals on on health systems, um, and that again is a trilateral infrastructure partnership program between Australia, Japan and the United States. I don't have the sums for that uh, with me, but it may be worth, um, through you, Chair, um, doing a, an AIFFP and uh, infrastructure in the Pacific update to the committee. I think you'd find it very interesting. That would be great. Yeah. Happy to offer that. Thank you. And we'd be very happy to accept. Thank you. That would be and I think your deputy accepted for you, Chair. Yes, yeah, so, so, so it seems. It's her birthday, though. She's <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, all, it's, it's a good committee. I just get run roughshod all the time. <laughs> okay. right, I think I'm, I'm on 5.50. Yep. Done. Senator Vane, five <laughs> minutes. Thank you, Chair. Um, could the department outline some of the results that we've achieved in the, in the Pacific and Southeast um, through our additional COVID-related support, um, both in health and economic terms? So, Senator Ewan McDonald, um, I can talk about Pacific. Of course. Uh, in terms of what's been achieved there, our contribution has been substantial. We talked uh, a little bit, I think, uh, with other officers about the government's agreement to temporary funding uh, of $300 million uh, into the region. That's been extremely important in terms of particularly uh, frontline workers being paid, as you can imagine, Senator Van, uh, the impact on vulnerable groups has been significant. Uh, we're concerned about um, other unintended consequences of shutting the border, 
uh, a lot of these countries we're, we're also concerned about in terms of just enabling their frontline workers to go to work by getting paid. So the government uh, agreed to, to that package, which has been extremely important. We've also delivered uh, around about, I think, three million vaccines into the region or thereabouts. I can be corrected on that, but it's that sort of figure. Uh, which has resulted in a country, for example, which you'd be interested in Fiji, for example, uh, double vaccinated up into the 90% range, uh, now going through their third wave and coming out of Omicron, open tourism coming back in. Uh, so we've seen some of the contributions that we've made with like-minded countries in the region that's starting to pay dividends. Um, and, and it hasn't just been vaccines and the financial support, it's so been other health support, hasn't it? Yeah, it has. It's been the complete spectrum. So in some uh, countries, we've inserted uh, health experts into the country to assist. It's been all the P PPE that goes with that. And Australia, uh, when it goes into these countries, uh, uses what we call wraparound services, but it's basically the complete uh, the, the vaccines or the PPE getting to where they need to in a country. You think about a country like Solomon Islands trying to get it out sure. into those. So it's been a, a very extensive contribution package from the government. And other non-ODA instruments such as loans and defence cooperation, how has that complemented our development assistance? Yes, yeah, so uh, as was just talked about, Senator Van, in terms of AIFFP, I think it would be good to get a, a good sure. briefing on those, but we're be. very conscious of those loans assisting with some of the economic growth you would want to see come back into these countries. So like Australia, trying to generate jobs and um, economic opportunity, particularly where there's such large uh, young populations. So that's a factor that we're building into those projects as well. Uh, thank you, Ms. Klugman. Did you want to add anything to that? Ms. Klugman, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, I think uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. McDonald has, has um, set it out very clearly. I guess the only contribution <clears throat> additionally that I can make usefully is just to talk about a little bit about partnerships for recovery. So that's the minister's framework under which all of these things have been rolling out. As you say, that's a, that's a framework uh, purpose-built for a COVID circumstance. Um, it has three pillars. One is indeed health security, you mentioned. Uh, stability and economic recovery uh, are very much part of that. Some of the temporary target, targeted and supplementary me measures that the government has announced and has rolled out uh, last year and this year are uh, very much focused on hitting uh, those pillars. Uh, on economic recovery, um, in particular, I think the, the work that we've done through the program and building on decades of, um, of partnership with, for example, Pacific governments uh, through budget support and really putting our efforts behind the, the, the governments of the Pacific so that they can make sure uh, they, they are, are best able to make decisions about priorities uh, in, in delivering their um, services to, to their people, uh, but also in current circumstances with a particular focus on health systems, on other basic services, on payment for uh, health workers, for uh, uh, police and other essential workers, uh, all of this has been part and parcel of what we've achieved through partnerships for, for recovery. There's Thank a very you, strong, yeah. the last thing I'll say, um, particularly sitting next to uh, Senator Payne, uh, she, <laughs> would, um, she would scowl at me if I didn't point out that... She uh, scowls. <laughs> well, she should I've been accused of glaring, not a lot of scowling. <laughs> she should scowl at, uh, scowl at me if I don't point out that um, gender equality um, mm -hmm. is in a very material way. Uh, supporting women, their children and the most vulnerable, people with disabilities, in everything we do under all of those three pillars of Partnerships for Recovery has been front and centre and a key cross-cutting theme, as we say in the game. Very important measures. Thank you, Chair.
Thanks. Senator Rice, take us home. Yeah, look, I've just got a few follow-up questions on Myanmar. Um, Minister, you mentioned early that you'd engage with the Future Fund shareholder ministers about US sanctions on Myanmar. I said uh, I'd written to them, I think, Senator, or engaged with them. I can't remember what term I used. <laughs> I think I've got the, the transcript that you said I have engaged yep. and that DFAT was going to engage with the Future Fund. And I just want a bit more information if you could help us out. So, had, do, so have you met with the shareholder ministers, Birmingham and Frydenberg, about this issue? Um, I've raised it with them, Senator. I don't think there's been a specific meeting on this issue. But of course, as the finance minister and the treasurer, I meet with them all the time. Yes, but on this issue. Not yes. a specific meeting, no, Senator. OK. And we're, so we were aware now of one instance of the Future Fund divesting from a company. Has there been a broader process of identifying companies which the Future Fund should potentially divest from? Uh, do you mean by DFAT? By DFAT, yes. Uh, Senator, I don't believe so. Um, the Future Fund has uh, its own um, processes, as you know. It invests independently from uh, government. It has a policy on uh, environmental, social and governance matters, as I understand it. Um, and so in seeking to provide briefings from DFAT uh, in the context of that, of that existing governance framework, uh, I, am, I was reaching out to my colleagues to say that DFAT can provide further information uh, and further context um, to the Future Fund. Okay. I mean, you said in your and broadly, it's a matter for finance, ultimately. You, you said in your earlier evidence that DFAT is going to engage with the Future Fund and increase their engagement with the Future Fund in response to that. So I was wanting well, some more details about what that was going to be. So, Senator, when, um, when the Finance Minister responded to my cor correspondence, which was only earlier this month, uh, there was a welcoming of the offer of briefings by DFAT. Uh, and um, that process uh, has, has not commenced to the best of uh, my knowledge, uh, but ultimately it is, um, it is something which um, we are engaging on. So is there any more detail about what that engagement looks like? <clears throat> uh, Senator Andrew Goldznoski, First Assistant Secretary, Southeast Asia Regional Division. Um, as the minister said, this exchange between ministers has just taken place. Um, we're seized of that now. We're, uh, uh, prepared to begin the process of uh, putting together workshops with the um, Ministry of Finance to talk about any aspects of Myanmar that would help them to inform their decisions in how they relate with the super fund, uh, with the super fund in terms of their um, investment portfolio. Okay. And is DFAT going to assist them with potentially a list of companies which you think that, um, potentially should be divested from? I don't think we should speculate about what DFAT will and won't <laughs> provide, Senator. Um, this is a, is a, there a, a matter which is at the beginning of engagement between the department and the future fund. Um, but clearly there's a process that's begun. Is there an intention to, to be, for DFAT to be providing a list of companies or will you be leaving it up to the Department of Finance or the Future Fund to do their own research? It is ultimately a matter for the Department of Finance. And and I understand that, Minister, but I'm wanting to know what DFAT's engagement in that process is going to be. Well, we'll develop that, Senator, and perhaps it would be more productive to discuss it on the next occasion. Um, Minister... You said you'd get back to me about um, Minister Dutton attending the virtual ASEAN Australia Informal Defence Minister's meeting, which was on the 10th of November, which was attended by the Myanmar, a member of their Special Administrative Committee, um, Lieutenant General Mia Tun U, um, who says that he's now their Minister for Defence. He is sanctioned by the US, the UK, Canada and the EU, and New Zealand has imposed a travel ban on him. Um, I'd like to table three documents. One was um, a, tweet, a, screen, a tweet which included a screenshot taken at the meeting, the Myanmar News Agency report about the meeting, and in fact Minister, du um, Minister Dutton's own media release about the meeting. So I can table those. Um, is Ms. Minister, is Minister Dutton attending this meeting? Is this another example of a difference in approach between um, Minister Dutton and yourself when it comes to issues of diplomacy? Um, Senator, broadly speaking, uh, our, broadly speaking, I, I would suggest that, uh, sorry, Senator, let me start that again. 
In terms of the approach that the government takes and, uh, and that uh, agencies take, uh, is that in all meetings where a representative of Myanmar is present, we raise concerns about Myanmar actions. Not all of the meetings are in our control in terms of um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, those who are invited to attend. Um, they're not all run by us. ASEAN, for example, determines um, participation in its meetings. Uh, and uh, as you and I have discussed, engaging with ASEAN con continues to be a priority for us. In terms of Mr Dutton's um, uh, own engagement on this meeting, uh, I, I'll suggest that you refer that to Defence tomorrow. I'm not going to speak for, uh, for Defence in relation to this. I mean, I would have All expected right, that Minister... Can I just six. one final question? It is whether I would have expected that Minister Dutton's approach to diplomatic relationships to be in line with yours. Did Mr Dutton consult with you before attending this meeting? Senator, there are countless meetings across the ASEAN system yes. uh, all the time. But I'm specifically asking about this meeting, And Minister. I suggest you refer those matters to Defence tomorrow. I'm specifically right, asking whether Mr Dutton consulted I, with you. And, Senator, I've said... Can, uh, um, can I get an answer to no, that question, no, please, no, from Senator, your I've perspective, Minister? You have already asked the question. We've got an answer on the hand side. I haven't got that, an answer. I'm wondering whether the Minister's claiming public interest, interest Rice, immunity claim Senator over answering Rice. this question. Did Mr Dutton Senator consult Rice. with you before attending the meeting? Senator Rice, you will come to order. I've been more than agreeable with your request for time. You've gone well over time, and uh, the committee has now concluded its examination of the department's non-trade programs. I thank the officers for their attendance. The committee will now move to the examination of the department's trade programs. Can I again thank the officials? Thank you. And we'll have a short suspension. I haven't got it. Department of Trade or officers from the department with responsibility for the trade program. Minister, any opening statement? Uh, no, thank no, you, Chair. I assume in the absence of the secretary, no opening statement. So let's move to questions. Senator Rice has the call to start for the first five minutes and the stopwatch will be put on you this I time. I think it will Senator. be even less than five minutes, Oh, Chair. good. <laughs> You will um, make up for your sins early no, in the evening. Good. Um, I'm interested to know what the status of DFAT's feasibility study on strengthening trade with Israel is. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Senator. Tim Yeen, Associate Secretary, Trade uh, Investment in, in DFAT. Um, the, the, there has been a feasibility study done uh, on a possible uh, trade agreement with Israel. Um, it's something that um, the Minister is now considering on uh, next steps. Do we have a timeline? Uh, this is something we're still discussing with, with the Minister. 
So we don't have a, a precise timeline, but we are looking to move it ahead as, as quickly as we can. Okay, so the feasibility study is completed? Uh, that is correct. Yes. yes, and so it's basically discussions yes. with the Minister and no timeline on when things move ahead. Yep. Okay. Um, given the clear recommendations relating to trade and investment with the State of Israel provided by the UN Security Council, the UN Human Rights Council and international NGOs such as Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, has DFAT sought any external legal advice concerning issues associated with trade and investment with Israel? Uh, no, we haven't sought any uh, external legal advice, but we are in the process of briefing the minister and coming to a position on uh, the next steps with the, uh, with the, the proposed FTA. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. All right, thank you. Senator Kitching. I was going to go to LNG exports, but could I just ask um, the department for their views on the Abraham Accords and the normalisation of, of um, agreements with uh, that Israel has entered into with Bahrain, uh, the UAE, uh, I've forgotten the third one, and I think there was uh, going to be some, uh, there was potentially an agreement to be signed with Yemen, I think. Okay, th and, thanks, um, and so I might ask my yeah, colleague, Mr Innes Brown, to, uh, to answer Mr. that Innes Brown. question. Sure, thank, thank you. you, Senator. Yeah, uh, the, one of the other countries was Morocco. Morocco, thank and you. And I think there have been some tentative agreements with um, one or two other countries as well. So um, I think um, <clears throat> there have been uh, important and welcome developments in the region. Um, I think those steps have uh, uh, um, important for regional stability and, and the general sort of conduct and atmospherics of international relations in relation to the UAE. Those um, normalisation arrangements are probably uh, most advanced. And um, just uh, most recently, um, the President of Israel visited um, the UAE in a, quite an historic um, visit. And um, as I understand it, the, uh, shortly the uh, UAE Foreign Minister is planning to, to visit to visit Israel. And um, there's been quite an extensive, I think, or uh, from a small base, but a growing rapidly sort of um, connectivity between the two commercial sectors and uh, strong interest in, um, in uh, um, expanded cooperation in a, in a range of areas, but um, so um, very welcome, um, Senator. And uh, yeah, varying degrees of um, follow-up. As I said, I think the UAE, as I understand it, the UAE is the most advanced. And I think the um, Israeli Prime Minister was this week visiting Bahrain. Okay. Yes. So I think that's very good as well. Mm. Um, and obviously, um, there have been a reliable trading partner even before the normalisation of. Relations agreements, yes. Um, look, I might move on to LNG exports now. So I want to ask particularly in relation to the Russian-Ukrainian tensions. Thank you, Mr. Innes Brown. Thank you. Um, could I ask what advice did DFAT provide to the PMO and to ministers' offices prior to a government press release uh, on January the 26, 27? Senator, good evening. Michael Grouter, Assistant Secretary, Trade, Expansion, Diversification Branch. Um, I must admit I'm not familiar with the press release you're referring to, so I might need to grab uh, that and come yes. back. Bear with me. I'll, I'll give you a call. Sure. Do you want me just to, to give these to you, or I can table them? It might be, it might be helpful table. if you tabled yeah. them, Senator. Yeah. So one is entitled Australian LNG Ready to Aid Europe Over Ukrainian Crisis. And sorry, it's not a press release. It was a media conference uh, in Sydney on 27th January um, last. <coughs> Okay. 
Um, can I just ask? Um, I don't have the I don't have those documents in front of me now. But sure. when did DFAT provide this advice? I'd have to. I'll have a look if I can, and I think I'd have to take it on notice. I'm not aware of any advice we provided specifically to the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet on that, but I will have to take that on notice to yeah, be sure. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. Um, could I ask you? Did DFAT advise uh, on the advise on the model or the impact on Australian relations with our LNG buyers in Asia? So, did we advise them that we might be um, providing LNG to Europe? Again, I'd have to take okay. that on notice. Um, did we liaise with any LNG exporters? To the best of my knowledge, no, but again, on notice to okay. be sure. Um, did DFAT seek advice from outposts in the EU regarding the risk of LNG shortage prior to that, that announcement? And that also on notice, meeting? sorry. Yeah. No, 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 <laughs> it's all good. Is DFAT aware of any other LNG exporting nations making similar announcements? The... Um, we have seen discussions in, the in, in media uh, where the US, for example, is having discussions, I think, with Qatar is something we've yeah, seen. Yeah. Um, and also last week, from memory, uh, Japan had announced that it would look to, obviously not an exporter itself and an importer, but release some cargoes or um, supply from some of its reserves. But the details of that, I think, are still very much in the preliminary stages. But they're, they're some of the ones we've seen in the public domain. Uh is DF are you aware of any uh, formal requests to LNG exporters in Australia post this announcement? We're not aware of any formal requests, no. Um, are you aware of... Uh, so where there's LNG producers with long-term contracts in Asia, are you aware of those? And then if there was a supply to Europe, what that would do to those long-term contracts? I think our starting point would be that we would expect Australian... Obviously, these are commercial decisions, yes. not Australian yes. government-determined decisions, but our expectation would be that Australian producers would be looking to supply their long-term contracts in Asia in that way. Um, we value those very highly, as do the producers. They're obviously often foundational customers and obviously large investors as well in most of those. What decisions, the implications of those, we would not, I couldn't really comment on exactly Senator. how and would Senator, And Senator, if, if I could just add that, um, that the, the LNG issue is actually being, uh, uh, Department of Industry has responsibilities. So we're obviously um, involved with them and, and other uh, agencies, but uh, this is partly why we don't have the information at hand at, right. at the moment. Um, is there a, a committee formed? So is Senator, it as formal as that? Yeah, I think the minister spoke this morning that this matter had been uh, discussed at the National Security Committee of Cabinet, and so therefore the industry department has the lead on this matter, and okay. the industry portfolio, industry and resources ministers. Okay. I mean, I guess I, I'm asking from DFAT's point of view, yeah. Um, I might, I'm going to move on to... Um, well, I'm going to move on to the global COVID-19 supply chain. So has DFAT done modelling on the impact of the global COVID-19 supply chain crunch on the Australian economy? So I reckon we might, this might be with the other officers that we've just let go. Um, so, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Why don't I just, well, I'll go through the questions and then if you're able to answer, otherwise I can put them on notice. Yeah, that'd be great, sorry. Um, so, what, will, what liaison with, has the government had with regional economic partners to secure supply? So I think that is with our, um, our colleagues who have That's okay. left. Um, what, liaison, um, so what liaison has the government had with Five Eyes partners to secure supply? Uh, so uh, I, I know that we have information on that and we'll be able to answer that on notice okay. for you, Senator. Um, has, uh, has DFAT been in contact with shipping companies to discuss supply chain issues? I don't think we've been in contact. I think that's been led by the Infrastructure Department, but we'll take that on notice and give you a more fulsome answer, Senator. Thank you. Um, is DFAT aware of reports that the supply chain crunch will ease before the end of this financial year? Uh, I think I don't. Is there any officer at the table who is able to answer that? Uh. I have. I mean, yes. Supply chain sits within the division that I come from, but I don't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say we're aware of particular reports like that, Senator. Have 
have you done your own model? Have you done your own research or modelling on that? Yeah. So we, we, this... we typically modelling of that nature on the macroeconomy would be Treasury's responsibility, not DFAT's. But you have a section that's dealing with it. With supply chains, yeah. And have you? Um... Uh, have you, so do you have, have you done, you haven't, so you, have you done any research in your section about when the supply chain crunch would end or do you rely solely on Treasury for that information? I would say a, a mix of industry liaison and Treasury, if you will, as the two sources. So you're not doing any modelling yourselves? We don't do modelling of that nature, no. Um, do you receive modelling of that nature? I don't, department I don't believe we have. I take that on notice, but I don't think we've seen anything that you would call modelling on supply chain issues. But you are doing work on supply chain we issues. Are. So, I mean, do you have any... I uh, don't want to ask your opinion, but have you, has, has the department... Does the department have any... Um, do you ha I mean, do you have any views or have you um, given information... Uh, to government around when you think the supply chain crunch will end? I'll take that on notice, but I don't think we've been giving advice of the nature of the length of time we would be looking at okay. to that. Um, what steps has the government, government taken to ease the pressure on businesses from increased freight rates? As the Secretary said, that's a question for the Department of Infrastructure more than ourselves. They have okay. the lead on shipping and transport, those sort of issues. Okay, thank you. I'm going to pass to my colleague who's going to ask about free trade agreements. Thank you very much. I have a few questions about the UK free trade agreement to start. And if you're asking on that, I might have a few questions. Thanks, Jane. Yes. Yep. Very happy with that. Um, can, can you please confirm uh, the report? That, that I've read, which says that labour market testing has been waived for all workers from the UK in the agreement. Is that right? Thank you, Senator. Elizabeth Bowes, Chief Negotiator and First Assistant Secretary, Regional Trade Agreements Division. Senator, the commitments we've entered into under the UK FTA concern the temporary movement of natural persons. So that refers specifically to skilled professionals, business visitors, intra-corporate transferees, installers and services, as well as contractual services suppliers. We already have commitments in the WTO with respect to many of those categories that do waive labour market testing. In addition to those WTO commitments, we have agreed with the UK on a reciprocal basis to waive labour market testing for contractual service suppliers. And that's the category that people are concerned about. If, as the department modelled the impact of this on Australia's labour market or, our, uh, or, or rates of unemployment? Uh, Senator, no we have not, but what we do have is historic evidence from uh, other FTAs where labour market testing has been waived on that category of temporary uh, migrants. And in fact, our evidence from those other FTAs has shown that there has been a decline in the use of uh, that particular mode or visa that supplies that mode of um, movement in relation to the FTA. So in fact, if anything, there is no uh, impact from the wave of labour market testing, at least discernible from our historic experience of other FTAs where we have la waived labour market testing for that category. So if that's the case, why is the concession being sought and given? What's the... Senator, it was a specific ask of the UK it is in fact an ask of many of our FTA partners. It is something that is valued 
by our FTA partners, which is one reason why we certainly consider it on a case-by-case -case basis. It is part of the overall balance of the deal. And it was in that context, noting that this is an extremely high standard, comprehensive agreement, that we agreed with the UK to waive labour market testing on a reciprocal basis for that particular category. So you haven't done specific modelling, but you maintain that it has no impact on our labour market? Uh, Senator, we have not done specific modelling on the labour market flows. As I've said, we've got the experience that we've noticed from other FTAs. Has the department modelled the number of additional temporary migrant workers expected to enter Australia over the course of the next period as a result of the agreement, over the next five years, say? Uh, no, Senator, we have not done that specific modelling. We have consulted with Home Affairs, of course, on the uh, visa categories, which remain constant for the temporary entry of migrants. But I would note, and, and by migrants I mean those categories that I referred to, skilled professional business yep. people, um, but I would note that it is very much demand driven. It's a demand responsive process. Uh, and in particular supports our exports of services as well as supports inwards and outwards investment. The mobility outcomes in the FTA were an element of the FTA that was perhaps the most focused upon by all stakeholders with whom we spoke in negotiating the agreement. And that is in both directions. So increased movement, of people between Australia and the United Kingdom on a temporary basis to live and work on a temporary basis was the number one request of nearly every stakeholder with whom we engaged. So contract for services, backpackers? There is a separate commitment alongside the FTA. So backpackers, working holiday makers, don't normally fall within the mm. category of temporary entrance. But we have agreed in a side letter with the United Kingdom that we will, on a reciprocal basis, increase the age limit to 35 years of age in both countries and extend the availability of that visa to three years. Now, that's a considerable outcome in particular for Australians wanting to go to the United Kingdom where the length of period was previously two years. So we now have a three year, within two years, we will finalise that arrangement, uh, increasing the age limit to 35 and extending the time limit for three years. And there's no modelling about the impact of that measure, that side ladder on the, um, on the labour market? There's no specific modelling, but uh, certainly uh, it is used, uh, working holiday makers from the United Kingdom and Australians in the United Kingdom are certainly a significant proportion in both directions. Would you uh, agree that the agreement is politically contentious in the United Kingdom? Uh, Senator, there are aspects of the agreement that have caused some concern or raised some questions in some very specific sectors in the United Kingdom. I would say on the whole, it has been very widely welcomed throughout the United Kingdom population, um, and in particular from many of the stakeholders with whom we've spoken. But there has been some concern, particularly raised by the agriculture sector, because as I've said, this is a very comprehensive, highly liberalising free trade agreement in both directions. Has the, has the department provided the minister with advice about the dissent, particularly, particularly from the agriculture sector? I beg your pardon? Has, has the department provided the minister with advice about, about that dissent, particularly from the agriculture sector? Certainly, um, we are in contact with the Trade Minister's office and uh, the Trade Minister is certainly aware of those concerns. When I was in the United Kingdom with the Minister in April last year as part of the negotiations, I met with the head of the National Farmers Union and her aide to discuss uh, the negotiations in particular. And it was very clear that while there were some concerns about Australia, in fact, they're not Australia specific. 
and it is more about the precedent that this agreement would set. In terms of the, um, so you say it's feedback from local industry and local stakeholders? As well as from British Yes, stakeholders. but in, sorry, the, in Australia, yes. feedback from local industry? Yes. What's been the... Um... It has been uh, incredibly positive. I have consulted, we've conducted over 140 cons consultations, 250 separate meetings since uh, signature in December. I've had a number of meetings with stakeholders from different sectors. It has been uh, almost uniformly positive, particularly the mobility outcomes, the agriculture sector, of course, which really does stand to gain under this agreement, is incredibly uh, happy, pleased with the outcomes. But so are investors, so are companies that are looking to increase investment or indeed attract UK investment into Australia because the outcomes do facilitate increased investment in both directions. So unanimous applause from... Widespread. The, um, so just back to the, uh, the side letter on um, working holiday visas. So that can be um, altered or cancelled without any consequence for the broader agreement. Is that it is essentially right? It is separate from the agreement. It is not legally binding, but it is part of the overall FTA package. Yeah. And uh, principally... There, there are other, sorry to interrupt, but there yes. are other side letters dealing there with are. other matters, are there? Yes, that's right. They don't typically fall within the four corners of an FTA, but are considered part of the broader package. On um, one, one area that um, there's some concern about, of course, is from our wine industry who <coughs> say that implementation of the proposed UK duty regime would disadvantage countries in which wine grapes naturally ripen at relatively high sugar levels. Has the Minister had representations um, uh, from his counterpart in the UK regarding the impact of proposed alcohol tax changes in the UK? Uh, Senator, that issue is under or indeed has just been the subject of a public consultation. We are aware of the UK proposal to address its excise regime for alcohol, and I note it's excise, not uh, customs tariffs. Um, the Minister, there have been concerns raised, not only by our own wine industry, but indeed wine producers in different countries. Uh, the Minister has written to uh, his counterpart, in fact to the Chancellor, to note uh, the UK Chancellor, for, which has policy responsibility for this proposal, to note our concerns, or the concerns of industry with the proposal, and I understand Wine Australia has also put in a submission to the public consultation process. So, Can I come in on that? Yes, that sure, Chair. That was the area I was going to ask um, in relation to the UK Free Trade Agreement. A, a good agreement. We've noted concern. Is that all, or have we used language that is a bit stronger? Uh, in relation to a particular area, Senator? Yeah, yeah what you were just talking about, the alcohol tax Oh, the changes. alcohol. Oh, I, I beg your pardon. Uh, no, we have noted that uh, there has been uh, concerns in particular that Australian wine, because of the climactic conditions, would be disproportionately impacted by the effect of this proposed um, tax. Yeah, you you indicated that we had expressed concern. Mm. I'm just hoping that we may have expressed <coughs> considerable displeasure rather than just concern in whatever the jargon of diplomatic world is, but uh, to let it be known that yeah, we are not amused to use the English expression. I like don't think we're amused, no. Right. But we did highlight the intention to put forward a submission in the public consultation process, right. and Wine Australia has done so. Good and, and also, Senator, um, just to, to add that Minister Tian himself is is very much involved in this issue, and I think, as Ms. Bowe said, he um, wrote to 
um, the Chancellor of the Ex Exchequer, and he has been staying himself very much closely involved with um, Wine Australia um, because we do see this as, a, as, a, as an issue that we would that, that's not not a good development, but it's a, a separate issue from the mm. outcome on the FTA itself. Mm. Was it? All right. Was thanks. It, yeah. wh why wasn't the department aware that this um, that this had been proposed? When, when, uh, when the department was negotiating the agreement? Taxes don't normally fall within the uh, discussions on FTA. They're not part of the FTA negotiations. So, But, uh, but it, it potentially just wipes out the benefit for that sector. Uh, Senator, it's I disagree. The outcome that we have negotiated under the UK FTA is for the elimination of all customs duties on wine exports to the United Kingdom on entry into force. That does benefit the industry. It will save some $43 million worth of duty. And uh, it ensures that, in fact, Australian wine will have preferential access to the United Kingdom alongside the European Union. Preferential access that isn't enjoyed by some other major wine producing companies. So there's a difference between the duties at the border yes. and the customs but, excise, but uh, if, the excise. If the Characteristics of our wine mean that they're going to be more, you know, charged a higher duty or excise. Well, doesn't that doesn't that put our wine exporters at a disadvantage? Uh, Senator, the the United Kingdom has uh, set out in its consultation paper that this is a non-discriminatory tax. Uh, that applies to wine regardless of or origin. It's calculated on alcohol by volume. There yeah, is an argument. Oh, I beg your pardon. Sorry, you got finish. I, I was. Uh, there has been an argument put forward by our industry that because of climactic conditions, we could be uh, disproportionately uh, affected by that tax compared with yes. cool, cool climate wines, for example. Yes, and so. And we have the minister, Minister Tian, has uh, raised that concern with his, with the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Has the department modelled the impact of the of the um, duty regime, the alcohol tax regime, on Australian wines? Uh, Senator, what we have done is looked at our exports of wine in the period, and, and this is the basis upon which we calculate all of our tariffs negotiations. Uh, on the period 2017 to 2019, average exports of wine to determine on entry into force when the customs duty is abolished, there will be a saving of around $43 million. So that is what we can say based on historic data. To my knowledge, and I, and I should add that uh, DFAT is not the lead agency on this particular issue, but we are working closely with uh, Wine Australia and the Department of Agriculture. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, there have been some calculations by industry about yeah. the projected impact, yes. But yes. we have not so, done that. And, and was the department specifically aware that the UK government was intending to review its alcohol duty regime uh, at the time of negotiating the agreement? Uh, we were aware of this issue um, some months, one month, two months before <coughs> the conclusion or the signature of the FTA. So potentially, if the industry's right, the UK's given with one hand and taken with the other, and the industry's estimate is, uh, I heard you say $43 million advantage, they say £82 million pounds additional cost. It's, um, it's the situation for that industry is worse than when you started, isn't it? Uh, Senator, as I said, what we've negotiated is it's preferential duty-free access of the wine industry, of Australian wine, to the United Kingdom. And that is um, an outcome that is not affected. It is separate from the behind the border tax, which is not the subject 
of FTA negotiations and which is non-discriminatory and applies to all wine regardless of origin. Has the Minister sought advice from the Department about uh, waiving the requirement for 20 joint sitting days before Jay Scott um, can review a major international treaty? Has there been a discussion about waiving the 20-day requirement? Um, Senator, we are obviously very aware of the um, wish to have this <coughs> agreement go through Jay Scott processes. Um, Ex, as, as would be the normal practice. But given the time frame, Senator, uh, this was tabled last week, and are we aware that the 20 joint sitting day requirement uh, will not be met within the life of this parliament? So is there an intention to, waive, to, to, to seek to waive it, or it's just going to have to be dealt with um, in the course of the next parliament? Uh, Senator, we, are, um, we have looked at options, but that includes the J. Scott requirements, and we're very cognizant of the J. Scott requirements, including the 20 joint sitting day requirement. Looking at the sitting calendar, we're aware that that cannot be met within the life of this parliament. So, so, no, so a waiver won't be sought? Uh, Senator, I um, am not involved in those conversations. Has, has advice been provided to the Minister about waiving the 20-day requirement? Senator, I, we have had um, a conversation about that issue, but no formal advice. Can you tell me, Senator, I think it's, it's something that uh, is still under discussion. Um, the minister is still uh, reflecting on how he wants to uh, advance on this issue. So, um, but we don't have any more advice for you than that at the moment. Can you tell me how, can you tell me how many times that requirement's been waived since um, Minister Downer, who got a mention earlier this morning, I think, since, uh, since Minister Downer uh, implemented the convention in, I think, in 1996? We probably need to take that on notice, mm. Senator. I don't think anyone's got that statistic to hand. It'd be um, an interesting... I mean, given what we've discussed in terms of the wine industry, it'd be an odd thing to do to try and rush it through the parliament. Um, so the department doesn't have a view about whether it warrants an exemption? Senator, I don't think that's what we said. I think uh, the officers at the table said that the matter was still under consideration and they were discussing it with the Trade Minister. So, so I'm, I'm not sure our views... I think this is, goes to the advice we would give to the Trade Minister and it's under discussion with the Trade Minister. What's the UK's own ratification protocol? Uh, Senator, that is a fairly new process that the UK has implemented specifically for trade agreements. So immediately after signature, the uh, Secretary of State for International Trade wrote to a newly established body, the Trade and Agriculture <coughs> Commission, to examine the impacts of the agreement, on, in particular on the agriculture industry, so to examine the agriculture outcomes. That commission has three months to report back that report will then be considered by the Department of International Trade, which will do its own assessment. The DIT's assessment and the Trade and Agriculture Commission's assessment will then be tabled together with the agreement <coughs> itself before Parliament, the UK Parliament, and the requirement there is for 20 sitting days, that the agreement be laid before Parliament for 20 sitting days. However, I am aware that there are concurrently, as we, and also as we speak, three parliamentary committees conducting inquiries into the agreement. So there's the House of Lords International Trade Agreements Committee, there's its counterpart in the House of Commons, and then there's also the Food and Rural Affairs Committee, and then a number of other committees have also examined the agreement, but without raising specific inquiries, more as part of its normal functionings. So there are a number of parliamentary committee inquiries 
already on foot in the United Kingdom parliamentary system. I think the UK Secretary of State for Trade said, we anticipate there will now be a period of several months before the agreement's formally laid before the parliament. That's right. So my understanding is they will not, the UK Secretary of State for International Trade will not be laying the agreement before parliament at least until the Trade and Agriculture Commission has finished its work at the end of March. But we also understand that there needs to be a period of internal examination before the agreement is then laid before parliament. So from the 31st of March, the time frame is a little unclear. So end to end, that could easily be six months, couldn't it? The, the, does the treaty only enter into force when both parties ratify it, I assume? That's right. So uh, for example, both parties have to go through their domestic treaty making processes, notify the other party that those treaty making processes have been completed. And it's only when both parties have made that notification that the treaty will enter into force 30 days after the notification is made or at another date as agreed between the parties. Well, what's the argument for, for rushing it through then? Um, I appreciate what the Secretary says, there's some discussion backwards and forwards, but, but it's been contemplated. Uh, what's the... What's the purpose of... Senator, uh, I mean, notwithstanding the need for um, the due process, and this is something the Minister's considering, yeah. um, this, the outcomes in this, uh, this FTA are the most ambitious mm. outcomes that we have had, apart from uh, the CER agreement. So there is a lot of interest uh, from, from uh, various industry groups. The, the outcomes uh, in agriculture, as we alluded to before, are very good and the, interest, the industries, uh, relevant industries uh, that have been involved in this negotiation uh, do have an interest in it coming to, into force as, as quickly as possible. So this is something else just to, to mention, um, that there is that kind of pressure as well. And this is all being weighed up by the minister uh, in deciding how to, to move forward. Well, well, you assert that. I notice the chair nods vigorously. Um, mm. But the wine industry saying, hang on a second, um, questions about the labour market impact. Look, these are, there's a reason we have processes in the parliament to deal with these agreements carefully. Well, in relation to labour market, can I quickly ask? It's reciprocal, isn't it? So whilst UK... Um, residents, citizens can work in Australia. Similarly, Australians can go over to the UK and work. On a temporary basis, yes, under yeah. the agreement, yeah, that's, yeah. that is correct. Yeah, yes. yes, so it's completely reciprocal. Yes, yeah. uh, we, have, we have accorded the UK best FTA treatment. The UK has gone beyond uh, its usual practice and what Australia has been accorded is access equivalent to that accorded to EU nationals in the United Kingdom? Yes, and that doesn't obviate though people's <coughs> concerns about the impact. Appreciate Senator Abetz's point, but so, some people travel for work overseas, and it's a very good experience. In many cases for young Australians to do that. Um, there are questions about what happens in country towns and job opportunities for people in country towns, and those issues need to be weighed up carefully uh, by the parliament. Um, I, I can't see, if we've got a six month Jeez. process, give or take a few months perhaps, what, what the possible argument could be for rushing it through. But I won't ask you to express an opinion look, about uh, that. Country I have some towns are very labour poor at the moment, so... I have, some, I have some questions about the TRIPS waiver. Um, All right, another five well. minutes. That's, um, yes, thank you, that'd be good. Mr Baxter, welcome. I, um, I saw that the WTO Director-General said about um, uh, 
this TRIPS waiver set of issues, we should strive to get this result out by the end of February. Does, does the department expect a resolution on this issue by the end of February? Um, Senator, we are working uh, very closely with other key countries uh, involved in this discussion. At the moment, uh, there, are, there are four countries uh, in particular who are, are, are trying to uh, come to an agreement. That's uh, India, South Africa, uh, the EU and the US, working very closely with um, the Director, Director General. Uh, we are staying in very close touch with uh, all of those players and the Director General. The Minister spoke uh, with the Director General, speaks with the Director General regularly on this issue and on the, the broader set of issues uh, about developments at the WWTO following the postponement of the Ministerial uh, in December. But uh, uh, yes, this is, a, this is a, a key issue that Australia is looking to play a very positive role in finding the kind of compromise that will be necessary from all sides. Um, the Minister also, uh, you may be aware, he was in India um, just recently and India is a, a key player on this issue and uh, the Minister was certainly engaging with Minister Goyal as well with a view to uh, encouraging uh, all sides of this discussion to, uh, to look for the necessary compromise to find an outcome that, uh, that, 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 that all of these key players um, uh, will uh, be able to live with and will fulfil the objectives of the TRIPS waiver. And of course, Australia itself um, is supportive of the TRIPS waiver. I, th I think there was some ambiguity about Australia's position last year, but do, do, do you say that it's not possible um, within the current provisions of the agreement to achieve what's adequate in the context of COVID-19? So Australia is seeking... I, I might ask Mr Baxter to go into a little bit more detail for you, Senator. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Senator. James Baxter, First Assistant Secretary, Office of Trade Negotiations. So what I would say, Senator, is there have been a lot of discussions in the WTO about the uh, role that intellectual property rules are playing in, in terms of uh, vaccine distribution and access in particular, uh, but more recently, not just vaccines, uh, therapeutics, diagnostics more broadly. Yes, okay. There are certainly a number of developing country WTO members who are making the point that a waiver of intellectual property rights is needed to support their efforts to ensure that necessary um, uh, vaccines or other materials are able to be distributed widely. Okay. So what... Um, One last question. <clears throat> I should choose it chair, carefully then, Chair. You'd um, better choose it carefully, yep. But don't take too long. There's an opportunity yeah, cost yeah, there, yeah. isn't there? That, there um, is. What, 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 what is the government's... Um, what, what, what additional is going to happen? So it sounds to me like the prospects of this issue being resolved by the end of the month are um, not as strong as the WTO Secretary-General might hope. What, what additional will the government be doing over the coming weeks and months on this issue? Has it been raised in the context of the UK FTA or any of these other uh, discussions that we're uh, having around the place? What, 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 what is the best way to bring this I mean, issue to a conclusion in the department's view? As I indicated, we, we do believe that um, this ongoing discussion with those four countries, they must come to an accommodation in the first instance. Um, but we do believe that Australia can be an honest broker, given the position that we have, and this is why uh, both in Geneva uh, we are extremely active in, in uh, discussions with other key players, particularly the four members that I mentioned. As I've already indicated too, um, Minister Tien uh, takes opportunity to raise uh, the need for uh, finding a way forward on this issue as part of what is needed to unblock a whole set of issues uh, at the WTO at the moment. So in all his uh, engagement with ministers, I mentioned Minister Goyal, but he has regular contact with other ministers. He participated in a um, informal ministerial meeting 
at the end of January, where this was uh, one of the key issues, or the key issue, I think, under discussion in terms of finding a pathway forward. Um, so I, I think those kind of actions, we are already doing them, and I think that we will continue to do them uh, intensively given um, the importance of this issue, both on the substance but also in terms of um, our view that this is a critical issue that must be resolved to allow us to <coughs> advance a number of other issues in the, in, in the, in, in the WTO at, at present. There's a series of other questions, Chair, about a range of well, other I'm matters. Sure there are. We will so put we them on notice uh, for you. <coughs> thank you. Senator Van, you have the call. Uh, thank you, Chair. I've got some questions on uh, trade law. So, if the, the trade law? Trade law? Yes, yeah. we've got trade law experts. I, I have no doubt you do. I'll, I'll start off with my preamble um, to making way to the table. Um, Obviously, there's been um, welcome, Mr. Kenner. Um, there's been widespread publicity or media coverage uh, about the um, coercive trade tactics that uh, China has been using against Lithuania recently, and I'm aware that the EU has brought um, uh, or is seeking to bring an action, the WTO, um, and that Australia is seeking to join that um, that action. Could you tell me a little bit more about that? Mr. Kenner is the expert on this. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks, Senator. Uh, yes, you're quite right, Senator. There was um, in late, oh, sorry, Jonathan Kenner, Chief Trade Law Officer. Uh, in late January, the EU requested consultations um, with China um, regarding uh, its um, allegedly uh, disruptive and restrictive trade practices directed at at Lithuania. Um, we very quickly came out with a decision to seek to join those consultations. Um, that is open to, to members with a substantial interest in the matter. Clearly China as our biggest trading partner means that we have significant interest in how this plays out. So uh, we have requested to join those consultations. Under the WTO rules, um, China may, for example, reject third party requests to join consultations. So we will see the response. Um, and we anticipate um, them, those consultations taking place uh, in about a month or yep. so. And, it, and if they reject us, what are our options then? When, if and when this dispute gets to the panel stage, we can also request to be a third party to the dispute, and at that point, um, that uh, there's no objection to that. So parties can join when and if and when the dispute um, reaches the panel stage. Thank you. Thank you for stepping that out for us. Um, staying on trade law, but a, a different area, um, with the RCEP. Um, coming into force uh, 1 January, I believe it was, this, this year. Does the RCEP um, provide Australia with any remedies uh, against the coercive trade tactics being used by China against us? Senator, I might turn to my RCEP um, colleague to answer. That's uh, Elizabeth Bowes. Ms Bowes will yep. pop back. Thank you. It's a question I haven't been able to find the answer to even on my reading of the RCEP. Thank you, Senator. Elizabeth Bowes, Chief Negotiator and First Assistant Secretary, Free uh, Regional Trade Agreements Division. Um, RCEP, as you say, which entered into force on the 1st of January 2022, is now um, the world's biggest FTA and as such represents uh, a strong representation of the commitment to rules-based trade, particularly in our region. In particular, uh, there is a dispute settlement process that applies where the commitments under the agreement are breached. Um, and by extension, does, does do those provisions provide um, Australia with, with any course of action 
um, against the, uh, whether it be barley or wine tariffs that have been imposed? Um, Senator, under most FTAs, there is a dispute settlement mechanism, and I note, and uh, my colleague, Mr. Kanar, might want to pop back, but uh, there are dispute settlement mechanisms under most FTAs, but in many cases where there is a breach, and you mentioned an uh, issue of trade remedies, for example, on barley uh, and wine, a consideration is given as to what would be the most appropriate forum in which to bring a complaint in relation to that particular breach. And uh, that includes, and in many cases, it includes opting for the WTO rather than an FTA dispute settlement mechanism. In the case of trade remedies, for example, there's a well-established set of jurisprudence on trade remedies disputes in the WTO and um, it is uh, a well-established set of rules as well. So it provides a foundation for those particular complaints. But do you have to choose one or the other, or could we pursue both? Um, in many cases, most FTAs would have that choice of forum. So if you commence an action, but not exclusively. Um, I'm, I'm talking specifically about RCEP in, in this case. I would have to take that on notice, Senator. I don't have those details mm. right If you would, if you could consider it carefully and you know, look yeah, at what options exactly. are available under that. Uh, I would note, Senator, that those disputes arose before RCEP entered into force on the 1st of January 2022. So uh, generally we would only be looking at, in any case, anything that arises from the 1st of January. Fair point. I, uh, I, I hope uh, there aren't any new ones, but uh, I'm, I'm not that hopeful. Thank you, Chair. All right, wouldn't be an examination of the trade portfolio if I didn't ask about Manuka honey. <laughs> and, uh, We've been waiting for it. <laughs> so um, that'll take us out in the next two minutes. Um, can I put on the record my welcoming of the federal government's uh, assistance to the Manuka honey sector to help fight? Um, the kidnapping attempts by New Zealand of the name Manuka honey, and it's very timely because I understand the New Zealand Manuka honey producers who failed in their own country are now appealing that decision. And uh, this has been a, a very uneven fight given that the New Zealand Manuka honey producers have been given a lot of financial assistance uh, by the government. So. Uh, Ms Duff, you've come to the table undoubtedly to tell me that you will continue to have a very good uh, uh, watching brief on the issues as they emerge in New Zealand and uh, hopefully encourage the Attorney General's Department to make more monies available should that become necessary. Um, Thank you, Senator. Uh, Kate Duff, First Assistant Secretary, uh, Pacific Bilateral Division. I think you've just answered the questions for me, Senator, in uh, Good. <laughs> what you provided yeah, around like the most uh, 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 crucial update, and that is that the government is contributing grant funding through the Attorney General Department towards the Australian Martin and Kahani Association's uh, legal costs, reasonable legal costs for proceedings relating to the trademark dispute. So that is a development since we last spoke about these uh, these uh, uh, matters, Senator. Uh, in the meantime, though, of course, we continue to uh, press New Zealand around these issues and at ministerial level and uh, indeed uh, the Trade Minister, uh, Minister Tian, uh, raised these issues with his New Zealand counterpart, um, Minister O'Connor, during an in-person meeting in Melbourne in November, pressing the points around wanting to work together collectively and in some workshops and other other manners that can try and deal with these issues a little bit more cooperatively. So that, uh, that discussion ongoing is ongoing. Uh, we are, Senator, as you, as you mentioned, continuing to closely monitor the ongoing certification trademark uh, hearings and uh, 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 procedures that are occurring. Uh, I mentioned last time, Senator, that we, had, uh, we were able to get an observer into the Australian uh, Monica Honey Association's opposition hearing to the New Zealand case uh, in October, and we continue to watch that very closely. 
Uh, there are, uh, as you point out, um, none of the ongoing certification trademark cases have succeeded at this mm. stage. Uh, there are some still under objection procedures or have been rejected or are being assessed. Uh, and in December last year, the UK Intellectual Property Office rejected the trademark bid in the UK. And the assistance, and uh, if you, the Secretariat can pass that to Attorney Generals if need be, but the monies being made available are for new cases, as I understand it. And if that's the case, do our appeals considered new cases? Thank you, Senator. I would need to take that on notice and refer to the Attorney General's Department as, as manager of that particular process, but I'm very happy to do yeah, so. It was the release tells us the federal government will lend financial support to future legal okay. proceedings. Okay. So I hope that future legal proceedings include um, appeals. Senator, but, we'll pass that on to the yeah. Attorney General's Department Good. and I'll mention it to the Senator. Look, uh, th thank you very much. And, uh, this concludes the committee's examination of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. I thank the officers for their attendance, uh, Secretary, as well. And the committee will move to its examination of the Department of Veterans Affairs. It's scheduled at 8.15, so I think we've got about one hour, 13 minutes for dinner. And we suspend until 8.15. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Thank and Thank Zeb, you. thanks for your valuable Thank you, contribution. All right. We'll get started. I welcome Assistant Minister Daniam, representing the Minister for Veterans Affairs. I also welcome Ms. Cosson, Secretary and Office of the Officers of the Department of Veterans Affairs. Minister, do you wish to make an opening statement? No, I don't. Thank you, Chair. Secretary, do you wish to make an opening statement? A very quick one, please, Chair. Emphasis on the on very the quick. very quick. Good on you. And do you have <laughs> copies for... Yes, thank you. Um, yes, we do. Thank, thank, you. thank you, Chair. Good. Over um, to you, Secretary. Thank you. Um, I am conscious that the committee does have... Um, has indicated they have a range of questions to ask at the hearing this evening, so I will be brief. Um, I did want to acknowledge the important work of the Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide and that the Department will continue to respond to the Commission and also continue to support veterans and their families during the conduct of the inquiry. Chair, I also want to put on the record a significant milestone achieved on Saturday 29 January with um, Open Arms, Veterans and Families Counselling. It celebrated its 40th anniversary. The history of the service is quite remarkable. It was established in 1982 as a result of lobbying by our Vietnam veterans who identified the need for specialised counselling and support for veterans and families. And the department continues to focus on delivering outcomes for veterans and families. This includes the key priority of addressing the backlog of claims and supporting veterans through the claims process. Chair, I did want to take this opportunity to highlight another of our key uh, department outcomes, outcome three, which is the acknowledgement and commemoration of those who served Australia and its allies in wars, conflicts and peace operations through promoting recognition of service and sacrifice, preservation of Australia's wartime heritage and official commemorations. This week in particular is um, a poignant week in this regard as we mark a number of very significant anniversary anniversaries with our nation's involvement in the Second World War and later conflicts, including National Servicemen's Day on the 14th of February, honouring the hundreds of thousands of young Australian men who served our nation through compulsory military service. The 80th anniversary of the fall of Singapore yesterday on the 15th of February. The massacre of Australian nurses on Banker Island 80 years ago today and the 80th anniversary of the bombing of Darwin, the first time in modern conflict that mainland Australia came under direct attack on the 19th of February. These are just some of the many commemorations that the department is involved in, and we are still supporting veterans from the Second World War who are alive today and supporting their families. We are also preparing for significant upcoming commemorations of some more modern conflicts and operations, including the 75th anniversary of Australian involvement in peacekeeping in September this year, which will recognise all Australian peacekeepers and peacemakers over the past seven decades. 
and the 50th anniversary of Australian withdrawal from Vietnam in 2023. Recognition, understanding and commemorating service and sacrifice are important aspects of our commemorative activities. The department is committed to honouring the service of those that defended our nation and sacrifice of their families. Finally, I take this opportunity to acknowledge and thank all the staff of the department. I am proud of their efforts maintaining services to veterans and families during this challenging time. I also thank our veteran community, including ex-service and veteran organisations and the advocate community for their ongoing commitment to veterans and families. Chair, I welcome questions from committee. Thank you, Secretary. Senator Ayres has the call. Thanks, Chair. Welcome, Minister. I um, just want to take you firstly to a, a few pieces of uh, evidence that have, uh, that have gone to the Royal Commission that uh, consistent with some of the material that we've traversed. Um, uh, I think the Commission heard that the Department had an average of 100 days to process claims, but that that's recently doubled to 200, in some instances, 14 months. Now, I know we've had some quite specific discussions about uh, lengths of claims, you know, waiting periods, but is that, that's roughly right, isn't it? There are some claims, definitely, Senator, that are waiting 200 days and that we're not meeting our targets. I think some of our claim types, we are meeting targets around 28% um, um, of claims being made within target, and Ms Coles joined me. But yes, that, that would be about right. Thanks. Um, welcome, Ms Cole. I um, see Dr Boss said that some pension, what she called tri-act claims, which is not a term I'd heard before, but understand it's commonly understood, um, could take up to two years to process. A broad agreement that that's right? It depends, Senator, quite a bit on the claim itself. Tri-act claims refer to, acts where, uh, to claims where there's potentially eligibility under the three acts. Yeah. So it can start in a particular place, usually Merca, and then we discover that actually it's a VA Durka type case, which can add extra time and complexity. At times we have uh, cases where they actually claims actually get conditions decided under the three different acts. So they are our most complex and our most difficult caseload. It's around 15 to 20% of the total caseload. 20% of the total caseloads across the three? In the, um, in the compensation stream. And you, um, I think Dr Boss said that urgent reforms were needed. I know that in these hearings we've focused on the, the operating procedures, the resources, um, uh, you, you know, how the department's response to uh, claims is managed. Dr Boss said, the end user shouldn't be going back and forward against each act. There is a psychological cost and people who are not well find it incredibly difficult to deal with fairly straightforward administration, let alone having to go back and forwards trying to get their head around which act they're supposed to be dealing with and why. The bottom line is that the system is too complex trying to travel across three acts. I mean, she's not the first person to have made that observation. I think the Productivity Commission report said essentially the same thing. Um, what's, um, what's, the, uh, what's the plan in terms of what, 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 what are the things that the department has to do to deal with that issue? Um, legislative reform required, but and beyond that, what, what steps can the department take to deal with that complexity in red tape. Yep, so certainly, Senator, um, as you rightly pointed out, the uh, legislative reform is a big one um, that um, a few previous reviews have identified it would be um, better to um, 
uh, reduce the complexity. I think we've got over 2,200 pages of legislation and it's about 800 odd instruments and some of them are the um, um, operating principles. And so it is very complex and that will take time because the fundamental issue with legislation is one, you've got a, an old act um, for veterans, which is a pension type scheme and the new act, which is our MRCA, is a rehabilitation scheme. So yeah. I think Dr. Boss identified, well, it would be good just to move on to a, a single act, like a wellness act. So that will take some time to actually um, work through that plan. But because it does take time to change legislation, some of the things that we have been doing uh, includes um, talking to um, advocates about how they can uh, support the veteran in what information they should be gathering before they lodge the claim. A lot of the wait time that we're seeing are veterans who have to go and gather additional information, um, which will take time through the claims process. But also for us, we've got a claim support team to to actually do more outreach with veterans, um, to talk to them and educate them about what um, they can do to support us and, and we can then support them. And uh, Ms Cole in her division has um, established a, um, another team that is calling veterans. We now also have on about 56 of our defence bases, uh, veteran support officers, about over 30 of them, who are assisting veterans in that process of transition to get them claims ready um, and then decision ready so that they can lodge them. So there are a whole range of initiatives which happy to go through all of them um, that uh, Ms Cole has been looking at in addition to other areas in the department to help veterans lodge their claim and help them make, make sure that they've got all of the supporting material so that they don't have to wait. And importantly, to make that assessment early, what act do they fall under? And certainly veterans who uh, enlisted after 1 um, July 2004, predominantly they do sit under the MRCA, but what yeah. we have seen recently is a growth in that um, triact um, eligibility across the three acts, particularly DERCA and MRCA. Um, and so there's a whole range of issues which I'm happy to talk a little bit more about if that's helpful or if there's a specific area you would like us to focus on. I think the Commission also heard that the backlog of claims at, at June 2021, um, 56,663 claims in the backlog is, is double that of two years earlier in June 2019. Um, I mean, I assume you agree that that's unacceptable. Certainly, um, Senator, we're very focused, and that is our priority with the, the Minister as well, to reduce the claims backlog. Um, and we are seeing improvements in productivity uh, with our yes. staff, and particularly with the additional training that Ms Cole has introduced for delegates, um, and with the additional recruiting and getting some stability in, in the workforce has been... Um, we're starting to see signs, and Ms Cole was just briefing today in particular that where the determinations, not quite meeting the actual claims received, but it's getting closer. So that gap is closing. Um, and yes, we agree, the claims backlog, the way um, it was growing, was not sustainable. Um, and it is not um, good for the, the veteran community to be waiting that long for their claims to be determined. I mean, it seems to me that, um, you know, we've, we've done these hearings many times in the short short amount of time I've been in this um, in this place um, and the you know there is um, you know, there, there have been criticisms leveled against the department in the course of these hearings about a range of issues um, resourcing um, how claims are managed. Um, you know, your staff, and I can see your leadership team sitting behind you, um, people are making an enormous effort to grapple with these questions. But there's a clarifying, you know, the, the evidence before the Royal Commission is pretty clarifying in terms of these issues, isn't it? There's, if what Dr Boss has said is right, um, that, it, that the system is hopelessly complex, essentially. Um, th there's too much red tape. The, the volume of 
backlog of claims is increasing, not decreasing, um, the, the issues in terms of resourcing and the level of, you know, despite the increase in, um, the, the small increase in staffing levels that have been provided to the organisation, that, that these challenges are just continuing to overwhelm you, aren't they? Um, so, if I may, Senator, I, I won't talk about any evidence before the Royal Commission. Um, I shouldn't, but I can talk about what you're um, uh, yeah, mentioning no, there about I'm the not claims trying backlog. To draw no. you into a discussion no, no. about. Um, yeah. So the claims backlog, absolutely, and we're very conscious of trying to reduce some of that complexity and the red tape. But importantly, I know there's been a lot of commentary around the, the backlog and uh, the veterans waiting um, for their claims to be determined. But what we have put in place, recognising that there is that backlog and that there are veterans who may actually be seeking some support from us, that they don't have to wait. Uh, Ms Cole's team triages every single claim that comes in, has a look to identify whether the veteran is risk. So when we talk about the claims number, by the way, it's not the number of veterans. The number of veterans is less than the number of claims, but that yes. aside, um, we will uh, make sure that if uh, the veteran is in need, we're connecting them to support. And I also um, just flag that anybody that has served one day in our Australian Defence Force now is eligible for non-liability health care for free access to mental health treatment. Um, and we now write to everyone uh, since 2017 who leaves the Australian Defence Force to let them know that they can access that. Um, but we also have those, as I mentioned, those teams we established to core veterans who have been waiting for long periods of time just to find out if their circumstances have changed. But I'd encourage any veteran, if their circumstance has changed, and they do um, wish us to have a look at their claim for prioritisation, to call us um, on 1800 Veteran, and we will have a look at them. Uh, we have, a, as I mentioned, a claim support team, and um, because we are very focused on it as well, we know it's going to take us time. We're training up all our, our delegates um, and we can start to see a bit of a shift, but we have it will take us the, the time that we've been given the resources to re, to actually eliminate the backlog. What, what's the um, what's the current backlog of unprocessed initial liability and permanent impairment assessments at let's say thirty one December? Okay. Yeah. Um, Senator, the current on hand. So that is cases that are in progress and cases that are not in progress, that are waiting. Um, so that is quite important to understand what on hand is. For Merca initial liability, it's 34,249 claims. For Merca permanent impairment, it's 6,045. For, uh, would you like to know the other? That's the largest. One, would you like to know the other acts? Thank you, yeah. Senator. Uh, for Durka initial liability, it's 9,862. For Durka permanent impairment, it's 4,772. Yes. For war widows, it's 130 claims. And for disability pension, which is essentially both initial liability and permanent impairment, the way that act works, it kind of rolls together. It's 9,147. And the, the figure that I gave to you earlier that um, had been provided in evidence to the Royal Commission, mm -hmm. is that just a roll up of all of those numbers together, is it? It also includes um, items such as incapacity, which is both under Merca and Durka. Um, uh, to be honest, uh, Senator, I'm not sure entirely just from your number exactly what it includes because there are a number of small small categories which could be in there but um but on yes, that, it's on, likely to be it's likely to be the same thing mm -hmm. so I, even on that i mean my basic maths you know at, at, at december you're north of sixty-five thousand. um of those ones that i've just listed the ones that we would normally include in compensation it's sixty-five thousand and thirty. okay well, my, my maths isn't too bad for um, day three of estimates then, but that is a 20% increase on, um, on the July 2021 figures. Um, sorry, Senator, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. 
56 to 65. Yeah. Call it 20 between friends, I think. Still very significant increases. We are still seeing increases in the application rate. Yeah. So. Well, yes. Well, they're not coming from nowhere. It's it's a there, there's. Yeah, that is the that's the challenge that the organisation faced since the first round of cuts in 2014 is what what the government believed was going to happen didn't happen and that the impact of a number of things but not least our commitments overseas in Iraq and Afghanistan have meant that there's very significant applications out there and more to come it hasn't peaked yet presumably no, we do keep seeing uh, the growth in demand, which um, I'm OK with, uh, that veterans are actually um, coming to the department to, uh, if they need it. But also we have a much better connection with defence, which we didn't have quite a few years ago, Senator, where um, when you left defence, it wasn't automatic that you were connected into the Department of Veterans Affairs. So that's one thing we've closed uh, that gap. So we do know... Um, everyone now that does serve in the Australian Defence Force, which we didn't prior to 2016. So is that that uh, I was going to come to that data issue. So that data issue has been resolved, has it? I'm, I'm, you know, I've heard a story of a soldier who had real difficulty proving that he'd been a soldier. Yeah. You're saying that issue is absolutely resolved? I'd never say absolutely, Senator, but um, certainly from the time that um, we started the early engagement process with Defence and the data sharing, um, still not completely there with the data sharing, but we do now know everyone that has served from enlistment um, and we connect with the Defence, particularly those that are medically transitioning, transitioning and to support them during their transition. And in a number of cases, um, we have been able to make sure all of their claims um, are ready and processed uh, before they actually uh, leave um, the Australian Defence Force. But certainly um, you will still hear stories of um, those who have served prior to 2016-17 um, who will find that challenging um, in um, finding their records. And, and there have been occasions. So I think Senator Lambie's... Uh, yep. Just that. So what you're telling me now is before anyone leaves defence, all their claims are done. No, no, I didn't say that, Senator. I said that those that may be medically discharging, you will see that a lot of them, not all of them, um, we work with Defence to make sure their claims are being prepared before they leave. And um, in a lot of cases, I won't say all, uh, their claims are ready when they are leaving through transition for medically discharge. Not for all discharge, so it's about 20% at the most. Of those medically discharged? Yeah. So you've got 20% of those claims fully done? No, sorry. Of those that transition, about 5,500, 6,000 a year, um, about 20% of those are medically discharging. Yep. That's roughly the figure. Yep. And of those that are medically discharging, we work with Defence and our veteran support officers work with them to make sure that their claims are, are prepared and that they're ready before okay, they leave. So they're prepared, they're not processed. So they're not completed though, but they're prepared. Is we that try what to get them completed. Me? We try to get them completed, Senator. And How many out of that 20% oh, are being completed? I'd have to take that on notice, Thank Senator. You. I don't have, have that. Sorry, Senator. Take that on notice, Senator. There are, um, there are some legislative reasons why not all claims can be done before the person actually discharges. So, for example, if a person is seeking in capacity while we can have their claim ready to go and their initial liability claim actually sorted. We aren't able to actually pay, grant and pay incapacity until they're no, no longer employed by the ADF. So we try to make that happen within a very short period and have all the prep work done essentially before the person leaves so that they have some continuity of income. And similarly, with permanent impairment, would take some time after they leave mm. if they've loved the, so their liability no, for the I, permanent I get that. impairment. Could you break that down into the numbers and provide that to the committee, though, please? I'm Can sorry. We take that Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Can I ask you to? I just want to get a bit of a sense of how we're going in terms of some of these issues. Um, can you tell me in September and December of last year what, what the number of claims were on hand? I have. Um, on me, Senator. Um, well, we can do this on notice if you like, yes, but I wouldn't please. mind if, if, <laughs> if, if we can, if it's possible to go through them now, I think it would be 
useful for the committee. Are you in a position to tell me the number of claims on hand in September and December? I can tell you the number of claims. So we've gone through the number of claims that were on hand as of 30th of Dece 31st of December 2021. Yes. I do have with me as at 31st of December 2020. Is that helpful, Senator? Give me that date again, sorry. 31st of December 2020, so the 12 months prior. Noting that on yep. hand is always point in time. Yes. Yep. Would you like those? Yeah, oh, yes, please. Thank oh, you. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, so VEA disability pensions, 6,617. War widows, 127. Merca initial liability, 25,035. Merca permanent impairments, 4,852. Durka initial liability, 6,112. Durka permanent impairment, 6,124. And I believe that's the main categories I gave you previously. Yeah, what was the Lurka initial liability, I'm sorry? Merca initial liability was 25,035. And, and what is that as a total? As a total, including incapacity, it was 49,481. Okay. Um, uh, can I just, is, is, so if someone puts in 10 claims for 10 different injuries, is that 10, is that count as 10? Are they ever, are they ever counted as, because they're close claims, have got three different ones for a knee, that that is, claim, that, that, that is cla claimed as one, so that is one claim? Yes. Okay, so they're, they're not actually true figures. So if someone's got 10 different claims in, and you say, no, there's three relating to the one area or with the same problem, that's one claim, yeah? So no, that's actually no, not, not no, quite Senator, true. It doesn't quite work like that. So um, how we count them is in terms of conditions and claims, uh, if you see what I mean. So a person might put in one claim with one condition. For example, say they have a knee issue. A very common claim is a knee issue, right? Um, or they may put in, um, under Merca or Durga, they may put in two claims in my service, one for a knee condition and one for a shoulder condition. And we will count those as two claims when they're registered, but we will combine them into one claim. So as, and this is the difference, this is why we talk about gross and net claims, mm -hmm. we will c combine them into one claim and we will say that's one net claim. And the reason why we do that is because then one delegate is dealing with that individual rather than two delegates. So it's a client service um, initiative, basically. If that person subsequently okay. comes back later and three months later and puts in a third claim for, say, lumbar spondylitis or similar, we will try to give it back to the original delegate, but we will count that as a separate claim. So if you've got alcohol abuse, uh, major depression and some other illness, but that goes to one, ele one delegate, that's one claim. Is that what you're telling me? One, well, it's, it's net, one, claim, one net claim and three one gross. One net claim, is it? but three okay, thank you. in terms of the application. And the numbers that we're talking about are gross claims. Yes, yeah, we're talking yeah, about okay, gross thank claims. You. Yeah. I might just put, I might ask you to take these on notice for September and December. Um, just given the time, I, I'm keen to get to some other um, issues, but I'd, I'd like to know in, as of September and December uh, last year, the number of claims on hand, and I think you've, you've started to answer that very well, the number of unallocated claims on hand, the average time for a claim to be allocated, uh, the median time taken for a claim to be allocated, the average processing time for claims, the median processing time for claims, and the number of claims on hand not processed within 100 days. I think it's pretty similar to the sort of material that we've sought before. Can you tell me where the um, this $1.3 million McKinsey claims diagnostic audit is up to? Uh, so this is the one that the minister announced um, another yes. review when he um, became the minister, I think. So Senator uh, McKinsey's um, completed their diagnostic work and provided us the report on the 17th of December. And at this stage, we're in the process of analysing um, with um, the minister the, the outcomes from that McKinsey report. 
Uh, I think you said last time this would deliver some KPIs or milestones over the next 18 months to two years and that there would be some evidence of change when we came to the next estimates. Um, are there any early results or, or metrics that you're able to tell us about? Uh, so the a few things that uh, McKinsey certainly did identify is the complexity of our environment and they looked at our initiatives that uh, we were looking at and certainly validated some of the work that we were doing which I've just um, briefly described on supporting veterans in uh, the claims process but other than that um, we're still going through the process of considering uh, those recommendations. No quick wins or... No. I think the Minister said... Um when he announced the review, that he wanted to see immediate progress so that veterans and their families can get the support they need and deserve. Um, that's not... I, mean, I appreciate you're going through a process of considering the outcome of the review, but there's no immediate results, are there? In fact, the, the issues of complexity that you've pointed to and Dr Boss has pointed to and we've seen in, you know, vivid colour in previous estimates proceedings and the Royal Commission is now getting to have a look at, that, that, that those problems are the same and the issues are continuing to overwhelm the department, aren't they? I think McKinsey did some really good diagnostic work to understand what was the, the heart of the problem and did actually identify um, some ideas that we could consider uh, taking forward. Um, but at this stage, Senator, it really is um, something that's being considered, actively being considered by the, uh, the Minister and, and the Department. Well, Minister G said this is not another review. Um, Importantly, Senator, it provided, a, as you rightly pointed out, uh, McKinsey was looking at an action plan for us and some key milestones for the six, 12 and 18 month, 24 month period to say what we could be looking at to actually realise um, the benefit of uh, some of the, the work that they've, um, some of the initiatives that they were putting forward. So it is more than a review, it is actually a, an action plan for the department um, and what we can be doing to, to keep a, an eye on um, managing um, the delivery of um, the, and we're reducing the claims backlog over that period. The Minister said, I won't be waiting to action this roadmap, Minister G said. <clears throat> well, we're many months down the track, aren't we? Um, can you tell me? Um, did the review examine the impact of staffing and staff shortages? It looked at everything, Senator. It looked at our legislation, looked at our processes um, and staffing, um, our IT, um, our digital capability. So certainly McKinsey's did a, a, quite an extensive um, analysis, diagnostic work um, of the claims process. Can you, um, can you table the review? It it's still being report? considered by government at this stage, Senator, so I know I can't. You can't tell me what the key findings and recommendations of the review are? No, Senator, they're all under consideration at the moment. So when did the Minister announce this review? Oh, I'm sorry, I don't have that date. Um, I, I think I have... Oh, Secretary. it's the um, 16th of October, <coughs> Senator. Is, is what the department really needs another review from an, yet another Minister for Veterans Affairs? Is that...? Uh, well, Senator, we actually commissioned the review. Um, we um, went out to uh, the panel to look at some ideas from a, a few organisations, not just McKinsey, and did some analysis of um, some proposals that came forward, and we actually commissioned McKinsey's. We were very keen, noting that um, we there was... Um, a, the backlog uh, was growing and we were really keen to see whether some of the work that we were doing was going to be able to support us in reducing that backlog. Um, and the Minister announced um, that commissioning of the, the review. So we, we commissioned the review in the department. The department's commissioned the review. The, the Minister 
seems um, <clears throat> at least has created the impression of optimism and action. What, what, what are the tangible results of this review going to be? I think what had been indicated to us was that there would be a, um, in the minister's terms, a roadmap to action, whatever on earth that means. Um, what, what are the tangible results of this going to be? That really would be um, a matter for government to consider those initiatives. So we can't see the review. We don't know what the result's going to be. And we're... Not yet, Senator, no. Six months down the track. How many um, families and individuals participated in the review? Um, I think in the end uh, we've got a number of submissions. I don't have the number, but Ms Rundle might be able to give you the number of submissions we received. Um, and I think in the end there were three families, three or four families, two, two families. Two families were interviewed as part of the process. But Ms Rundle might be able to take those facts, if you like, Senator. Thank you. Okay, uh, Vicky Rundle, Deputy Secretary of the Department of Veteran Affairs. The, uh, the people who were consulted in the Mackenzie Review were two families. There were um, three or four, I think three formal submissions received. There were a number of uh, emails to the Minister's office with uh, wanting to contribute and with ideas which were passed on as well to Mackenzie. There were, uh, from many? memory... Sorry, uh, how many emails? I think from memory there are about 33 uh, mm -hmm. emails. Um, the, the, we also consulted with some of the ex-service communities, oh. so our ESORT, our Younger Veterans Forum, our Female Veterans and Family Policy Forum, and also our Multi-Act Claims Working Group. So, well, let me... Um, so $1.3 million <laughs> review. <laughs> I saw in the minister's press release he had his um, had his email address for people to send emails to. That 33 emails. I think at the last estimates you said six families, now two. Oh my god! And three formal submissions. 1.3 million dollar review. <laughs> Commenced in October, concluded just before Christmas. 17th of December. That's right. See, well, the that's government right, hasn't so. handed it in. Um, how, so, how's, I how does that? I mean, so, how does that? How does that? So, how is that a robust evidence base for for yet another? I mean, we uh, we've got a very significant undertaking in terms of the Royal Commission. Very obvious set of issues. Um, I'm, I'm trying to be patient with the idea that another review somehow is going to add value here, but. $1.3 million review that's spoken to two families. Well, can I also please offer, Senator, that um, that doesn't account for all of the staff engagement that McKinsey um, I hope so, yes. with the department. Um, the the, the um, Ms Cold's division and a few other areas in the department were very active in engaging with workshops and discussions with McKinsey. Um, and Ms Rundle was part of a steering committee with um, McKinsey just to explore <coughs> ideas. Um, it was a, a fairly, I believe, a thorough diagnostic piece of work that was looking at our claims <coughs> process. But I just am not in a position to talk about, at this stage, while it's being considered by government, what the outcomes were in that, um, that review. Minister, is the government going to have anything to say about this review before we get to the election? Well, um, I... I... I see that McKinsey staff are in front of the Royal Commission mm. next week, I think. Yeah, Thursday. Don't, don't you think Thursday. that report would be handy if the Royal Commission had that report or that? You're waiting for them to ask for that report because that would be rather embarrassing. Other than that, I guess we can, we can make the Senator, we can make the Minister come in uh, and explain to him why, under the circumstances of veteran suicide, they have not released that report. That would be rather damaging for the part of the Government of the day, I would think, in the last few days of sittings. Seriously. We'll take that as Thank questions. you. That'll be helpful. We'll take that Do, as a warning because it's coming. Can, can you tell me if the um, if the government and minister consulted with the royal commission about the review about the McKinsey review? Did the commission express a view about the review? Uh, certainly, the the commission did. Um, the uh, commission did 
uh, issue a media release, but I'm sorry, I don't have that with me. But I'm not sure whether I have it actually. Sorry, Ms. Rundle has that. The commission uh, issued a media release on the. I'm sorry. Now it's uh, not long after the ministers. I had it with me. I think it's the 21st, but I will look through my folder. So we'll and take that it. and we'll be able to give you an answer uh, shortly. Uh, I think what, what Mr. Sandoz was asking is simply this: Did the did the commission raise concerns? About this, did they raise? Surely you must know that 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 would stick in your mind. You, so, you don't so need to come back. That's to what us. we're just trying to find. That, that, well, certainly they didn't raise it with me personally. The commission hasn't done that, but they did issue yeah. a notice or a the media release. The nineteenth yes, of the nineteenth of October. October. Um, so the commission did express concerns, uh, uh, interest, what, more interest. What did they say? What did they say? I can um, have this copied and tabled if it's in the public. Is it very long? Maybe just give us a quick uh, brief on it. What, what concerns did they have? Uh, well, I, I don't wouldn't characterise this as concerns. I mean, it's not for me to characterise what the Royal Commission you, said, Senator. Okay, okay, just take Thank you. Um, in the last estimates, I think you said that there were some preliminary findals, findings that McKinsey provided to you that were about improving the department's correspondence and the way that delegates engaged with veterans. Has that been, those issues been resolved? Um, what I was referring to earlier as well, Senator, we have looked at how we can uh, simplify our letters. We've been doing that for a very long time as well, but how we can um, connect with veterans to uh, support them in lodging their claims and making sure they've got all of their um, the records that they need to lodge a claim. So we have been doing that and through the outreach that I mentioned um, in Townsville and Tasmania, calling veterans and talking to them about their claims. So we have been doing quite a bit of that. Um, and and how, is, how does the work of the... I mean, isn't there some real prospect of the review and the work of the commission overlapping? pointing in different directions? I think they share the same interest and outcome. Certainly the Royal Commission is very focused in understanding uh, what are the barriers to veterans um, and families receiving the support uh, from, um, in my case, from the Department of Veterans Affairs and in order to reduce uh, any incident of suicide. So I know that's a key focus of the Royal Commission. And, um, and McKinsey's is looking at it from one slice of that, which is the claims backlog. Is this causing concern to the veteran community and how we can remove the barriers um, to streamline our claims processing, which is something uh, we share. And I know the Royal Commission, from what I'm, I'm listening, share that as well to find out, well, what can we be doing to remove these barriers? Okay, I just want to deal with some staffing questions. Um, uh, we've traversed these, uh, I think, a few times, and I think over the course of some of the other um, parliamentary processes, there's been a series of different figures being provided to the parliament. I, I think, I think the uplift in ASL positions was 447. That's right, isn't it? 447, that's yes. correct, yes. Um, how many of those positions have been filled? Oh, Mr Harrigan will come up and help me with that, Senator. So we have Thank been, you. certainly since we received the uplift in our mm -hmm. ASL, we have been, particularly in Ms Cole's division, uh, the first step we took was identifying the number of additional ASL for her division, uh, which I think was around uh, 270, uh, but Mr Harrigan will correct me. Um, and what Ms Cole did initially was look at all of the labour hire that we had on board to see who could convert to uh, non-ongoing, which I think we talked about at the last sessions, yeah. and then going through recruitment with uh, those to see um, who could convert to or who could be recruited into ongoing positions. So it's been a steady increase. We have faced some challenges with um, recruiting in particularly Melbourne and Sydney with lockdowns and a bit of few workforce pressures and a little bit of attrition. Um, but we uh, are seeing a bit of an uptick in our ASL 
And um, I am pleased to report that uh, the percentage now of labour hire to ASL has come down. Um, but Mr Harrigan might be able to give you some actual numbers if that's helpful. Yes, please. Thank you, Secretary. Uh, Mark Harrigan, Chief Operating Officer. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Senator. So the, the recruitment of the additional 447 uh, that we received in the budget uh, is progressing well. Uh, around 360 of those uh, additional positions uh, have been filled. Most of those are in the targeted areas of claims processing, uh, case coordination, on-base supports, rehab services and our veterans access network. Um, so these are APS positions as we've previously discussed. Mm. Uh, and so the, how many in each of those categories? Uh, I'll have to give you the splits uh, on notice, uh, Senator, but um, the, most of them uh, were designed for the uh, client areas. In terms of claims processing, uh, it was <coughs> around 250 of those. So, uh, so the lion's share in claims processing. Yes, yes. And then the rest The rest, uh, the rest are in, in client support areas where there's a workload for the department flowing on from the additional claims that are lodged for the department and the work done by claims processing staff. Um, uh, a lot of those positions that have been filled has, have been uh, conversions of labour hire and we've previously spoken about the, the benefits of us doing that in that we are, are providing those staff the opportunity to, uh, to be appointed as public servants but importantly uh, capitalising on the investment that we've made in their training, uh, their learning and development, uh, which in, uh, in, in... Sorry, i just just take you back to the beginning of that. You're saying the majority of people you've recruited from the labour hire companies who you'd previously engaged. Yes, that's right. So labour hire yep. individuals who we've had on the books for a while. We made the op offer to them to convert over uh, to public service roles. Uh, we had a good response to that. And as a result, uh, we've um, kept our investment that we've made in their learning and development. So. Uh, the lion's share uh, of the additional APS roles have come from uh, labour hire staff we already had. Okay, so for those staff, w there was some confusion, wasn't there? Because the first, the first uh, thing that they heard was that there was a plan to the ASL cap had lifted. They were recruited into non-ongoing positions. Um, for two years, which was all you'd been funded to do. There's no commitment to maintain the higher ASL cap beyond the two years, was there? So the ASL cap uh, was over the ongoing, so it wasn't, ju wasn't just the, the two years, um, the funding for the ASL, it was to come back because we were... Maybe I have you confused with one of the other departments who told me that um, they were only funded for two years, we were so only they funded offered... funded for two years, yeah. so that's correct, but yes. the ASL... Um, correct me if I'm wrong. ASL cap was beyond the two years, um, and the intent was to always to hopefully eliminate that backlog in the two years and to then have a look at what we needed moving forward. So, so you might get more funding, you might find savings from somewhere else within the organisation. Possibly. Or you might have redundancies. But have a look again at what is the backlog now after the two years if we've had the injection of additional staff in the workforce. So, so total number of staff, my rough maths, depending on whether I've got this right, based on the figures that I've had before, around 3,158 if you incorporate the new positions, is that right? Yes, uh, Senator, at 31 December 2021, we had a total workforce of 3,158. Uh, that consists of, of consisted of 2,100 APS staff, uh, being a mix of ongoing and not ongoing. Sorry, say that again, sorry. So 3,158. 3,158, yep. uh, 2,100 of those are APS staff. Yep. The remaining 1,058 uh, labour hire staff. There's still a very high proportion of labour hire staff, l largely in those, yes. what did you call them, client facing uh, areas? Yes, yes, that's the client benefits division. But if, if we look at the department as a whole, the we were six months ago at 38% yes. labour hire, we're now down to 34%. So that's tracking, tracking in the right direction. If I look at the claims benefit division, which is where the claims processing staff are, six months ago they were at 41% labour hire. They're now down to 27. So 
So, and that 300, the 360 additional positions, just so I understand this, how many of those are now on non-ongoing contracts and how many have now been transitioned into permanent APS roles? Uh, that is a split I'll need to take on notice, Senator. So the 50-50 or...? Uh, well, at the moment, I, I, I'd, I'd say 50-50 yeah, is probably a close estimate because we've explained previously that the, the initial step was to, uh, to lock in the investment in our labour hire staff, uh, convert them to non-ongoing, and then run a, a series of recruitment processes to then uh, ideally allow those individuals to become permanent uh, APS staff. But as the Secretary has mentioned, the last six months has presented some challenges in, in, in terms of the speed of our recruitment caused by tight labour markets. Uh, it's very competitive, a very competitive market in most of our locations where we have uh, client-facing staff uh, and the, shut the lockdowns in a couple of states has uh, made it difficult to progress recruitment at the rate that we would like. And despite that claim still overwhelming the organisation well, certainly the demand is outstripping our capability and capacity at the moment. Absolutely, Senator. I think questions I noticed the last round of estimates, uh, you indicated that contractor expenditure, um, including fee for service and labour hire arrangements for 2020-2021, was $69.7 million. And I think you indicated the period 1 July to 31 October 2021 was 24 $2 million. Um, can, can you provide a figure for that 1 July to 31 December 2021 period? Uh, yes, Senator. So for 1 July 2021 to 31 December 2021, uh, the figure is $37.3 million, which is sort of on par to... Sort of be about the same. Yeah, the previous financial year, yes. And, and why is that? If, if you've transitioned 360 people... So we still need um, some labour hire... You've still got... In, in, so 360 people have moved from labour hire, to, but the bucket's been filled up by additional labour hire people, has it? Is that...? So we'd still need some labour hire to... We will, yes, we'll I understand that, but I, I would have thought it would be a smaller number, but it's, it's really, it's little really little about the yeah, same, It's really it? about the same, um, and is, um, as, um, as we've talked about, and we're always going to have labour hire, um, but uh, we use them as well for our recruiting pool. So we bring in our labour hire, and if um, we need them, we can turn them, uh, ask them to um, consider non-ongoing and then later ongoing. So we will continue to have labour hire uh, engaged. Mm. But yes, it has not dropped as, as much because we, we actually still need the labour hire helping us with progressing the claims. And Senator, there are other budget initiatives that, where it has been necessary to bring on some labour hire staff. Uh, one example of, of that is our digitisation initiative. Uh, that's a, uh, a time-limited uh, initiative where it's appropriate to bring on uh, those skills for a short period of time. So that's added to the, the recruitment in labour hire too. So, so essentially same level of expenditure on labour hire and consultants. We know $1.3 million of that is this McKinsey report. Uh, no, um, that, that, sorry, Senator, that would be, that would be separate. Yeah, that's, the consultants are separate, and we are okay. seeing that coming down a little bit, um, Senator. So, um, uh, well, could you? I think you've done this for me before. Could you provide me with an updated list yes. of DVA contracts that um, uh, below a million dollars and above a million dollars, and mm -hmm. the total value and cost of all of those? Uh, and tell me how many consultants are currently engaged by the department and what tasks or mm -hmm. functions they are engaged in. I think it's a matter of updating what you might have already provided. Um, th th there's no reason for optimism, is there, Ms Cosson, in terms of the projections about the number of claims? There's nothing you know about the number of claims that, you know, the traffic that you're getting coming in reducing, is there? 
claims are going to continue to rise. We always think that, um, and this is a, a question as well that we raise with the Australian Government Actuary when we're looking at the long-term projection for our military compensation scheme, we don't know when we're going to reach that steady state. So at the moment we're still seeing a growth. But if you, if you look at the numbers that transition every year, which is pretty steady, but then you're going to, if you see an increase in recruitment, then we, yes, we will see our numbers go up. So we're always trying to project, and we, we our data team do a, a fairly good job at trying to project that. Um, but the demand, I think it will level off um, to a point, but at this stage, Senator, you're correct, we are continuing to see the growth. Well, that's what Tony Abbott said in 2014. Um, Mr Abbott, I suppose I should call him in here, Chair. Good to know that you took notice of him. Uh, how long will you still do, given that Senator Van is going to ask a few questions before the evening adjournment? Well, I don't want to create the impression that i am become all agreeable or anything, or, <laughs> no or that I'm frightened of the Chair, but that was, in fact, my last question. Thank well, you, my last Senator question at this stage, I may come back on yes, some Royal yes, Commission yes, related yes, issues that was a bit later in the evening. Senator Van, you have the call. Thank you, and I'll try not to go too long into the, the, the break. Uh, good to see you, Ms Cousin. Uh, thank you for appearing again. Um, can you provide an update on the implementation of the uh, veteran wellbeing centres across uh, Australia, but particularly um, uh, the, the one in my home state, Wodong, uh, Victoria, the one in Wodonga, uh, but also the ones in Nowra and Townsville? Certainly, Senator, if you don't mind, Ms Pope, we'll pop up and um, give you a bit of a rundown <coughs> on where we're at with all of the wellbeing centres. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Senator. Kate Pope, Deputy President of the Repatriation Commission. Get myself sorted. Uh, yes, to, to commence with Wodonga, as, as, you, as you asked, um, uh, I'm aware that uh, uh, the building has been purchased for the establishment of the Wodonga Centre. It's in the main street of Wodonga. It's a really uh, central and very accessible location. And I, I understand that the uh, Victorian RSL is in the process of uh, um, contracting a provider to do the fit out and other works uh, to get that centre up and running. Um, similarly, in Nowra, the, the uh, uh, construction has commenced and in fact you'll be able to watch it live. They're setting up time-lapse photographies that, that, that we'll be able to observe online once it's operational. There goes Just... my Saturday night. <laughs> yeah. I, I could make a comment, Senator, but I won't. Um, <laughs> no, you're um, right. I don't have a life. <laughs> um, but there'll be an opportunity to see how that's uh, progressing. And one of the excellent um, outcomes of this is the cooperation between RSL Life Care, <clears throat> who are establishing NARA. Uh, and the Wodonga Centre, and a centre that's being established um, outside of the program but in close cooperation with it, so not funded at this stage, in Wagga, um, that uh, uh, RSL Life Care is cooperating with, and they're working with Nowra, Wodonga, and Wagga are all cooperating to uh, deliver services in Wagga as, as well. So it's a, a great benefit to see from the uh, uh, network that's developing um, around the country. Um, you asked about Townsville. Um, I'm aware that uh, there's been qu quite a lot of events held, um, a Christmas fair, a uh, very successful book fair, uh, and a relaunch of the uh, Check, Check Five campaign. Um, and so the number of organisations involved in, in uh, Townsville is, is growing and the centre is uh, developing very well. Um, in the case of Darwin, um, throughout January they had over 300 uh, almost 300 clients um, uh, receiving services in, in Darwin. Um, they're not in their final location yet, but they're delivering from a, a temporary premises while the final one is um, established. Um, in South Australia, uh, they've been doing some particular work with um, people who are, are veterans who are transitioning out of uh, corrections um, and helping them transition back into uh, mainstream life. Um, it's a particularly challenging time where it can be, so they have a particular focus of a project um, in that respect at the moment. Um, <coughs> I think that probably gives you a rundown on the, the ones you mentioned. Sure, but they're, and they're typically well received by veterans and families? I would say so, yes. And the important thing is that they respond to local needs and interests and uh, can be adapted to whatever suits the community that uh, is accessing the services. And there's lots of opportunities for uh, the veterans in that area and their families to influence 
uh, what sort of services are available, how they're delivered and how the centres uh, run. And I think the, the lead organisations in all those locations are doing a really good job of um, engaging closely with their local veteran community to th develop it in the right direction. Thank you. I'm, 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 I think it's safe to say I'm, I'm normally not the most parochial of, of senators. <laughs> Um, and you did mention the centre in, in Wodonga, but there, there's nothing in Melbourne um, or planned for Melbourne? Uh, the RSL is, has established quite a few centres. I'm aware of one in Frankston and I think one in Warrnambool, and I think they're looking at other uh, locations as well, but they're not ones that the federal government has directly funded. So the, uh, the $5 million that was allocated to Victoria went to the Wodonga uh, centre. And, and do you think that Melbourne, particularly you know, um, central Melbourne, would be you know, give veterans a lot of access to, to services that the wellbeing centres can provide? Oh, I think there's probably a number of locations that could be considered for, for future um, uh, wellbeing centres if, if you know, funding becomes available. Um, Ms Cousin, you're aware of 310 St Kilda Road. Do you think that would make a, a good wellbeing centre for veterans? Um, I love 310 St Kilda Road. I did work just near there, Senator, and we've talked about that before. Um, I, I'm not too sure the, the status of 310 at the moment, whether it's gone oh, we'll to... We'll find Melbourne out Council. tomorrow when uh, estates and infrastructure okay. come up. Uh, <laughs> I, I promise you. Um, but uh, you know, do you think that, you know, given the, the historic nature, it was a repatriation was. clinic, um, do you think that should be a, a... or could make a good wellbeing centre? I'm going to um, join Ms Pope on this one, Senator, and say there are many good locations. Um, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of the wellbeing centres. I think they are the way of the future, uh, where veterans can pop in. And it, certainly if there's traffic along St Kilda Road, which I know well, um, then there are so many places that uh, as long Do as you, veterans sorry, go there... I just want to finish off. Um, um, obviously two different departments, but is there cooperation between Department of Defence and DVA, you know, and looking for surplus properties that uh, D Department of Defence are looking to um, um, dispose of? Uh, there, there potentially would be if there was, uh, if, if an opportunity arose. Um, it, it hasn't been the case with the funding that's been allocated to the centres so far because for the most part, properties were either already identified or, uh, or, like, or were under construction, for example, like the RSL um, Anzac uh, Centre in, uh, in Perth. Uh, there's certainly very strong cooperation from local defence in Wodonga, um, and I'm personally particularly aware of that, um, because parochially that's near my hometown too, mm. um, and uh, very strong interest in, uh, from the barracks nearby to support the services and to potentially deliver some things that are currently delivered behind the wire outside the wire through the, uh, through the wellbeing centre, mm. which I think would be a really great uh, development, particularly for the families, making it easier for them to, to access. It's uh, just a shame that we can't get that same cooperation on 310 St Kilda Road. But um, thank you, Chair. I'll just ask a question off that so I don't have to come back to it. I do notice that um, you're, you're saying that this is all going to happen, but I've just seen Daniel Andrews truck 500 million bucks in to Legacy down there to do exactly what you should be doing. So have you spoke to the Labor Party in Victoria, the State Labor Party. Um, and if you haven't, can I ask why you haven't done that? Uh, no, Senator, I haven't. Uh, uh, are you going to reach out so you're not doubling up somewhere and see where you can actually be more effective and work beside them to make this happen? So, Senator, um, how with the wellbeing centres have been structured, it's um, based on going out to get expressions of interest to establish wellbeing centres. That, we don't run them. Ms Cousins, I'm asking you to please, can you please, yeah. before we spend any more money, see where you can help uh, without doubling up um, and without doing your own thing, because it seems the Andrews government is already moving ahead with this. Mm. Um, it would be smart to contact their Veterans Affairs Minister and find out where we can contribute um, to where we haven't done that before uh, and, and team up. That's all I'm saying. Thanks, Thank Senator. you. Senator Mirabella. Uh, Secretary. Uh, this, I'm happy for you to take this on notice. I'm not sure it's relevant to you. Um, if it is, you can take it on notice. If it isn't, you might be able to direct me. I've received a letter from a veteran who served operationally on Op Damon in 1979. Are you familiar with that operation? No, I'm not. I'm sorry, Senator. Um, he asserts that his service and all who served on Op Damon uh, has never been recognised as operational service. Um, 
Opdamon was the Commonwealth monitoring force in Rhodesia. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. It was a small operation, I think only about 130 personnel. It was a short operation, I believe only about four months, but in that time the soldiers were dispatched in platoon minus groupings deep into the Rhodesian bush uh, to live amongst thousands of heavily armed terrorist groups. And uh, many of them have suffered mental health problems mm. ever since. Mm. Um, who or what is the decision body on this matter as to whether those men mm. were, A, whether that was classified as operational service or warlike service? So if I can offer there, Senator, usually that's a, a matter for defence to determine whether it's operational um, service. Uh, but there's always the Honours and Awards Tribunal, which is separate, that um, can consider any cases that go forward in relation to um, retrospective recognition. But importantly, all of those um, men or women who did serve on Op Damon, um, they would be eligible for support from DBA, particularly for mental health support. Uh, as I mentioned, the non-liability health care, I'd encourage them to, to contact us to get that recognition so that if they do need um, support, because under our system, you don't need to have operational service to receive that non-liability health care. As I mentioned, it's just that one day service. So there may be a range of benefits to, for which they are, they are eligible, even if the operation wasn't deemed um, operational service. Okay, thank you. All right, the committee is suspended until 9.33.
committee is resumed. I have a uh, bracket of questions on a range of issues. The first one is, uh, is the department aware of 200 flight? 200 flight. Yeah, I'm that is a group of airmen who were the air support to our Z special group. I was formed to uh, support the operations of Z Special Group, and uh, they've been described as many. They were the bravest of the brave, and for the Z Special Group, without them, we were nothing. And it's been put to me that uh, 200 Flight has never received their own outright honour and citation, and we still have two of those veterans with us. Um, and I'm just wondering whether, well, what's the way forward with this if we do want to provide some mm. recognition uh, to mm. 200 flight? I confess I wasn't aware of them until Monday the 14th of February this year. Um, somebody drew it to my attention via email and mm. I thought it appropriate to raise with you. Certainly. Um, so, no, I'm not aware, um, Chair, so I'm happy to take that on notice. Yeah, if, if you wouldn't you mind could. passing the details, and uh, we can then follow up probably with our colleagues in defence as well. Good. Um, so I'm happy to, to take that on. All that. right. Thank you very much, Ms Cosson. Now, the topic of lawn mowing. I understand that under the VEA uh, principles, lawn mowing has been made available as of the 1st of January this year. Is that correct? I think the lawn mowing, and someone might have to join me on this one because I haven't got all the details. Who's there. got the Jim's Mowing franchise? <laughs> um, if you have a, um, a health condition, a health issue, mm. where you may be eligible to receive lawn mowing services. Um, so, um, oh, Ms Rundle. Ms Rundle, you're the lawn mowing expert, thank you. <laughs> I'm not the expert, Senator. Oh, because um, I was going to invite you to my place, just in case you were. But, uh... <laughs> um, no, Senator, I, I, um, I realise that uh, the person who would answer that question is not able to be here this evening. And normally That's I fine. look after this area, I'm just on uh, leave from that for the moment. But the thing I, we could do for you, and we're just looking for it now, is we did provide some advice to... Um, our clients and also to our, uh, uh, our ex-service organisations, ESORT and others, and we're just seeking that now right, and then right. we'll be able to share it. Well, and I'll just you have it. provided advice. Mm -hmm. They have circulated that advice and regrettably, as I'm informed, DVA still has not contracted the, the organisations or the providers of that lawn mowing service and so whilst it exists in name, it does not actually exist in practice. So you, uh, I do recall... So there's a business opportunity for yeah, somebody. But I do recall today, I did see an email, and I'm sorry I haven't followed up on a response, uh, from Ms McCabe, who did actually highlight there is an mm. issue with the lawn mowing. Um, so you've, I'll certainly be able to come back... you fingered my source. Yes. So <laughs> I will follow that up and be able to get back to Ms McCabe Right. As well. but, uh, and the other issue with that, because that does need to be clarified, because it one occasions embarrassment mm -hmm. to the organisation saying, avail yourself of this, only to find out that the okay. veteran community can't. But do people that have the benefit of the, if I call it the VEA lawn mowing service, as opposed to the MRCA lawn mowing service, do we think that they somehow, what, have bigger properties, smaller properties, was under VEA, I understand you get 15 hours per year of lawn mowing service, but under Merca, 26 hours. So how does that work? Unfortunately, Senator, before I hand over to Ms Rumble to talk about lawn mowing, that is an issue with our legislation, as you've yeah. heard. Um, and it's, if I can offer, a funeral benefit's the same. Under VEA, you're eligible for less than you are under Merca. Right, Yes. right. It's All right. Important piece of work there, but Ms. Rundle's got the lawn mowing. Uh, yeah. Well, probably, uh, Secretary, you've probably answered the main question. I think there's 
with the, it is the difference in legislation. That, but having said that... How does it, that work, that under one you can get 15 hours of lawn mowing service and the other is 26? Be, because, Senator, these are the... Um, the idiosyncrasies of the differences uh, across the legislation, and we too um, would like to see some of this evened but, out. But I, but I would just but, say to you that if a person is assessed as requiring more under VEA, then we do make decisions under exceptional circumstances, and there are VEA clients receiving more than 15 hours. Or be it, they can't access it at the moment. That. And I acknowledge that if there's not a supplier, uh, you're right, in that particular area, yeah, that is Yeah, but is there issue. a supplier anywhere in Australia at the moment? Yes, well, we've got uh, clients receiving lawn mowing services elsewhere. Under VEA or MERCA? I'm pretty sure we've got it under both. Under Senator, both? Yeah. All right. All right, so it does exist in some places. Yeah. All right. Then with rent assistance, I understand there was a change as of the 1st of January this year. That's correct. And uh, I understand it was budgeted for 2,500 TPIs, is that correct? Um, Ms Hancock will have to give me the number, but there was certainly um, a number of um, TPI veterans who would benefit from that change yeah. in legislation, but I don't have the actual number. The suggestion put to me was uh, that it was to benefit 2,500 TPIs, then it was opened up and we now have 7,000 claimants, but it's still the same budgeted amount. I'm just wondering how the maths is going to work out, if what I'm told is correct. Um, Veronica Hancock, First Assistant Secretary of Veteran and Family Policy Division. Um, we estimated that there would be 6,900 veterans, that includes TPIs and others, um, who would benefit from the changes to rent assistance. So far since the 1st of January, we have 5,370 veterans who have got uh, increased rent assistance or rent assistance for the first time. I don't know how many of those are TPI. Right, so the rent assistance that commenced as of the beginning of this year was not only designated for the TPI originally. That's right, it's for any veteran oh, who is right. renting privately who hits the eligibility thresholds for rent assistance. All right, thank you for that. And final topic, the Headstone Project. And Mark Walgraves. Pardon? And Mark Walgraves. Yes, that's yes. the one. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, a wonderful program, initiated and founded by uh, the great Andrea Gerard in my home state of Tasmania, yes, doing fantastic work and um, mm. wanting to do a bit more work, including in Devonport of recent times. That's mm. in the seats so ably represented, not only by the good Tasmanian Liberal senators, but more importantly, Gavin Pearce, the member for Braddon. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering any sort of funding or prospects in relation to ongoing support for the Headstone project? So at this stage, Chair, no, um, but that doesn't mean it's not um, under consideration because it was a very successful program. It was um, indeed. And uh, we were really impressed and I know that uh, the community was very disappointed when it ceased on the 30th of June. Um, so we're looking at um, different options that we can put forward and I believe that government is considering those at the moment. All right. Senator Lambie, you have the call. Um, could you tell me how the department is commemorating Anzac Day this year? Uh, with the, yeah, that'd be great. Certainly. Um, so what we are developing now, Senator, are some options to um, have back again this year uh, international services in France. Um, as you know, we have uh, for the last couple of years been able to um, conduct those services in France and Turkey. Um, so uh, Mr Bayliss and the team are currently going through some planning and we're working very closely with DFAT uh, to look at if we can, so it's probably smaller scale because of less travellers and, and uh, making sure that uh, everybody's within a COVID safe environment. But our hope is um, certainly that they will be 
on again this year. Oh, okay. So um, nobody in the last two years has travelled over there at all from the department last year, the year before. No, not for not for international services. Okay. Um, I'm assuming that you're also uh, planning services in Australia too. No, uh, the Australia uh, the domestic services for ANZAC Day are usually conducted by RSLs um, in each of the, the state um, and territories. Correct me if I'm wrong. And the, War and the Australian War Memorial with the RSL here in ACT is the national service. Okay. So will that include PNG as well? Because you used to go to PNG once upon a time. Oh, well, PNG oh, is Kokoda. run by the RSL up there. So they oh, that's the RSL. RSL. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank you. But for that. we provide support to them. We do have um, Bamana Cemetery, of course. Our Office of Australian War Graves up there supports uh, the Bamana Cemetery. And we often send um, um, a small team to support the RSL uh, to conduct those services. Do you intend on sending a small team this year? Tim Bayless, uh, Acting Director of Office, Office of Australian War Graves. Yes, we are intending to send a small team to support that service at Vermont. What is a small team? How, how, many, how many does that usually involve? Uh, probably two from Australia. We also have uh, a presence in, uh, in uh, Papua New Guinea okay. um, from our War Graves team, and they're also in location and they'll support the uh, service as well. Okay. Uh, are the staff from the department planning to go back to services in France and Turkey? Uh, yes, Senator. Um, how many staff are you planning to send to France and to Turkey? Uh, we're still working through that at the moment um, to look at what are the safety and security requirements, working of course with the host nations and um, the heads of mission in the, the two um, countries to just to work out for safety and security and, uh, and importantly for Turkey we work closely with New Zealand and at this stage New Zealand are considering uh, the numbers they'd be sending over because it's actually their year to lead the, the commemorative services in Turkey. So there's a few things we're working through and I don't have the final numbers at this Is stage. Is there a ballpark figure, 5, 10, 20, 50? Oh, it's normally, um, in past years it's been up to 30 for those two locations, in oh, each so, location. So that's for France and Turkey, or 30 to France and then 30 to Turkey? 30, correct, the latter, 30 to each. Uh, is there anyone with outside the department that you that you will be paying for anybody else's um, travel to attend those services, or is it just for staff? It would just be the staff that um, we would identify to go over there. That's from the department to run the service, yeah. Uh, will you be attending the ceremony in Australia, Miss Cousins, or are you planning to go to services in France and Turkey? No, I'll be at the War Memorial, Senator. You'll be at the War Memorial? Yes. In Canberra? Yes. Okay. Uh, when will your staff arrive in Europe? Oh, um, I think that's still part of the planning. They'd certainly arrive a few, at least a week, uh, before the event to work with the um, host nations to set up all the logistics and the infrastructure um, and all the rehearsals um, that are required to, um, to conduct the, the services there. Okay, and we probably would have broadcasting again this year. I know we will in Turkey. We're still working through that for France. Uh, so to work with the, the broadcasters uh, to set up all of the, the details. So they probably get in there at least a week before the Anzac Day. Uh, 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 so how does it work? Do the staff go to France first or do they go to Turkey separate, first? Two separate uh, contingents, uh, Senator. So okay. there'll be a contingent that will go to Turkey and one that will go to France. Why well, if there's nobody else going and um, you're not taking any veterans this time... Why would, you be, why would so many staff be going over there? Uh, because what they do on the, the ground is that we have, um, if I can describe, with the host nation, and particularly Turkey, our obligation to make sure the site is safe and secure, and uh, Turkish officials make sure we're supported by the gendarmes and similarly in France, and our team uh, work with the logistics provider, the event provider, to set up all of the, the sound systems, um, the, the uh, Fed guard is there to... Um, do all the ceremonial work, so there's quite a bit of... But, but we're not taking any other Australians over there. You're just sending your staff over there for a trip. I, I don't understand no, it's that. No, it's actually to welcome visitors that are travelling through France and Turkey who would like to visit commemorative services. We've got a lot of expats over there and um, 
tourists um, who do like to go to the events. They're all ticketed, so um, we know the numbers of Australians. And a lot of the tour operators organise bus trips uh, for Australians to visit the site. And similarly with, um, um, with Turkey, you have the Australian Commemorative Site, and then um, New Zealand runs a site up on um, um, Chanak Bear. So th there are a number of services of which we work very closely with New Zealand in Turkey. And then in France, in Villas Bretonne, at the Australian National Memorial, uh, we run a service there. And then um, the uh, French host services down in the villages, of which all the Australians um, who are travelling and even French tourists um, will visit those services. They, well, are, they uh, are very popular. Why can't the consulate staff in Europe do that? Well, that, they are there. Um, oh, you've got them as well. Wow. So the head of mission will be there. She will certainly lay a wreath. Um, it's, that's normal. But they don't actually run the event. They, okay. uh, they attend that with us. Right. So but they support with us. But they don't have that number of staff in in country to be able to run the big events that um, that we do run there. How many days are they planning? Like, how many days do you plan for each group to spend? Uh, you know, how many how many days do they spend in Turkey, and then how many do the groups spend in France? Uh, they generally go in two uh, packets, Senator. Uh, yeah. One small packet will go early, and they'll probably spend two weeks in uh, France. And, and how many is in that packet? Uh, approximately five to ten. Right. And, and then they're, they're a, doing what? Uh, they're doing all the logistics and setup <laughs> for the events and okay. making sure all the liaison and the tasks with the uh, local security forces um, and, uh, is, is, is arranged. And then we have a small team that come, or a larger team that comes over that does uh, all that point-to-point uh, -point people movement, uh, bus control, um, transport, um, uh, escorting uh, uh, people, particularly in, in Turkey, being with our with Turkish uh, security forces to particularly look after uh, Australians over there. Um, would, we, would the committee be able to have um, a look at the itinerary for the trips to France and Turkey that have been outlined? We still go through the detail. Yeah, we have it, as I mentioned, Senator. We haven't finalised all that, but I don't see any reason why we couldn't share that with the committee. About drafts. Yeah, no, drafts or um, I'll have proposals. To, I'll have to have a look at that, Senator. I'm sorry. But if, Has there if been we, drafts or proposals done? Have we? We've Has there been drafts briefed, or proposals briefed, done already? Yeah, we've certainly briefed the minister on what some options might be, but no, we're doing knows, some further if work you on it. The minister, I just ask whether you've done drafts or proposals on paper. Uh, we have provided a brief to the minister, Senator. Can you provide that to the committee, please? <laughs> that would be for the minister. It's a, a brief to him. I'll take it on notice. That'd be good. Um, are any of the staff going to Paris during that period of time? Oh, well, a couple certainly would be, Senator, to visit the um, embassy, and that's where the ambassador, Australian ambassador is. Um, so there would be maybe one or two that might have to go to France to talk to um, the ambassador to finalise all of the protocol and logistics. And do staff usually stay on afterwards or go in between, take days off, do shopping out of that? No. That... They come back, Senator. Okay, so nobody's ever down. gone to Paris. So, nobody's ever in the before COVID hit. In the past, nobody's ever spent a day or half a day shopping in Paris. Is that what you're telling me? I, I'm not aware of it, Senator. But that no doesn't personal mean personal leave. No, they're not able to take personal leave after the event. They come home. And there's definitely been no shopping trips while they, while they haven't taken their leave. Then, not no stopovers. Not that I'm aware of, Senator. But I can take that on notice That'd if you be like. Great. Yep. <laughs> Officials travel in nowadays. A business class, Senator. Wow. What, so, 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 what does it cost these days for? So, if you've got thirty going to Turkey, maybe, and then maybe thirty going to France. Uh, what, 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 what is what is business class? Is that about ten grand or something? What, what, what is that? I have How to much? take the actual cost on notice, Senator. I don't. So you have haven't done any. So you haven't done any actual costings on paper either. I haven't, but um, certainly uh, Mr. Have Ballas you, Mr. has been done. Mr. Ballas, we can give you, you rough done any costings. We can give you some rough costings, but noting that we haven't locked in any final options yet. Yeah, no, no, that's not what I'm asking. If you've given the minister something, when you gave the minister in that, were costings providing that? Yes. Provided, right. For travel, yes, and some other costings, yeah. Okay. Uh, approximately, it is about ten grand for uh, travel for an individual to go across there. 
Okay. So what's the total cost to the Department of running these services in France and Turkey? Because I've, I've assumed you've calculated that for the amount of time you've got in there if you've done a draft to give to the Minister. We've got, uh, we get an appropriation from government for 3.6 million to conduct the services in Turkey and a similar appropriation of a 3.2 to conduct services in France. Wow, so we're looking at six and a half million dollars. So what's all the staff, the accommodation, the travel, and all, what, what is all that come for those, if you're looking at about 60 people over there without the flight, what, what does that all come up to? It's certainly less than what we've been appropriated, Senator. Um, and I think if we can just revisit the history of this, Australia was asked to, and this department, as part of one of our key outcomes, of which we've got three, um, we are responsible for delivering services in Turkey and in France for Anzac Day. That um, eventuated from um, issues in Turkey where Australian tourists um, were made a mess of Anzac Cove and the Turkish officials were not happy and that was quite a few years ago, certainly before my time. And then it was determined that this department would run those services and we have received annual appropriation to conduct those services that are dignified and that can accommodate and keep safe and secure those that visit Turkey and visit the peninsula and to make sure that the peninsula is respected and it's left in a safe and uh, tidy state after those commemorative services. And we have have conducted that successfully for many years, contributes to this country's reputation and also um, some diplomacy in working with Turkish officials. So that is important to, for the context of why we do it. And in order to run those events of which the department is held accountable for, of which I am also accountable for those staff that deploy there, I need to make sure they are kept safe. And particularly um, in changing security environments and COVID environment, I need to ensure that the staff are well looked after and we're doing those COVID plans. And similarly in France, the Australian National Memorial is our memorial and we have the Sir John Monash Centre at Villas Bretonneux. And for years we have now been working very closely with uh, officials in the Embassy, with DFAC colleagues, to run a, a dignified and respectful service in uh, Villas Bretonneux. And we go down to the villages as well with the mayors to make sure that they have the opportunity to thank Australians for their sacrifice on the Western Front in the First World War. And they are very important events which we take extremely seriously. They're not a jolly. Um, they are not intended to go shopping to Paris. They are intended to make sure that we commemorate <coughs> service and sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, in your plan, um uh, you know, in your, your draft planning and with your costings, uh, what were there COVID rules that apply to the services in France and in Turkey? And have you looked at how many people they're allowed to have there, the restrictions for social distancing, things like that? How many people are actually allowed to go in the first place? How many tourists are allowed to... Uh, well, how many I'll people do you expect to, to go to the service? I mean, you're sending over the same... Yeah, there will be restrictions and COVID plans okay, in place, so and do we're you doing need as all many of that people now, Senator. ...as what you usually use in the past to have all those people going over. That's what we're looking at now. So, for example, if you look at the COVID safe plan, if you have got, say, um, at the risk analysis that says maybe a third of your contingent might contract COVID, what redundancy do you need for all the tasks? That, we do trips to task. What are the uh, not, tasks that are going yet. to be performed? That's and fine. what happens if a third yeah. of the contingent right. comes down with COVID? So what is my redundancy that I require? Because I'm the accountable authority for those that deploy to those two locations. And we are going through all that planning now. We are doing an assessment of what are the numbers and what is the actual cost and it will be within the appropriation that we have been provided what to make sure we do that. What are the numbers in France that they are expecting that they are allowing to be at these services in Turkey? Mr Bayliss yeah. might you be able know, to answer that. You could not that. do any costings or staffing until you knew the numbers. So what numbers are they expecting in Turkey? We're getting significant <laughs> interest from France and England in terms of the services to be conducted in France. So we're getting lots of calls at what is happening, what's interest. And I would say at the moment that interest would suggest a about 300 inquiries, be it that we're still two months away from Anzac Day. The important thing, I think, for any commemoration, it's not necessarily the numbers. It's about the solemn commemoration that we're doing. We have 44 lost souls there in, in France, yeah, yeah. another 8,500 in, uh, in, in Gallipoli is an iconic service. It's important okay. for us to commemorate yeah. those iconic yeah. 
uh, commemorative events. Yeah, it is apparently very, very important on Australian soil too, while the rest of us remain here, while you go over there on your trip. So my question here is quite simple to you. Um, there is no main national service, but just a small ticket of dawn service here, a march with no saluting officer or, or and any wreath laying. The main wreath laying for Anzac Day is to be held at the last post ceremony. That is at the War Memorial. So that's, that's my first problem. And then, so my question is, why are you running no services in Australia, but flying 30 people business, business class to Paris for a service that basically no Aussie, except DBA staff on a payroll can attend? Do you really think that passes the sniff test? Well, for one thing, Senator, we do not run the national service here at the Australian War Memorial. We are responsible, and it's part of our delivery of Outcome 3, to deliver those services in Turkey and France. I'm simply asking, do you that think is that our responsibility to deliver those. Right. Do you, do you think that passes the sniff test while you're sending those people over there on trips and we've got nothing big here going on and you're not saying, well, nothing to do with us and we don't want to be involved? Senator, I'm delivering Seriously. on a government commitment to, for services in Turkey and France. That is my job. So, um, so do we know how many people will be attending? I have both? told you I'll take you all of that on notice because we are still finalising the planning arrangements and we are still to provide those options to the minister. We when have given him a preliminary brief, which, as we said, the minister may wish to share that with you, but um, we are continuing our planning and we have not finalised that at this point. Um, have you been overseas to attend ANSAC Day services as a representative of DVA before, Ms Cousins? Yes, I have. I attended uh, Gallipoli in 2011 and I attended France in 2019. Have you looked at other lower cost options? How is business class the lowest cost? Is that value for money? Senator, we're looking at all options at the moment. Okay, so, so let me get this right. So you've basically got draft a draft plan which you've given to the minister, and which you're going to provide to us. Is that correct? Subject but in to the, the meantime, you're still looking into options. You're going to correct. give them a draft number two, are we? Is this what we're doing? How many drafts are you get going to supply the minister? We have offered to brief the Minister on Friday on what those options are so we can finalise a brief, but at this stage we're still waiting for New Zealand to advise us if they are going to lead the contingent and what are their numbers. I have a, hopefully a meeting with the CDF of the New Zealand Defence Force next week to discuss. As you appreciate, it is a joint service. Um. Okay. Can I ask a supplementary on that? Yes, please. So, so just, uh, I think uh, one of the um, issues that Senator Lambie is getting to is that um, if there are COVID restrictions and then reduced numbers, then the support staff might change accordingly. Uh, Senator, it certainly may, but what we still have to factor in, even if one person um, a bit, uh, attends the site, we are required to have appropriate security, particularly if officials attend, which we know both ambassadors will attend. We have an obligation, and the Turkish officials particularly, have outlined what their expectation is in relation to security. So there will always be a security footprint, regardless of the actual numbers that uh, appear okay, at the so site. Just, just if I reverse engineer this, if we were, host, we were having an event here uh, to, that, that commemorated a, a foreign service, in terms of security, um, uh, yeah, the AFP or someone like that would provide that sort of service. When you say security, what does that mean? So, as I've been to, to both sites, um, around uh, the site at the Australian Commemorative Site, which is just down from Anzac Cove slightly, we, we set up a perimeter. Sure. And certainly the gendarme in Turkey will have a huge security presence there, yeah. um, of which you don't see, sure. <laughs> but they have a, a huge presence. And we sure. establish a, um, a perimeter which people have to go be ticketed um, they have to, we have to advise all uh, Turkey who is coming onto the site. They have to go through all of those metal detectors yeah. um, and have bags checked like you would at well, any well, major I event. guess my point is so that the metal detectors, for example, would be manned by people that you might have contracted locally. That's correct. Thought. Okay, and I'm just trying to work out what, how, the, how the security aspect... I think security is mostly about 
people and you wouldn't be in a position to be able to have anyone armed or necessarily even able to, you, you, to, to, to conduct security. Just like it's a sound system. Why do we need to take someone over there and do a sound system? Can't you hire someone in? It's already in France. I'm sure they know how to use a sound system. We do hire a lot of local labour in both locations. I think you should also recognise that both France and Turkey are opening up. Uh, the opportunities to travel, the op opportunities to visit are opened up in those sure, two regions. Sure, and, and that might go to numbers, but again, just going to the security aspects of it, I'm, I'm just trying to work out in my head why you take Australians across to do security when I suspect the most uh, efficient and sensible thing might be to employ security guards familiar with local laws, um, perhaps that are certified in some way. Uh, I did, I did, I, I, that's the bit I don't understand. Taking security in terms of us. security from Australia, it's more of a security liaison function where we liaise with the local security forces. Okay. And when the, in terms of manpower, often we send people with as liaison officers with security forces so that they can personally deal with Australians that might be in those locations that might be having some issues. Okay, so they're more liaison people. The, the hard security. We don't have authority to exercise. Yeah, well, that, that was my point. Yes. Is that but it's a bit of, a bit of yeah. both, if I can, as well, there, Senator. From when people are going through the security barriers, the, a lot of them are Australian. Sure. So having Australians there alongside the gendarme, and they're helping talk, um, speaking sure. and checking the bags and talking to the people to direct them where they go on the site, and then throughout because the events normally people come onto the site sort of afternoon, they stay all night until the dawn service so they, they're sleeping on the site there sure. and the staff from DVA are on duty um, yeah, I was just trying, help trying to untangle in my mind mm. the idea of a hardcore security person which would no, almost always sorry. be local police for services and or some security services that are hired familiar with local laws able to use force all of those sorts of things that was the picture you painted in my mind when you said you know, I'm taking a security detail across. So it's, well, I, it's something different. I think I'd be asking why you weren't taking defence for that, but anyway, and that would be defence's pick up. Um, do you think that, as well as providing that draft, that you could give us a list of the staff that you've approached to go? Uh, who's planning on going that have said yes, they're available? Uh, and what their role is on notice, if that's OK, within the department? I'll probably be able to give you the role, Senator. We haven't selected the staff yet. And, um, right, if I could have the roles, thanks. Yep. The That'd roles I can certainly do and the numbers against those roles. Okay, uh, I just want to go to the veterans hubs, unless you had any other questions on that, Rex. No, no, no. Good. Uh, the government's finally released the UTAS feasibility study into Tasmania veterans wellbeing centres. The main report is just 24 pages. That cost $120,000. Do you reckon that was good value for money? It certainly um, informed the delivery of a wellbeing centre in Tasmania, Senator, so yeah. I think that would be good. Uh, I'd argue it wasn't good value for money because you've completely ignored what the study recommended. Isn't that right? I don't know whether that's correct, but Ms Pope can certainly that would be give correct. you some more detail. Uh, well, Senator, we haven't implemented the $5 million yet in Tasmania, so there isn't any um, evidence yet to say whether we've done what the study suggested or not, but oh. I, I can certainly tell you that the intention is very much to align with the recommendations of that uh, report, particularly yeah. in relation to uh, a dispersed service model um, and the feedback that uh, Tasmanian veterans are not keen to travel distances to access services mm -hmm. and so a dispersed model mm. where there might be more than one centre that uh, veterans and their families might be able mm -hmm. to access was uh, certainly the feedback from, from that report mm. um, and quite a lot of feedback on the kinds of services that they would like to see uh, such centres provide. So, um, so I just want to go over the uh, recommendation, if you don't mind, what the study recommended, because how I, how I read it was that the research said Tasmania should have two wellbeing hubs, uh, one in Hobart and one in Launceston, plus a network of other smaller centres. Yet the Minister's press release on the report says you're going to ignore all that and put a transition, in, transition centre in Burnie instead. What was the point of the study if you were going to chuck it in the bin the same day you release it? You've completely gone against what it asked you to do and instead you're going to put one of them in Burnie. 
I can explain, Senator. Oh, that'd be great. Uh, there was a separate announcement made of an additional $2.5 million for Tasmania, which you rightly point out was announced at the same time as the uh, feasibility study was released. 2.2 million of that is, as you point out, um, allocated to Burnie and uh, $250,000 to Launceston RSL. That's separate to the $5 million that is in play in relation to the uh, uh, feasibility study and wellbeing centres for uh, Tasmania. Um, so your so your department set aside thirty million for six hubs across the country. Uh, the Townsville hub got five million from you guys to get started. The Adelaide hub got the same, but the Tr Bernie Transition Centre is getting two point two million. Why is Bernie getting less than the mainland centres? No, sorry, Senator. There is five million in addition to what uh, Bernie and Launceston are getting. So it's a total of 7.5 million for Tasmania, 5 million for um, wellbeing centre, centres, depending. Um, and because we, we would have to do as we've done with every other location for wellbeing centres to go out for expression of interest. And uh, then it, it might be one, it might be two, it might be three, it depends on what uh, comes okay. back. Okay, so um, where did the 2.2 million figure come from? Was that costed by the department? What analysis is there behind that figure? That how, did that, how did that money just float around like that? It was a decision of government, Senator, and we're implementing it as, as requested. No, 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 I'm not, I'm not asking. Yeah, OK, so maybe uh, you, Senator O'Donium, can find out where they flaked the 2.2 million from um, and was there any analysis? So if you've just... If they've said it's 2.2 million, where did, the, where did the analysis of that come from? Where's the analysis? to say why they're, that they're getting 2.2 million in Braddon? I can't answer that question, Senator. It was a matter for government. It's a decision of when government. When you, when you take on notice uh, what information... That's because it's a Liberal seat there, when, when, marginal. When you say it's um, a decision for government, I, just, I break things up into the judiciary, the legislature, legislature and the executive. I presume you're saying it was a decision of the executive government, which includes you guys. <coughs> Or are you saying it's a decision of, that went to cabinet? Um, because I'm and, not too sure the way the way it's supposed to work is ministers don't generally make decisions without receiving a brief of some kind from a department like yours. You know, if you you are some, the subject matter experts. Sometimes they do, Senator. So you're saying in this instance, the government received no brief on the two point. 2.5. Um, no, we did not brief on the 2.5. Did you provide any advice to the government no, on Senator. that centre in Burnie? No, Senator. No, Senator. Well, so how was, under what program was it funded? So, something that's not a, a, department, a responsibility of the department? It's a wellbeing centre. So it's a wellbeing centre that was never told to be put in Burnie, but we're deciding to put it in Burnie. So there's, there's no, that, that's not what the recommendation said, never mentioned anything about Burnie at all. Mm. Nothing on the northwest coast. Uh, but anyway, the. Minister, did it involve any colour coded spreadsheets, red and, um, red and blue? Well, I appreciate your references to matters that are entirely outside this portfolio. Uh, I've indicated I'll take on notice all matters related to this and provide to the committee what I'm able to through that process. So, so the department didn't do a proposal on why we should put the transition centre in Burnie and why we should not put it anywhere else in Tasmania? There's, you didn't provide anything at all? In relation to the five million, uh, we have the feasibility study that you've already uh, referenced and we will con uh, conduct consultations with uh, Tasmanian veterans and their families in order to determine who the best lead organisations might be in Tasmania, how many locations might be the optimum where they might be. Uh, that, that work is uh, still to come, Senator. The 2.5 is separate to the 5 million, and it's the 5 million that the feasibility study related to. Oh, oh yeah, OK. How, how, how long do you reckon it's going to take you? How much time are you going to spend with all those families down there? In that, Because you know, this would be a world record if you actually did this in four weeks to get all that information. Why don't you give me a timeline on that? I can do that on notice, Senator. That would be wonderful. 
So, so I just want to get this right. A feasibility study that cost 120000 was ignored for a government pick. Is that what's happened here? I wouldn't agree with that, Senator. As I've described, the feasibility study relates to the $5 million, <coughs> which has yet to be allocated uh, through a consultation process and the establishment of uh, lead organisations through an expression of interest that is yet to take place. Uh, the $2.5 million was handled differently. OK, so first of all, did you look at where the veterans are and where the need is? Because most veterans in Burnie would tell you that there's more people who need help in Lonnie, to be honest, and that's what your 120,000 study said too. So where did you get the breakdown of... Because um, really, I've asked this in the past, of breakdown of veterans and where they are, and you can never give me numbers. So this is a brand new... Have we got a brand new... Um, we got a brand new person doing all this now, have we? Because I have never, ever... I've never, ever been able to get a breakdown from you people exactly how many veterans are where in this country. When did this happen? I, I don't know your question, Senator. Did, so the 2.5... Where are you getting your number? Where are your veterans, Senator? As you tell said, me, in five electorates in Tasmania, how many is in each electorate? I, veterans. I, I didn't say I knew that no. um, information. That's Senator. what I'm asking you. Right, so, so Senator, how do you we, know where these can, hubs are going? We can actually have a look um, broadly at where veterans are located. So we do have some data on that, which I'm happy to look at and take on notice for you in relation to Tasmania. And I can South tell Australia. you I believe there are about 8,000 veterans in Tasmania, but uh, I'd have to take on notice their distribution. And I'm taking that off the top of my head, so you can, you're looking like I might be wrong, and I may be, but I <laughs> well, believe right, that's yes, roughly lost 4, the... And haven't gained any more in the last six years. No, that's, that's roughly the, the number. Uh, but it's not just uh, uh, distribution that's taken into account. There's also infrastructure and transport and other considerations. And we would take advice from uh, the uh, representative organisations who may be the leads in determining what the best locations might be for those uh, centres. Can, can you take that question on notice about distribution numbers and distribution yeah. across Certainly. South yes, Australia as well? Yeah. The local yes. member for. Bernie has been exceptionally outspoken and supportive of a wellbeing centre for uh, the Bernie area, and I think there were, there was the what? There was, if you like, for want of a better term, a wellbeing centre, but without government That's support right. locally a through a local GP, if I recall correctly. Mm, yeah, I don't think that's going very well. I can ask who, questions on it if you like, who, but I don't think that's going Who did a lot well. of uh, good work and, uh, yeah, oh. that was part of the reason to for mm. formally so, establishing. Okay. So, so the, the, it wasn't, uh, the Bernie wasn't chosen because Mr Pearce has asked for it. Is that what you've asked? Is that what you're telling me? We well, he, comment on that. he advocated for it, most definitely. But it's not based on numbers. It's not based on numbers. It's not based on infrastructure or anything else. They're just getting $2.2 million. Captain's pick. <laughs> Captain's pick. Here we go. OK, can you give me on notice everything you've done to plan for and establish the Bernie Hub? Costings, any feasibility studies you've done and any analysis of the value for money of putting the hub there instead of Launceston? I want to know why Bernie Senator, was chosen instead of what I just need to be clear that the decision hasn't been sent. made to place the centre in Bernie and not in Launceston. The $5 million is still to be allocated. Where's the $5 million going then? I mentioned that there's consultation to take place. How and long will the consultation of interest, take? Because you've had three years. We've all been talking about that for three years. An expression years. of interest uh, process to identify lead organisations uh, in, and then to determine where the best locations will be. Who's doing the consultation? The department will be doing the consultations. When will the de when will the department when will the department be on the um, when will the department be on the ground in Tasmania? We hope in the near future, Senator. Is there a reason you haven't been down there already since the coalition promised that to Tasmania when they first took when they first won when they won the last election? We're hoping to do it shortly, Senator. When does the expression of interest take place, and how long uh, will that take to to um, be dealt with and the consultation. I agreed to provide a timeline on on, uh, on notice, uh, Senator, but uh, oh, typically it's not. To, uh, uh, we'd like to give the organisations time to put forward sure. their business cases. Um, sure. Generally, 
six to eight weeks for them to put those cases forward after we've conducted the consultations. Uh, it's not then very long to assess those uh, proposals and uh, determine which organisations are bit most suitable to be the lead organisations and take the uh, program forward. So that takes us into the caretaker period, doesn't it? Uh, potentially. Mm. Mm. Is, is it a competitive tender? It's, a, it's an assessed process, Senator, so organisations put forward proposals against the uh, guidelines. We have one running now, Senator, for South, South East East Queensland. Queensland, so mm -hmm. if, if you see how that's being conducted, that will give you an indication of how it may be uh, conducted in Tasmania. As we have done in all the other locations, right. well, the other locations where a lead organisation wasn't already um, in, the, in position. Like Nowra and... Um, Wodonga and, and Darwin. Uh, Darwin, yeah. Do, can you tell me whether members of parliament um, ever, or have their, do they get to nominate um, organisations for funding? No, we do the analysis and um, we then provide advice. advice. That's how it has worked with the previous one, Senator. Uh, so, and then who's the decision maker on that when you? The department makes a recommendation to the minister, Senator. Right. Okay, and that's always done that way, is it? Yes, it is. In the cases where a lead organisation wasn't already identified, so in the case of Perth, you'd be aware that the RSL already had a program and a project underway, and the funding was allocated to uh, the Western Australian RSL. But where there wasn't a lead organisation, for example, in Darwin, we went through a, a similar process of identifying a suitable lead organisation through a consultative process. Uh, are there, um, so is there a certain, when you make a decision, do you have to run through a criteria while you're making that decision? There's a set of guidelines against which the organisations have to put forward their proposals. Could you um, please provide them to the um, Yes, Senator, committee, they're publicly please. available, I, but I can do that, yep. Uh, did the, did the, your government, did your department, um, um, so, sorry, all the information I can find about the Veteran Wellbeing Centre, oh, sorry, on all the information I can find about the Veteran Wellbeing Centre network comes from ministerial press releases. How is the Wellbeing Centre network going to run? What services are you looking to fund and how will you select them? Will you fund existing organisations like you've done already for the RSL in Launceston? Or are you proposing to set up a bunch of new service centres around the state? Are you talking about Tasmania in particular? I am talking about Tasmania in particular, yes. Okay, so the uh, consultations and the feasibility study that we've already conducted um, have given us quite a lot of information about the sorts of services that Tasmanian veterans and their families are looking to see from a wellbeing centre. Uh, the intention is that the lead organisation then, once appointed, uh, continues to consult and engage with uh, local veterans and their families in order to work out what would be the best combination of services. And the general experience with the other centres is that they start with a core of uh, maybe two or three organisations uh, or types of services and they build as they go along. And you would see that in Townsville, uh, you'd see similar in South Australia. Um, uh, and they respond to local needs and they make their own decisions about uh, what, what services they would uh, like to commence with, what other things they want to add, what works for their local uh, community. And within the broad guidelines, uh, they can make decisions that are different from centre to centre. So the money for the two Tasmanian wellbeing centres was set aside more than six months ago? Is that correct? Uh, yes, it is more than six months ago, Senator. Yes. Uh, you've had the feasibility study since April last year. Is that correct? Yes, Senator. So what's taking so long to get the money out the door? Honestly, you can chuck a quarter of a million at the Lonely RSL, but there's still no plan for anywhere else. Well, the remaining uh, centres is not necessarily two centres, Senator. It'll depend on the outcome of the consultations and the expressions of interest. But yes, Hobart and Launceston are two likely uh, locations, but there may be others that are suitable. That'll be an outcome of the consultations okay. and the expression of interest okay. process. You've got veteran suicides going on out there. You've got a Royal Commission you've taken since April last year. You've had six months. You've just had a report that said it should be in Lonnie and, I, Lonnie and Hobart, and you're going, let me get this right, you're going back out there to do more consultation. No, Seriously. Senator, I'm sorry, Senator, but no, that's not how it's working. There's $5 million for Tasmania. 
of which no decision has been made in relation to wellbeing centres in Tasmania. That needs and is subject to consultation to then determine where is the best location for those centres or centre, it might be one, it might be two, um, in Tasmania. So that's the $5 million of which Ms Pope mm -hmm. has identified that yeah, we yeah. will go out and consult on, as we've done with those other organisations that we needed a lead organisation, because we don't run them. Um, so in relation to the $2.5 million for Launceston and Burnie, um, that is a completely separate issue to the $5 million. Okay. Okay, so why is it you can decide to have one hub in every other state, but in Tasmania, you're now going for two? No, we're why not, don't we, you explain that to we me? We haven't, Senator, so because the five million, we haven't actually consulted on that yet. It might be Why one. not, Ms Cousins? Because it's still under consideration before the minister announces the consultation. So it will go out shortly. Oh dear. Okay, so I think what I want to be upfront about and what other people are worried about down in Tasmania, because you'll find that veterans already know it needs to be in Launceston. The RSL does very well there. Three floors, great building, needs redone, best advocacy, best wellbeing centre we've got there. We already know what's going on there. So what we're all worried about is that the government's going to spend the money on getting Liberal MPs elected, not on veterans. And you can understand why they're worried about that right now with what's happened with sports rorts, car park rorts and the like, and that they're going to get ripped off down there because they're not going to get where it should go because it will not be based on veterans' needs. It will be based on the sitting MPs' needs, not the veterans. Well, if that were the case, Senator, analyse it yourself. The member for Bass got elected with a margin of about 500 votes. The member for Braddon with a margin of five thousand votes. So if it were to be solely on marginality as you are asserting, then one assumes Launceston would be um, favoured over Bernie. So your own logic fails you. It's not about being favoured, it makes no common sense in having it in Bernie full stop. And there's other people in the play this time, uh, Chair, isn't there? Can I just ask Yes, please do. The Secretary. So I just yeah, eight weeks from now takes us up to about the time a, 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 an election will have to be called. Um, under the caretaker conventions, one of the considerations you must make as the secretary, because a lot of the responsibility then goes back to you, is uh, the dollar value of the commitment and whether a minister has to make the decision. Uh, on a $5 million commitment uh, made by a minister, would that be something that would um, fall within the caretaker convention such that the minister would have to consult the opposition? Um, can I take that on notice, Senator? I think it would have to, if, with such a significant uh, decision. Um, I believe that the minister would consult with the opposition on that type of decision. Well, I, I think they have to, as long as it meets yes. your criteria, but having come from... That's correct, yeah. Having come from PM&C, uh, when, when it gets into the caretaker mode, uh, in some respects, you then take control over what ought to be decided by, uh, by you know, in, in the portfolio, mm -hmm. more so even than the minister. Yes. If I, if I may, Senator, it's likely that we would conduct the consultations and the EOI process because that sort of work can go sure. on during caretaker mm -hmm. and it may be that the decision would be made post uh, caretaker. Yeah, well, it looks to me like that's what's going to happen. It could be. On the timing. Okay, so I just have one more question in this area, but can the department show um, where the money, show the money, where the money's, the money it's going to where it's needed? Because it looks like we've got 2.2 million being chucked at Bernie without justification and $5 million ready to go right before an election and a $120,000 report that's being ignored. So the really, report hasn't... I just hasn't... find this really bad, in bad taste when it's uh, about veterans first. I'll just repeat that the $5 million hasn't been allocated yet. The feasibility study relates to the $5 million. We'll be holding consultations and an expression of interest process in relation to that $5 million. Yeah. Oh, no, I think and it will be allocated to whichever okay. are the best uh, okay. locations. So I think, like I said, our concern is it smells like it's going to be rolled out two weeks or a week before an election. 
that's what my worry is. Uh, it, it can't be, as we've just been discussing right. with Senator Patrick. Uh, Senator. So I just want to go into the Royal Commission, the, the National Commissioner report now. Uh, I'm, I was very open and honest about a fan of not being a fan of the National Commissioner because of the way she was appointed. But one thing she got right was the effect of delays in the claims of process on veterans' mental health. In her final report, she says that excessive delays in DVA claims processing has caused veterans additional mental stress. She says this has had catastrophic consequences with claims being rushed through after a veteran has taken their life. Obviously, the Royal Commission will have more to say about your claims processing. But do you agree with the National Commissioner's assessment? So, um, Senator, I'm, I'm not a clinician, but I am aware from reading uh, Professor Colley's report and other reports such as the Productivity Commission report and the um, an Interim National Commission's report that a uh, compensation claim can act, aggravate um, a mental health condition or illness. And it is very important that we in the department recognise that and why we introduced a range of initiatives to help reduce that impact of a delayed claim process to make sure those that are at greater risk or at need are able to get connected with support and services through the department. Um, so Dr Boss has picked up on that fairly consistent theme. And if you go back to 20, 20, I think it was, um, where Professor Colley identified 11, um, 11 findings in his report about what we could do to improve the experience for veterans to try and reduce the impact of that compensation okay. claim process. So I, so I just want to ask this um, to the two of you sitting there now, and I want you, it's a yes or no question. Do you believe the detrimental impact of the, complex, of the complexity of the DVA system must not be understated and health professions have outlined to me that claims process can be as traumatic as the original injury. Do you both believe that the claims process has been as traumatic as, a, as the original injury? Not for Do you veterans. agree with what Dr Boss is saying? Some veterans, yes, will have that experience, Senator. I'm asking you whether you agree with her assessment, Ms Cousins. Not across the board, Senator. Not all veterans will have that experience. But yes, there will be veterans that will uh, be impacted by the claims processing system. Do you system. believe that some veterans, that their claims process can be as, as traumatic as their original injury? Do you believe that? I'm going to have to think about that one, Senator. Oh. <coughs> I am, because that is um, quite a complex question that you've asked, because I would have to know well, what the, the injury was that the veteran has experienced, because that's got might nothing be to do with the claims. I'm not asking you about the injury, well, I'm asking you about the claims the, process. The injury that the veteran I'm has you. experienced. I've, I just really okay. do not think I can honestly answer that. Um, without some consideration. Do you Senator? not think the way your claims process is done and that it can take seven to ten years does not destroy a family and their children? I would Are you going to say that to me? I'm going to say to you, Senator, that if a family is struggling as a result of our claims process, oh. that we can support them through the claims process and make sure that they're getting support. I would hate to think that they would not that they were silent through that. That they can come to us, they can come to Open Arms. If you, as you heard, it's been around 40 years to provide support. But what's also important that if they are unable to access treatment wherever they're living or unable to access support, we can help them find that. How? how I, okay. Let me rephrase it this way. How can you possibly sit there as a secretary of Department of Veterans Affairs and tell me the way that your claim processing is done at people, where it takes years and years and years, does not have just as much detrimental effect as the as the as the as the original injury, if not worse? That's the same question you asked me, Senator, and I'd prefer not to just jump at an answer to that. I need to consider it. But I do want to say that if there are families that are struggling as a result of our claims process, we have got so much in place now. It's not perfect. We know that, and we've discussed that before, but they should reach out to us or reach out to someone they trust to make sure they're getting the support through the process. 
because we can help them if they are prioritised through the process, if they are struggling. And we've extended family packages now for support to them. So I would encourage anybody that you're aware of going through that process to please contact us. Recommendation 4.2 was for you to simplify the claims process, which I know you're working on. Recommendation 4.3 was for all DVA staff who have dealings with clients to be given regular trauma-informed training. When did that start? Oh, I might have to ask Ms Cameron to um, answer that one, if that's OK. Um, so certainly the trauma-informed training has been underway for a, a period now, and um, Ms Cameron might be able to give you a bit more detail around that. Call on my earring, sorry. <laughs> I've lost so many earrings with these things. There we go. Um, Senator Leanne Cameron, First Assistant Secretary, Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, we have implemented ongoing training, um, uh, particularly around trauma-informed care and support, um, focused very much on our case coordination staff, but also providing um, information and support to our um, claims processing delegates. And certainly that is um, the basis of a lot of the care that we provide through Open Arms and the training and support that the staff in those um, teams receive as well. Uh, so, so that's ongoing. Uh, okay. But when, when did it start? So you, obviously this is a new recommendation. Uh, this was not happening according to um, the rep to Miss Boss before this was given to you. Mm -hmm. So when did this... You, you had some sort of training beforehand, which obviously was not effective, otherwise she wouldn't have said doing regular trauma-informed training. So when did that happen? When did that start? Yep, so we've been um, uh, providing trauma-informed training for, op for open arm staff for a very long time. Um, I would have to take on notice exactly when it started for um, staff outside of the open arms yeah. section. Yeah, DBA yep. staff, I think it, that's, yep. that's what you said. But it has started though? Yes, absolutely, Cinder. And yep. I think the point with uh, Dr Boss and um, we will take it on notice, but she was saying for all staff, all, okay. all um, staff that are um, working with veterans that they have that training, so it's expanding it, of uh, which okay. we have been doing. So can you tell me how you're assessing that, if it started? Obviously, if it only started last week, you're not getting an assessment, so I just want to see how you're assessing that that's actually working. Can you also provide the um, committee with that? Yep, it will take Thank that you. Notice. Uh, the Commissioner's report also said the government is exploring whether it's possible to treat Defence and DVA as a single entity for the purposes of the Privacy Act. This would make it easier for information to be shared between the departments. Can you tell us about where that work is up to? So, Senator, as you, 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 may, you may be aware, the whole report for Dr Boss is under consideration at the moment. There hasn't been a formal response to all the recommendations, but I can say for privacy that would be a matter for the Attorney-General's. They own the legislation for the Privacy Act. Okay. Okay, so we have no time frame on that. Um... Uh, I have a problem before I move on any further with, um, uh, and he's allowed me to talk about that with Mr Fusen is that he's gone to the Ombudsman. The Ombudsman's now been on to you for, I think, over six months, waiting for information from DVA so they can move on with uh, handling his case. Why is that taking DVA for that long I to get that information? I provided a response, Senator, but I'll, um, I'll find out who can respond to me on that one. Respond to you, sir. Senator, we will need to uh, uh, possibly follow up a little bit more for you in terms of the exact FOI request. We're very familiar with it and we've oh, been ombudsman. working. The Ombudsman, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, uh, why is he waiting? Yes, we, no. well, I, why, I'm, not why? Clear, I'm not clear, Senator, on your question because I understand that we've got regular communication going between the Ombudsman and also Mr Fusen, but I would say... They're asking for a document. I'm asking you why you can't provide... Why is it taking so long to provide um, that document? And they also request additional information in December. 
uh, and was told it'll be forthcoming in February. That's what you told him. So what date this month do you intend to give that to the Ombudsman? So can I, can I suggest that we do take that on notice and also that we just find out what we haven't. Perhaps you could give us a little bit more information as well uh, offline so that we can find out exactly what he was expecting mm -hmm. that we haven't given to him. But we would say to you that we are working really hard to try and give Mr Fewson all of those things which he's asked for. No, it's not him. He had to go to the Ombudsman, that, like I had to go to him, so I could get the stuff out of you people because you wouldn't provide it to him in the first place. OK, we'll need to take it on yes. now okay, to if find you can out do what's that. still so outstanding that for the Ombudsman. Yeah. Yeah. It is, no. Um, OK. Uh, could you please tell me um, how long is it taking... Uh, can I just ask a question yeah, about sure. that, if, if you don't mind? Yeah, please be my guest. Uh, the Ombudsman, I think it's Section 9 of their Act, has a, an extensive power to get access to pretty much anything unless the attorney issues a, a certificate to prevent that. Now, uh, he doesn't exercise that power normally. He simply seeks cooperation. Mm -hmm. I just wonder, you know, in terms of turnarounds for documents from the... if, a, if an Ombudsman makes a request, I would think I would have thought that would be relatively quick. So my understanding, Senator, is that we have been giving a lot to the Ombudsman and we're working very closely with the Ombudsman. So that's why I think we've suggested if we could take it on notice on what's still outstanding um, and what's still open that um, uh, the Ombudsman is waiting for. I guess I was going to a general general principle. I would have thought that um, I mean he, the Ombudsman can exercise a power which is pretty hard to resist, mm. uh, but. Normally, they'd look for a cooperative way to do business. Absolutely, and we, we always yeah. try and cooperate. Uh, yeah. I don't know a time we haven't cooperated with the yeah. ombudsman uh, for any requests they have for information yeah. from us. So, so I'm just not too sure. What's, what's a typical turnaround time between a request oh, yeah, for a document depends. and a, a I, response? I, I honestly think that would be very hard to answer. We'll try to do that for you afterward, uh, off, uh, on notice if you wish. I do think it depends upon the complexity of the uh, case. And we know that from experience, mm -hmm. and this is partly why it may have taken us a little while uh, longer with this particular client. We did actually turn around some information reasonably quickly, but I think the Ombudsman came back and sought more. And because um, this is a veteran with considerable needs, uh, it's taken a little while to possibly give them everything they need, but we'll find out. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I, I just find it absurd that this has been going on since um, August last year. I, I just find it absolutely... It blows me away with the state that Mr Fusen is in and that you have the Ombudsman uh, coming at you and wanting this information and you are still sitting... I, I just... I, this blows me away. It's nearly like... He's obviously looking into the effect that you've had on him and his family and it just makes me wonder whether you're actually slowing those requests down on purpose. Yeah. And that bothers me. Senator, okay. I, I, I would just say... I'm just telling we, you... No. We, we would not do no, that, that ever. OK. All right, so I just want to go down to... Um, how long is it taking uh, for the DVA to respond to requests for information or documents from the Royal Commission? Watch your, watch your turn around. Mm. Um, so, Senator, when we receive a notice from the Royal Commission, they will give us a date uh, which we are to respond. Um, we have made every attempt on most of those notices to respond in the, the time. If we are unable to, uh, then we go back and seek um, um, some further time uh, to be able to provide that information. But we make every effort to meet the, the timings of the Royal Commission. Um, OK, so could you please supply us with the data of how many requests for information um, have been asked for from the Royal Commission, how many have been given to them on time and how many are still outstanding. Um, and if those ones are outstanding, how much more time you are requesting for those, those, those that are outstanding. You'd like me to take that on notice? Or? Yep, thank yep. you. Have, um, Yeah, and how many of them were extended? I think I asked you that, sure. didn't I? Yeah, thank mm -hmm. you. Sorry. Um, have any of the commissioners or staff at the Royal Commission formally raised concern about delays from DVA in responding to requests for information or documents? 
I'm sorry, I missed it. Have that. you had any complaints from the Royal Commissioners or the staff working oh, um, uh, at the Royal Commission? Not directly. Have they raised any concerns about delays? Not directly to myself, but I am understanding that we um, were non-compliant in one of the requests um, because we were delayed in providing the response in time. Can you tell me what that request... I'll have to take that on. Okay, that's so fine. Can we have that? We don't need full days and names or whatever. Maybe just give us a rough thing why that was the case. Um, have you engaged anyone external to the public service to assist DVA's response to the Commission? Any private firms, communications group, public relations, advisors, lawyers, anyone like that? Have you specifically put them on? We've certainly engaged legal support, Senator, um, because of the document search that we need to undertake um, to provide uh, when we receive a notice to produce, we are required to um, have that legal support. It's a, a system that's used to provide all the documents. So we have that and we have engaged some additional legal support in helping us in that record retrieval and in supporting witnesses uh, appear before uh, the Royal Commission. But I'm happy to take that on notice and give you some further details. Do you know detail. who those law firms are that you've engaged? Can you name them? Can anyone else in here name them now? I can uh, name the... Um, uh, the firm that is doing the document search, it's, um, and I always get their name right, Minter Elson. Minter Elson. Okay. Uh, and uh, is there another firm doing other stuff, or are they just private lawyers contracted, or...? Um, we may have some other individual lawyers. We do have some on Sir Comet from the Australian Government Solicitor. So I can give you um, a breakdown or notice. I'd rather not try and... Yep, that's fine. Details. That's fine. So you're you're not you have not put any new, you haven't given any new contracts out. You haven't commissioned any firms to do communications, public relations, um, that sort of thing. You haven't employed anyone since that royal commission we, to pursue. We have employed do that. some. We have employed some individuals on contracts to support us in um, because the workload has increased. So I, I I have employed additional contractors to support us. How many contractors have oh, you? I'd have to take that on notice. Sorry. I've How much have money notice. have you spent on that? And what sort of contractors are they? Are they once again? You've said contractors, but what what communications contractors, public relations ones? What you must know what you're having. Yeah, what are they no, doing? No public relations, but certainly um, some supporting communications, uh, supporting legal, as you've already identified. Um, some support in other areas, just uh, in bringing together all of the the responses that we need to. But that's probably about it. But I'd rather make sure that I'm giving you all the facts because we did receive funding in. Uh, budget, as you know, of around $23 million to su support the department in responding to the Royal Commission. Okay. So can you just provide a, whatever your, your views so far in relation to that? Um, uh, yeah, in relation to that, anything that's been non-legal help besides what I've asked you to provide about them sure. um, that you've used now money for, for anything to do with the Royal Commission? Can you uh, supply that to the uh, Royal Commission? Uh, to the committee? committee. Yep. Sorry, yes, thank that's you. Okay. Um, I just want to talk about the McKinsey Review and finish off, but um, of your claims processing, and I know that Senator Ayres has touched on this, what did you learn from the consultants that you didn't know already? Well, the diagnostic was probably the most extensive diagnostic work we've had in relation to our processing um, in the department. It was very, it was very extensive. Um, and no, no, that's uh, not what I ask you. I want to I know can what ask you Ms. Rundle to, to talk. I can't tell you about the recommendations as no, I no, mentioned, no, no, Senator, no, I but just... we've certainly learned a few things that um, that were um, McKinsey's were asked to have a look at. So, Ms. Rundle, can you? Yeah. Take what, what were yeah. they that you didn't already know? Um, Without going, so I can talk broadly about this because otherwise it sort of goes to the uh, the content of the report that's being considered at the moment. But what McKenzie did was they looked at a range of things. They looked at the, and they were asked to do this, so this is in the public domain. They looked at the end-to-end -end, uh, claims processing across the contemporary claims. So they are Durka, IL and PI, Merca, IL and PI, and VEA disability claims. They, for each one of those, they mapped uh, the pathway and they looked at 
the experience of um, clients, veterans and families, and they identified some of the pain points, which was uh, something we had asked them to do. They also did the same thing. They talked to, they reviewed a lot of documentation, a lot of, they looked at m much of our, uh, during our veteran-centric reform, we had done a lot of engagement with families and uh, veterans, and they looked at all of those and collected up all of that intelligence that the community had given us. They, uh, they sat down in the claims office, particularly in New South Wales, and they looked at the, the systems and how the systems worked for a delegate making decisions, and they did a lot of discussions with staff and met with them to look at what staff experience in the end-to-end -end process to be able to work out where were the improvements that could possibly be made with the aim of doing two things, to reduce the time taken to do unnecessary things so that we could make the experience better and faster for veterans and to reduce the backlog. So, so that's, that's what they did. Okay, so you're telling me with all the consultancy that's been done, I won't name the hundred millions of dollars that you've paid out and who to over the last 10 years, I simply asked these questions. What did they possibly, what did you, what, what did they give you that you didn't already know that the rest of us already know, honestly, seriously? Well, I actually think they did. Uh, and again, okay. They, okay. It, I did, I do. And I think that um, uh, the secretary has already said this and uh, nothing is truer than the fact that DVA staff are, are completely focused on trying to reduce the claims uh, backlog. And, and we, we just did not have the sort of capacity and the skill set that an independent consultant brings to a problem. And they bring global expertise, having done similar work elsewhere, which show you some things and give you insight into problems that you may not okay. otherwise know. Okay, so, so um, once again, uh, Minister, uh, it would be good if that document could be released, please. Sure, well, I'll take that on notice Thank as well. Thank you. Um, you told, told me last <coughs> estimates that the McKinsey would set goals for the department to meet over the next 24 months, right, when it, when it was seen. So the first set of goals was for the three-month mark, which would be coming up soon. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Or was that to start later? The, the way that uh, uh, will the best way to describe this to you is uh, they were asked to give a high-level roadmap with milestones, and you're right, three, six, nine, mm -hmm. 12, 18, 24 months. And uh, it's fair to say for those things, we, we, because they are still being considered by government, then that clock would start ticking uh, from the time that we were able to implement, because clearly we wouldn't be able to implement something within three months if we hadn't uh, received a green, a green light to start implementation. Okay, so um, we touched on this before, but just in case, did the Veterans Suicide Royal Commissioners or any officials working at the Royal Commission raise concerns with the department or the minister's office that the McKinsey Review may hinder their inquiry in any way? I think um, we provided the um, a statement from the, the Commission. No, 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 I'm not taken. asking about the statement. I'm going to ask beyond the statement. The statement looks pretty. That's lovely. And it seems funny that they do this big statement and, oh, my goodness, look at all we saw McKinsey. Why would you put that in there? What else was giving to either you guys or the Minister behind closed doors that we haven't got with this? There's no way you would put a statement out of it and him the commissioners write that much about McKinsey. They were concerned about it. They were concerned about it. So, so somebody has received correspondence. Now that's either been you as Veterans Affairs or the minister, and we would like to see that, please. Um, I'll take that on notice. You do that, thank you. Um, Five minutes, Senator. I have a few questions to finish on a positive note. Oh, um, Chair, I'm going to give you 10. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, in How's that, that for you? Uh, well, Not well because done, I'm Senator. fond of you either. Thank you. <laughs> no, there you go. Thank you so much. All Chair. right. Thank you. Um, just want to revisit the issue of um, 
the psychiatric assistance dogs uh, seems to be a good, good uh, program. And I was wondering whether we could be given an update on dogs, veterans matching, what's the latest and how's it being received? Certainly, And be careful of the earrings. I will, <laughs> Senator, thank you. Um, I'll just grab my dashboard. It's been received extremely well, Senator. Um, we have had an interim report back from the La Trobe University trial and um, the feedback that they have been getting and the um, interim findings that they have given us, noting that it's a small sample, mm. um, very positive about the impact on the veterans that have been participating. <coughs> to date, we've had 381 applications, and of those, 72 have actually graduated through, so that's to the point where they've passed both their public access tests and the veterans and the dogs are living together. Um, we've had 44 out of WA, 120 from Queensland, 96 from New South Wales, 9 from Tassie, uh, 54 Victoria, 43 South Australia, 12 from the ACT and 3 from the Northern Territory. And, bit, sorry? I was just sorry, they are a bit slow in Tassie. Is that because of the lack of dog trainers or something we've got down there? Because I know there's quite a few people, I'm not sure if the Chair's heard, he's probably heard too. We've got quite a few of those veterans down there looking for that, is there a problem? Yeah. We do have Food national supply. coverage yeah. from the four, from the four providers supplies. that we have, that's yeah. exactly right. Okay. But there has been a little slowing in the, in the actual supply of pups. Oh, You'll okay. probably recall during COVID that there was quite a rush on um, a lot of people mm. wanting to oh, get dogs as pets. Yeah, so there's a lot of competition for actually accessing the dogs themselves. Um, but that's, um, uh, that's picking up. Um, we've actually got um, 118 at the moment, dogs and veterans who are in training, and another 63 who are going through the dog uh, matching exercise. So um, we are seeing a, a really good increase uh, in numbers across the board. And I think last time we were here at Estimates, there might have only been one or two from Tassie. So we're up mm. to nine now, so it is increasing. Good. Mm, it's great. Well, all strength to your arm with that one. And on that note, uh, can I thank you, Assistant Minister, Secretary and officials uh, from the Veterans of Department of Veterans Affairs. And the committee is now adjourned until 9am tomorrow morning when we will consider matters defence. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.